Pepsodent invite you to have a date with Judy. It's a summer evening on the Foster front porch. Judy and her friend Mitzi are there, and Judy's brother Randolph is kibitzing. This is the third night in a consecutive hunk I don't have a date. Oh, business is bad with me, too, Judy. I wonder what's become of men. It isn't what's become of them I care about. It's what's going to become of me. And what's going to become of my new evening gown if I never wear it. It'll just probably stay in the cupboard until one day it falls off the hook. Dead. Be quiet, Randolph. You know, this is the longest lull without dates I've ever known since, well, for a couple of weeks, anyway. I know what, Judy. Let's have a party. Oh, Mitzi, that's a brilliant idea. It'll put us right back on our feet socially. Well, anyhow, it'll give you another crack at the boys. <laughs> you know, the trouble with most parties is other girls. You too positively said it. It seems like every time I give a party, some other girl gets, well, practically engaged. If you could only have a party without other girls. Just with boys. Mitzi, why couldn't we? Why couldn't we what? Have a party and just invite boys. Millions of them. We'd have all the men to ourselves because the only girls who'd be there would be us. Are you sure you want Mitzi to come? <laughs> well, when will we have it? Tomorrow night. What do you say? It's a deal, Judy. Okay. We'd better start inviting boys right now. Isn't this a scrumptious idea? Yes, except do you think the boys will want to come to the party when they find out we're the only girls there? We won't tell them. But won't it be kind of a letdown when they find it out at the party? We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Come on, Mitzi, we're going over to your house now and call the boys. Why can't we do it here at your house, Judy? Because my family gets nervous when I use the phone 25 or 30 times in a row. So does mine. Oh, but Judy doesn't have to live with your family, Mitzi. Come on, Mitzi. If you let us call the boys from your house, I'll have the party at my house. Sounds fair enough. Hi, Mother. Hello, Randolph. Where have you been? Out on the porch with Judy and Mitzi. Aren't girls weird? Mm-hmm. Babble, 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 back and forth. No. Hey, Mother, you're not even listening to me. I'm very busy right now, Randolph. What you doing? I'm counting the people I've invited to my party tomorrow night. Your party tomorrow night? Well, certainly. Who else would be having a party tomorrow night? Well, you never can tell. <laughs> You see, I thought it would be a good chance to have a very snooty hen party while your father's out of town. Yeah, but under the circumstances, I think you'd better forget Randolph, about... Randolph, please, go over to Curly's house or someplace. I haven't time to chat. Chatting might be very profitable at this moment, Mother. On account of I can hand you some chat that'll make your hair stand on end. Now, that's enough. For a boy your age, you talk too much, Randolph. Tomorrow night about this time, will you please remind me of that remark? Now, let me see... Mrs. Smith makes 11, Mrs. Goodman makes 12, Mrs. Randolph, aren't you gone yet? That settles it. I will now stand by and let nature take its course. <laughs> there, I guess that does it. Well, Randolph, what are you going to do tomorrow night? Me? I'm just going to sit back and enjoy a double feature. <laughs> Well, it looks like fireworks coming up in the foster home. You've heard the cause. In a minute, you'll hear the effect. Here's another case of plain cause and effect. I know a girl just like Judy who's had unusually good luck lately. Cause, Pepsodent. Effect, sparkling teeth and a brighter smile. No wonder her luck's changed. Pepsodent removed that dingy coating from her teeth, and now they're sparkling clean, and she has a dazzling smile. So many attentions come her way, the girls say she's lucky, but the men say she's a knockout. Tomorrow may be your lucky day, if you're ready to attract good luck with a dazzling Pepsodent smile. Go to your drug counter tonight and say, Pepsodent toothpaste, please. And remember, government orders, take an empty tube with you, any size from any product, to exchange for a new tube of Pepsodent. And now, let's get back to that date we have with Judy. Judy, I want you to help me with something for the party tonight. The party? Then you know about it. Well, what do you mean, know about it? I'm up to my ears in work for it, aren't I? Oh, but I hate to see you working so hard. I was Hold going the step to... Hold a stepladder, will you, dear? I want to get down the sterling silver. The sterling silver? 
Gee, Mother, you shouldn't go to all that trouble. The everyday silver would be perfectly good enough. <laughs> don't be silly. They'd all go home and talk about me if I just had everyday silver on the table. Oh, I don't think they would. I don't think they'd even notice it. <laughs> My dear, they'd notice it if there was a dead fly on the inside of a chandelier two inches from the ceiling. Oh, you won't need to worry about them hanging from chandeliers or anything. They'll probably behave pretty well, most of the time. Well, I certainly hope so. Well, look, I haven't time to gossip, Judy. I haven't even decided on a menu yet. Well, I was thinking about hot dogs and baked beans and maybe a bunch of dill pickles. Why, I never heard of anything so ridiculous in all my life. Hot dogs and... Judy, I'm going to have pâté de foie gras and caviar canapés, if I can get the caviar. And I might have a guinea hen. A guinea hen? Oh, Mother, how too utterly luxurious. Let's see. I suppose cocktails are out. Cocktails? Oh, Mother, don't be silly. Root beer's good enough. Judy. <laughs> if you don't stop making idiotic suggestions, root beer. I want this to be one of the nicest parties ever held in this house. Well, that's the way I feel about it, but I didn't know you felt that way. We'll have fruit punch and serve it with the hors d'oeuvre. Mother, you're just about the most understanding person I ever heard of in my whole life. Well, if I wouldn't understand how to have a nice party after all these years, it... You know this party's going to cost about ten or twelve dollars? Ten or twelve dollars? Oh, Mother, that's awfully generous. And since you're so terribly sweet, I'm going to put up 50 cents of my own money. Oh, Judy, you don't need to spend your money on this party. Why not, Mother? I'm glad to. Oh, Judy, sometimes I underestimate you. When you come right down to it, you're about the sweetest, most unselfish girl I know. Mr. Gordon, this is Mrs. Foster. I'd like to order some salted nuts for a party this evening. Hello, Mr. Spiegel. This is Judy Foster. Could you send over some cigars? No, they're not for Father. They're for party. Is this the record shop? Well, this is Judy Foster, and I'd like to buy a few records for a party I'm having tonight. Have you got Conk Me on the Bonk with a coconut? Oh, gee, that's wonderful. Is this Mr. Mayworm? Well, this is Mrs. Foster. Mr. Mayworm, I'm having a party tonight, and I wondered if you could come and play your lovely harp for the ladies. You can? Oh, Mr. Mayworm, that's wonderful. The selections? Well, suppose you play something sort of... Uh, well, yes, that'll be nice, but couldn't you play... Well, all right, but you see, the, uh, that's lovely, but you see... Uh, uh, no, Mr. Mayworm, I haven't any more suggestions. Goodbye. Hello, Randolph. Where's everybody? Well, Judy's upstairs dunking her loveliness in the bathtub. Mother just finished ducking hers. And me, I'm just hanging around. This is going to be quite a night. Gee, I guess somebody's coming already. Doggone if it isn't a man with a harp. How do you do, young man? Now, if you just hold the door open, I bring my harp in. Before you go to all that trouble, maybe it'd be a good idea to find out if you've got the right address. Well, this is the foster residence, isn't it? It is, where anything can happen. Hmm. Young man, is this the largest door you have in this house? <laughs> It's going to be very difficult to get my heart through it. Maybe you could sort of fly in through a window. No levity, young man. Kindly send for your mother. Mother! Mother! I did not say shout. Shouting is the only thing that gets results in this house. Did you call me, Randolph? You huh? see? Oh, goodness, Mr. Mayworm, you're here with your harp. Uh... Come right in. Well, he can come in, but the question is, can his harp? This is the smallest door I've ever encountered. Well, 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 don't break your harp trying to get it through. No, that would be catastrophic. <laughs> Randolph, suppose you run around to the backyard and see if Mr. Mayworm's harp can get through that way. Don't worry, I'll open wide them pearly gates. Come along, little fellow. Oh, hello, Mitzi. What are you doing here, waiting for Judy? Yes, Mrs. Foster. I think I'll go upstairs and hurry along. Oh, Somebody's here already. Heavens, and I haven't even got the punch ready. Hello, Dora. Surprise, I'm home. Melvin. Well, for goodness sake, 
I didn't expect you till the first of the week. Well, I have another surprise for you, dear. This is Mrs. Miller. How do you do? How do you do? Yes, I, I stopped off with the Millers in Cleveland to talk a little business, and I talked Mrs. Miller into spending a few days with us as our house guest. <laughs> well, how lovely. Uh... Well, isn't that grand? I knew you'd be tickled to death. <laughs> you know, I've talked to Dora so much about you, Mrs. Miller. You and your charming husband. <laughs> Haven't I, Dora? Oh, you certainly have. <laughs> well, goodness, uh, to think I'm having a party this evening. and uh, A party? Uh, a hand party. Just paying off some obligations, you know, Mrs. Miller. I see. Well, that's fine, then. <laughs> well, Dora, I suppose Mrs. Miller will want to go upstairs and change after the ride in. Hmm? <laughs> oh, of course. Uh, I'll show you to the guest room. Oh, I have news. Mr. Mayworm can't get his harp through the back door either. Oh, hello, Father. Oh, hello, son. Uh, Mrs. Miller, I want you to meet my boy, Randolph. How do you do? How do you do? I wonder if Mr. Mayworm should try the side door. I've told Randolph so much about you, Mrs. Miller. Haven't I, Randolph? Oh, oh, oh yes. I should say so. <laughs> oh, he's been drooling all over the place about you, Mrs. Miller. <laughs> yes, he certainly has been, Mrs. Miller. He's hardly talked about anything else for months. Randolph, suppose you show Mrs. Miller up to the guest room. I'd like to speak to your father a minute. Well, sure. Right this way, Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Follow me, Mrs. Miller. For goodness sake, Melvin, who is she? Dora, she's the stiffest, most straight-laced, tight-mouthed woman in the world. That's obvious, but I still ask, who is she? She's W.L. Miller's wife. And who is W.L. Miller? Just one of the biggest smoke tongue distributors in this country, that's all. Cheapers. Dora, if I can get this account, I won't have to give my business a thought for a year. I certainly hope this is going to be a nice, polite party. I hope you haven't asked any of your usual friends. Just what do you mean by that? No, no, don't get excited, dear. It's just that I want everything to go smoothly. Now, you've no idea how much influence Mrs. Miller has on W.L. She's got to go home and tell W.L. that she wants him to give me his account. Well, I'll do everything I can, dear. The guest is in the guest room taking off her duds. Thanks, Randall. <laughs> Dora, I hope you're not playing cards tonight. Why not? Well, nothing, except when some of your friends sit down to play bridge. It's no longer a polite social game. They play for blood. Does the Red Cross know about that? <laughs> really, Melvin, I don't send my friends to charm school before I invite them to a party. Besides, it's going to be a very dignified affair. There's no reason why it shouldn't be just the thing to please her. I can think of a few reasons. What's that, Randolph? Uh, sort of a quick glance at my watch makes me realize that it's too late to bring up a thing. Well, if you mean about Mr. Mayworm's harp... Have him try the side door. Uh, well, now, look, Dora, there's no sense of me hanging around. I I'm going to leave Mrs. Miller entirely to you. Well, what are you going to do, Melvin? Well, I think I'll go down and look in at the office. <laughs> you certainly don't want any men around the house tonight. I should say not. I should say not. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll just run along then. Have a good time tonight, Dora. And more important, see that Mrs. Miller has a good time. Oh, don't worry about her. My, Mrs. Miller certainly came as a surprise. Oh, well, I'm sure glad we have a nice party for her. Do you suppose everything is all set, Randolph? Like a fuse. <laughs> well, I guess somebody's here. Oh, hello, Mrs. Foster. Oh, Gerald, it's you. I guess Judy and Mitzi will be down in a minute. I hope you'll all go out someplace and don't come back till the party's over. Till the party's over? Hello, Gerald. Look. Oh, oh, hi, Judy. Hello, Mitzi. Hello, Gerald. Everything looks so nice, doesn't it, children? It's been a lot of work. The flowers and the... What are those cigars doing there? I put them there, Mother. Cigars? Why, well, I never heard of such a thing. Take them away at once. Well, it is a little daring. Daring? But... It's revolting. Well, I didn't expect they'd smoke them right now, Mother, but I thought it would be nice for them to take home and smoke them in a few years, maybe. <laughs> Judy! And I put the pretzels and popcorn on the table, too. I stuck them in a couple of pretzels. bowls. Pretzels? I... Mr. Mayworm can't get his heart through the side door either, Mother. <laughs> oh, for the love of heaven. Well said, Mother. Will everybody please stop being witty and stop putting pretzels and cigars around and let me think? Randolph, tell Mr. Mayworm to bring his harp up on the porch. Since he can't get the harp in the house, the ladies will have to come outside to hear him. The ladies, Mother? Well, certainly. What do you think I'm having to this party, men? No, but I am. Judy, what are you talking about? There are 15 women coming this evening. No, they're not. There are 15 boys coming. Aren't there, Mitzi? Judy's right, Mrs. Foster. See, Gerald's here already, and he's a boy. Aren't you, Gerald? Well, <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> Judy, do you mean to say you're having a party tonight? Of course. What have we been doing all this work for? For my party. You mean a lot of women are coming tonight? 
Judy Foster, why do you do these things to me? Don't worry, Mother. I could have invited my boy scout troop, but I didn't. <laughs> Mrs. Foster, Mrs. Foster, great news. I've just succeeded in getting my harp through the cellar door. I'm going out of my mind. Well, blow me down. Visitors. I'll answer. No, no, I'll go. You better let me do it. I'm neutral. Good evening. Good evening, Mrs. Hi, Hi Judy. Hi, all these boys and all these girls. My, what a coincidence. We'll be back on that date with Judy in just a minute. You know, there's a funny little trick that practical jokers try out once in a while. They'll stand talking to you and all the while gaze intently at your left ear. Well, you soon begin to feel uncomfortable. You wonder what's wrong. And you have that same uncomfortable feeling when someone keeps glancing away from you because he doesn't like the looks of your teeth. Dull, dingy teeth always make people look the other way. But teeth polished with Pepsodent make people look your way. For teeth with that shining Pepsodent sparkle attract attention and hold it. How about your teeth? Don't take it for granted that your teeth sparkle just because you brush them every day. Not all toothpaste can give you the same results Pepsodent does. For you see, Pepsodent contains irium, the super cleansing agent that loosens and flushes away that filmy coating you can feel with your tongue. It's this film that collects stains and hides the true luster of your teeth. Pepsodent removes it and then polishes teeth to a brilliant, shiny smoothness. So make your daily brushings pay dividends to your smile. Use Pepsodent and make teeth really sparkle. Tomorrow may be your big day, so get a tube of Pepsodent toothpaste tonight and be sure to have an empty tube with you to exchange when you say Pepsodent toothpaste, please. And now, back to Judy. Met all the boys, Mrs. Miller? I have. Gerald and Oogie and Red. And I believe this is Stinky over here. <laughs> well, you slut at Jojo Duran and Panty Waste Hoffman. <gasps> oh, gracious. Is anything wrong, Mrs. Miller? That boy just winked at me. What boy? That one. That's Oogie. I'm surprised at him. Well, there's just something in his eye. He's not being fresh, Mrs. Miller. Oh, Mrs. Foster. Uh, yes, Mrs. Newton. I think this is the most novel party. It takes me right back to my girlhood. And that's quite a trip. <laughs> Randolph, please. Hey, hey, Judy, come over here a minute. Okay, Gerald. Gee, I'm terribly sorry this happened. Oh, I honestly don't get this, Judy. All us boys and all those old dames. It's all a most terrible mess. But how was I to know Mother was having a party tonight? Oh, I understand about your mother's party, all right. But what I'm talking about is your party. Where are the girls? Well, there's Mitzi and me. Two girls for 15 men? Well, it was just an idea Mitzi and I had. Yeah. We thought it would work out all right, and it would have if Mother didn't have a party, too. Judy... Judy, I'm simply frantic. Mrs. Miller's just sitting there glaring. I think she's shocked to death. But at what, Mother? My goodness, nobody's done anything. I don't know what she thinks. I tried to explain we were having two parties, but I don't think she believes a word of it. Look at the way she's sitting there. She isn't very relaxed, is she? I just don't know what to do. If your father loses his business deal on account of us... Do you think it would help any if I got my more boys to mix with your girls? It certainly would not. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get everybody down in the cellar, and we'll listen to Mr. Mayworm play his harp. In the cellar? Well, he can't get his harp in anyplace else. So we'll just have to go down there. At least it'll get people's minds off each other. My fifth rendition. Oh, no. I have chosen a medley of the lesser known works of Giacomo Meyerbeer. Well, all right. Frankly, I didn't know that Meyerbeer had any lesser known works. Oh, brother, here we go again. Be 
quiet, Randolph. You're not supposed to be at this party anyhow. Who is? <laughs> Gee, boys, I'm terribly sorry about this. This is the hottest jam session I was ever to. I wish you'd jive it up a little. On a harp? I'm terribly sorry. It's all part of the horrible mistake. There are the best-looking girls at this party I ever saw. They're part of the mistake, too. Be quiet, Mitzi. Mr. Mayworm's glaring at us. Well, I'm glaring at him, too. My special favorite number is Mrs. Miller. Look, she's asleep on her double chin. Be quiet, Gerald. She's the guest of honor. No wonder. She's the cutest one on the whole bunch. I'm terribly sorry, Gerald. I guess you're not having a very good time. Oh, Judy, I'm loving every minute of it. <coughs> there goes my E string. This is too much. I can't go on. I just can't. Playing in a cellar like this, I'm not used to it. And all that whispering. No more strings, boom. <laughs> Pity, Mr. Mayworm. Now we won't be able to hear the end of the piece. No, <laughs> neither will I. <laughs> well, uh, we'll just have to go upstairs, ladies and uh, everybody. And Mr. Mayworm will have to play for us some other evening. That is debatable. Mother, Mother, come over here a minute. I want to talk to you. As a member of the family, can I be in on this conference? Be quiet, Randolph. Now, what is it, Judy? Well, on account of your women are kind of old for my men... I was wondering, could you take your party in the dining room and let my party dance in the living room? I don't care what we do anymore. Father's deal is beyond saving. Mrs. Miller's fast asleep anyhow. Are you going to wake her up, Mother, or are you going to leave her to enjoy herself? I'm going to wake her up. She's the guest of honor, and she's not going to get out of it this easily. Well, come on, everybody. My gang, I mean. We're going upstairs and play conga records. Oh, swell. That's See a great idea. Come on, and what are we ladies going to do, Mrs. Foster? Well, we're going to play bridge. Would you all please go upstairs to the dining room? Randolph, I'm going upstairs with the others. Could you tactfully wake up, Mrs. Miller? You bet. Oh, Mrs. Miller! Mrs. Miller! Uh-huh. Time to get up! Oh, what's that? I mean, uh, would you like to play some bridge? Oh, 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 lovely, lovely music. Oh, that's been over for five minutes. It has? I was sitting here thinking so deeply I didn't realize it. Oh, oh. That's conk me on the bonk with a coconut. Oh, don't say. Gay, isn't it? Oh, my word. What's that? Oh, they started a conga upstairs. That's the house bouncing. Good evening, Mr. Spiegel. I'd like some cigars. Sure, Mr. Foster. The usual brand? Yes, sir. How come you're not at the party at your house, Mr. Foster? Oh, that's my wife's party. She doesn't want me around. <laughs> she doesn't? That's very funny, Mr. Foster. Yeah, what's funny about wanting to steer clear of a hen party? A hen party? You know, I wouldn't be too sure about that. Just what are you driving at, Spiegel? Oh, oh nothing, nothing. Uh, forget I even said anything. I, I, I wouldn't want to hurt your feelings. Now, look, you're going to lose a good customer if you don't stop hedging and come right out with what you have to say. Well, uh, this is a delicate topic. But, Mr. Foster, there are men at your house tonight. Oh, no, you're mistaken. It's strictly for women. Well, all I know is I sent two boxes of cigars over to your house, and they weren't your brand. Yeah, uh, cigars. And I want you to know you have my sympathy. Why, well, I ought to punch you right in the nose. My wife wouldn't spit. Speak I'm going right home. If anything has happened to Mrs. Miller, I'm cooked. <laughs> Young people do make a lot of noise, don't they? You know, Mrs. Foster, just while I'm dummy, I think I'll go into the living room and see what they're doing. All right, Mrs. Newton, but hurry back. The last dummy we had went in the living room and never came back. Seems most of the ladies are in the living room. Mrs. Miller. Mrs. Miller, it's your turn to play. Uh, uh, oh, 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 um, I bid four spades. No, I'm sorry, the bidding is over. You're playing the hand. Oh, yes. I was just listening to the music. Weird, isn't it? Oh, I hope it isn't bothering you. Not at all, not at all. Well, girls, having fun. Randolph, what are you doing in here again? Go back in the living room. Okay. You know, I think I'll go with him. Just take my arm, Mrs. Miller. And, Mother, may I suggest you give up bridge entirely and play solitaire? Uh, well, what are they doing, Randolph? That's a conga line. My, isn't Mrs. Newton graceful? I can't wait to see you in action. Judy, what in the Sam Hill is going on in this house? Oh, hello, Father. When did you come in? Where's your mother? Judy, what are you doing? The conga. 
Here, turn that music off right away. Oh, Father. Mrs. Miller, has anybody seen Mrs. Melvin? Yes. Oh, Melvin, the most awful thing has happened. I'm so sorry. Well, you ought to be. What are you trying to do, ruin my business? I thought you said this was going to be a dignified evening. Well, it started out to be, but you mm, see... Well, if no one else will turn off that music, I will. Stopping it for, Mr. Foster. I was just beginning to enjoy myself. Enjoy yourself? Well, I, I don't get it, Mrs. Miller. I, I thought you'd be oh, Mr. Foster, I congratulate you. Oh, dear, this is the first time in my life I've had a good time with a business acquaintance of my husband's. Most of them are so straight-laced and boring. Really? <laughs> oh, dear, if you knew how many harp solos and mezzo sopranos I've listened to, and I've been to so many bridge parties, I'm numb. Oh, I tell you, it's a pleasure to find people who know how to enjoy themselves. Oh, well, thank you. Why don't you join our conga line, Mrs. Miller? Oh, well, I, I don't know how to conga, but I bet I can still bunny hug. <laughs> bunny hug? Oh, Mrs. Miller, that's a wonderful idea. I think these young people would love it. I'll play the piano. Oh, well, I, I don't like to brag, but uh, I was the bunny hug champion of northern Ohio in 1911. <laughs> well, I'll be a son of a gun. Well, come on, show us how, Mrs. Miller. <laughs> well, all right. I, I, now, all you do is put your arms around your partner like this and let her rip. Oh, <laughs> oh my. Remember, I'm a little rusty. Not so as you'd notice it. <laughs> I surely never figured her for a jitterbug. Hey, what do you say, everybody? Let's all do it. This is lots better than La Conga. Well, this is wonderful. But she's having such a good time, I must search to get that contract. Judy. Yes, Father? You know, you'd do well to take a tip from your mother. She certainly knows how to entertain. Father, you too positively said it. There's more coming. Which reminds me, there's more coming from me, too. I haven't said anything yet about the Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush and how it does right by your teeth. But I will. It does right by tender gums, too. Doesn't scratch them. Not even when the brush is new. And the Pepsodent brush has gentle nylon bristles that feel great. They don't get soggy or flabby. They stay alive and springy. And because there are 50 tufts of those gentle nylon bristles, they do an extra swell job of cleaning teeth. It's a pleasure to use the Pepsodent brush because you don't have to break it in. It feels grand right from the start. Get a Pepsodent 50 Tough toothbrush tonight for each member of your family, and you'll get a bonus with every brush. A cash certificate worth 10 cents extra spending money. It was some party. Wasn't it? Gee, everybody had the best time after it got started. Well, Mrs. Miller's gone to bed. I should think so. She was exhausted. You know, it was the first party I didn't have to worry about the other women snagging all the men. I can understand that. <laughs> but, Melvin, how will we entertain Mrs. Miller tomorrow night? Oh, Mother, that's all arranged. The gang's coming over and we're going to teach her how to conga. Before anybody does anything, there's a job to do in the cellar. Why, what's wrong, Randolph? It's Mr. Maywarm. He can't get his harp out of the cellar. Remember, you all have a date with Judy on Tuesday next. A Date with Judy with Deli Ellis and Dix Davis is written by Aline Leslie and Jerome Lawrence. Original music by Gordon Jenkins. And remember, too, for the safety of your smile, use Pepsodent twice a day. See your dentist twice a year. Larry Keating speaking. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. K. 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 Pepsodent.
invite you to have a date with Judy. Let's see. It's early evening in the foster home, and Father, Judy, and Randolph are waiting anxiously for the phone to ring. That's it. That's Mother. Judy, hurry up. Father says long distance call through. I'll be right there. Hello, Dora. Hello. Melvin? Well, now, who else would be calling you long distance? What did you say, dear? I said, who else would be calling you long distance? Well, how's everything in Springfield? How's Grandma? Just fine. She wants me to stay another week. Well, now, don't stay too long. I I miss your cooking. What? I said I miss your cooking. You don't need to rub it in, Father. How's Judy and Randolph? Uh, Just a minute. I'll let you talk to them. Here, here, Judy. Talk to your mother. Hello, Mother. Hello, Judy. How are you, dear? Just fine, Mother. Just a minute. I'll let you talk to Randolph. Hello, Mother. Hello, Randolph. How are you, dear? Just fine. Just a minute. I'll let you talk to Father again. Uh, Hello, Dora. How are you, dear? We're just fine, Dora. Isn't it amazing? Every one of us is just fine. Melvin, Grandma wants to say a few words. All right. Hello, Melvin. Hello, Grandma. How are you feeling? I can't hear you. I I said, how are you feeling? Well, I don't know what you said, but this sounds good. How are you feeling? Uh... (laughs) Who, me? Oh, I'm feeling fine. Well, I... I don't want to take up any more time. After all, this is a long-distance call, and Aunt Lily wants to say a few words. Hold the line. Uh, what was that? I said hold the line. Yeah. Here's Lily. Hello, Melvin. Uh, hello, Lily. How are you? I'm fine, but I know this is costing money, so I'm going to let Uncle Pete say a few words. Hello, Melvin. How are you? Uh, great, Pete. Great. Uh, how's business? Well, I tell you, but after all, this is a long-distance call, and I don't want to take up too much time. Besides, Dora's dying to talk to you again. All right. Hello, Melvin. Hello, Dora. This is a fascinating conversation. Well, I suppose I'd better hang up now. After all, this is a long-distance call. But we haven't been talking three minutes yet. Uh, What did you say, dear? I said we haven't been talking three minutes yet. Look out, Father. You'll spend three minutes telling her you haven't been talking three minutes. Anyhow, there's something I want to tell you, Dora. You know the old Reynolds house on Maple Street? Oh, yes. The one with the lovely old lawn. Yes. Well, well, I got it on a trade. On what, dear? A trade. I bought a lot for the factory expansion, and I got the house on trade. Well, what are you going to do with it? Well, I thought we might uh, live in it. Will we really, Father? Oh, Melvin, that's wonderful. Well, we'll talk about it when you get home. All right, dear. Well, this is a long-distance call, so goodbye, dear, and kiss the children for me. All right, Dora, goodbye. Are we really going to move, Father? Oh, why not? It's a good house. Well, children, now that I've talked to your mother, I'm going to bed. Now, don't you stay up too late. Gee, that's super. Maple tree. Good night. Good night, Father. Good night. Randolph, I have the most luxurious idea. Wouldn't it be wonderful if Mother could arrive home and find herself just entirely moved? Well, who's going to do it, the little brownies? On account of if you're counting on me. I am counting on you, Randolph. We've been living off Mother and Father long enough without taking any responsibility. I'm satisfied. Randolph, we won't say a word to anyone. Not even Father. You know what we're going to do? I hate to think. We're going to start moving tomorrow. Yes, things are beginning to move in tonight's date with Judy. Chaperone by Pepsodil. And we'll find out which way they're moving in a moment. You know, it's surprising how many people go around with dingy teeth. Not because they can't help it, just because they don't know it. If they'd only make the tongue test, they'd find out quick. Try it yourself right now. Run the tip of your tongue over your teeth. Do you feel a filmy coating? Then switch to Pepsodent tonight. Pepsodent removes that filmy coating you can feel with your tongue. Flushes it away, dingy stains and all. Polishes your teeth to a beautiful, shining brilliance. Make the tongue test again after using Pepsodent, and your teeth feel shiny, smooth to your tongue. They feel clean, they look clean, they are clean. Get a tube of Pepsodent toothpaste tonight and see how much better you look when your teeth shine and your smile is sparkling. And now, let's get back to that date with Judy. I guess this is the house, Randolph. It's empty. This big hunk of masonry? Isn't it luxurious? It's practically a mansion. Well, let's take down the for sale sign and go in. I'm positively panting to see the inside. 
right this big. Foster found it didn't look positively puny living in this big dump. How will we get in? Well, the door's locked. Groupers. It looks all marbly and everything inside. Like a palace almost. Stand back, Princess. I'll try a window. Oh, that was easy. Let's climb in. Jesus, it's kind of gloomy. Hey, a marble staircase. Gosh, I never expected to see the day I'd live in a house with a marble staircase. Judy, look, I'm here in the entrance. What'd you find, Randolph? A fish pond, a fish pond right smack inside of the house. And a fountain right smack inside of the fish pond. Oh, Randolph, it's too terribly elegant. Well, one thing, we'll never be lonesome with a bunch of fish living here with us. <laughs> of course, the house needs a lot of work. And the pond needs a lot of fish. We'll have to do something about these floors and walls. Ourselves, personally? Of course. We'll save Father all the expense we can. He won't have to pay for a single thing, except wallpaper and paste and paint and brushes. New floors and walls will put life into this house. You know what else will put life into this house? What? Fish. Young man, you've been looking at the goldfish for the last half hour. Have you made up your mind yet? Well, this is a difficult purchase. You know, it isn't every fish you can live with. How about goldfish? People have been living with them for years. No, I think you get kind of tired of goldfishing time. I had some once in a bowl, and I got tired of them the first time I had to change the water. <laughs> have you got any cleaner fish than goldfish? Well, the swordfish have nice habits. Well, they're rather large for our house. What about pollywogs? Well, they're rather small. What do you think of speckled trout? Well, I think they're quite speckled. Well, I wish you'd make up your mind. You're the toughest customer I ever had. Oh, Randolph, did you buy the fish yet? Why should he hurry? What else have I got to do today but wait on him? As a matter of fact, I'm torn between speckled trout and guppies. Oh, I think guppies are adorable. I think we ought to take them. Well, you know, on a pinch, you can eat a trout. Oh, I wouldn't eat a fish on you personally. Well, okay, mister. I'll take two dozen guppies. Wrap them up. It would be a pleasure. Well, that's over. Now all we have to do is hang the wallpaper and paint the floors. That shouldn't take us any time at all. Oh, Randolph, I'm so tired of painting. I've been doing it for a solid half hour, and all I've got painted is the upstairs. Oh, that's not bad, Judy. It took Michelangelo years just to paint the ceiling. I think I'll stop painting for a while and wallpaper for a bit. Knocking off a room or two every ten minutes. Well, I don't poke around like you. My goodness, it's taken you the whole half hour just to wallpaper the dining room. <laughs> yes, but it's neat. What happened to the fireplace? Well, I thought I'd take the course of easiest resistance. Meaning what? Well, I tapered over it. <laughs> sort of ran into difficulties tapering around it. I thought it'd be easier to cut the paper off later when we need the fireplace. We have to wait till winter to see that beautiful fireplace? Oh, I'll cut it out someday when I have some spare time. Hello, folks. Oh, hello. Who are you? I'm the gas man. I come to turn on the gas. Oh, Randolph, guess what? We're going to have gas. Well, isn't that just dandy? I've been all over the back of the house, and so far I ain't been able to find the gas meter. Oh, I'm sure it must be around someplace. Yeah, it usually is. I wish some of the other people had come. Have you seen any of your co-workers, mister? Like the water man and the electricity man and the telephone man? No, ma'am. We usually go our separate ways. Well, I wish they'd come. My goodness, I sent for them early this morning. Is that so? Yeah, my fish are especially anxious for the water man to come. They're in a little pail of water and they're just dying to get in the pond. That's too bad. Well, I guess I'll go ahead and... With the wallpaper. I think I'll start in the wall hall here. Yeah. Oh, aren't you going to take the cobwebs off the wall first? Why, no. The wallpaper will cover them anyhow. <laughs> I guess you got something there. Oh, good. This paste is awfully good. Could I help you, lady? Well, you could hold this bell while I stand up on it hang the wallpaper. It's a pleasure. Thanks very much. See, this is kind of fun. I always did like pasting these together ever since I was a little girl and made paper dolls. You've got that paper a little crooked there, lady. Oh, I don't think it makes a lot of difference. Randolph, look. While I stand up on this bell and paste the paper up on the upper part of the wall, you stand below me and take it the rest of the way down. It's a deal. You're a little crooked again, lady. The critic says you're a little crooked again, Judy. Oh, just a very little. 
Well, I want this to be perfect. Well, we'll do our level best to please you. I just love to dabble around in paste. Mister, whatever got you started on the career of a gas man? I don't know. I went out one day looking for a job, and when I came home that night, I was a gas man. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Well, I'm going to get off the barrel. I want to stand back and see what this looks like. Hold out your hand, mister, while I jump. It's a pleasure. Mm. Well, it doesn't look so bad. Except for one thing. That big lump down at the bottom. You're darn right. I'm the lump. <laughs> well, Jeepers, how did you get under the paper? I mean, just how the cobwebs must feel under there. Trapped. Oh, goopers. This is a mess. I'm very discouraged. I think I may know the way out of this darkness. I read a book once, Tom Sawyer by M. Twain. There was a very similar situation. What happened? Well, he was painting a fence, and it gave him a pain in the epiglottis. But did he let on it was a pain in the epiglottis? No. He pretended it was a veritable circus. And you know what happened? No. Everybody else wanted to do it for him. Honest? Yep. Now, Judy, if you'll be so good as to wipe a little paste off my second best suit... I'll go out in the world and come back with a whole army of willing workers. You know, that kid's got a good thinker on him. Our case is here in the class closet. We don't walk in the Look out, Shirley. Don't come in here. The paint isn't dry. The kitchen's all papered, Randolph. Oh, fine, Hilbert. One kitchen paper. Check. And Mitzi wanted me to tell you that she's nearly finished painting the dining room floor. One dining room floor, slightly painted. Check. She can't get in to report personally. She's painted all around herself. Oh. She's marooned in the middle of the floor. Oh, hiya, Judy. This is darling of you kids. Isn't it wonderful of them, Randolph? Oh, think nothing of it. Why don't you help them, Randolph? I'm supervising. Come to think of it, why don't you help them? I'm busy encouraging them. Hey, look, guppies in this fish pond. Yeah, they're all settled. And they seem very happy in their new home. Well, if I'm going to be happy in my new home, the telephone man had better get here. Bear up, child. The phone's in. Look, folks, I'm in a desperate position. I've been all over this house with a fine-tooth comb, and I still can't find the gas meter. Oh, how terrible. <gasps> Gee, Randolph, I wonder if you could have wallpapered over it. Oh, not me. I wouldn't do anything like that. Listen. Listen, everybody. Huh? Stop painting and papering. We've got to take time off and help the gas man find the gas meter. Oh, a treasure hunt? Hilbert, that's a wonderful idea. And whoever finds the gas meter wins a prize. Well, what's the prize? Whoever finds it first gets to shellac the kitchen linoleum. Oh, well, don't worry. We'll find it if we have to tear the house apart. You're doing okay now. <laughs> hey, come on, you kids. Let's go, huh? Strange thing, mob psychology. I wonder who that is. You the lady of the house? Well, in a way, yes. Then sign here. What? Sign here. She makes it a point never to sign anything without reading it first. Listen, this ain't the only load of furniture I've got to deliver today. Sign here. Well, okay. That'll be $23.40. How much? You heard me, $23.40. Hurry up and get it from your mall so we can start unloading this stuff. Well, I doubt very much if we have $23.40. Can't you just charge it to Melvin Foster? Sorry, bud. We do strictly a cash-on-the-line business. Oh, Randolph. I guess we'll have to call Father after all. Gene, I did want it to be a surprise about us moving. Oh, he'll still find a few things to be surprised about. <laughs> Wait till he sees this house. Well, anyhow, this will give me a chance to try out the new phone. Gee, where's all that money just for moving a little furniture? Foster's office. Hello, Miss Perkins. Is Father there? He's not in, Judy. He's at the railroad station. What's he doing there? Oh, I thought you knew. Your mother and grandmother are arriving on the 5.30 train. Oh, no. That can't be. He got a wire. Oh, Coopers. Goodbye. Good news, no doubt. Randolph. Mother's back. I don't believe it. She got in on the 5.30 train. And Grandma's coming with her. It's almost 5.30 now. You got my money? Well... No, my father's not in his office. No money, no furniture. Goodbye. Hey, where are you going? When you get the dough, let me know. Gee, there goes the furniture. What will we do now? You think he'd take a down payment? Maybe. Well, I know where there's five bucks. Oh, wonderful. Well, let's go back to the old house and get it. All right. Hey, whoa. On second thought, there's a slight complication. What? 
The moving company's already got my five bucks. It's in the top drawer of my dresser. We'll be back with Judy in just a moment. You know, I've noticed at every party, there's always one girl who has a group of admiring men around her. And she doesn't use hypnotism either. She may not be beautiful, but there's one thing she's sure to have, and that's an engaging smile. The Pepsodent kind of a smile that flashes out from shiny, sparkling teeth. Everybody likes to look at teeth that sparkle and shine, but dingy teeth make people look the other way. You may have dingy teeth without realizing it, because you may not be getting the results you think you are getting from your toothpaste. Here's the way to find out. Run the tip of your tongue over your teeth. You feel that filmy coating... That film on teeth collects stains, so no wonder your teeth look dingy. Better rush to your nearest drug counter and get a tube of Pepsodent toothpaste. Pepsodent contains a super cleansing agent, Irium, that washes away the dingy coating from your teeth, makes them so clean they're shiny smooth to your tongue, brilliant and sparkling. And the cool, clean flavor of Pepsodent makes your mouth feel as fresh as a lake breeze. Tomorrow may be your big day. So go to your drug counter tonight for a tube of Pepsodent toothpaste. And remember to take an empty metal tube with you. And now, let's get back to that date with Judy. We're almost home, Grandma. I always say, east, west, home's best. Certainly will be good to jump into a nice warm bath after that train trip. I never expected you back so soon, Dora. And Grandma here, too. Boy, was I tickled when I got your wire. Yep, here we are. All out. Oh, it's swell being home. Do you know what I'm looking forward to? Sleeping in that old four-poster bed that used to be Grandpa's and mine. I haven't slept in that bed for 20 years. Been missing it all this time. Sorry I ever gave it to you, Dora. Oh, Grandma. <laughs> now, you two are just going to take it nice and easy. It's going to be wonderful being in a house where there's some young people and some excitement once in a while. My house is so quiet and empty nowadays. <laughs> well, Grandma, there isn't anything very exciting. Melvin! What's the matter? I, I d- Melvin, where's the furniture? Gracious! It's gone! Everything's gone! For the love of heaven! There's not a stick of furniture in the house. Well, everything was here this morning when I left. Melvin, did you move into the Reynolds house while we were gone? Move? With you away? Do you think I'm crazy? Grandma, Mother. Hi, Grandma. Welcome home, Mother. Judy, Randolph, come and kiss Grandma. Judy, Randolph, have you two done anything that got anything to do with the bare condition of this house? Well, yes, it's part of a surprise. Surprise is putting it kind of mildly. Father, we moved. Moved. Now, you don't need to worry about a thing. We've got the new house all fixed up. The floors are all... Even the fish are in the fish pond. Now, now, wait a minute. Let it leak out gradually. I don't think I can take it all in one solid hunk. Now, don't worry, Father. We've taken care of just positively everything. The lights are on and the telephone's in and the water's turned on. There's only one small item that's bothering us. What's that? Well, the furniture. What's wrong with it? It isn't there. It isn't there? No. Well, if it isn't there and if it isn't here, where is it? Well, when last seen, it was heading south on Maple Street. (laughs) What? But you don't need to worry about it, Father. Yeah, I'm sure it'll turn up one of these days. Don't drive so fast, Judy. Oh, be quiet, Dora. This is fun. I'm sorry, Mother. I'm just so anxious for all of you to see what our gang has done to the new house. I can hardly wait. What are we stopping here for? Well, because this is our new house. It most certainly is not. What? The old Reynolds place is three blocks down on the other side of the street. Would you mind saying that again, Father? I said this is not the house I bought. Are you sure, Father? Well, of course I'm sure. Gloomy, Zoomy, this is grim. Judy... This isn't the house you wallpapered and got all fixed up, is it? Yes. Oh, for the love of heaven. Can't I turn my back for a minute without something terrible happening? All that energy gone to waste. Hours and hours. I hate to look, but we'd better go in and see what you did to this house. (laughs) This is a mighty interesting situation. Let me help you out, Grandma. Help me nothing. I'm not so old I can't get out of a car myself. Judy, 
Whatever made you think this was the house? Well, Father said it was a mansion on Maple Street. Mansion? It's a monstrosity. Why, well, they haven't been able to rent it for years. But look, there's a marble staircase and a fish pond. With fish? Are you sure you wouldn't rather live here? I'd just love to live here. I'd just be crazy to live here. Judy, will you please get it through your head? It isn't mine. You're darn right it isn't yours. Uh, Who said that? I did. May I ask what the devil you're doing on my property? Well, I'm very sorry, Mr... Buckley. Uh, uh, Buckley, yes, Mr. Buckley. My, my, my son and daughter just made a little mistake, that's all. I, uh, they, they thought this house was mine. And I suppose your son and daughter stuck striped wallpaper all over my walls and slopped cheap paint all over my floors. It's not cheap paint. It was very expensive. How expensive? Who paid for it? Why, you did, Father. We charge it to you, naturally. And the wallpaper, too, I suppose. Well, naturally. That's not the only thing you're going to pay for. Either you settle for the damage these kids have done, or you've got a lawsuit on your hands. Well, you don't have to scream, Buckley, even though this is your house. I can scream on my property any time I please. Then I can, too, if I have to pay damages for it. That's right, Melvin. Give it to him. Yeah. <laughs> Melvin, please, let's not have a fight. Father, you haven't got time to fight. You've got to try to find the furniture. Oh, the furniture. Yes, yes, all right. I'll, I'll call the moving company right away. Take your hands off that telephone. I'll not take my hands off the telephone. This is my house, and I say you can't use the telephone. My children happen to order this telephone, and I'm paying the bill. And I'll use it just as much as I please. Give it to him, Melvin. <laughs> Judy, what moving company was it? Well, Judy, I don't remember. <laughs> You've got to remember, we won't have a bed to sleep in tonight if you don't. Think, darling. All of a sudden, it slipped my mind. Randolph, do you remember? Judy, call him, not me. Good grief, the things that happened to me. I hope you can't find your furniture. That's a fine thing to say. Hello, information. Give me the numbers of every van and storage company in town. Griffin Storage? Do you have a load of furniture belonging to Melvin Foster? No, you don't. Thank you. Prospect moving? Do you have a load of furniture to be delivered to Maple Street? Oh, all they move is buildings. Elite moving? Hey, could you tell me if you have some furniture belonging to Melvin Foster? No, don't look at the dead storage. This furniture is very much alive. Yes, you do? Yes, that's my furniture, all right. All right, deliver it right away. Look, I, I don't care if the van is locked in the garage for the night. Unlock it. I want that furniture delivered right away. My goodness, I've had more excitement here in one day than I've had in Springfield in 20 years. Well, come on, everybody. Let's get out of here. It's about time. Now you can see the house that Melvin really bought, Grandma. This kid, what do you know? I found it. Good heavens, who's that? Well, folks, it took me a long time that I found it. And who are you? It's the gas man. I finally found Anita. Guess where it was. I give up. Behind the bathtub. I never would have guessed it. Well, now the gas is all turned on. Well, that's just dandy. Because now you can go right back and turn it off again. Gee, this isn't much of a house, is it, Father? I'd like to know what's wrong with it. Well, it's not a mansion. There isn't even a marble staircase. And where will I keep my guppies? You know, I think this house will look very nice with furniture. Where in the name of heaven is that furniture? You think they were bringing it in from the Canadian border? Grandma, this is a fine welcome for you. I'm terribly sorry. The first night you're here, we have to sit around on a bare hardwood floor all evening waiting for the furniture to come. <laughs> what time is it, Randolph? Wait a sec till I turn on my flashlight. Uh, it's almost midnight. Grandma, you shouldn't be up this late. Well, I haven't been for I don't know how long, but I like it. All I can think of about is, is how much this business is costing me. Surprise. Huh? Well, we were just trying to save you and Mother work. Will it be very expensive, Father? Expensive? Putting a telephone in, taking the telephone out. Turning the gas on, turning it off. Lights on, lights off. Our furniture going for a joyride all over the map. <laughs> This will cost me $75 if it costs me a penny. And heaven knows what damages I'll have to pay Buckley. He'll probably... Oh, that must be the moving men. Oh, thank heaven. Look here, Foster. What are you up to anyway? Oh, it's you, Buckley. You're darn right it's me. And I want to know what's the idea of unloading a whole truckload of furniture into my house. For the love of heaven, did they deliver the furniture to your house? To the mansion? They did. 
And all I've got to say is, get that furniture out of my house before morning. How can I? Where will I get a moving van at this time of night? Well, Father, you've got a nice collection of telephone numbers. <laughs> Goodness, the furniture's in place. What time is it, somebody? When you hear the gong, it will be exactly 10 a.m. <laughs> Imagine going to bed at 10 o'clock in the morning. Well, Grandma, you're all set. Good night now. Good night, children. My, this four poster bed sure looks tempting. Uh... Good night, Grandma. Now go to bed, Randolph. Okay. Good morning. <laughs> Melvin, I wonder what our new neighbors think of us Moving in at 6.30 in the morning Oh, forget the neighbors, Dora Oh, let's get some sleep hmm. I was beginning to wonder if I'd ever see a bed again as long as I lived Oh, sleep, wonderful sleep Who oh, the devil is that? Okay, okay, I'm coming Who is it, Father? Imagine anybody ringing the doorbell at a time like this 10 o'clock in the morning, practically in the middle of the night Oh, Buckley, it's you again. Ah, good morning, Miss Foster. Beautiful day, isn't it? Now, what do you want? We finally got our furniture out of your tub. Who's and... complaining? Guess what? All right, I'll guess. A man came round to my house first thing this morning, wants to buy it. The mansion? Yep. Says he sees possibilities in it. Now that the floors are painted and the walls are papered. Of course, he'll have to do it over, but it gave him a good idea of what could be done with the place. <laughs> Well, blow me down. <clears throat> Naturally, I feel I owe you something, so here's my check for $100 for all your trouble. Oh, it was no trouble at all. A hundred dollars. And to think Randolph and I earned it all ourselves. Hold on. Our date isn't over yet. We're going to interrupt the moving business to talk about the toothbrush business for a minute, that's all. You know... There's such a swing to the Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush, I can only explain it in one way. A lot of folks must have been dissatisfied with their toothbrushes and just waiting for a brush like Pepsodent's. It's so different, it's patented, you know. There's not a scratchy bristle in that Pepsodent brush, and not a flabby, soggy one either. For Pepsodent uses slender nylon bristles that are gentle and yet stay springy and alive. 50 tufts of gentle bristles united for super cleansing. It's a pleasure to brush your teeth with the Pepsodent brush. It's even a pleasure to buy it, because you get a bonus. When you open the package, out pops a cash certificate worth 10 cents extra spending money. Be good to your family. Protect their smiles. Get Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrushes all around. You'll get a 10 cent cash certificate, a Pepsodent bonus with every brush. And now, back to Judy. I must say, this is the quickest moving we've ever done. Yes, Mother, and with the exception of the marble staircase and the fish pond and the elegance, I like this house as much as the mansion. Gee, Mother, where did Grandma disappear to all of a sudden? Why, she just went up to take a nice hot bath. Dora! Dora! Dora, I'm scared to pieces! Why, Grandma, what's the matter? Dora, there are guppies in the bathtub! <laughs> invited to have a date with Judy on Tuesday next, with Pepsodent as your chaperone. A Date with Judy with Deli Ellis and Dix Davis is written by Aline Leslie and Jerome Lawrence. Original music by Gordon Jenkins. Remember, for the safety of your smile, use Pepsodent twice a day. See your dentist twice a year. Larry Keating speaking. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Pepsodent invites you to have a date with Judy. Well, 
let's see. It's a summer day at the Foster House. Nobody is home but Judy, and she's about to receive a visitor. Oh, hello, Oogie. Hello, Judy. Gee, what are you doing here? Well, I- I've come to bestow a great honor upon you, Judy. An honor? Mm-hmm. Judy, you-, you know the guinea pig that's the mascot of the school football team? Of course I know it. Its name is Baby, and it's a perfectly adorable guinea pig. Yeah, well, it- it's been my duty and honor to take care of Baby for the team. And now, well, i got to go on a vacation with my folks, and I've chosen you out of everybody I know for the honor of taking care of them while I'm out of town. Me? Uh-huh. Why, that's awfully nice of you, Oogie. Oh, that's all right. I-, I regard you as a very reliable character, and I'm sure the team had backed me up in my decision to the last man. You think it would? Yep. So on account of I'm leaving on this vacation right away, I- I'll bring Baby right over to the house immediately. Well, gee, that's wonderful, Oogie, but pigs ought to, well, have a pen or something to live in and... We haven't any. Oh, well, he won't care. He'll, he'll be perfectly satisfied living right here in the house. Yes, but mm-hmm. but will my father and mother be satisfied? Well, what do they care? It's only for two weeks. My goodness. Yes, but two weeks... Judy, and... haven't you any school spirit? Well, of course. But father and mother don't have much... Don't, don't you care about the, the future of the football team? Well, naturally, Then but... the least you can do is take care of its mascot. Baby has been very lucky for the team, you know. We only lost six games out of eight last season. That was a uh, that was a big rise over the year before. Well, I don't know, Oogie. I never took care of a guinea pig before. I wouldn't even know what to feed him. Oh, well, you, you wouldn't have to worry about a thing, Judy. He'll eat anything. Look, I- I'll have him over here before you can say pig in a poke. No, no, Oogie. Uh, on thinking it over, I don't think this house would be a very good atmosphere for him. Well, and vice versa. Well, <laughs> Gee whiz, you'd certainly think a person would appreciate it when a big honor is bestowed upon them. But if that's the way you feel about it, it's okay with me. Gee whiz, you'd think a person would have more appreciation when... Hi, Ogie. Hello, Randolph. What you doing here, Ogie? Oh, I just wanted Judy to take care of a pig for me. Will you pardon me a moment while I go in the house and clean my ears? Uh, I mean, I mean Baby, the football team's mascot. Oh, that pig. Gee, Randolph, I'm desperate. I've been walking my legs off trying to get one of the kids to mind Baby while I'm out of town, and now Judy refuses the honor. Well, the pig will probably be glad to hear that anyhow. Gee, Randolph, I don't know what to do. My folks are sitting in a car in front of the house waiting to drive off on our vacation. I'm desperate. Doesn't anybody want him? No. Trouble with people is they have the wrong attitude about pigs. I tell you what, Mm. why don't you put him in a basket and leave him on somebody's doorstep? Then they'll have to take him in. Oh, Randolph, that's a brilliant idea. Gee, that's just what I'll do. (laughs) Thanks. So long, Randolph. So long. Boy, what an idea. And I know just whose doorstep I'll leave it on. And that's how things start in tonight's Date with Judy, Chaperone by Pepsodent. You know... You can't change your features. You can't do a thing about the color of your eyes or the shape of your chin. But you can do something about your smile. If it's dingy, just switch to Pepsodent toothpaste. Because Pepsodent with irium is quick to make teeth brilliantly clean and sparkling. You see, Pepsodent contains super cleansing ingredients that speed up the brushing action because they loosen, then flush away the filmy coating you can feel with your tongue. So give Pepsodent with Irium a chance to perk up your smile by putting a sparkle on your teeth. And now, let's get back. We have a date with Judy. Randolph, I'm going over to Mitzi's. Gee, I hope Oogie doesn't feel too bad about me not taking the pig. Oh, he won't. I just gave him a brilliant idea about what to do with it. Well, just so I don't have to take care of it, I don't care what he does with it. Well, so long, Randolph. So long. What's the matter? Randolph, throw me jeepers. I nearly stepped on it. There's there's a basket here on the doorstep. There is? Yes, and and there's something in it. Alive. It's moving. I... Oh, Randolph, do you suppose somebody left a baby here? Well, I have a hunch, a very slight hunch. It isn't a baby. I'm... I'm going to take the blanket off its face. <gasps> Randolph, it's a guinea pig. It's Oogie's guinea pig. Well, what do you know about that? Well, that's a nice thing for Oogie to do. Whatever gave Oogie an idea like that? I can't imagine. (laughs) Randolph Foster, did I hear you say you gave Oogie a brilliant idea? Oh, yeah, but gee, Judy, I didn't know he was going to work it on us. Oh, bugs. Now I'm the big sister of a pig. I resent that remark. (laughs) Of course, it is kind of a cute little pig. 
Look, he's kind of holding out his arms to me. You know what? I think it won't be so bad taking care of baby. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> Look, he likes me already. I'm going to pick him up. You sure are hard up for affection. Hello, baby. Judy's going to take good care of you. Baby's going to have the best two weeks he ever had in his life. Is on him's baby. Do you have to keep calling him baby like that? That's his name. And besides, it fits him. He practically is like a little baby. Randolph, you know what you're going to do? No, but I'm not going to like it. You're going to run right down to the drugstore and buy him an ice cream cone. I am? Yes. And I'm going to take baby in the house and make a nice bed for him in the kitchen. That is a beautiful and touching thought. <laughs> Hiya, Randolph. What do you have? Two ice cream cones. Who's the other one for? A pig. No, don't get fresh, kid. It's the truth. It's for a guinea pig. Look, just because I'm a soda jerk, it doesn't mean I'm a jerk. No, oh, honest. <laughs> we got a guest at our house. The football team mascot. Oh, baby. Well, why didn't you say so? So Woogie finally pawned him off on somebody. Well, you don't have to make me sound like a dope. My sister Judy found him on the doorstep in a basket. In a basket? That oogie some kid. In a basket, huh? Your attitude is slightly annoying. And you don't need to gloat about it to everyone in the world, either. I wouldn't repeat it to a soul. Hiya, Dick. Hear the latest? The Fosters have Baby, the football team mascot. Oogie left it on their doorstep in a basket. Yeah, honest, Mrs. Davis. Can you believe it? The Fosters found Baby on the doorstep in a basket. Exciting news, Mrs. Austin. A baby was left on the Foster's doorstep. Oh, Mr. Colby, have you heard? The Fosters have just had a baby. Oh, the Fosters? <laughs> Are you kidding? I just heard it with my own ears. Why, I see him every day of my life, and he never said a word about it. Well, the old son of a guy. They certainly have kept it a secret. Well, believe me, I'm running right over to his plant now. <laughs> Will I kid the ears off of him? Imagine him never saying a word. Congratulating for me. <laughs> and don't forget to get a cigar. <laughs> You can go right in, Mr. Colby. Mr. Foster will see you now. Great! <laughs> hello, Foster. Oh, oh hello, Colby. <laughs> you old son of a gun. <laughs> keeping it from me, huh? Uh, uh, keeping what from you? Oh, now, don't let on you don't know what about. <laughs> Come on, get out with the cigars. Uh, cigars? Well, I think, I certainly think the occasion calls for them. Occasion? Uh, what occasion? Now, look, Foster, you've kept this up long enough. Why, it's all over town by this time. What's all over town? Oh, cut it out, Foster. Everybody knows your wife's had a baby. What? <laughs> Would you mind repeating what you just said? Oh, you're a card, Foster. Well, I've got to be running along now. And say, congratulate your wife for me. Yeah. Yeah, so long. What in blazes is it? Congratulate my wife. My wife. Hey, Miss Perkins, get my home on the phone for me. Did you say something, Mr. Foster? I said get my home on the phone right away. Well, certainly, Mr. Foster, but my goodness, you don't have to shout. In a predicament like this, I have a right to shout. Hello? Here they are, Mr. Foster. Here, give me the phone. Hello? Oh, hello, Father. Uh, Judy, is anything, uh, anything uh, sort of peculiar going on at home? Well, not terribly peculiar, Father. Why? Uh, Judy, tell me, uh, where's your mother? Mother? Oh, oh. she's out playing bridge. <laughs> playing bridge? Well, heaven be praised. Why? What's wrong, Father? Well, nothing's wrong. Everything's right as rain. <laughs> you, you know, I was worried. Some fool came in here and said we had a baby in our house. What did you say? Did you say something about baby? Yes, I said I was worried. Because... Oh, baby's all right. Oh, baby's all right. <laughs> Did you say baby's all right? Yes, he's grand. I'm giving him some milk now. Judy, I, I can't believe this. There's something wrong someplace. You say mother's out playing bridge, and you're giving baby some milk. Yes, father. Judy, I know something's wacky someplace, but, but please tell me, how did this thing, whatever it is, happen? Oh, it was left on our doorstep in a basket. Are you serious? 
Does your mother know about this? Who, mother? No, she was out. Well, for the love of heaven, where is she? Now, you can't handle this alone. She, she'd better come right home. Oh, I'm handling it beautifully, Father. Now, Judy, don't do anything rash till your mother gets home. Keep him warm and say that he has plenty of milk. I will, Father. He didn't like the ice cream cone. Ice cream cone? <laughs> Judy! Don't do anything at all. Just leave everything alone. Your mother and I will take care of everything. Gee, Father, I think it's terribly sweet of you to be so nice about me. Nice about it. Why, a poor little thing that's been left and... Judy, where's your mother playing bridge? At Mrs. Hastings' house. I'll call her right away. Now, now, you just keep cool and, and, and don't give him a bath or anything. I won't, Father. Goodbye. Goodbye. Good heavens, a baby. What did you say, Mr. Foster? I said, good heavens, a baby! Get me Mrs. Hastings' house on the phone right away. It's, it's a, a, a fern day. Goodness, I never saw such cards. Why, Dora Foster, that's the second slam you've bid. Don't worry, I haven't made it yet. <laughs> oh, darling, phone. Excuse me a minute, girl. Hello? Oh, just a minute, please. Dora, it's for you. Oh, thanks. I wonder who's calling me here. Hello? Hello, Dora. Oh, yes, Melvin. Dora, I, uh, I, I, I don't know how to tell you, but... Uh, well, Melvin, you sound so excited. Is anything wrong? Is anything wrong? Dora... We have a baby. We have a... Melvin, did you say a baby? Yes, Dora. It was left on our doorstep. On our doorstep? A baby? What? Oh, Melvin, I don't believe it. It's a fact, dear. Judy found it. But I can hardly get it through my head. Oh, Melvin, what are we going to do about it? Oh, it's kind of nice, isn't it, Dora? We did want another one, then... Oh, Melvin, do you think we'll be able to keep it? Well, I... Uh... If there aren't any complications about parents or anything, oh, I don't... Oh, dear, I... if whoever it belonged to put it there, don't you think they'd want us to keep it? Yes, I suppose so. You know what I'd better do? I'd, I'd better check with my lawyer. Oh, Melvin, I hope we can keep it. Now, Dora, you, you'd better go home right away. Judy's there alone with him. Well, dear, it'll take me an hour to get home. Oh, Judy will probably drop him on his head before you get there. Do you know that she tried to give him an ice cream cone? An ice cream cone? Yes. Oh, my goodness, I'll hurry as fast as I can. Oh, wait, Melvin, I just thought, we don't really have a thing at home for a baby. You'll have to buy some things right away. Well, uh, what does it need? Well, uh, bottles, bottles and nipples and a sterilizer. And, oh, Melvin, you just better ask the sales girl in the children's department to pick out a whole layette. All right, dear. Now, now, I'll get everything. Just hurry home as fast as you can. I will. Goodbye, dear. Goodbye. Oh, girls, have I got something to tell you. Oh, is it true somebody left a baby on your doorstep? It's true. Why, that's the most exciting thing I ever oh, heard I'm so thrilled for words. Well, I've got to go right home. Oh, no wonder. Now, Dora, if there's anything I can oh, do Oh, there's not you. a thing. I'll just take my bag and I'll, I'll go. <laughs> Goodbye, girls. I can hardly wait till I see you, dear. <laughs> oh, well, isn't she lucky? A foundling. Oh, my goodness. I wonder how long it was there on the doorstep before anyone found it. Why? You don't suppose the exposure could hurt it, do you? Well, you never can tell. That's the danger with foundlings. Oh, don't worry. This one is probably as healthy as a little pig. We'll be back with Judy in just a moment. You know, anything can happen from this point on. You never know. And you never know, speaking of never knows, exactly what impression you're making on others. But it's wise to check. Notice, next time you're talking to somebody, if they avoid looking at you, better check your teeth. Find out if they're dingy and stained. Don't guess about it. Find out now. Just run the tip of your tongue over your teeth. Can you feel a filmy coating? That filmy coating collects stains. Next time you brush your teeth, better use a toothpaste that removes that stain-collecting film. Better use Pepsodent toothpaste, because Pepsodent with Irium is a high-speed super cleanser that loosens and flushes away the dingy film from your teeth. Whisks it away in a clean-tasting foam of bubbles. Makes your teeth feel clean. Makes them shine and sparkle so brilliantly that eyes are attracted your way. Tonight, make your toothbrushing give results you can see and feel. Tomorrow may be your big day. Get a tube of Pepsodent toothpaste tonight. Remember, government orders. Take an empty tube with you to exchange for the new one you buy. Any size, any kind of collapsible metal will do. And now, let's get back to that date with Judy. Perkins, Miss Perkins, where's my hat? Where it always is, on the hat rack. Oh, yes. The fact is, I'm so flustered. I 
I've got to buy a sterilizer. I could, uh, Miss Perkins, where's my hat? It's on your head now, Mr. Foster. Oh, yes, so it is. Well, goodbye. Uh, no, 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 wait. I, I, I want you to call my attorney. Mr. Jackson? Yes, and ask him what you do when a baby's found on your doorstep. Well, I can tell you that. You call the police. Yeah. Uh, no, no, look, Miss Perkins, I want to keep this baby. Ask Mr. Jackson what I should do. Uh, stake out a claim or what? <laughs> ask him what I do in order to adopt the baby. Well, I get it. Tell him to call me and let me know if he can stop proceedings right away. Yes, Mr. Foster. Well, goodbye. goodbye. And tell him to be sure and make it good and legal. Oh, Judy! Judy! Yes, Randolph? You know who just called? No. The newspaper. It was a reporter. He heard about Baby being found on our doorstep. He wants to write a story. Oh, butterflies, that's wonderful. We'll be on the front page. And he wanted to know if there was a note in the basket. Like, please take care of baby, signed a heartbroken mother or something like that. But what'd you tell him? I told him there wasn't any note. Well, he said he'd make one up. Gee, that's nice of him. He said he's coming right out to the house for an interview. With us? Oh, Randolph, wait till the team hears about this. You know, I had the funniest feeling all the time this reporter was talking that he thought baby was a baby. A baby? Oh, Randolph, that's very silly. Where would he get an idea like that? Oh, I don't know. Well, maybe it was just my imagination. It must have been. Mm, there goes the phone again. Hello? Hello? Who is this? This is Randolph Foster. Oh, well, Randolph, this is Mrs. Hastings. Your mother just left my house, and I want you to tell her as soon as she gets home that the other girls and I are going to give her a shower. A shower? You know, dear. A party. Everybody who comes has to bring the baby a present. And the baby? Yes. And if you keep it, you'll need so many things for it. Tell your mother I'm inviting all her friends. But Mrs. Hastings... She's made out a list of 35 already. And tell your mother if she can think of anybody else she wants to let me know. Oh, yes, but, 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 but Mrs. I Hastings... I have to get back to the bridge game, dear, so... Bye-bye, and kiss your little brother for me. <laughs> oh, is it your little sister? It's my little brother. I mean, in the no, I mean... What am I saying? Oh, you're all excited, aren't you, dear? Well, I won't keep you. Goodbye. Goodbye. What on earth was that? It was Mrs. Hastings. She wants to give Baby a shower. Why, how sweet of her. Judy, something tells me she thinks Baby is a baby, too. Oh, Randolph, no. Well, is Mrs. Hastings the type to give a shower for a pig? <laughs> well, no, she isn't. Oh, Randolph, do you suppose... Do you suppose Father thinks Baby is a baby? Could be. After this, nothing would surprise me. He did act very funny on the phone. And and he said he was going to call Mother. Do you suppose he told her baby is a baby? Could be. Well, where do you suppose they got that idea? Oh, Randolph, what's going to happen when they find out the truth? Personally, I'm refraining from thinking. Cheapers, I hope they haven't gone to any trouble. <laughs> Now, let's see. We have the sterilizer, the bottle warmer, the... You want a complete layette, don't you? Yep, the the whole trousseau. The whole layette. Well, whatever you call it, I want the whole works. Uh, Would you please make it snappy? I'm anxious to get home and see the baby. Oh, the baby's been born? Well, of course it's been born. What a silly question. (laughs) I just meant if it hasn't a layette yet. What's it wearing? (laughs) Well, what it had when it came, I suppose. (laughs) The... We certainly will have to hurry, won't we? Now, uh, do you have a crib or a bassinet? We don't have a crib or a bassinet. Well, you weren't very well prepared, were you? Oh, no. (laughs) The last thing in the world I expected at our house was a baby. Well, I I suppose we'd better choose a bassinet. All right, wrap one up. Wouldn't you care to look at them first? No, 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 you pick it. My, what a proud father you must be. Oh, I'm not the father. Are you the grandfather? (laughs) The grandfather? A man of my age? Well, certainly not. Well, may I ask just what relation you are to the baby, sir? Well, I've no relation. We found the baby on the doorstep. On the doorstep? Yes. Oh, how wonderful. Why, it's just like a movie, isn't it? (laughs) Exactly. I never thought it would happen to me. But since it has, let's get the layout together quickly so I can scram out of here. Oh, right away. Now, we'll want bottles and nipples, my, on your doorstep. And baby oil and cotton... Have you a pediatrician for the baby? Well, no. Why? Well, I was just thinking... A little baby found on a doorstep. Oh, you're absolutely right. We had a pediatrician for our own children, and they never went through what this baby's gone through. Look, could I use your phone here? Certainly. I'll call Dr. Harrington. We had him for Randolph. Yes, I feel much better with the doctor. You're right. Hello? 
Uh, hello, Dr. Harrington. Yes? Uh, this is Mr. Foster, Melvin Foster. Well, what do you want? <laughs> well, I'd like you to go over to my house right away and look at the baby. Say, listen, Foster, your boy is about, uh, about 12 years old now. I'm a baby doctor. Oh, no, it's not for Randolph. It's a newborn baby. Why, Foster, that's great. Certainly is nice to have you for a customer again. When did this happen? Well, I haven't got time to explain it to you right now, but uh, uh, will you please go over to my house right away? Why, sure, I certainly will. Uh, how's Mrs. Foster? Uh, she's fine. Isn't that great? <laughs> well, uh, I'll be seeing you. Uh, thanks, goodbye. Uh, uh, goodbye. Hey, somebody open the door. I've got my arms closed. Oh, hello, Father. Well, where is it? Where's what? With the baby, of course. Oh, the baby. Yes. Oh, it is sure nice to come home to a little bitty baby again. Ah, it's been such a long time. Well, where is it? Judy! Judy, come here! Yes. Judy, would you mind explaining some things to Father? I've got to, uh... Oh, well, I just remembered I've got an important appointment. So long. Where's he going? Oh, he just hasn't the heart to break it to you. He wants me to. Judy... Is, is something wrong with the baby? Well, not exactly wrong. It's just that... Well, well, where is it? Oh, Melvin, you're home already. My, it took me so long to get into Dora, this. Judy says something's wrong with the oh, baby. Oh, nothing's oh. wrong with him. I mean, he isn't sick or anything. Oh, good. Well, where is the little tyke? He's in the kitchen. In the kitchen? Why, I never heard of such a thing. Judy, where's your mind? Well, gee, what did you want me to do with him? Put him in bed, naturally. <laughs> in my bed? Or father's in my bed. Didn't that ever occur to you? Well, frankly, no. My goodness, Judy. Gee, Mother, I never dreamed you and Father would be this nice about it. Nice about it? Anybody with simple, common decency would be nice about it. Yeah, but you seem to be going a little overboard. And besides, I don't think it's so decent to put a little pig in your bed. A little pig? Judy, how can you say such a thing? Just because it's a foundling. Well, you see, Mother... Baby isn't quite a baby. That is, he's young and everything, but... Well, the fact is, he's not really a baby. Judy, do you know what you're saying? Yes, I do, Father. You've kind of had the wrong impression. Baby was left on the doorstep, all right. But, well, he's the mascot of the football team. The mascot of a football team? <laughs> a little baby? No, Father, that's what I'm telling you. He's not a baby, he's a guinea pig. A, a guinea, guinea pig? pig? But you said it was a baby. No, I said it was a guinea pig named baby. Oh, Judy. Judy. Judy Foster. Just wait till I pull myself together. Am I going to get mad? Gee, I'm, I'm sorry you got the wrong impression, Father, but I... Do you think... realize what this has done to me, Judy? Why, I've told everybody that we found a baby on our doorstep. Gee, Father, what a shame. Do you realize, Judy, I've been handing out cigars? You have, Father? You realize I've taught a lay at home from town? For a guinea pig? <laughs> oh, Melvin, this is funny. Well, laugh, why don't you? Do you realize I've tried to adopt this pig? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Melvin. Gee, Father, it was all perfectly all right until somebody uh, got all mixed up. Judy. Do you realize I sent for a baby, Doctor? Yes, I know, Father. He's here. He's here? Yes. He was awfully mad, too, when he found out baby was a pig, but he went in the kitchen to look at it, and he's been there ever since. It's been more than a half hour. Oh, what a fool he must think I am. Well, what could he be doing looking at a guinea pig? You wonder why I didn't send for a veterinarian. I don't know. Oh, I think I hear him coming out of the kitchen now. Well, Foster... Things certainly do happen in this house, don't they? Listen, Dr. Harrington, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I hope I haven't put you out. Oh, oh, I found it rather interesting. Took me back to my days at medical school. Listen, Doctor, I... Hi, everybody. Here's Mrs. Austin with a baby carriage. Dora, I brought you a baby carriage. I had the worst time getting it back. I'd loaned it to the Evergreens, and they'd loaned it to the Pentwoods. But I finally got it back from the Maccabettys. Oh, for goodness sake. Well, I'm sorry, Mrs. Austin, but we won't be needing it. Uh, there wasn't a guinea pig. That was a guinea pig in the basket. It wasn't a baby. It was what? A, a guinea pig, not yes. a baby? Yes. Oh, Judy. 
How do you get me into these things? Well, Randolph got me into this. Yeah, sometimes my brain's boomerang on me. Oh, I'm simply amazed. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Mrs. Hastings called up and said she was giving Baby a shower. A shower? Didn't you tell her Baby was a pig? Well, no. Well, why on earth didn't you? Well, I was afraid if she knew it was a pig, she'd call the shower off. <laughs> You're darn right she's going to call it off. I'm going to phone her right now. How do you like this? We're playing nurse girl to a pig. Now, that's where you're all mistaken. Uh, what was that, Dr. Harrington? I said that's where you're all mistaken. You're not playing nursemaid to a guinea pig. You're playing nursemaid to seven guinea pigs. Oh, what? Seven. Yes, baby just gave birth to a fine litter of six. Oh, Cooper, that's wonderful. Wait till the football team hears about this. I bet they win all their games next year. Hey, look, out on the porch, a man with a camera. It must be the newspaper reporter. The newspaper reporter? Yes, he's going to interview us about Baby. Tell him to come right in, Randolph, and bring his camera. Okay. Should I tell him to take Baby alone, or do you want a group picture? <laughs> well, hold on, there's more coming. You know... I've told you a number of times that the Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush has 50 tufts of nylon bristles. That's very elemental. I know because I count them every morning. 8, 16, 24, 32, 48, 50. I know because I use a Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush. I'm talking to the folks who use other kinds of toothbrushes and don't even know how many tufts are in them. The Pepsodent brush has 50 tufts of evenly tapered, gentle nylon bristles to give maximum brushing contact with your teeth. Maximum cleansing efficiency. The Pepsodent brush actually has twice as many tufts of bristles as any other brush having a small, compact head. And it feels great in your mouth. Those nylon bristles are gentle. They don't scratch tender gums. They don't get soggy or flabby. So there are three good reasons why it pays to get the Pepsodent toothbrush. Now, first, it cleans your teeth so they sparkle and shine. Second, it feels good. And third, you get a bonus besides. A 10-cent cash certificate with every Pepsodent toothbrush. So be good to yourself. Get a Pepsodent toothbrush tonight. And now, back to Judy. Come right in. Melvin, it's your attorney. Good evening, Mrs. Foster. Evening, Foster. Uh, Jackson. Yes, I dropped in to let you know what you could do about the adoption. Adoption? I... Oh, Melvin. Uh, yes. Now, now, legally, a foundling is... Am I spared nothing? Uh, what do you mean, Foster? Uh, there's a little red tape. If there are no claims, why, the little fellow you found on your doorstep will be all yours. Listen, Jackson. He's all ours now, with compound interest. <laughs> Remember, you all have another date with Judy next Tuesday night. A date with Judy with Deli Ellis and Dix Davis is written by Aline Leslie and Jerome Lawrence. Original music by Gordon Jenkins. And remember, for the safety of your smile, use Pepsodent twice a day. See your dentist twice a year. Larry Keating speaking. This program came to you from Hollywood. Pepsodent invites you to have a date with Judy. You know Judy Foster, a typical American girl in a typical American family. Well, let's see. It's a quiet evening in the Foster house... Mother is sewing, father is reading, 
Randolph is tying Boy Scout knots, and Judy is glumping because she doesn't have a date. Mother looks up. Melvin. Yes, dear. I had a letter from Grandma today. You did, Mother? What'd she say? She's worried about Aunt Lily. Why is she worried about Aunt Lily? Well, because Don't she... Don't tell me. Let me guess. Because Aunt Lily isn't married. Well, yes. Well, that's nothing new. Grandma's been worrying about that for the last ten years. I was just thinking, maybe we ought to have Lily here for a visit. A sweet girl like Lily. Girl? Mother, she's 34 years old. Well, really, Judy, that isn't the last stage of senility, you know. They're girls to mother till rigor mortis sets in. <laughs> I'm going to write Aunt Lily to come, and we'll see if we can't find somebody for her. Maybe Judy could get her a date. Me? I'm having enough trouble getting dates for myself. I haven't had a date for three nights. Well, what are you complaining about? Aunt Lily hasn't had a date for three years. <laughs> that isn't so. I'm sure lots of young men have been extremely fond of Aunt Lily. In 34 years, they've had lots of time to. <laughs> the problem is, how can we dig her up a man? Digging him up might be a good idea. <laughs> Gee, come to think of it, I know somebody old enough for Aunt Lily. Oh, who? Mr. Manchester. He's a librarian at the library. I bet he's 35 if he's a day. And he's a day, all right. Why, that's a simply wonderful idea. But I wonder how we should go about asking him. Well, I could kind of take a book out of the library and just sling the invitation to him. We could invite him to dinner the very first night Aunt Lily's here. Oh, sure. We wouldn't want to waste any time. After 34 leisurely years, we got a step on it. <laughs> That's only the beginning of your date with Judy, chaperone by Pepsodent. How would you like to find out if your present toothpaste is really doing what you think it is? Maybe it's letting you down. Now, here's the way to find out. Run the tip of your tongue over your teeth. Can you feel a filmy coating? That's what makes teeth dingy. And it's a sign that you'd better switch to Pepsodent toothpaste tonight. Pepsodent with Arium is the new high-speed toothpaste with the fresh taste and the super cleansing ingredients. It removes that dingy coating from teeth, makes them so brilliantly clean, they feel shiny smooth and they look sparkling bright. So, hunt up a collapsible metal tube from any product and take it to your drug counter tonight to exchange for a new tube of Pepsodent toothpaste. And now, back to A Date with Judy. <laughs> My goodness. Hello, Lily. Well, it's certainly good to see you. Do I get a kiss from my favorite brother-in-law? You sure do, Lily. Too bad, Father. Oh, he'd be perfect. Well, I'm starved. When is that guy going to get here? Guy? Dora, have you invited someone else to dinner? Well, uh, yes, in a way. A uh, man? Well, uh, yes, in a way. Oh. <laughs> oh, Dora, really, you didn't have Now, to... Lily, this is just sort of an accident. As a matter of fact, we'd invited this gentleman to dinner long before we knew you were coming. Oh, yes, eons before. I'll go. Now, I wonder who that could be. Uh, <laughs> good evening. Oh, good evening, Mr. Manchester. Very kind of you to stop at the library this afternoon. Invite me to dinner. This afternoon? Oh, that's perfectly all right, Mr. Manchester. Come in. Um, I'd like you to meet my, uh, well, a friend of mine, Lily Rogan. How do you do? How do you do? And you know the rest of the family. Oh, my, what a formal introduction. <laughs> Suppose I do it all over. Uh, Lily, this is Donald. Donald, this is Lily. How do you do? How do you do? <laughs> do people ever call you Don? Oh, yes, indeed. At college. Ohio Wesley in 1924, they called me Don. Or Manchie. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that cute? <laughs> Manchie. Isn't that cute, Lily? <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, now that that's over, when are we going to have dinner? My Aunt Lily cooked every inch of it from soup to nuts. I ran off. I did not. <laughs> Lily is so modest. Well, how's business, Mr. Manchester? Uh, business? Yeah. Oh, very good. We collected 32 cents in fines today. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Mr. Manchester is the new librarian, Lily. Uh, Lily is very interested in books, Mr. Manchester. Oh? She'd make a wonderful wife for somebody who was interested in literary things. Judy! <laughs> Hi, that was 
a fine dinner, Mrs. Foster. Thank you. Uh, Melvin, aren't you planning to go to your uh, lodge meeting tonight? Why, no. My lodge meets on Thursdays. Oh. Uh, well, uh, the exalted high counselor called uh, and said it was moved up to tonight. Early tonight. Are you going out tonight, Mother, as if I didn't know? <laughs> well, uh, yes, I am. My Red Cross class meets tonight. Well, I thought that met on Fridays. Well, uh, uh, during emergencies, uh, they call special sessions. Yes. <laughs> well, my goodness, I, I must say this isn't very sociable of us to run off like this, but uh, it will give you two a chance to get acquainted. <laughs> oh, really, Dora, you don't have to do that. Uh, Judy and Randolph are going out in the kitchen and wash the dishes. Aren't you, dears? Well, I guess we are. I guess. And then they go right to bed, so you won't have to worry about them disturbing you. Well, come on, Melvin. Uh, thank you very much for the dinner, Mrs. Foster. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night. Well, Dora, what are we going to do tonight? What do you think we're going to do? You're going to take me to a movie. <laughs> Are they still in the living room? Stay back here in the hall, Judy. I'll take a quick peek. Are they? Yeah. He's on one end of the Davenport and she's on the other. Let me look. Gosh, she isn't turning on the heat, is she? Uh, personally, Mr. Manchester, I prefer Dickens' later works. Great expectations always seem to me a little, uh, immature. Jeepers, I'd never handle him that way. My favorite work of Dickens is Nicholas Nickleby. Although I have found great charm in Pickwick papers. Me, I find no charm in this conversation. Shh. Uh, uh, have you read much of Pope and Dryden? Yes, yes, I have. Poor Aunt Lily. She doesn't know beans about men. She's a rank amateur. Well, I wouldn't call either of them great lovers. Uh, uh, don't you love the lilt of Pope's rhyme couplet? Yes, yes, I do. Isn't that awful? Hey, hey, he's getting up. Maybe we'll see some action now. Oh, my. It's 9.45. It's getting late. <laughs> getting late? It was charming meeting you, Mr. Manchester. I hope I'll see you soon. I hope so, too. This is the critical moment. If he asks her for a date now, she's in. Otherwise, she's cooked. Good night, then. Good night. She's cooked. <laughs> Uh, what are you doing a week from tomorrow night, Miss Rogan? A Wednesday? Well, nothing. He came through. But a week from tomorrow night? Yeah, I wouldn't exactly call it a whirlwind courtship. I, I wonder if I might come to call. Call? He's one of those parlor plopters. Oh, I'd be very happy to see you. Well, good night then, Miss Rogan. Good night, Mr. Manchester. Well, he's gone. Yipes, at a one-a-week rate, it'll take her till Christmas. You know, Randolph, I think I'll have to give her some advice about men. You mean you're going to part with some of your vast store of knowledge on the subject? If it helps her yoke a bloke, I'd be glad to. Well, you've sure done enough research on the subject. <laughs> I hate to say this, but frankly, your technique is a little oogie. There speaks the voice of experience. Aunt Lily, tell me frankly, do you have a yen for Mr. Yanchester? A yen? Oh, why, Judy, I, I hardly know the man. What's that got to do with it? I asked you if you had a yen for him. Well, I, I think he's very intelligent. In Aunt Lily's language, that's a yen. <laughs> Look, Aunt Lily... One of the first principles of getting a guy gaga about you is to be glamorous in his eyes. Now, for instance, take Edgar. Who's Edgar? This guy I go with. He's gaga about me. Calls me up night and day. Now, the first thing I did when I wanted to make him wacky... And he was that way to begin with, believe me. <laughs> Randolph, please. How can I give Aunt Lily any advice? Well, the first thing I did was find out what moving picture star was his ideal. Then I simply made myself look like that star, and there I was. His living ideal of glamour. Do you always do that? Well, sure. This week she's Dorothy L'Amour for Edgar. And a couple of weeks ago she was Lana Turner for Gerald. Oh, for goodness sake. Her Lana Turner's okay, but her, her Dorothy L'Amour is, is very nerve-wracking. It is not, Randolph. 
Aunt Lily, I'll guarantee this will work. Do you think so, Judy? I'm positive. Well, I'm not so sure, but... Well, give me the works. <laughs> I want you to make Aunt Lily positively oomphy. I will make her so oomphy it will hurt. Good. You can start with a mud pack, and then an ice pack, and after the glacial, a facial, and then an eyebrow pluck and an eyelash curl. This is not go, Aunt Lily. It's perfectly terrific lipstick, isn't it, Andre? Glamorola number five, no less. It's positively kiss-proof and everything. Now, pucker up your lips, Aunt Lily. And, Andre, when you finish the manicure, give her a pedicure. The passion red nail polish on her feet, too? Of course. Oh, the passion red nail polish. He's so passionate. <laughs> Gee, Mitzi, what did Judy want us to come over here for? Well, she said that something startling was going to emerge from the beauty shop. She mm. wanted both of us to pass on it. Well, here it comes. Well, Mitzi... Hi, Randolph. Hello, Randolph. Aunt Lily. Aunt Lily, this is Mitzi. I asked her to drop by to, well, sort of give you the once-over. Oh, really, Judy? Do you have to call in perfect strangers? Oh, Mitzi isn't a perfect stranger. She's my best girlfriend. Besides, she's practically an authority on glamour, aren't you, Mitzi? Well, practically. Doesn't Aunt Lily look perfectly yummy? She sure does. Me, I haven't been able to take my eyes off Aunt Lily since she came out of the beauty parlor. And I see a couple of pedestrians with the same idea. I don't know whether they're staring at me or glaring at me. Let's go. Just wait till you get home and Mother sees you. She'll be insane about you. And as for Father, they'll have to put him in an institution. <laughs> Gee, Aunt Lily, don't you feel just like a movie star? Well, I certainly don't feel like myself. I think you wow any man you meet. If you just remember to turn on the heat. Turn on the heat? That's what I've been trying to tell her, Mitzi. She means just give with the stuff, Aunt Lily. You know, quick on the trigger. Give with the stuff? It's really very easy. For instance, what repartee would you hand out if a man said to you, Come on, mouse, let's grouse? Well, no man I know would ever say, Come on, mouse, let's grouse. You'd better listen to Mitzi, Aunt Lily. Her advice has been very successful with me. All I'm trying to do is make a cuddle cat out of you. Well, I, I'm not so sure I want to be a cuddle cat. Why, you do too, Aunt Lily. Go ahead, Mitzi. All right. Now, what do you come back with when somebody says to you, what's cooking, good looking? Well, I, I don't know. You come back with soup, droop. Uh, <laughs> I do. Well, blow me down. Look who that is over there across the street. Why, it's Mr. Manchester. Oh, my. Why, Aunt Lily, under that glamour roll of number five, you're blushing. He's coming over to talk to us. Now, remember, Aunt Lily, sparkle. Be enthusiastic. I can't. Do I look all right? You look like a house of fire. That's what I'm afraid of. Do you, want to, do you want to make a positive impression on this guy, Miss Rogan? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. And hand out the goo. Do like Mitzi says. Talk about his necktie and, and his shoulders and his chest extension. Well, I'll try. Oh, here he comes. Oh, Miss Rogan. Oh, dear. Miss Rogan. Good luck, Aunt Lily. Good afternoon, Miss Rogan. And hello, children. Hello. Hi, Mitzi. What? What? Miss Rogan. What's cooking? Good looking. I beg pardon? That's, uh, well, that's a very beautiful necktie you have on. And so are your shoulders. Um, what was that, Miss Rogan? And you've got a very snazzy chest expansion. Why, Miss Rogan? When are you coming over to dinner again, Mr. Manchester? Why, I don't know. I, uh... You know what we're having for dinner tonight? Well, uh, no, I... I'm... We're having soup, Drew. Oh, uh... Well, oh, my goodness. You're doing fine, Miss Rogan. Would you like to come to dinner tonight, Mr. Manchester? Well, uh, I uh, hardly think I can make it. I, uh, well... You can come over and grow, Mouse. Well, uh, uh, some other time, perhaps. Oh, but... But, Mr. Manchester... Well, uh, the fact is, I... Uh, I have a library committee meeting tonight, and I... Uh, well, I... I must attend. I'm, I'm dreadfully sorry. Uh-huh. I'll see you next Wednesday, then. Well, I, I'm not absolutely sure that I can make it. That is, uh, well, I'll have to let you know. Well, I, I'm very glad I saw you. I'm sorry I have to dash. Goodbye, Mr. Manchester. Uh, goodbye. I, I really have to dash. 
Mm, that certainly was a dashing conversation. I can't understand it. You were just wonderful, Aunt Lily. Yes. You certainly sparkled and everything. Yes, I sparkled all right. Sparkled him right out of my life. Well, he certainly did have a funny reaction. Oh, well, Aunt Lily, don't bother about him. If he has funny reactions like that, I just wouldn't waste any time on him. I certainly wouldn't. He acted like an ache. He did not. He's a sweet, sensible man, and I, I like him very much. Jeepers, I never thought love would enter into this. <laughs> Well, Judy and Randolph seem to be doing it the hard way. We'll see what happens on your date with Judy in just a moment. You know, there's a hard way and an easy way to do everything. The hard way to learn if your teeth are dingy, if your smile is unattractive, is to watch the reaction of your friends. If they seem to avoid you, that may be a clue. The easy way to learn about your smile takes two seconds and spares you lots of embarrassment. Now, here's all you do. Run the tip of your tongue over your teeth. Feel that filmy coating? That dingy film collects stains on your teeth, spoils the effect of your smile, and there's no reason in the world why you should put up with it. For Pepsodent toothpaste removes that filmy coating you can feel with your tongue. Pepsodent with Arium is a clean-tasting toothpaste with super-cleansing ingredients. It foams through your mouth in millions of refreshing bubbles that loosen and flush away the dingy film from your teeth. When you brush your teeth with Pepsodent, they're so clean they pass the tongue test. They feel clean, and they look so sparkling and shiny, everybody likes to see you smile. Tomorrow may be your big day, so go to your drug counter tonight and say, Pepsodent toothpaste, please. And remember to take an empty tube, any size from any product, to exchange for your new tube of Pepsodent. Well, let's see what's happening now on Your Date with Judy. I feel terrible. Aunt Lily's been practically in tears ever since we got home. She's practically ruining her makeup. Well, to me, she looks better with it ruined. You know, Randolph, I think she goes for Mr. Manchester. Well, she'll never marry him if we keep helping her. You know what I'm going to do, Randolph? I hate to think. I'm going to offer her Edgar. Edgar? What's she going to do with him? Well, haven't you ever heard of the Eternal Triangle? When Mr. Manchester hears Aunt Lily's going out with Edgar, well, you know what we'll have? What? Jealousy. I'm calling Edgar right now. Hello? Hello, is that you, Edgar? Yeah, what do you want, Judy? Uh, how would you like to have a date? Huh? Isn't this a slight reversal of form? Oh, sure, Judy, any time you say. How about tonight? Swell, when will I pick you up? Oh, the date's not with me. It's with a new girl who just came to town. A terribly new girl, just 34 years old. Be quiet, Randolph. Is it a date, Edgar? Hey, what are you trying to pass off on me? Some witch? Why, Edgar, what a way to talk. This girl's just about the cutest number you ever saw. All right, what's the matter with her? Nothing. She's very young and very attractive. And hasn't had a date for six years. Randolph. Edgar, will you do this for me? Right. I'll do it if you'll promise to go with me to the summer prom. It's a date. Now come right over and pick up Aunt Lily. Aunt Lily? Okay, Judy. I'll be right over. He's going to do it. Aunt Lily! Aunt Lily! Yes, Judy? Aunt Lily, I've got your date with a new man. I don't want a date with a new man. Why, Aunt Lily, don't be silly. You didn't want a date with Mr. Manchester, and just look how he turned out. Yeah, just look. <laughs> Now, Aunt Lily, it's absolutely imperative you impress Edgar. Because then you'll get dates with other boys. And the first thing you know, it'll get back to Mr. Manchester. You're chasing around with everybody. Will that be good? He'll be eaten up. Now, look, Aunt Lily, we've got to rebuild your personality entire. Again? Oh, no. We're going to rehearse. Randolph, you're Edgar. I'm who? You pretend you're dating Aunt Lily. Well, okay. I'm in the Edgar mood. And here I come, ready or not. Judy, somehow my heart isn't in this. Remember, it's all for Mr. Manchester. Well, well, Randolph? Why, my dear Miss Rogan, it's a pleasure to see you again. <laughs> May I kiss your hand? Randolph, you know Edgar doesn't talk like that. <laughs> you don't have to be so, so Shakespearean. Oh, excuse me. It's the Manchester influence. 
Okay, I'll start over. Hiya, goon, let's spoon. <laughs> That's too abrupt, Randolph. It's too abrupt. Don't you understand? Try it again. Oh, dear, that must be it. We haven't had time to rehearse. Oh, it really doesn't make much difference, Judy. Hello, Edgar. Hiya, Judy. Uh, oh, Edgar, I, I want you to meet your date, Aunt Lily. Aunt Lily, this is Edgar, and Edgar, this is Miss Rogan. How do you do? How do you do? It is a pleasure to meet you. Gee, he's positively Shakespearean. <laughs> Edgar, Goopers, what are you doing over at my house so early in the morning? I, I couldn't sleep, so I, I just thought I'd come over. Did you have a nice time with Aunt Lily last night? Judy, Judy, I gotta talk to you. Well, of course, go ahead. Judy, I'm... I'm bats about her. Who? Oh, Lily. Aunt Lily? Don't keep calling her Aunt Lily. Well, she's hardly any older than you are. Why, Edgar Wilson, she's twice my age. And yours, too. That's just it. She's so... so mature. I'm... Edgar Wilson. Have you got a crush on Aunt Lily? Don't call it a crush. That sounds so... well, childish. And Lily... Lily's so... Well, spiritual and, and, and womanly and everything. Judy, I'm going to ask you something. What? Do you think I have a right to ask Lily to wait for me? Wait for you? <laughs> well, yeah, just until I finish high school. <laughs> Edgar, you're out of your mind. No, I'm not. A lot of men have married older women. Why, when I'm 60, she'll only be 77. <laughs> And gee whiz, when you're 77. Oh, Bugs, I never thought this would happen. Judy, would you mind just awfully if, if I took Lily to the summer prom instead of you? Oh, characters. May I see Lily, please? She's still sleeping. Do you want me to wake her? Oh, no, no, no. I, I wouldn't disturb her sylvan dreams for anything. I'll come back later. Bye, Judy. Oh, Lily Bell. This is grim. Randolph! Randolph, come here. I need you. What's the matter now, Miss Fairfax? The triangle just backfired. Edgar is gaga about Aunt Lily. Now I have seen everything. And, and me. I'm just positively gaga about Edgar. Oh, Randolph, I'm desperate. Aunt Lily's in grave danger. Of what? Being robbed by the cradle? <laughs> relation, Aunt. Sweet, unselfish little Judy. Of course you aren't worried about holding Edgar or anything. Randolph, don't quibble. What will we do? Well, let me put my brain to it. I'll think of something. Now, don't be so desperate, Judy. You'll get your man back. Hey, if Edgar had married Aunt Lily, he'd be my uncle. <laughs> telling you, Mr. Manchester. Hush, no loud talking in the library, Randolph. Well, what I've been trying to tell you is that my Aunt Lily's been running around with another man. She has? Yeah, he's practically on the verge of almost proposing to her. Hush, he is? Yeah, it's one of those whirlwind courtships. He's got her practically swept off her feet. Hush, oh, that's terrible. He likes her because she's so simple and intellectual and everything. You know that day we saw you in the street... She was just made up that way because she was going to a masquerade. Hush. A masquerade? I never thought of that. Yeah. She was going as Judy. Everybody had to go as something funny. <laughs> you heard her practicing talking like Judy. Yes, I did. A masquerade. Well, that's wonderful news. Of course. Now, if you move fast, you may still be in time to stop the elopement. There may be a ladder outside of her window this very moment. Randolph, I'm going to move faster than I've ever moved in all my life. Mr. Manchester, hush. Where is she? Well, good afternoon, Mr. Manchester. Where is she? Where's who? Well, Lily, of course. Well, I guess she's upstairs in her room. Oh, quick, before she escapes. Mr. Manchester, are you going upstairs? <laughs> We've got to stop that elopement. Oh, yes, of course. Elopement? There may be a stepladder outside her window this very moment. Well, if there is, this is the first I've heard of it. Lily! Lily! Where are you, Lily? Who 
who's doing all that yelling? Mother, what's happening around here? I don't know. Mr. Manchester just ran upstairs like a crazy man. I wonder what made him do that. <laughs> Gee, I hope he doesn't see Aunt Lily. She isn't a bit half or glamorous today. She's just herself again. Oh, that same old personality she used to have. I found her. Don't, I've got her. Don't. Hey, look at him. He told me Aunt Lily downstairs like a cave. Put me down, Donald. Put me down. She likes it. I want to say something, Lily. I want to say it right here in front of everybody. Don't do it, Lily. Do what? I can't imagine. Lily, call off that elopement. Why, Lily, what's been going on in this house? Oh, I wouldn't know. I'll make you a devoted husband, even though my courtship hasn't been whirlwind. Sounds mighty whirlwind to me. <laughs> Blows me completely over. Donald. Donald, are you proposing? Well, I... I guess I am. Take him up on it quick, Aunt Lily. All right. I accept you, Donald. Gee, they're engaged. <laughs> Just as soon as I get my breath, I'll congratulate you. Lily, I think I'm going to kiss you. Oh, oh not here, Donald. Oh, oh go, go ahead, ahead, Aunt Lily. It's fun. <laughs> Children, I just got another letter from Grandma. What'd she say? Well, let me see. She says, I'm very happy to hear about Lily's engagement, and... Uh... Oh, good heavens. What's the matter, Mother? She's sending Aunt Gertrude and Cousin Georgiana to visit us. <laughs> she wants us to get them married, too. <laughs> You have just heard A Date with Judy, the story of an American family. Let's join the foster family again for a moment. Gee, Mother, I had a good week. You did, dear? Yes, I had five dates. One with Ogin, and one with Hank, and one with Skunky. And... Answer the door, Randolph. Yes, Mother. Within 20 minutes after the receipt of this order for deportation, you, together with the members of all your family, shall be ready for departure and wait in the street outside your house. You may take with you one set of clothing... One wooden woolen blanket, blanket per person. Who, for several days, birth certificate. Not more than $20. Other Fantastic. Person... No, not at all. Hundreds of thousands of Dutch, Belgians, Poles, French have heard that order read. It is being read this very minute in some black corner of Europe. People are victims. Always the quiet, innocent people like you. Old and young, women with babies in their arms. And it can happen here. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it can happen here, unless we stamp it out over there. And that means guns and tanks and planes. Not only more than the enemy has. Not air supremacy, but air and ground mastery. That takes money. Every day, every hour. More planes must be built. More guns made. More tanks manufactured. That's right, Dora. Buying a few bonds isn't enough. We must buy bonds regularly so we can make the engines of war without stopping. Every quarter we invest in war bonds sends one dozen bullets ripping into Axis tank columns. Every dollar we invest turns our war wheels faster, grinds our enemies smaller. That's why our government urges us to put at least 10% of our earnings into war bonds. That's why millions of Americans have already joined the 10% club by buying war bonds regularly every payday. The best way to safeguard our future is to destroy completely everything the Axis stands for, with bullets, with planes, with tanks. And it'll take money. Ten percent of it every payday to do the job. My dad's a member of the Ten Percent Club, aren't you, Dad? That's right, Randolph. Because we know that every day, every dime counts in lives and blood. We hope you buy your quarter of war bonds tomorrow. A date with Judy came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Next week, at the same time, Bob Hope will return to the air. With Bob Hope will be all your old friends, Jerry Colonna, Francis Langford, Skinny Ennis, and Vera Vague. And now, Pepsodent invites you to have a date with Judy. <laughs> Yes, you all have a 
date with Judy, chaperoned by Pepsi. At last, something big and important has happened in Judy Foster's life, as her brother Randolph is gradually finding out. Now, let me get this straight, Judy. You are a reporter on the Daily Chronicle? Society reporter, Randolph. Do you have an office at the Daily Chronicle? Well, not exactly. I'm sort of a reporter without portfolio. Are you also a reporter without salary? Don't be ridiculous, Randolph. I get five cents an inch for everything they print. And how much have they printed so far? An inch and a half. An inch about the bridge party Mitzi's mother was planning and half an inch when it was called off. How come it was called off? Well, Mitzi and I were the ones who planned it. Keep that up indefinitely and you'll be a millionaire. And today the most wonderful thing happened. The regular society reporter got acute indigestion. Lovely, lovely. And I had to cover the most utterly super wedding ever held in this town. The Waterman Brewer nuptials. Listen to this. The bridal table was garnished with gladioli and sweet peas. After a sumptuous bridal dinner consisting of lobster a la Newburgh, the bride and groom left for an undisclosed destination, probably Sandusky. Probably the hospital. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful, Randolph? I wrote every word of it myself. Even that word sumptuous? Of course. You'll probably get the Pulitzer Prize. Children, I've got the most wonderful news. Quick, Judy, get out your notebook. I just got a telegram from Aunt Lily. She and Mr. Ma- Manchester are getting married. Mother, that's luscious. Does Mr. Manchester know? Well, I suppose he had uh, something to do with it. Where are they going to get married, Mother? Right here in this house. In this house? But that's gorgeous. We'll simply blank at the society page. Inches and inches. Boy, will you be in the chips? Uh, oh, wait a minute, Judy. I'm not sure Aunt Lily will want to be blanketed. Now, Mother, you just don't need to worry about a thing. I know exactly how to handle this. I'll take care of Aunt Lily, all right. I can see her now, garnished with sweet peas and lobster all in Newburgh. <laughs> right smack in the middle of the society page. Poor Aunt Lily. <laughs> That's only the beginning of a date with Judy for tonight. Here's an examination that was never included in any school curriculum. But it's a mighty important test whether you're of school age or not. It's called the tongue test. And it'll help to give you your personality rating. Now, here it is. Run the tip of your tongue over your teeth. Can you feel a filmy coating? If you can, you've flunked the test. And you'd better get Pepsid and toothpaste tonight. For that filmy coating on your teeth is collecting stains making your teeth look dull and dingy, hiding the sparkle of your smile. And it's a warning that your present toothpaste may be letting you down. Pepsodent toothpaste whisks up that film away, makes your teeth so clean and sparkling they feel shiny smooth. Pepsodent with Irium is the super cleanser that makes your teeth feel bright, makes your mouth feel fresh and cool and clean. So get a tube of Pepsodent tonight. Use it tonight, because tomorrow may be your big day. Just take a used metal tube to your drug counter, any kind or size will do, and say, Pepsodent Toothpaste, please. And now, let's get back on that date with Judy. Lily, I'm so glad you're here. And John, come right here. It's so good to see you. For you... Surprise? <laughs> <laughs> oh, surprise. I, I was never so glad to hear anything in all my life. And, Aunt Lily, you don't have to worry about a thing. Everything's under control. You should only know. Uh, Lily, have you set the date? Well, we thought this Saturday. This Saturday? You can't dream of... Take a month to get everything ready. I'm ready now. Oh, no, <laughs> Mr. Manchester. <laughs> Never, Mr. Manchester. There are millions of things to do for a big wedding like this. Well, Judy, I think you've got the wrong idea. We're going to have a quiet, simple ceremony with just the family. Yes, we just want to, well, get married. (laughs) Oh, we can't do that. I'd lose my job. What? If anybody in our family gets married and it's not a society wedding, I'd be disgraced. Oh, dear. I've decided it's going to be a garden wedding. A garden wedding? Of course. The Waterman Brewer wedding was... And we could never cram a big mob of people into our living room. But we don't want to cram a big mob of people anywhere. We just want to get married. (laughs) Who are going to be the bridesmaids? Bridesmaids? The bride picks them from her most intimate friends. There were eight at the Waterman Brewer now, Joe. But I don't have eight intimate friends. I don't even know any other women in town here. Oh, they can't be women. They've got to be girls. Except the matron of honor. 
She's allowed to be a little matronly. Well, I hope the bride's allowed to be a little matronly, because Aunt Lily... Just think of some of your school chums, Aunt Lily. <laughs> but, Judy, I haven't been in school since, well, 1926. Hmm. Instead of bridesmaids, she ought to have eight matrons of honor. <laughs> then, Mr. Manchester, I appeal to you. Couldn't we convert some of your friends into bridesmaids? His intimate friends? Well, <laughs> oh, why, why do we have to have bridesmaids? We, we just want to get married. <laughs> Mr. Manchester, let's get down to fundamentals. Who are you going to have as your best man? Well, is a best man absolutely necessary? It's vital. No nuptial should be without one. Well, uh, could Randolph here sort of... Uh... Best man? Me? Have you looked at me lately? <laughs> Randolph is utterly out of the question. The best man has to be an intimate friend of yours. Well, uh, Randolph and I sort of uh, understand each other. <laughs> Try to think, Mr. Manchester. I could give you a hint by mentioning that at the Waterman Brewing nuptials, the best man went to Princeton with the groom and belonged to the same clubs. Well, uh, there was a fellow who took a library course with me at night school, and we both belonged to the YMCA. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can't you think of anybody else? What about that friend of yours from Ashland, Donald? Uh, Bert Oliver? Yes, he might come. Oh, but it's a lot of bus fare just That's for... fine. Bert Oliver. I'll make a note of it. We'll send an engraved invitation to him. When we get him engraved? Uh, just who is Mr. Oliver, may I ask? You may ask. Oh, he's a mailman. A mailman. Uh, covers the whole Ashland district single-handed. <laughs> Shapers. How's that going to sound in the Daily Chronicle? Look... Does it really make any difference how it sounds in the Daily Chronicle? All we want to do is get married. Well, seems like a simple wish. In town for the Rogan Manchester nuptials is Bert Oliver, well-known government executive. <laughs> for goodness sake, Judy, he's only a mailman. And he isn't even in town yet. He doesn't get in here until tomorrow morning's bus. The Daily Chronicle is never wrong. Judy, please, let's not have any more publicity. Well, my goodness, the way everybody's acting, you'd never know we were going to have any nuptials in this house tomorrow. Aunt Lily ought to be trying on her wedding gown. Oh, I'm just going to wear that little gray suit I bought last spring with a white blouse. Aunt Lily, that's impossible. You've simply got to have a wedding dress. I intended to take at least four inches to describe it. And four inches is 20 cents right there. I don't know what's going to happen to my job. If I have to come in the office and say, my aunt was married in a little gray suit with a white blouse. Oh, uh, maybe you should have a wedding dress, Lily. After all, it makes it more of an occasion. And you only get married once. She'll be lucky if that comes off. Oh, I just want to have the kind of wedding you had. Oh, yes, it, it was nice, wasn't it? Now, just a minute. What happened? Well, it was in Grandma's living room in Springfield. There were about 12 people there, all close members of the family. 12 people? But it was practically a secret. I guess the ceremony only lasted about 10 minutes, but I'll never forget it as long as I live. What did you wear? A white afternoon dress with a pink sash. Yes, I remember when you cut it up into dust rags. <laughs> no veil? No, darling. Your father and I just wanted to, well, get married. Why, it doesn't sound like it was worth an inch in a newspaper. It certainly would have been different if I'd been there. That I can believe. Hello, everybody. Oh, oh Donald, hello. where did you come from? I took a few minutes off from the library. I couldn't go right through the day without a glimpse of my uh, intended. <laughs> How sweet of you to say that, Donald. I brought my suit over, too. Well, isn't that nice? I thought I'd better leave it here. It'll be easier to change into it here tomorrow. You're not going to wear that blue serge suit for your wedding. Oh, yes. This wedding is the biggest occasion in my life. I don't see what else I should save this suit for. Don't you have a, a, a morning coat or, or a cutaway? Me? Oh, no. But you can't get married in a messy old serge suit. Well, I'd look beautiful at my graduation from library school in 1931. <laughs> or, Randolph, would you do me a favor? Well, sure. I haven't had a chance to get it pressed. Will you run it down to the cleaners for me? Oh, sure thing, pal. Randolph, would you like me to walk down to the cleaners with you? Hmm. To what do I owe this kind but sudden offer? I just thought, well, it's a kind of heavy suit, and maybe you'd like a little help carrying it. Well, okay, but you frighten me. 
Whenever you get that sweet, helpful look in your eyes, something awful starts, like a blizzard or an epidemic. Come on, Randolph. Goodbye, folks. We'll see you later. Goodbye, Judy. Okay, Judy, let me have it. What's on that pretty little mind of yours? Randolph, I suddenly decided in there that if nobody's going to help me give Aunt Lily a society wedding, I'll have to do it myself, single-handed. Are you kidding? I've made up my mind. Mr. Manchester is not going to wear this suit. He's going to wear a tailcoat. A tailcoat? You're knitting it for him, of course. <laughs> Incidentally, this blue serge suit smells funny. Well, you'd smell funny, too, if you had mothballs in all your pockets. Imagine Mr. Manchester wanting to wear this at his wedding. Yeah, I can see him reaching for the ring, pulling out a mothball. <laughs> that shows what you know about weddings. It's the best man who handles the ring situation. Hiya, Judy. Where are you going? I was just coming over Mitzi, to help. you're just the person I want to see. I'm going to need you. For what? I'm going to take over Aunt Lily's entire wedding. You are? Are you going to let Aunt Lily stand at the altar, or do you take over there, too? <laughs> I want you to come with us, Mitzi. First, we're going to trade this blue serge suit for tails and white tie. We're not going to have it pressed? We are not. We're going to Sam and Joe's swap shop. Oh, Judy, that's wonderful. I adore swapping. Should I take the mothballs out of this suit, or should we swap them for something at Sam and Joe's, too? Take them out. I don't want him to get the impression this is an old suit. Oh, they'd never get that impression. Not unless they can smell. <laughs> hey, Judy, look what I just found in the vest pocket. What? An address book. Well, look at this. Velma Teasdale, phone 7630. Well, I never would have thunk it of Uncle Donald. Randolph, that gives me the most terrific idea. What is it? That's where we're going to get our bridesmaids. Where? In that address book. Since Aunt Lily doesn't know any girls in town, is there any reason why the bridesmaids can't be his friends? I can think of a few reasons. <laughs> well, it's kind of daring, Judy. I don't care. Anybody this hard up for bridesmaids would do anything. Who else is there in the book, Randolph? Oh, let's see. There's an Edith, spelled with a Y, phone 264. She doesn't have a last name. I don't see how we can invite her if she doesn't have a last name. Oh, but we've got to have Edith. She's Mr. Manchester's best friend. How do you know? Her page is practically worn out. <laughs> Let me see that book. Maybe we can find some more names. Archive Bookstore. What a bridesmaid. Are there any others? The Acme Wrought Iron Beam Company. Ah, there's your matron of honor. <laughs> well, at least we'll get two bridesmaids, Velma and Edith with a Y. You know, I'm really getting interested in this wedding. Oh, Mitzi, it's going to be wonderful. I know just how I'm going to start it in the Chronicle. How? In the delightfully arboreal setting of the Foster's Garden, where the corn and taters grow. <laughs> We'll be back with Judy and her plans for Aunt Lily's wedding in just a moment. Say, did you folks see the eclipse of the moon a few weeks ago? Well, I hope you did, because there it was, an illustration right in the sky of what I've been talking about. There was the moon bright as could be, but as the shadow of the earth moved across it, the sparkle and brilliance of the moon was covered up with a dark film. And that's what happens to your teeth when they're covered with a filmy coating that collects stains. Their brilliance and sparkle are covered up by film. And there's a total eclipse of your smile. But remove that film with Pepsi and toothpaste, and your teeth will shine again as they were meant to shine. Sparkling and beautiful. You see, Pepsi is a very special toothpaste. It contains irium and a super cleansing ingredient that loosens and flushes away the filmy coating from your teeth. Millions of refreshing bubbles foam through your mouth. Make your teeth brilliantly clean. Leave your mouth feeling cool and fresh. Tonight, Hunt up an empty tube, any size from any product, and take it to your drug counter to exchange when you get a new tube of Pepsi and toothpaste. Then bring your smile out from under that eclipse. Give yourself a big, bright, dazzling Pepsi and smile. And now, back to that date with Judy. terrific wedding ever held in this town. I figure to make at least 80 cents on it. Is the garden all cleaned up for the wedding? It's simply arboreal and everything. Randolph Foster reporting on the general chaos. What's wrong? 
Oh, nothing much. Mother's practically hysterical. Aunt Lily isn't sure what's flying. Mr. Manchester is struggling into a wing collar. The guests will arrive any minute, and it looks like rain. Now, don't worry about the rain. That's the silliest thing I ever heard of. You might tell that to the clouds. Randolph, have the bridesmaids come yet? No, but the best man has. He has? What does he look like, Randolph? He's indescribable. <laughs> We're going to have quite a tussle writing him up. Where is he? I want to meet him. He's in the house, pacing up and down, carrying a violin case. A violin case? He said he brought it with him in case anybody wanted him to play I Love You Truly. That's a wonderful idea. Come on, let's go in and meet him. I wonder what he's going to wear to the wedding. Did he bring white tie and tails, Randolph? No, but he brought his violin. How's that going to sound in the Chronicle? My goodness, the best man wore a violin. Gee, I don't see why people can't cooperate. Well, there he is. Mr. Oliver, this is my sister and her friend, Mitzi. <laughs> How do you do? Gee, he isn't any Cary Grant, is he? <laughs> well, lady, what has Cary Grant got that I haven't got? <laughs> well, for one thing, a chin. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny, <laughs> Very funny remark. <laughs> Mr. Oliver, are you acquainted with the duties of a best man? Well, I guess what I do is kind of stand beside the groom and catch him if he faints and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Oliver, this is very serious being a best man. I hope you won't take your duties too lightly. Well, how can he? He's going to be a mighty busy man. He's not only got to hand the groom the ring, but play I Love You Truly, too. <laughs> well, looks like somebody's here already. How do you do? Oh, how do you do? I'm Thelma Teasdale. Oh, one of the bridesmaids. Come right in. <laughs> Are you the one who phoned and invited me? Yes, I am. Well, I think it was wonderful of Donnie to want me at his wedding. <laughs> Donnie and I used to be uh, that way. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, I'm so glad you were able to come. I think your gown is lovely. <laughs> There's only one question I have. Yes? How'd she hook him? <laughs> well, I couldn't say. <laughs> I'd love to get a squint at her. Well, she's upstairs dressing right now. <laughs> I think I better tune my fiddle. <laughs> oh, Mr. Oliver. Uh, this is Miss Teasdale. He's the best man, Miss Teasdale. <laughs> How do you do? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> 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 I feel the same way about him. Uh, Judy, Judy, come up here. Oh, excuse me. The bride wants me. Do you mind if I tag along? This is the most fascinating day. I don't want to miss a bit of it. I'm coming, too. You play the violin, I see. I love talented geniuses. What do you suppose Aunt Lily wants, Randolph? She wants to get married. I, however, am laying odds. Oh, be quiet, Randolph. Oh, there you are, Judy. Your mother tells me that you planned the wedding in the garden. Why, of course. But I don't want it in the garden. I just want a simple, quiet wedding in the living room. And it seems to me Aunt Lily ought to have her way about something. But she's got to have it in the garden. Today's Chronicle says it's in the garden. Six inches says it's in the garden. <laughs> but the Chronicle also says it's going to rain. And I don't want to have a wet wedding. Now listen, Aunt Lily. I know the weatherman at the newspaper. And he's very unreliable. Every time he says it's going to rain, it's all sunshiny and everything. Judy Forster, come here to the window. Why, what's wrong, Mother? Who are those ladies in the garden? I don't know them. Oh. Oh, I know them. Well, what are they fighting about right in front of everybody, too? They're the bridesmaids. Judy, did you invite bridesmaids after all Aunt Lily and Mr. Manchester said about having a simple family wedding? Well, Mother, at the Waterman Brewer wedding, they... Haven't you done enough? Aunt Lily had to let out all the seams in that wedding dress you bought for her with heaven knows whose money. Poor thing having to sew on her wedding day. And Mr. Manchester's practically crying. Crying? That tailcoat is so tight it hurts him. <laughs> but, Mother, it was the best one Sam and Joe had in the whole swap shop. Judy, will you please attend to those bridesmaids? A fine thing at a wedding, where everything is supposed to be sweetness and light to have a bunch of women fighting. I wonder what they're fighting about. I haven't the slightest idea. I also haven't the slightest idea where you got them. You'd be simply fascinated if you knew. <laughs> now, please, Judy, don't complicate this wedding anymore. I'm having troubles enough with Grandma. What's wrong with her? Well, I knew she was going to cry at the wedding, but I didn't think she was going to start an hour beforehand. <laughs> Maybe she and Mr. Manchester ought to get together. Judy, are you going to quiet those bridesmaids, or aren't you? Oh, all right. Come on, Randolph. Okay. 
My goodness. I have to do everything. It's a good thing I'm capable. It isn't every Aunt Lily who has an assistant society wedding editor to arrange a wedding for her. Hey, I just thought of something. Who's going to give the bride away? Nobody, I hope. She's 34, you know. Judy! Oh, Judy! Oh, Mr. Manchester. Why, you look positively handsome. I feel like a penguin with these tails. <laughs> the swing collar keeps flapping back and forth like a, a windmill. Stop worrying. This is going to be the most wonderful wedding I ever gave. But I don't want you to give me a wonderful wedding. I just want to get married. Oh, we'll throw that in, too. All I ask is a teeny-weeny favor. Give me back my blue serge suit. We can't until after the wedding. Unless you want to get married in your underwear. I like that blue serge suit. I, I want to wear it. I'm, I'm personally attached to it. Well, at present, Sam and Joe's swap shop is personally attached to it. Don't worry, Mr. Manchester. You can swap it back right after the wedding. Oh. Would you care to accompany us to the garden, Mr. Manchester? We're going to see the bridesmaids. Bridesmaids? Do I know them? <laughs> Why, you'll just be surprised how well you know them. <laughs> you ought to be better be locked you, and I don't care what oh, you say. Oh, is that oh, so? Oh, 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 my goodness. He never gave you a poodle dog. Oh, 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 my goodness. Oh, that, that, that's Edith. Oh, Edith Crawl. I wonder what archive she came from. Oh, 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 what's she doing here? And uh, Velma, Velma Teasdale. Oh, 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 my, oh, my word. I went with him three years ago last May, June, and July. Oh, dear. May, June, and July. You couldn't have. That's what I was going with. Oh, oh no, gee, I think they're fighting over you, Uncle Donald. Uh, uh, Randolph, uh, Judy, uh, uh, does Lily know who the bridesmaids are? Not exactly. We didn't see a word about them, except that we found their telephone numbers in your little black book. Oh, oh dear, this is awful. Oh. Awful. He had a terrific crush on me. Well, for the love of Pete. Look, there he is. Oh, Donald, dear. Donald, you like me better than you like Edith. No, didn't you? Oh, well, that isn't true. He had a bigger crush on me, didn't you, Donald? Oh, my. Crush on you, Edith Kroll. I'll crush you, you two-timer, you. Oh, ladies, oh, ladies, please, the ceremony's about to begin. I don't care. She stole Donnie away from me. She stole him away from me. Oh, my goodness. Ladies, ladies. She's no lady. <laughs> and to think that in May, June, and July of 1939, I lived in a beautiful pipe dream. You stole Donnie away from me. And you... Oh, look, ladies, what difference does it make? He's marrying somebody else. Oh, my. Oh, here comes Lily. Now, quiet, everybody. Here comes the bride. Well, I don't care. He did like me best. Oh, yes, Donald didn't even know that you were alive, did you, Donald? Oh, uh, hello. Oh, Lily. Well, what's all this about? Oh, are, are these the, the bridesmaids? Donald was in love with me. He was in love with me. <laughs> oh, Donald. Now, don't, don't pay any attention, Lily. It, it doesn't mean a thing. Oh, how could you? You told me I was the first woman you'd ever loved. And all of a sudden, here are two more. Uh, but, 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 Lily, I... How many others were there, Donald? Lily, listen to me. It, it, it was only puppy love. I, I, I was very young then, still in my early 30s. <laughs> You're a, a Casanova, that's all. Uh, Lily, please. Aunt Lily, don't be mad at Uncle Donald. Don't call him Uncle Donald. But Uncle Donald went with these girls years ago. Eons before he knew you. Did you love them, Don? Of course not, Lily. Well, he gave me a poodle. And me a fox terrier. Puppy love is right. <laughs> Lily, uh, I love you. Uh, I've never loved anybody else. Now, please believe me. Uh, let's get the wedding started. All right, Don. I believe you. Oh, that's wonderful, Aunt Lily. Mr. Oliver, strike up the fiddle. Mr. Manchester, get down there by the minister, quick. Oh, oh my, oh, my. And now, Aunt Lily, start walking slowly. The bride looks just lovely, doesn't she? For her. I knew this was going to be the most wonderful wedding the Chronicle ever had on its society page. Oh, for the love of heaven, it's beginning to pour. Oh, now, now, ignore the rain, everybody. We've got to get married. Oh, Donald, how can we? My wedding dress will be ruined. Oh, we've got... Now, look, uh, maybe we better all go in the house. What'll I do with my violin? Sound retreat! <laughs> Sound I can't. My violin's full of water. Oh, 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 this tailcoat's beginning to shrink. It's crawling up on me. Choking to death. Come on, everybody, into the house. Oh, yes. Oh, this beautiful, beautiful wedding. I'm all wet. This is what comes of Grandma crying so much. Now, we can all get together in the living room. And don't worry about tracking up the carpet. Oh, somebody slipped me out of this... Uh... This corset. Oh, dear. Now we'll have to get married in his shirt sleeves. Mr. Oliver, as soon as everybody rings themselves out, you can start to play the wedding march again. No, I can't, ma'am. My fiddle's flooded. 
<laughs> My beautiful, beautiful fiddle. Oh, but it was only a cheap violin, wasn't it, Mr. Oliver? I loved it like it was a Stradivari. Oh, for heaven's sake, let's get this over with before my tail coat disappears entirely. Uh, Reverend, start the ceremony, please. Mr. Manchester, I have the most appalling news. The pages of my little book got all stuck together in the rain. Oh, oh dear. Well, can't you remember how the service goes? I can try. Will you stand here, Miss Rogan? And you here, Mr. Manchester. Oh, oh, no. What's that? At the Waterman Brewer nuptials, the bride stood there and the groom stood there. This is the last straw. I don't give a hoot where they stood at the Waterman Brewer nuptials. All I want to do is get married. But I was just trying Judy to... Judy get... Foster, you come here. Mr. Manchester, what are you going to do? Up until now, I've been a quiet man who has never put his hand to a woman. But I can restrain myself no longer. Oh, no. Don't do that, Mr. Manchester. You can call me uncle now. And bend over, please. Oh, Uncle Donald. Wow, oh. He's spanking her. Oh. Good. She's needed it for years. Oh. I never thought it was in him. No. This is the end. That's right, oh. Randolph. That's exactly where I'm aiming. Oh. <laughs> And now I'd like to tell you all about something that's... Mr. Keating, we have something terribly important to tell you. Well, hold it just a minute, Judy. There are a couple of things I have to do first. Then we can talk. Well, this is quite a monumental decoration on Judy's part, Mr. Keating. Okay, kids. I'll be with you right away. But first, I'd like to say this. High school kids and that nice old lady next door, pretty girls and hard-boiled businessmen, they all have told us how much they like the Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush. High school kids like it because the nylon bristles keep their pep. Don't get flabby and go blah on the teeth. That nice old lady likes it because it's gentle as well as efficient. Doesn't scratch tender gums. Pretty girls like it because it ensures that attractive smile. And businessmen like the Pepsodent brush because, from every angle, it's a swell buy. Super efficient, thanks to those 50 tufts of nylon bristles. Twice as many tufts as any other brush having a small, compact head. And there's a Pepsodent bonus with every brush. In every package, a cash certificate worth 10 cents extra spending money. So please everybody at your house, get a Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush for each member of your family when you go to your drug counter tonight. Now, Mr. Keating? Now? Okay, Judy and Randolph, what's on your mind? Well, the fact is, Mr. Keating... For the first time in her life, Judy wants to refuse a date. Huh? Yeah, there's a young chap you may have heard of who's sort of taking over starting next Tuesday. I can't accept the date because I want to stay home and listen to him on the radio. His name's Hope. Bob Hope. Likeable chap. I predict he'll go far. Yes. <laughs> you see, he's coming on the air as... Well, sort of winter replacement for our program. And so next Tuesday night, with Pepsi and the Chaperone, we all have a date with Bob Hope. And the whole gang, Francis Langford, Jerry Colonna, Skinny Ennis, and Vera Vey. That's right. Isn't that super? That's right, kids. Super is the word. Next week, Bob Hope. <laughs> Julia Randolph, we think you've been super. So long for a while. A Date with Judy with Deli Ellis, Dix Davis, B. Benaderet, and Louise Erickson is written by Aline Leslie and Jerome Lawrence. Original music by Gordon Jenkins. This is Larry Keating speaking for Pepsodent, inviting you to listen next week to Bob Hope. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. KFI Los Angeles, Earl C. Anthony, Incorporated. 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 Bristol Myers, makers of iPlanet toothpaste and sparkling sal hepatica, presents A Date with Judy. Hello? Judy? Why, hello? Uh, Judy, I'd like to ask you for a date tonight. Of course, I don't have a motorcycle with a sidecar like Jojo Duran. You don't? I know I'm not as good-looking as Jojo Duran. You aren't? And I don't have as much money as Jojo Duran. You don't? But 
Could I have a date anyhow? Why, certainly. But can I ask you one question? Sure. How can I get in touch with this Jojo Duran? <laughs> That's Judy, folks. Judy Foster, the cutest date in town. Well, let's see what's doing. It's 2 a.m. in the Foster house. The clock is ticking and a water tap in the basement is dripping. But except for those things, everywhere there is silence. All the Fosters are asleep. That is, all but most of them. Certainly, Mother is awake. She's talking to Father. Melvin. Wake up, Melvin. I want to ask you something. Mm -hmm. Uh, What do you want, Laura? Have you heard Judy come in, dear? Judy? No. Why? Do you know it's 2 a.m.? I'm worried. Worried? Why? Because it's 2 a.m., Melvin, and I don't think she's home yet. Not home? Who? Oh, where is she? I don't know. That's why I'm worried. Do you remember who she went out with tonight? No, some boy, I guess. Of course, some boy. (laughs) Do you remember who called for her? No, don't remember seeing her go out. I saw her go, but I can't remember which boy it was. She goes out with so many. Melvin, I- I'm going to get up and go downstairs and see if I can see some sign of her. All right, I'll go with you. Hand me my robe, dear. Yes, uh, here. Thanks. Did you say it was 2 a.m.? Yes, I'm worried sick. She hardly ever stays out this late. Well, come on, dear, if you're coming. I'm right with you. Just wait till she comes in. I'm going to give her a talking to. I haven't slept a wink. Melvin. Well, I haven't. Just been lying there worrying. Oh, Melvin. Well, I have. Mother, father, what are you doing out? Randall, go back to bed, dear. We're we're just kind of worried. Judy isn't in yet. Well, I bet she's out in the front porch pitching woo. If she is, I swear I'll spank her. <laughs> Even if she is 16. Well, we'll go see. Uh, you go back to bed, Randolph. And miss what is lucky to turn out to be a very interesting sight? No, hope I'm coming right with you. All dark down here. Hey, uh, well, let's not turn on any lights. Let's just suddenly appear on the front porch and yell surprise. Mm. Our supplies are all right. And as for whatever young puppy she's pitching who with, I'll kick him out of this house so fast he'll never come back. Now, Melvin, control yourself. Hmm. Control myself? Well, the porch is all dark. I'll make you bet they're sitting in the swing, mushing and slushing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Randolph, that sounds horrid. Never even close my eyes. Surprise! Oh, gee, they're not here. Oh, now I am worried. She's not even home yet. Oh, Melvin, do you suppose something's happened to her? No, and come on back in the house. Just wait till I tell that young puppy what I think of him. I wouldn't even care if she were mushing and slushing. At least she'd be home. To think, night after night, she's out there in that swing tossing the gook around. And just tonight, when we could get some fun out of it, she isn't there. Now, Randolph, stop exaggerating. I'm sure Judy doesn't kiss anybody. Well, not anybody. There was a gazook last January she refused to. (laughs) Randolph. Oh, wait a minute. I I think I see a light in the kitchen. In the kitchen? First time she ever necked in the kitchen. (laughs) Randolph, stop that. Come on, Melvin. Just wait till I lay my hands on that lady killer. Just wait. Now, Melvin, if you're coming in the kitchen with me, control yourself. Oh, Judy. Oh, hello, Mother. What are you doing up at this hour? What are we doing up at this hour? I just want to tell you a thing or two. Keeping this whole house up all night. Oh, hello, Father and Randolph. Don't you hello me, Father. I'm going to spank you old as you are. And as for you, young man, I'm going to... Oh, hello, Leah. Oh, hello, Mr. Foster. How are you? It's great to see you. Oh, I'm just fine, Mr. Foster. Have you met my wife, Leah? This is Leah Novogroski, Dora. How do you do? Oh, Hi. A rather good pie you've got here, Mrs. Foster. And this is my son, Randolph. Oh, hi. Hi. Hey, do you have to eat all that pie? Oh, Leon's got a tremendous appetite, don't you, Leon? Yeah. And those were good meatballs, too, Mrs. Foster. Just think. Leon ate all the meatballs that were left over from dinner, Mother. Now he won't have to have them again tomorrow. Well, isn't that nice? We won't have any pie left over for tomorrow, either. I was very fond of that pie. Dora, didn't you say you baked two pies today? Why, yes, Melvin, I Fine, did. fine. Leon's finished all of this one. Have another pie, Leon. Okay, believe I will. But that pie was for tomorrow, Melvin. That's I was saving That's all right. We can have something else. Go right ahead, Leon. Well, I think we'll be getting back to bed and leave you two kids alone. Come on, Dora, Randolph. But, Melvin, you Good said... Good night, that... Leon, Judy. I'll be upstairs in just a few minutes, Father. That's all right. Take your time. See that Leon has enough to eat. Good night. Good night, Father. 
Melvin, I thought you were going to scold that boy. Scold him? Why, do you know who he is? What's the difference who he is? He's What's in there. the difference? Why, he's the star pitcher on my factory's baseball team, that's all. Just the best pitcher we ever had. And the best eater. Why, with him, we can lick every other factory team in town. Is that why he can keep Judy up as late as he pleases? Well, we've got to be nice to him. He's the office boy, you know. Young, healthy. On account of the war, he's the only man on the team under 40. Mm. <laughs> that must be some team. All the other factory teams have old men, too. Yes, with Leon, we stand a good chance to win the pennant this year. If we can provide enough pies. Well, <laughs> come on, let's go to bed. I want to get back to sleep. Oh, now it's back to sleep. Before, you hadn't slept a wink. Don't be silly. I slept like a top. Oh, my goodness, men. I'll never be able to understand them. Good night, Randolph. Sleep well, son. I don't know how anybody expects me to sleep when the last pie in this house is being devoured right at this very minute. Good morning, Judy. Good morning, Mother. Well, I don't know what you're so dismal about. After the rip-roaring time you've been having every night for the last two weeks with that Leon Novogrosky. Oh, it wasn't rip-roaring at all, Mother. It was heart-rending. Heart-rending? It's Leon. He loves another. Another what? Another girl, Mother. <laughs> I'm so in love with him, and he loves that nasty old Ruth Whiteman. Then why does he come over here every night? Unless it's for the food. <laughs> He only dates me when he can't get a date with Ruth. And then he spends the whole evening telling me about her. How dull. It is not dull. Anything he says is perfectly wonderful, even if it is all about Ruth. Well, I wouldn't like to listen to him talk about Ruth all evening, especially with his mouth full. <laughs> oh, Mother, you're so absolutely unsympathetic. Jeepers, some mothers, if their daughters were in a situation like this, would make some helpful suggestions. Would they, dear? I bet Ruth Whiteman's mother helps her snitch away men from other girls. Well, maybe Ruth Whiteman's mother's had more experience snitching men away from other girls than I've had. Oh, the trouble with you is you've always lived such a sheltered, protected life that you're utterly guileless. You're so naive, Mother. I don't think you've lived at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I've always thought of myself as having lived. Never mind, Mother. If I want help, I'm sure there's some stranger who'll be glad to give it to me. Somebody who's lived? Yes. <laughs> Well, what are we going to have for breakfast? Oh, that's simple. Whatever Leon didn't eat last night. <laughs> well, I wouldn't attempt to offer any help to Judy with her specific love problem, but I don't mind passing along this bit of general information to the lovelorn. Namely, a high date rating goes to the girl with a radiant smile. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, there's real magic in a radiant smile, but it doesn't take magic to make one. Just plain common sense. First, visit your dentist regularly. Second, take advantage in between times of the daily help which eye pan toothpaste and massage can give your gums and teeth. For healthy gums are mighty important to sound teeth and sparkling smiles. And Ipana toothpaste not only cleans teeth thoroughly, but when used with massage, it increases gum circulation, helps stimulate gums to a heartier, healthier firmness. So why not, for your own smile's sake, follow this healthful dental routine? Brush your teeth regularly with Ipana toothpaste. And every time you do, put a little extra Ipana on your brush or fingertip and massage it on your gums. You'll help yourself to brighter teeth, firmer gums, and a more sparkling, winning smile every time you massage with Ipana toothpaste. And now, back to A Date with Judy. Well, it looks like Judy has fallen in love with Leon Novogrosky, the 17-year-old star pitcher on the baseball team at her father's factory, and incidentally, the biggest eater in town. As our scene opens, Judy is at the typewriter. Randolph, come here. I want to read you something. Go ahead. I'm all ears. Like that guy from Ashtabula you had a date with last month. This is the letter I'm writing to Bettina Fairfeather. Who is Bettina Fairfeather? Why, the lady who runs the advice to the Lovelorn column in the Daily Chronicle. My goodness, you certainly ought to know that. Why should I? I haven't been particularly lovelorn lately. (laughs) 
Listen. Dear Bettina Fairfeather, I am a young girl of 16. I am charming, attractive, intelligent, and very popular. Who wrote this letter? Hedy Lamar? <laughs> don't be silly. I wrote it. Mm. So far, I don't recognize you from the description. <laughs> Keep quiet and listen, Randolph. My problem is, Miss Fairfeather, that I am ecstatically in love with a young man of 17 who is the star pitcher on a baseball team and who loves another. Another what? <laughs> another girl. My goodness, Randolph, you sound just like mother. Therefore, Miss Fairfeather, I would like to know, what should I do? Well, I'm not any Bettina Fairfeather, but I could tell you. <laughs> Take a nice cold shower. <laughs> Randolph. Uh, how have you signed this literary gem? Blue eyes. Mm, blue eyes, huh? Aren't you afraid the readers of Miss Fairfeather's column might figure out that the author is none other than Judy Foster? After all, you do have blue eyes, you know. You're right. I better sign it brown eyes. Mm. <laughs> That'll throw him off the track. Another thing. Maybe on account of this is such a personal letter, I better ask Miss Fairfeather not to publish it in her column. Just to write to me personally via the U.S. mails. Mm, write you via the U.S. mails. Yes, that'd be nice for a change. <laughs> now, I'll just put this in the envelope and you can mail it, Randolph. Oh, you're so good to me. Here. Well, thank goodness that's off my mind. Yep, you're just practically engaged to be married now. Hi, Randolph. Oh, hi, Curly. What you doing, Randolph? Mailing a letter. I am very unhappy about it, too. My sister Judy is seeking advice for the love loan. If you ask me in this case, I'd rather see her love loan in any other condition. Well, why? Because the guy is Leon Novogrosky, and can he eat? Yeah, Leon Novogrosky, huh? He goes out with my sister Ruth, too. Oh, he does? Funny, you don't look hungry. <laughs> well, I'm not. I can't understand it. I'm starved. Well, Jeepers, you ought to see our icebox these days. Stark naked. Yeah? How's your ice box? Oh, we never have anything left in our ice box anyhow after dinner. We eat everything we got and start all over from scratch the next morning. <laughs> well, and all I can say is Leon Navagrosky is the perfect guy for your sister Ruth. My sister Ruth, I don't care who she goes out with. Well, my sister Judy, I don't care who she goes with as long as it isn't a big eater like Leon Navagrosky. Maybe it's on account of him being on the ball team. He eats so much. Oh, you think so? Yeah, it gives him an appetite. You know, Curly, I got me an idea. A major brainstorm, I might say. You see this letter? Yeah? Well, my sister Judy is writing to Bettina Fairfeather to ask, I'm in love with a gazook. What should I do? <laughs> well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to answer it. Well, you ain't Bettina Fairfeather. No, but I could be. I could write her a personal answer via the U.S. mails. Hey, my cousin Sylvester, he works on the Daily Chronicle... He could snitch some Chronicle stationery for you, and your sister Judy would think the letter came straight from Bettina Fairfeather at the Chronicle. Curly, let's go visit your cousin Sylvester at once. Sure. Uh, what are you going to advise your sister Judy to do? Well, you know where she asks, I'm in love with this gazook, what should I do? Yeah. Well, I'm going to answer straight from her shoulder. Get him to resign from the ball team. You think that'll help your sister Judy's love life? No, but it'll help her brother Randolph's food life. <laughs> Was there any mail for me today? Yes, there was, Judy. Over there on the table. I see. Oh, it's from Bettina Fairfeather. Oh, I can hardly wait till I get it open. What on earth is Bettina Fairfeather writing you for? Come on, I'm trying to read it. She couldn't be asking you for advice. <laughs> Listen to this. She says, Dear Brown Eyes. Brown Eyes? That's I. I wrote to her asking her how to get Leon Navagroski wacky about me, and she says, Dear Brown Eyes. Get him to resign from the baseball team. Sincerely yours, Bettina Fairfeather. Get him to resign from the... What? <laughs> That's some advice. That'll get him wacky about you, all right. Well, I guess she just didn't have time to explain how it'd work. But she certainly ought to know. It's probably very subtle advice. Oh, it's subtle, all right. That's all it takes to be a love loan editor. I think I'll apply for the job myself. Oh, Mother, what do you know about love? More than Bettina Fairfeather, I can tell you that right now. Just because this isn't obvious advice doesn't mean it isn't probably very brainy and cryptic. 
Now, how can I get Leon Navagroski to resign from the baseball team? Uh, why don't you write Bettina Fairfeather and ask her? Now, Leon, it'd be the most sensible thing to do. But gosh, resigning from the team? The best pitcher Foster Canning Company Incorporated ever had? Well, oh, gosh, everybody loves me on account of I'm an athlete. Ruth wouldn't even look at me if I wasn't an athlete anymore. Why, of course she would. As a matter of fact, Ruth told me confidentially she'd like you a whole lot better if you weren't an athlete. She did? Mm-hmm. She said the only thing she had against you was that you were the athletic type. She prefers the... the intellectual type. She does? Absolutely, most girls do. Honest? Gosh, I never knew that. Yes, Leon, I think your only recourse is to resign. Well, maybe you're right. Okay, Judy. Oh, Leon, I think that'd be wonderful. Why, you absolutely seem more intellectual already. Yeah? Why, you seem almost, almost preposterous. Mr. Whiteman. Hello there, Foster. How's Mrs. Foster and Randolph and Judy? Just great. How's Mrs. Whiteman and Curly and Ruth? Just great. Say, I uh, I hear you've got quite a pitcher this year on your factory team. I'll say I have. Greatest in the world. Why, that kid would be on the Giants if he were old enough. Oh, 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 come on, Foster. He can't be that good. No, he's terrific. That kid's so good, we're going to lick every other factory team in the district. Oh, yeah? You want to make any bets? If you're serious, you're darn right I do. Only to be like taking candy away from a baby. Oh, don't worry about me. I'll bet you 25 bucks you don't win the pennant. Listen, you wouldn't have a chance, White. <laughs> I'll take my chances. Want to go in the cigar store and... Have them hold the money for us? All right, Whiteman, this is a break for me, but I certainly feel sorry for you. Ho, ho, ho. Save your sympathy for the big game. I'll save it all right, all right. Plenty of it. <laughs> you don't know Leon Novogrosky. <laughs> Well, Mr. Foster is feeling optimistic enough now. But when he learns how Judy has stacked the cards against him, he'll start feeling as miserable mentally as you feel physically when you wake up on the morning of an important business day feeling dull and logy due to the need of a laxative. And yet, in your case, the cards are stacked against you only so long as you leave them that way. For if you remember this important name, Sal Hepatica, and remember as soon as you get up, to put two teaspoonfuls of sal hepatica in a glass of water and drink it, you won't have to go on feeling miserable all day. For this is true. Then, sparkling sal hepatica brings quick, gentle relief. Usually within an hour. Yes, you can rely on this famous mineral salt laxative to help you feel better faster. And you can rely on it in another way, too. To help sweeten an upset stomach by helping to reduce excess gastric acidity. So, tonight or tomorrow, get a bottle of sal hepatica. Remembering this caution, use only as directed. And any time you need a laxative, morning, noon, or night, see how much faster you feel better when you take gentle, speedy Sal Hepatica. Now, back to A Date with Judy. Well, Father's just made a big bet that his factory baseball team will win the district pennant due to the prowess of Leon Novogroski, the star pitcher. But what Father doesn't know is that Judy has just persuaded Leon to resign from the team. Well, right now, Judy's on the telephone fighting with Ruth Whiteman. Is that so, Ruth Whiteman? Well, suppose I did get him to resign. Just shows he listens to me better than he listens to you. I just adore your telephone conversations, Judy. Keep still, Randolph. Listen, Ruth Whiteman, if you don't like him anymore, get rid of him. Tell him off. Don't see him anymore. And just see if I care. Absolutely fascinating. Listen, Ruth Whiteman, I am not sabotaging your love life. I am not even interested in your love life. Hello. Anybody home? Hello, Father. Hello, Hello. Father. I'm on the telephone. Excuse me. I don't care if you only liked him because he had athletic muscles. He only liked you because you have athletic brains. Gee, some conversation. Yeah, isn't it scintillating? That's all I have to say. Goodbye. 
Hello, Father, dear. Judy, who are you talking to so sweetly? Ruth Whiteman. I can't understand it. I'm such a good friend of Mr. Whiteman's. Your mother is such a good friend of Mrs. Whiteman's. Randolph is such a good friend of Curly Whiteman's. And you're always fighting with Ruth Whiteman. She annoys me, to put it mildly. Mm. I'll get it, I'll get it. Hello? Oh, hello, Whiteman. <laughs> Sorry already you made that bet? What? He resigned? Leon Novogoski? Oh, for the love of heavens. He was it to father. Listen, Whiteman, did you put him up to that? Oh, your daughter told you. Listen, Whiteman, I bet you did it. Of all the low conniving tricks, just because you bet me $25 my team wouldn't win, you didn't need to stoop uh -oh. that. I don't care what you say. Goodbye. Imagine that low-down son of a gun pulling a lousy trick like that. Uh-oh. Father, I... And you, Judy, if I ever hear you say a polite word to that stupid Ruth Whiteman again, I'll be furious. Furiouser than you are now, Father? Don't talk that to me. I'm going out in the kitchen and, and eat a pie of all the things I've ever heard of. Gee, I can't understand it. Father's such a good friend of Mr. Whiteman's, mother's such a good friend of Mrs. Whiteman's, and I'm such a good friend of Curly's, and you're such a good friend. Hey, Curly. Yeah, Randolph? Hey, listen, Curly. I was just thinking. I find it necessary to do another Bettina Fairfeather. You're going to give Judy more love loan advice? Yep. I find it necessary to advise Judy to advise Leon Navagroski to go back on the team. Yeah? Yeah. Therefore, I find it necessary to pay another call on your cousin Sylvester of the Daily Chronicle. Uh-uh. You're not going to use my cousin Sylvester's stationery to lose my father's money. But, Curly! Nothing doing! Oh, gee, I wonder if I could get Judy to go on the goodwill hour. Maybe I could be Mr. Anthony. Mother. Yes, Judy? Mother, it looks like Bettina Fairfeather's advice didn't work out so well. What a surprise. Be quiet, Randall. So, I was just wondering, Mother, would you mind giving me some advice? Me? Isn't that an awful come down from Bettina Fairfeather? Mother, don't be giddy. I'm really in the most desperate predicament. State your problem, Judy. Well, on account of Bettina Fairfeather's advice, Ruth and Leon had a big fight and don't talk to each other anymore. Well, that's fine, isn't it? Well, no. Because when Leon was gaga about Ruth, he used to come over here and tell me about her all the time. And now I hardly ever see him anymore. Well, then it isn't fine, is it? Oh, yes, it is. Because now Leon's in love with me. Oh, well, then that's fine, isn't it? Well, no. Because now that he's in love with me, I only see him about once a week. The rest of the time, he's over at Vivian Appleframe's telling her all about me. <laughs> what I want to know is, doesn't this guy like the girls he's in love with? <laughs> yes, but he's funny. When he's in love, he thinks he has to take out the girl he's in love with. And he can only afford to take a girl out once a week. So that's why he's over at Vivian Appleframe's all the rest of the time, telling her about the girl he's in love with. Poor Vivian Appleframe. I wonder how the food supply is over at her house. <laughs> well, anyhow, this is a big relief to us. But it isn't a big relief to me. It's awful. Hello, everybody. Hello, Father. Why, Melvin, what are you doing home this time of day? Came home to change my clothes, going to the factory ball team practice. Though what I'm going for, I don't know. I could see the same thing at the municipal home for the aged any day in the week. <laughs> but, Father, your team's won all the games this year, hasn't it? Yeah, all but the big game for the pennant. That's going to be some fun without Leon Novogrosky, watching my nine old men bat around with some other factories, nine old men. Well, don't you think you'll win the pennant, dear? Don't ask me such dumb questions like that. It isn't even losing the pennant I mind so much. It's losing 25 smacks to that conniving crook Ned Whiteman. Well, so long, folks. I think I'll be running along. Where are you going? Over to Vivian Apple Frames. To Vivian Apple Frames? But why? Oh, we have a little business about love to discuss. Goodbye. Love. And since when does he run around with girls Judy's age? <laughs> Melvin, the team's coming out on the field. That's not our team. It's the other team. Uh, How do you know, Father? You're not even looking. It's enough for me to come to this game. I don't have to look at it, too. Oh, here comes Foster Canning Company, Incorporated. Are they walking or riding in wheelchairs? 
Why, Melvin, I don't think they look bad at all. Why, they don't look a day over 50, any of them. That's great. We just gave the monkey gland injections in the locker room. Look! There's Leon! Leon Novogrosky? Leon, where? Down there. Well, imagine that. He's, he's, he's going to play. He's in uniform. I wonder how that happened. I don't know now, but it's, it's the greatest thing that's ever happened. They're starting. Leon's going to pitch. Oh, boy, this is going to be some game. Oh, oh what a laugh I'm going to have on Ned White. But... Is that so? <laughs> oh, oh, hello there, White. Man. What kind of low-down chiseling do you call this, Foster? What do you mean calling me a chiseler? You deliberately let me think Novogrosky wasn't going to play. And now you produce him at the last minute. I did not. You told me yourself he resigned from the team. Yes, and you certainly played innocent. As if you didn't know. Well, I didn't know. The devil you didn't. Don't you talk to me like that, white man. Why, you... Now, boy. Oh, you want to get tough, do you? You're darn right I do. Put up your dukes. You're darn right I will. Hold my coat, Dora. I'll show this guy a thing or two. I dare you. All right, I'll take your dare. Now, boy, boy, don't fight. Just you touch me, Foster, and you'll get an uppercut straight to the jaw. All right. I touched you. You... mm, Well, now, 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 you just get closer to me. Get closer to me and I'll beat the living daylights out of you. All right. I'm closer to you. Now, uh, boys. Why, well, if you were half a man, I'd let you have it. All right. I'm half a man. Yeah, you aren't even a quarter of a man. I have a good notion to ignore you. Oh, uh, boys, please. Don't worry, Mother. They're not going to kill each other. They're just going to scare each other to death. <laughs> That was some game. Wasn't Leon wonderful? Well, fair. Anyhow, Father won the bet with Mr. Whiteman. I wonder how Leon happened to show up at the game at the last minute. Well, if you really want to know, I had a little talk the other day with Vivian Appleframe. Vivian Appleframe? What did she have to do with it? Well, Vivian was in a desperate predicament. It seems she was in love with Leon and he was in love with you. So I advised her to write to Dorothy Dalwicks. Who's Dorothy Dalwicks? Well, you ought to know that, Judy. She writes the Love Lauren column on the Daily Bugle. But how did that... Well, it seems a guy I know has an uncle who works on the Daily Bugle. So I used the Daily Bugle stationery and answered Vivian's letter to Dorothy Dalwood. Yes, but... And advised her to get Leon to return to the team. Well, for goodness sakes. Randolph, you're a genius. Yeah, I and Orson Welles. <laughs> Dad won his $25, and now that Leon's back in the ball team, Ruth Whiteman will like him again... And on account of that, I'll see more of him. And that's what I'm afraid of. Six nights a week. Say, Judy, you know that tricky padlock you use on your bicycle? Yes. Does Leon know the combination to it? Why, certainly not. Well, keep it a military secret, will you? We can use that lock on the icebox. A Date with Judy is written by Aline Leslie and stars Louise Erickson as Judy and Dix Davis as Randolph. Original music was composed and conducted by Felix Mills. We invite you to be with us again next week at the same time to keep your date with Judy, chaperoned by Bristol Myers, makers of Ipana for the smile of beauty and Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Ipana, Sal Hepatica. No Webster says beforehand means in advance. Before the time. Bristol Myers says, Touche is the beforehand lotion. You smooth Touche on your hands before your daily soap and water tasks to guard your hands against the hot, drying effects of hot, soapy water. Women say Touche is a brand new idea in hand beauty and an important one. And during the warm weather, when we have our hands in and out of water more than ever, Touche is more important than ever. So begin today to use Touche. T-O-U-S-H-A-Y. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. K-F-I, Los Angeles, by transcription. I, Los Angeles, by transcription. I, Los Angeles, by transcription. I, Los Angeles, by transcription. Famous quick relief from acid indigestion presents A Date with Judy. Judy, could I have a date for Saturday night? Well, you certainly could. Well, I'm a little short on gas, so I wonder if you'd mind meeting me at Peterson's Drugstore. We'll have a soda, and then we can 
go someplace. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. I'll meet you in front of the drugstore at about 7.30. Uh, don't be late. Goodbye. Goodbye. Who is that, Judy? Jeepers, I forgot to ask. <laughs> Well, that's Judy, folks. Judy Foster, the cutest date in town. And your date with her each Tuesday at the same time is arranged by the makers of Tums, famous quick relief for acid indigestion. Well, now we pick up Judy and her 12-year-old brother, Randolph, in a department store where they're trying to find a present for their parents' anniversary. Randolph, how do you think Mother and Father would like a ping-pong table? I don't know how they'd like it, but I'd like it. <laughs> this isn't your anniversary, Randolph. Um, how do you think they'd like a set of books? They have a set of books. Oh, Randolph, I know just the thing. Oh, Randolph, this will simply be terrific. We'll buy Mother and Father some Frank Sinatra records. Oh, that'll be just dandy. <laughs> then for your birthday, Father can give you a box of cigars and a nice smoking jacket. <laughs> I think it was terribly mean of you not to let me buy Father and Mother the Sinatra records. Yeah, and after us spending a whole hour listening to them, too. It was a lovely morning, wasn't it, Randall? Yeah, but we still haven't got an anniversary present. Well, maybe this next door will have something we... Hey, look, Randall. What? Look what's playing at the Bijou this week. Two big feature attractions, one newsreel, one short, one Mickey Mouse, one serial, and a stage show. Well, that's a nice way to spend a week. Randall, I finally figured out a solution to all our problems. Instead of buying father and mother a present, let's take them to the show. You know, have a theater party. Okay, we'll invite all our friends and Randall, we... remember, we have only $3 to spend on their anniversary. How much are the tickets? 55 cents, as usual. Well, then we could buy... Let me see now, 55 and the $3 goes... Oh, we could buy five tickets and we still have 25 cents left over. Enough for five people and a midget. Oh, Randolph, look what the features are. Hepcat Katie and Jumping Jive. You know, Randolph, I know who'd really enjoy this bill the most. Judy, we are not going to invite any of your friends. This party is for mother and father. Well, you can't deny it. Oogie Pringle and his hot licks would love this bill. Oh, I don't know. Look at that cereal. The Mystery Cowboy Rides Again. Some of my gang would be crazy about it. You can get them in at 15 cents a throw. So much the worse. Randolph, in this occasion, I think it's up to both of us to act purely unselfishly. And only think of mother and father. She spends the whole morning quivering over Frank Sinatra, and suddenly she gets unselfish. Come on, Randolph. Let's go home and tell mother. Boy, wait till she sit through Hepcat Kitty and Jumping Jive tonight. She'll be sorry she ever got married. Melvin. Why, Dora, what are you doing downtown at this time of the day? Well, I was on my way to the Red Cross, and I thought I'd drop by the office for a moment. Well, good. Uh, sit down, dear. Thanks. Uh, Melvin, I just wanted to tell you that I think we have the sweetest children in the whole world. Huh? Guess what they've done. I can't possibly. <laughs> they've arranged a theater party in our honor. They have? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, what's the occasion, dear? Oh, Melvin... What's the date today? Uh, February 22nd. Well, doesn't that mean anything to you? I see. Oh, of course. <laughs> oh, then you did remember. It's Washington's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> why, Melvin Foster, I don't know why I ever married you. Well, uh, oh, 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 it's our anniversary. Yeah. Oh, I'll bet you actually thought I'd forgotten it. Uh, <laughs> Now, Melvin, don't try and pretend. Well, I did not forget it, Dora. You'll see when I get home. Mm. Oh, Dora, I just remembered I can't go to the theater tonight. Well, why not, dear? I'm expecting Mr. Gibbons here any minute. I've simply got to get that tomato canning contract from him, and I'm going to have to do some fast talking. He's on the verge of signing with the deluxe people. Oh, Melvin. Well, the children will be brokenhearted. They picked a show they think we especially want to see. Well, it is sweet of them, but... I don't know what I can do. It's such an important contract, I'd hate to lose it. Say, hey, Melvin, I have an idea. How would it be if we asked Mr. Gibbons to go along with us? Well, I don't know, Dora. After Mr. Gibbons spends an evening with your delightful family, I'll bet you'll get your contract. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I'll ask him when he comes in. I'd hate to let the kids down. No, I know you would, dear. And Melvin. Yes, Dora? I think I have the sweetest husband in the world, too. Oh. Oh, you do, do you? <laughs> yes, I do. Well, goodbye, dear. I'll see you this evening. Goodbye, Dora. Yes, Mr. Foster? Uh, Miss Watson, get the royal florist shop on the phone and have them fix up an extra special bunch of flowers for me. I'll pick them up on my way home. It's our anniversary. And you know I never forget anniversaries. Oh, Father. Oh, Judy. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you had someone in your office. Oh, that's all right. Come right in, kids. Uh, Mr. Gibbons, this is my daughter, Judy, and my son, Randall. Well, how do you do? Hello, Mr. Gibbons. I've met your daughter before, Foster. I think she's a friend of my son, Willie. Oh, yes, of course. Willie and I are very good friends. In fact, she was that way about him from September 1st to September 3rd of last year. That way? You know, she was making him her hobby. Oh. Uh, 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 children, uh, I think you'd better be running along now. Uh, Mr. Gibbons and I have some business to discuss. But, Father, we haven't told you what we came for yet. On account of this being your anniversary. And Mother's, too, naturally. <laughs> yes, your Mother's told me all about it. And I think it's very thoughtful of you kids to give a theater party in our honor. And you know what? I've asked Mr. Gibbons here to join us. Uh, Foster, I told you I don't think I can make it. You see, I want to make up my mind about that contract tonight. Oh, Mr. Gibbons, you've got to come. If you don't, Father won't. And if he doesn't come, it'll spoil Mother's evening. Of course, we could fix Mother up with Oogie Pringle. No. No, I don't think it's fair that Mother has to have a blind date in her anniversary. She really ought to be with Father. <laughs> Are they serious? Would they really fix your wife up with a, uh, a blind date for Oh, no, no, they're just kidding, just <laughs> kidding. <laughs> hey, you know children. Mr. Gibbons, you simply can't let Mother down like this. Well, I'm sorry, but I don't think I ought to oh, take Oh, the... come on, Gibbons. A little relaxation be good for you. Well... Please, Mr. Gibbons. We can afford you, you know. It isn't as though you'd have to buy your own ticket. Uh, well, all right. Sir. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, well, it's all settled then. Fine. And uh, now, now, run along, kids. Uh, goodbye. Goodbye, Father. Goodbye, Mr. Gibbons. Bye, Father. Goodbye. <sighs> this younger generation. Oh, I don't know. I think they're all pretty swell kids. Well, I wish I thought so. This jazz craze of theirs. I believe it's called Jeeve. Hmm? No, no, Jive. Jive. Oh. Jive. Now, whatever it's called, I hate it. In my day, music was music. Now, take Victor Herbert. There was a man who knew how to write music, had a melody. But this modern stuff... Uh, now, about this little deal about... Bobby uh, socks uh, and sloppy Joe sweaters. I don't know how the boys of this generation stand the girls of this generation, Foster. Well, now, Judy's a sweet... Every girl. time my son Willie brings one of them home, I just gape in wonder. Uh, <clears throat> uh, well, no matter what the deluxe people claim, I still know I can give you an all-around... And deal that Frank Sinatra. Uh, can you understand anything like that, Foster? Well, I don't know now. Judy's crazy about him. All the kids are. Now, believe me, my Willie isn't interested in this mooner cooner stuff. Tomatoes, that's a thing. He's going to follow right in my footsteps. In tomatoes? In tomatoes. Well, before we hear more about the surprise the kids have planned, uh, I want to give you a word of advice. Now, you may suffer a sudden spell of acid indigestion at any time. And when this happens to you, be wise. Take Tums right away. For Tums are compounded to deal promptly with indigestion due to excess gastric acidity. Almost before you know it, Tums relieve the acid pain, the heartburn, and that miserable fool feeling. And Tums are ready to take the very instant you need them. There's nothing to mix or stir, no fuss or bother at all. You don't even need water. Just slip one or two Tums in your mouth as you would candy mints. And know what it is to get quick relief from that upset acid stomach. Ask your druggist right away for Tums for the tummy. Only ten cents a roll. And now, back to A Date with Judy. Well, Judy and Randolph are having a theater party in honor of their parents' anniversary. Father's very anxious to get an important canning contract from a certain Mr. Gibbons, and he's invited him to the theater party, too. Now we pick up Judy and Randolph on the way home from town. Randolph, look who's coming down the street. Well, bless my soul, if it isn't your bosom friend and arch enemy, Mitzi. She's neither. I'm completely indifferent to her. You two used to be what we of the upper classes call inseparable. 
We used to. But she certainly turned out to be an awful mothball. Oh, is that so? I can't stand her anymore. She's a pot. Well, hello, Judy. Well, hello, Mitzi, darling. It's simply marvelous bumping into you. I haven't seen you for utterly ages. Well, I saw you the other night at Barney's Beanery. You did? I must have been with Spencer Havenhurst. No, you were with Oogie Pringle. I was. I always forget who I'm with. She just has so many dates, she gets them all mixed up. I was with Willie Gibbons. You were? I didn't notice. How is Willie these days? Oh, he's just adorable. Have you heard his voice lately? Just when he calls me up and asks me for dates. Of course, it happens. I'm generally busy. As a matter of fact, I haven't been able to give Willie a date in utterly months. Judy, it might interest you to know that Willie has been going steady with Mitzi for utterly months. <laughs> oh, really? Well, for gonna... <laughs> well, that's funny. I thought it was Willie calling me for dates. I guess I must have got him mixed up with somebody else. So many people ask her for dates, Mitzi. Well, anyhow, I wasn't talking about his speaking voice. I was talking about his crooning voice. Oh, does he croon, too? So many people do. <laughs> oh, but he swooner croons. He does? Oh, yes. He and Frank Sinatra have got the whole swooner crooner field tied up between them. Oh, he's utterly terrific. He's developed a vibration. A vibration? Has he really, it? Oh, yes. Believe me, Judy, if he had Frank Sinatra's publicity agent, well, he'd be a... Well, a... A Frank Sinatra? Yes, absolutely. Well, why don't we all get behind him and see that he gets the right kind of publicity? Gee, I wish somebody'd do something for him. Especially now that he's getting his big opportunity. His big opportunity? Oh, haven't you heard? No. Why, he's going to sing at the Bijou tonight. He is? Tonight? Why, what a coincidence. Yes, tonight's amateur night. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. He passed the audition with flying colors. Now, if only somebody in the audience would swoon tonight, his career would be in the bag. You know, Mitzi, that is a terrific idea. What is? Somebody in the audience swooning tonight. Judy, that's utterly terrific. Mitzi, I'll be glad to do it for you. You will? Oh, Judy, how darling of you. Oh, think nothing of it. She swoons at the drop of a hat. (laughs) I'll definitely be glad to do it for you, Mitzi. I'll never forget what bosom friends we used to be. Why, the least I could do is swoon for an old bosom friend like you. Well, it's really very sweet of you, Judy, but I was just wondering. As Willie's steady girlfriend, don't you think I'm the one who ought to swoon? I mean, it would seem kind of disloyal to let somebody else do it. Why don't you both swoon? Two swoons are better than one, I always say. Well, that's right. Why don't we, Mitzi? In fact, you could call up a whole bunch of people and everybody could swoon. Yes, we could. Oh, that'd get him all kinds of publicity, wouldn't it? It certainly would. I can just see the papers. Last night when the show at the Bijou was over, 40 bodies were lying on the floor. (laughs) I'll call up all my friends. And I'll call up all mine. So many bodies cluttered up the floor that they had to be swept out with a fire hose. (laughs) Oh, Judy, I think you're the most marvelous friend I ever had. I've always been terribly fond of you, too, Mitzi. Willie, we came over to tell you that we're going to give you the complete Frank Sinatra build-up. Your career as a swooner crooner will be in the bag. Oh, that'll sure be a relief. And I won't have to can tomatoes with my father when I get through college. Are you in any immediate danger? You haven't even entered college yet. Well, maybe father will stop training me for business. All he does is just drag me around to board of directors' meetings and make me keep his books. Which an accountant has to do all over again. <laughs> Wait until my father sees how much money I can make as a swooner crooner. You can let your father keep your books. Well, Judy and I better get busy and, and tell everybody to go to the Bijou tonight and swoon. Will you sure will go over like a house of fire tonight. They'll have to cut off the engines. Oh, yes, we're going to need all the fire hose we can get. <laughs> Say, do you suppose I can get Mother to swoon for us? Oh, I bet she'll be glad to. Well, I'll ask her. Well, we seem to have everything under control. You know, there's only one little item we haven't taken care of. What's that, Randolph? We haven't got anybody to squeal tonight. Squeal? Why, sure. What happens when Frank Sinatra vibrates? He's right. The girls all squeal. We need squealers just as much as we need swooners. Well, I'll tell you what we could do. We could ask everybody to squeal first, before they swoon. Yes, we'll tell them not to swoon till the end of the song. I can just hear it now. Squeal, 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 and then suddenly a general kerplunk. Girls, please, please be quiet Quiet Now, girls, this is Willie's big chance We've all gathered here at my house to do one thing Practice squealing Now, 
All together. One, two, three, squeal. Yipes, that's awful. Girls, if you want Willie to give Sinatra any competition, you'll have to do better than that. Judy, maybe we ought to let Willie sing a few bars so the girls can get in the mood. Oh, that's right, Mitzi. What are you going to sing, Willie? I'm going to sing Paper Doll. Do you want an accompaniment? Well, naturally, of course. I'll accompany Willie. <laughs> oh, what key do you want? <laughs> the key of C. Oh, that's lucky. That's the only one I know. Girls, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Willie. All right. I'm gonna buy a paper doll that I can call my own. A doll that other fellows cannot steal. Wait a minute, Willie. Uh, huh? Girls, put more oomph into it. Hey, would it help if I played a Sinatra record? Now, don't be silly, Randolph. Willie is just as good as Frankie. Nearly. Try it again, Willie. Sinatra's got a mic. Gee, I, I haven't got anything to hover over. Here, Willie, drape yourself around this lamp. Okay. I'm gonna buy a paper doll that I can call my own. Oh, see, that's much better. I hadn't noticed. <laughs> Be quiet, Randolph. Go ahead, Willie. A doll that other fellows cannot steal. And then those flirty. flirty Sinatra guys gets much louder squeals than that. Again. Eyes. Again. I'm sorry, Judy. They're just not giving me anything. Girls, he's absolutely right. You aren't giving it all you got. Judy, how about me getting out my white mice? I think that that would do the trick. Don't you? <laughs> Come on, Willie. Try it again. Well, all right. I'm gonna buy a paper doll. That I can well, that's buy better. Again. <laughs> We'll rejoin the Fosters and Mr. Gibbons at the theater in just a moment. Uh, but first, ladies and gentlemen, when you want relief from acid indigestion, you want it fast. So here's what to do. Slip one or two Tums in your mouth immediately. Now, Tums don't fool around. Tums promptly relieve indigestion due to excess gastric acidity. Yes, they really help a sour, jittery stomach feel sweet and comfortable again in a jiffy. They ease the acid pain. They soothe the heartburn. They put down that uncomfortable, full feeling, all in record time. And yet Tums contain no baking soda, no bicarbonate of soda. They relieve acid indigestion in a different way entirely, an up-to-date, scientific way that doesn't upset the system or leave distressing after-effects. And you'll find Tums so easy and pleasant to take, just slip them in your mouth as you would candy mints. Nothing to mix, nothing to stir, you don't even need water. So don't ever let an upset acid stomach cause you unnecessary distress when you can get such quick relief with Tums. Ask your druggist tonight or first thing tomorrow morning for Tums for the Tummy, only ten cents a roll. And now back to A Date with Judy. Well, Judy's crowd's going to give Willie Gibbons the Frank Sinatra build-up tonight at the Bijou, where he's going to appear in the stage show as an amateur. Now, Willie's father, of course, has no idea what the kids are up to. He's a member of the theater party Judy is giving for her parents' anniversary, and he's in for a surprise. We find Mr. Foster talking to his wife on the telephone. Oh, say, Dora, I'm terribly sorry, but Gibbons wants me to have dinner with him. So we'll have to meet you at the Bijou later, huh? I understand, dear. Now, don't keep us waiting. Oh, no, no, we'll be on time, all right. And, uh, Dora, uh, mm -hmm. be sure to ask the children to be particularly nice to Mr. Gibbons. I will, dear. But don't worry about them, Melvin. They've really planned a grand evening for us. And, and, and please tell Judy not to wear bobby socks. Mr. Gibbons can't stand them. Will you stop worrying? I'll see to it that Judy looks her best. Uh -huh. oh, oh, and Melvin, I forgot to tell you. Uh -huh. The children said they have a lovely surprise for Mr. Gibbons tonight. <laughs> Mr. Gibbons sees what a big hit Willie's going to be tonight. He'll be in a marvelous mood. Who, Willie? No, his father, naturally. Well, how many girls you got now who promised to swoon? Twenty-six. That's a goodly amount. I'm simply furious at Tootsie Whiteman. Oh, what's the matter with Tootsie? She refuses to cooperate. She simply won't swoon for Willie. She says she's faithful to Frank Sinatra, and she won't swoon for anybody else. The dirty dog. <laughs> Randolph, I was just thinking... 
Do you think I ought to call up the newspaper and tell him to be sure and have a reporter there tonight? Nah, that might be a safe procedure. I hate to see 26 girls swooning for nothing. <laughs> Well, here we are, everyone. Good. What's the picture we're going to see? Oh, there are two of them, Mr. Gibbons. Hep Cat, Katie, and Jumping Jive. Oh, huh? no. Judy, I wish you'd told me before we invited Mr. Gibbons. Oh, now, Melvin, don't spoil their party. Their party? Is it their anniversary? Eh, Foster, I don't want to be a poor sport. I'll go, but couldn't we leave after the first picture? Oh, no, Mr. Gibbons. That'd spoil the whole thing. Uh, look, I I'll tell you what, Gibbons. Uh, let's miss both pictures. You and I can sit out here in the lobby and have a cigar until the stage show starts. Hey, that's all right. That's a good idea. Hey, I'll send Randolph out to get you. Randolph? What on earth have you got in that package? Oh, nothing, Mother. Just some stuff. Well, I wish you wouldn't bring stuff with you to a theater. Well, come on, everyone. We're going to be late. <laughs> oh, this is the darndest, most uncomfortable chair I ever sat in. You'd certainly think a picture house could put better chairs in their lobbies. And speaking of quality, Gibbons, those deluxe people haven't anything that compares oh, with the quality here, of the... here's Randolph. Yeah. I guess the pictures must be over. Oh, Father, you got back just in time. I was so afraid you and Mr. Gibbons would miss the stage show. Oh, I wouldn't miss it for anything. Uh, uh, Judy, are you sure that your surprise for Mr. Gibbons is a pleasant one? Oh, my. Yes. Well, hello, soaps. I mean, folks. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Now for our big amateur show. That's all I need, amateur show. Ladies and gentlemen, I call you gentlemen, though I don't know you. <laughs> we have collected some excellent talent right here in our own little big city. Yes, sir. To open our contest tonight, we present a talented young man from the west side, Mr. Doodles Finberg. Mr. Finberg does bird calls, whistles, and imitations. Oh, no. <laughs> His first imitation will be that of a mockingbird. Do, Foster, get me out of here. Well, you can't leave now. Well, how do you like that, folks, huh? And now... Now we have a young man who's going to sing for us. Yes, sir, he's going to sing. I want you to meet little Willie Gibbon. Huh? Come on right out here, Willie boy. It's, it's my Willie. And what are you going to sing, Willie boy? I'm going to sing... The music... The music stops. Good Lord, Foster. The music stops. Yes, sir, the music stops. All right, boys, let's start it. Take it away. Isn't it wonderful, Father? Isn't it marvelous, Mr. Gibbons? Oh, marvelous. That's the surprise we have for you. I'll murder him. You ready, Mitzi? Yes, are you, you ready, Judy? Okay. Stop. Mother, I've got a nice, clean place on the floor oh, all ready for you. Whatever for? In case you feel like swooning. Oh, Randolph. Oh, for Pete's sakes. Oh, now, Mr. Gibbons, I think Willie sings very well. Yeah, he isn't so awful. I've heard worse right over the radio. Oh, he's wonderful. <laughs> for Pete's sake, what was that? Well, they're giving him the squeal, Father. Huh? Yes, and it's not anywhere near loud enough. What did you say they were giving him? The squeal. Proves he's a sooner crooner. Oh, I'm dying. Oh, aren't you sweet? So am I. It's not nearly loud enough. He's going to be a flop unless we can build it up. Well, Gibbons, you must admit that the boy does interest the audience. Yeah, so do monkeys. Huh? Oh, Randolph, I'm so discouraged. It isn't nearly loud enough. It doesn't sound like Sinatra fans at all. Well, you must remember that Willie's not Frankie. Oh, Randolph, can't you think of some way of building up these squeals? Well, I brought my emergency kit with me. Your what? Just you wait till I get that set of mine home. Mitzi, try the flops. The squeals are a failure. Okay, Judy, as Willie's best girl, I'll do the first flop. That'll be the signal to the others. Okay, go ahead. There. If that doesn't build up your squeals, nothing will. Randolph, what'd you do? You'll find out in just a second. But Randolph, I don't understand. Randolph! Melvin, what happened? My gosh, Gibbons has fainted. Jeepers, he didn't faint, Father. He swooned. Well, gee, how was I to know that such a big guy would be afraid of mice? Well, for 
Foster's will be back in just a moment. In the meantime, friends, let me ask you, um, if you have the old-fashioned habit of reaching for the baking soda or some other so-called home preparation when acid indigestion strikes, or have you been wise and discovered along with millions of others that the quick, modern, and pleasant way to relieve acid indigestion is with Tums. Almost as soon as taken, Tums bring relief from acid indigestion, from heartburn, from the acid pain, and the miserable stuffed-up full feeling. And yet please note that we don't suggest Tums to you as a cure-all, good for a half a dozen different complaints. We say, frankly, that Tums are scientific medication compounded for one thing, one thing only, the quick relief of acid indigestion. Tums are ready to give you relief the very moment you need them. There's no fuss or bother, nothing to mix or stir. You don't even need water. Just slip one or two Tums in your mouth as you would candy mints and relieve that upset acid stomach in a jiffy. Ask your druggist tonight or first thing tomorrow morning for Tums. Only ten cents a roll or the three roll package for a quarter. But insist upon Tums for the tummy, T-U-M-S. There are many imitations of Tums, but no substitute for them. And now, uh, let's get back to Judy. The Fosters and Mr. Gibbons have returned to the Foster's house. Randolph, where's Mother? She's upstairs putting cold packs on Mr. Gibbons. Where's Father? About halfway to the Canadian border. (laughs) Oh, Randolph, wasn't Willie sensational? Not as sensational as my little white mice. (laughs) Randolph, the mice were absolutely unnecessary. People would have swooned anyway. Mother said there were 28 swooners, 23 for the mice and 5 for Willie. (laughs) Judy! Judy! Where are you? In the living room, Father. Father sounds slightly upset. Judy, do you realize what you've done? Not only will I lose Gibbons' honor, but the Bijou Theater will probably sue me. But Willie's a great success, Father. We mustn't forget that. Squealers, squooners, white mice. I don't know what Gibbons will say when he's able to say something. Oh, there you are, Foster. Oh, Gibbons. Gibbons, yes. Ah, ah, ah. How, how are you feeling? Oh, fine, fine. Just huh? fine. Foster, you know, I've decided you're the man to can my tomatoes. Am I? I mean, I am. Yes, sir, you are. You know, I owe you a great debt. Uh, I uh, just talked to my son, Willie, on the phone, and uh, he's decided to come into my business with me. Oh, Oh, well, that, that's fine. Yeah. You mean he's going to forget all about this uh, swooner crooner business? Forget about it? Well, I should say not. He's going to be in charge of my advertising. And I've already worked out a novel idea for a radio program. You have? Oh, that's uh, great. Yes, I can see it now. The housewives all over the country will swoon all over the kitchens. And when they come to, they'll rush right out and buy Gibbons tasty, tempting, tantalizing tomatoes. Why, Mr. Gibbons, that's a wonderful idea. You mean Willie's going to sing on your radio program? Yes, every hour on the hour. Oh, really? Well, uh, wh- wh- what's he going to sing? He's going to sing, Gibbons' tomatoes are oh so red, and in the morning they're good for the head. Huh? When buying our products, you'll laugh and have fun. Just walk to your groceries and ask for Gibbons. Oh, no. Jeepers, Randolph. Now Father swooned. A Date with Judy is written by Arlene Leslie and stars Louise Erickson and Dix Davis. The original music is composed and conducted by Tommy Peluso. This is Art Baker inviting you to be with us again next Tuesday at the same time to keep your date with Judy, chaperoned by Tums, quick relief from acid indigestion. Get a roll tonight, ten cents at all drugstores. And be sure to listen to Tums' hilarious quiz program, Correction, Please, starring that quip quiz master, J.C. Flippin. It's heard every Saturday night over another network. This is the National Broadcasting Company. K.F. KF 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 Tom's famous quick relief for acid indigestion presents a date with Judy. <laughs> Hello, Judy. Are you doing anything today? No, I'm not. Not a thing. I just adore seeing you. Uh, That's good. Can you knit? What? Knit. You know, with needles. Why, yes, I can. Well, swell. Then I'll drop my sweater around at your house at eight. Drop your sweater? Uh Uh-huh. Tootsie made it for me. And Barbara burned a hole in it. I've got a date with Gloria tomorrow night, so I'd like you to knit it together again.
That is Judy, folks. Judy Foster, the cutest date in town. Your date with her each Tuesday at the same time is arranged by the makers of Tums. Quick relief from acid indigestion. Well, now let's see what's doing at Judy's house. She and her 12-year-old brother, Randolph, are getting ready to go downtown. Mother's talking to them. Oh, Judy, I hate letting you use the car. I wish you'd use the bus to go downtown. But, Mother, I absolutely haven't got time. My appointment at the dentist is 10 o'clock, and it's five minutes of now. You could have been ready an hour ago. Oh, Mother, how could she? She's been busy all morning thinking up an excuse to get out of going to the dentist. Be quiet, Randolph. Mother, please give me the keys to the car. I simply must dash. All right, dear. But you've got to have that car home again by 11. I just had a call from the transportation committee of my club. I'm picking up some soldiers and driving them out to the camp, and I can't keep them waiting. So, mind you, you dash that car back on time. Maybe I oughtn't to go to the dentist at all today. Mm, you certainly are going. Here are the car keys. And don't use up a lot of gas looking for a parking place. Just put the car in the first parking lot you see. All right, Mother. I just barely have enough gas to get the soldiers out to the camp and back as it is. Bye, Mother. Come on, Reno. Well, what's he going along for? I gotta go downtown and price a baseball glove. Price a baseball glove? Yeah. I'm on the estimating committee of the Poplar Street baseball team. And I gotta give the team an estimate on a glove. <laughs> Well, that team certainly doesn't ever rush into anything, does it? With only 43 cents in the treasury, you've got to use caution. Oh, come on, Randolph. The first thing you know, the dentist will think I'm not coming and give my appointment to somebody else. You hope. Now, remember, be back here at 11 with a car. Oh, and Judy. Yes, Mother? Please stop at the butcher's on the way back and get some lamb chops. All right. Here are the racing books. And be mighty careful of them. Yes, Mother. No, don't put them in your purse, dear. Now you lose things out of your purse. Well, where will I put them? Well, leave them in the car. And don't forget to lock the car when you get out of it. Well, here we are, Randolph. Gee, we were lucky to find a parking place, weren't we? Uh, would you mind donating to the Poplar Street baseball team the two bits you save by not having to go in a parking lot? I certainly would mind. Come on, Reno. Get out of the car. Okay. There. Well, shut the door. I can't understand why Mother always worries about me forgetting things. There. Lock the door. You did? Mm-hmm. I think these automatic locks are wonderful. You don't need to bother with keys. Come on, Randolph. Let's go. Wait a minute. I think you made a grave mistake locking that door. What the silly? Mother told me to lock it. Yeah, but she didn't tell you to lock it with the motor running. Jeepers. Did I leave the motor running? That isn't the train to Cleveland you're hearing. <laughs> oh, well, it's perfectly simple. I'll just take the keys and unlock the door. Perfectly simple. What's perfectly simple about unlocking the door with keys that are inside the car? Oh, gee. Did I leave the keys inside the car? Those are Mother's earrings you see dangling there in the dashboard. <laughs> Oh, caterpillars. And the ration books are locked inside. Tonight's dinner should be very interesting. What'll I do? Well, we could break a window. Don't be silly. Father'd be absolutely furious if we broke a window. And Mother'll be absolutely furious if we don't. Oh, there must be some way to get the inside of the car. Well, we could cut a hole in the roof. Oh. Or we could take out the machinery and worm our way up through the bottom. Randolph, please be practical. This is terrible. The dentist is waiting for me, and we're using up an awful lot of gas leaving the car running. Uh, I don't suppose there'd be any spare keys to the car, would they? Of course there are. Oh, Randolph, that's an utterly terrific idea. Father always carries the spare keys in his pocket. Now all we have to do is find Father. There must be some way to get the keys from Father without him knowing what we want them for. Sure. We could hire somebody to pick his pockets. Oh, Randolph, be sensible. This is a crisis. Mm -hmm. Oh, look, Randolph, there's Oogie Pringle. And his deluxe model 1912 rattletrap. <laughs> Randolph, might be aching at him to help us. Oh, Oogie, stop, stop your car. Hi, Judy. Oh, Oogie, I'm so glad to see you. Well, Judy, I didn't know you felt that way about me. What? Oh, Oh, I do. I've been utterly gaga about you for utterly ages. Oh, gee, I think it's just wonderful of you, Judy. Coming right out with it right in the middle of State Street like this. Yeah, double parking and everything. I just couldn't keep it from you any longer, Ruby. 
I just had to say it this very minute. Even if it is blocking traffic. Oogie, would you mind doing me a slight favor? Of course not, Judy. I'd be glad to. Well, that's fine. Because I'm in the most terrible predicament. I've locked my car with a motor running. Oh, gee. Yeah. But it's nothing serious, because there's a simple way out. There is? Mm Mm-hmm. Now, all we have to do, Oogie, is take your car and drive out to Father's factory so we can get the spare keys to open our car. Hello, Miss Watson. Oh, well, look who's here, Judy and Randolph. Hiya. And this is Mr. Oogie Pringle. Uh, Hello. Hello there. Miss Watson, I'd like to speak to my father. Oh, I'm sorry, Judy. He just went out. Went out? Where'd he go? Well, he went to look at a factory site about 50 miles from here. Oh, caterpillars, that's awful. When will he be back? Well, not until about 6 o'clock this evening, I'm afraid. 6 o'clock? Miss Watson, would you happen to know if he had his keys with him? Keys? You know, the usual collection. Well, when he left, he was jingling as much as ever, if that's what you mean. Oh, Jesus. By 6 o'clock tonight, our car is going to have used up an awful lot of fuel. By 6 o'clock tonight, our car will use up all the fuel in its system. Oh, gee. Do you think Mother will be mad at us? Why, no, Judy. By 6 o'clock tonight, she will have used up all the fuel in her system, too. Well, the kids seem to be in quite a predicament, even for them. But uh, before things get any worse, I have a message for you. When you suffer a spell of acid indigestion, it's just common sense to go after relief right away to avoid any unnecessary suffering. So be wise. Take Tums and know what it is to get almost instant relief from heartburn and indigestion due to excess gastric acidity. You'll find that Tums help that sour, fussy stomach feel peaceful and comfortable again in just a jiffy. And Tums are so pleasant and easy to take, there's nothing to mix. You don't even need water. Just slip one or two Tums in your mouth as you would candy mints and get relief from the acid indigestion quickly. Ask at any drugstore now for Tums for the Tummy, only ten cents a roll. And now, back to A Date with Judy. Well, Judy has locked the family car, leaving the keys inside and with a motor still running. Father, who carried the spare keys, has gone out of town. He won't be back till evening. Meanwhile, Mother, in blissful ignorance, is waiting for Judy to bring the car back to the house. We pick up Judy and Randolph in Oogie Pringle's jalopy after a futile visit to Father's factory. Dennis is still waiting for me. I wonder if the motor's still running. There's our car, still in the same place. Now, that doesn't strike me, John. Pull up the side of it. Okay. Do you think it'll matter if I double park like this? Of course not, Ubi. Who cares? I guess nobody. Well, come on. Yep. Motor's still running. Ubi, you simply got to think of something brainy to do about this. Well, we could break a window. Or cut a hole in the top. No, we've gone through all that, Ubi. You've got to think of something else, Brainy. Hey, I've got it. You have? Yes. All we've got to do is simply raise the hood and shut off the motor from the inside. That sounds charming. Except that the hood locks automatically. When the door's locked, so's the hood. Yeah? Jeepers. What time is it, Randolph? Uh, quarter past eleven. Oh, gee. Then I guess I won't get the car back to Mother by eleven. No, you won't. Uh, say, uh, you... Uh, were you addressing us, sir? Yep. This car belongs to you kids? Well, it sort of does. That is, it belongs to our parents. Hmm. Well, I've been standing here in front of the drugstore, and the cop came along. Said he was going to give you a ticket. He did? Yep. Thought you'd like to know. Oh, we just love to know. <laughs> Mother won't like this. Or father. Cop was mighty sore. Said it was a crime burning up gas like that in times like these. I know it is, but we're not doing it on purpose. Cop said there wasn't any excuse for this kind of thing. Where did he go? The cop, I mean. Uh, Went in the drugstore for a cold drink. Cold drink? Yep. Said he was so mad he had to cool off somehow. Oh, well, here he comes now. He doesn't look as if that drink was very cold. Well, so there you are. Well, mighty nice to see you back. Which one of you was driving this car here? I was. Got a license? Oh, yes, sir. Where is it? 
in the car. Okay, that'll cost you two dollars. It will? Now, wait till I write this down. Two dollars for not carrying license on Forsum. Two dollars? Oh, gee. That's just the first item. Now, overtime parking. Two dollars more. Overtime parking? There's a one-hour parking sign right over your head. There is? There is. And now there's the little matter of parking in front of a fire hydrant. My goodness, is that a fire hydrant? There ain't no hitching post. I didn't see it. Really, I didn't. Now, don't interrupt me. Wait till I write this down. Five dollars for parking in front of the fire hydrant. Five dollars? Isn't that a little high? I'm giving you the regular standard price. <laughs> Don't you sort of knock a little off for wholesale? All our prices are retail. And now about leaving the motor running like this. That takes a little figuring. Oh, officer, please figure it over very carefully. It's going to be a little upsetting to my parents. Well, they don't have anything on me. I'm upset, too. Officer, I feel I ought to say something in defense of my friend, Miss Foster. This has all been a sort of unfortunate accident. Hey, whose car is that double parked alongside of this one? Why, uh, it's mine. Well, so you want to say something in defense of Miss Foster, do you? Well, what do you got to say in defense of your friend? Well, I... Nothing, I see well, young man, do you know there's a law in this town again double parking? Well, yes, but I... I hope you know what the fine is for double parking. Well, no, I don't... Three dollars. Now, tell me, kid, shall I put it all on one bill, or do you want separate checks? <laughs> Hello. Hello. Is this Dr. Wilson? Yes, it is. Well, this is Mrs. Foster, Dr. Wilson. Is Judy still there? No, she isn't. As a matter of fact, she hasn't even been here. She hasn't? No. And frankly, Mrs. Foster, I would prefer that she find another dentist. This is the third appointment she's broken. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Doctor, but... Uh, well, what oh, for the love of heaven, he's hung up. Well, where is that young lady? Oh, I do hope that... Hello? Hello, Mrs. Yes. For goodness sakes, are you still at home? Well, yes, I am. Who is this? This is Mrs. Clendenning. Mrs. Foster, those soldiers have been waiting for you for a half an hour. Oh, I know. It's simply dreadful. But my daughter Judy hasn't come back with a car, and I... Mrs. Foster, if this is the way you're going to take your responsibilities, I'll just have to ask you to resign from the Transportation Committee. Now, don't worry, Mrs. Clendenning. I'll borrow a car from Mr. Schluthammer next door, and I'll be right down. Well, all right, but you'd better hurry. Oh, I will, Mrs. Clendenning. I certainly will. Oh, good. Great. Oh, jeepers. Father's going to die when he hears about these traffic tickets. Well, kids, that's the sum total. Guess that fixes you up. Yes, it certainly does. I can't think of anything else. You can't? Not even if you try? Well, I guess that'll be all. Goodbye. I'll be seeing you in court. Well, goodbye, and thank you very much. I've enjoyed the whole thing thoroughly. And who are you? Oh, he's just an innocent bystander. Yes, I've been standing here listening. Mighty interesting. Okay, well, get that motor stopped as quick as you can. So long. I wonder what we ought to do. Call a mechanic from a garage? I guess you better, Judy. Oh, you needn't to do that. I'm a mechanic of sorts myself. I'll be glad to take care of the matter for you. You will? How are you going to stop it, mister? Well, young man, I'll tell you. All you got to do is stuff a little cotton in the exhaust pipe. Chokes are off. Oh, how wonderful. Where'll we get some cotton? Mm, handkerchief will do. Well, here's mine. But be careful of it. It's a 50 center. No, oh, come out in the wash. Now. It, yeah. You see? Nothing to it. Well, isn't that ducky? Yes, isn't it? Mister. Hmm? Do you mean you've been standing here this whole time knowing the solution to this problem and you didn't do anything about it till now? Well, I didn't think about it till now. You didn't think about it till now? No, I'm a slow thinker. But you've been standing there. You were standing there even before we got back. You certainly had enough time to think. Well, I was working on it. Well, what's the use arguing? The motor's off. Now what'll we do? I guess... Well, I guess there's nothing to do. Gee, Judy, 
I'm sorry. I know, Oogie. Well, the keys are still locked in the car, so I guess we'll just have to leave it till Father gets home tonight with the spare keys. Randolph, do you realize if we leave the car here till Father gets home tonight, we'll be parked overtime even more than we are already? That's the risk you've got to run. I don't think that cop will bother you anymore. I think he shot his bolt. Do you really? Yep. He's giving you the works. He won't bother with anything more. Well, that's a relief. Mm. Of course, some other cop will probably come along. It hardly seems possible that anything more can happen, but uh, we'll see in just a moment. In the meantime, a word of advice. Whenever you suffer from acid indigestion, don't temporize, don't fool around. Take Tums at once. For they relieve heartburn, acid pain, and that uncomfortable, full feeling fast. And Tums contain no bicarbonate of soda, no baking soda. They relieve indigestion due to excess gastric acidity in a different way entirely, a modern, up-to-date way. Tums aren't suggested to you as a cure-all, good for a half dozen different things. Tums are sound, scientific medication compounded for one thing and one thing only, the speedy, pleasant relief of acid indigestion. They're easy to take, too. Nothing to mix or stir. You don't even need water. The moment acid indigestion hits you, slip one or two tums in your mouth as you would candy mints for prompt relief. Tonight, or first thing tomorrow morning, ask your druggist for Tums for the Tummy, only ten cents a roll, and carry them with you all the time. And now, back to A Date with Judy. Well, Judy's been the recipient of a large number of police tags due to an unfortunate occurrence when she locked the family car, leaving the keys inside and the motor running. Judy and Randolph have gone home, and meanwhile, Mother has had to borrow a car from her neighbor, Mr. Schlutzhammer. I hate lending you this car, Mrs. Foster. You know what I think of women drivers. Yes, but it's simply imperative I use it. Five soldiers are waiting, and I... Yeah, all right, but the brakes aren't working too good. I'll be very careful. Oh, and watch that door. It flies open sometimes. I'll watch it. And uh, look out for the steering wheel. It's kind of tricky. All right, Mrs. Schlutzhammer. Goodbye. I'll watch you out of the driveway. It's kind of tricky, too. Don't worry about a thing. And don't forget about those brakes. I won't. Hey, look out. Mrs. Foster, look out. That truck. (laughs) You doggone it. I told her to look out. Mrs. Foster. Mrs. Foster, are you all right? Yes, but isn't this awful? Well, you certainly made a nice mess out of my car. Oh, Mr. Schlutzhammer. Well, we're home. I wonder where Mother is. Mother? Mother? Guess she got tired waiting for us and left. Oh, Randolph... How are we ever going to break the news to her? I don't know. Judy, as we came in, did you notice that accident off the street? Oh, no, Randolph. Hope nobody got hurt. Now, who's that? Why don't you find out? Hello? Hello, Mrs. Foster. Are you still at home? No, I'm not. What? I mean, I mean I'm mean, i at home, but Mrs. Foster isn't. This is her daughter, Judy, speaking. Oh, well, this is Mrs. Clendenning. Judy, you can tell your mother not to bother. I've sent the soldiers out to the camp with somebody else. All right, I'll tell her. And another thing, my husband just phoned me. He's one of the members of the ration board. He is? A report just came in that your car was seen on State Street with nobody in it, and the motor running on and on for about an hour. Is that so? Your mother told me you were using the car this morning, Judy. Yes, I was. Well, you ought to be ashamed of yourself wasting gas like that. Oh, I know, Mrs. Clendenning. I feel simply terrible about it. Rest assured that the Russian board will take firm steps regarding this matter. Very firm steps? Very. I wouldn't be surprised if they cut your father's gas points down to the bone. To the bone? I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, Randolph. This has been absolutely the most devastating day in my whole life. Oh, hello, Mother dear. Well... So you finally got home. Yes, we did. Oh, Mother, I'm just terribly sorry. But the strangest thing happened to me. A rather peculiar little thing. Judy, do you realize the inconvenience you caused me? And not only that, would you like to know what the result of all this has been? Well, we've seen quite a few of the results. (laughs) I didn't do it on purpose, Mother. It was just a... Well, 
An accident. Don't talk to me about accidents. I've had enough of accidents for one day. Uh, speaking of not talking about accidents, did you happen to see the one up the street, Mother? See it? I was in it. You were? I certainly was. And if you had had our car back, you and you said you would, it wouldn't have happened. Oh, Mother. Judy, do you realize what it's going to cost me to fix up Mr. Schlutzhammer's car? Cost you? I wrecked it, didn't I? Now I have to pay for it. The garage says it'll cost $76 to fix it. This has been kind of an expensive day, hasn't it? It certainly has. Wait till your father hears about it. Just wait until he gets that bill. Well, uh, if you don't give it to him so quickly, he may get used to bills by the time you give it to him. What do you mean? <laughs> well, Mother, we've been given a few little police tickets. Police tickets? Mm-hmm. And, well, Randolph's right. If we just give Father one at a time, starting with the little two-dollar ones, and work him up gradually, uh, he might get so used to paying bills that by the time he gets the bill for Mr. Schlatzhammer's car, he, well, <laughs> just won't mean a thing to him. Just a minute. Would you mind if I lie down on the sofa? Oh, not at all. You go right ahead, Mother. <laughs> Thanks. Now, please start at the beginning. Oh, jeepers. I wonder what the latest bad news is. Hello? Hello, Judy. Yes? This is Miss Watson, dear. Oh? We just had a long-distance call from your father. You did? Yes, he must have some important papers. We've got to get them to him immediately. Well, where is he? He's still 50 miles away at that factory site. Oh, goopers. He says these papers are vitally important. Well, where are they? He says he left them in your car. Oh, no! <laughs> Women? Well, well, tell us, what happened, Randolph? Did everything come out all right? Oh, your worries are over. We got the papers out of the car, and Noogie took the car and off to meet Father. Oh, thank goodness. You know, Mother, it would have saved me a very upsetting day if I'd known the spare keys to the car were here in the house all the time. Well, now all we have to worry about is telling Father about all our police tickets and about Mr. Schlutzhammer's car, of course. Uh, you know, Judy... I've been thinking things over. Is there any reason why your father has to know about any of this at all? Well, no very good reason, except that it's usually his custom to pay the bills. Yes, but he doesn't have to pay the bills this time. I've decided to pay everything myself. Luckily, I have $100. You have? Yes, I've been saving it out of my housekeeping money. And you'll pay everything? Police tickets and all? Mm-hmm, everything. Everything. And if you won't say anything to Father about Mr. Schlutzhammer's car, I won't say anything to him about the police tickets. Mother, <laughs> you're the most understanding mother a girl ever had for a mother. <laughs> uh, say, Mother, you won't need the whole hundred dollars for today's mess. No, no, that's right. Seventy-six plus nine equals eighty... The whole caboodles comes to exactly eighty-five dollars. Oh? So you see, you say fifteen dollars. Well, we'll hear more from the Fosters in a moment. Before we do, I should like to caution you that acid indigestion often strikes when you least expect it and when you're least prepared to deal with it. That's why it's just common sense to carry a handy roll of Tums with you all the time, wherever you go. For Tums quickly relieve indigestion due to excess gastric acidity. Tums put down the heartburn, the acid pain, and the uncomfortable full feeling almost at once. And yet Tums contain no bicarbonate of soda, no baking soda. They're modern, up-to-date medication for acid indigestion and contain nothing to upset or overburden the system. And you can take Tums anywhere, anytime, without fuss or bother, whenever acid indigestion strikes. There's nothing to mix or stir. You don't even need water. Take one or two Tums as you would candy mints and relieve that upset acid stomach in a hurry. Ask your druggist tonight for Tums for the Tummy. Only ten cents a roll or the handy three-roll package for a quarter. But be sure you get Tums, T-U-M-S. There are many imitations of Tums, but no substitute for them. And now let's see if things are getting any better at the Foster's. I'll get it. Hello? Oh, hello. Oh? Oh. Oh. Well, all right. Bye. Judy, who is that? Oogie. 
He called from a garage. Oh, he did? Well, what did he want? Fifteen dollars. Fifteen dollars? Yes. It seems that when the ignition in our car is on for a long time, like it was this afternoon, well, the battery runs down. Oh, for the love of heaven. Of course, the new battery doesn't come to quite fifteen dollars. It only comes to fourteen dollars and fifty cents. Mm. Oh, that's a break. And I know just what we can do with the fifty cents left over. What? Buy a bottle of aspirin. Yes, we can split it three ways. <laughs> You know, friends, nobody likes to pay taxes. But during these war years, to be a taxpayer is a privilege. Your tax dollars are helping to pay for the war, helping to arm and equip our fighting men. Now, income taxes are the fairest means Uncle Sam has to ask you to support the war effort. For this tax is levied according to your salary or wages, according to your ability to pay. Now, March 15th isn't very far away. You'll be required then to file your income tax return for last year's earnings. I think we all know the rules, but I'll repeat them. All single persons whose gross income was $500 or more in 1943 must file this return. Every husband or wife whose individual gross income was $624 or more and every husband or wife whose combined gross incomes were $1,200 or more. Now, even though part of your pay has been withheld by your employer for tax purposes, you must still file a return by March 15th. If you've not received an income tax form through the mail, write to your local collector of internal revenue at once. Now, many banks also have these forms. And if you feel you need help in making out your form... You may obtain assistance at the office of the Collector of Internal Revenue. Feel free to call upon them. Now, get your return in early. Mail it today if you possibly can. Date with Judy is written by Arlene Leslie and it stars Louise Erickson. Dix Davis, who is usually heard in the part of Randolph, unfortunately is still confined to his home with the mumps. But we're glad to hear that he'll be back with us again next Tuesday. We're very grateful to Tommy Cook for taking his place. Original music is composed and conducted by Tommy Peluso. The program was produced and directed by Helen Mack. This is Art Baker inviting you to be with us again next Tuesday at the same time to keep your date with Judy. Chaperone by Tums. Quick relief from acid indigestion. Get a roll tonight. Ten cents at all drugstores. This is the National Broadcasting Company. KFI Los Angeles. I Los Angeles. I Los Angeles. I Los Angeles. Tom's famous quick relief for acid indigestion presents a date with Judy. <laughs> Yes, Bobby. Judy, I want to ask you something. When a boy wants to take a girl out on a date and he hasn't any money, do you think it's all right for him to borrow money from a girl? Why, of course, Bobby. I'll be glad to lend you some money for a date. Oh, gee, that's wonderful. Then I'll be able to take Barbara to the dance tonight. Barbara? Oh, I'm awfully sorry, but I'm utterly broke. <laughs> That is Judy, folks. Judy Foster, the cutest date in town. 
And your date with her each Tuesday at the same time is arranged by the makers of Tums for quick relief from acid indigestion. Well, now let's see what's going on at the Foster house. Judy and her 12-year-old brother in the living room. Judy speaks. Randolph, I've just been thinking. Do you suppose I ought to make out an income tax report this year? Huh? What would you use for income? Look, there's a whole lot of income tax forms here on Father's desk. Why don't I take one and make out my return? Hey, Father needs those forms himself. Yes, but he brought home a whole bunch of them. He certainly can't need all of them. If you've ever seen Father make out his income tax report, you'd know he needs all of them. (laughs) Well, he can't make six mistakes. He certainly won't mind if I use one of his forms. Well, I still contend you've got to have an income before you file a report. Randolph... Do you realize I earned $11.25 this year? You did? Yes. $9.25 for minding babies and $2 for that day I worked in the shoe store. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. I think I'm going to sit right down and make out my income tax, just in case. In case what? In case the government ever starts checking up on me. I can just see Mr. Morgenthau chartering a plane to fly down here and look you over. (laughs) I don't care. I'm going to make out a report just for the heck of it just to see what income tax I would have to pay. Well, I can give you the answer right now. Zero. Well, it won't hurt me to practice. Maybe next year I'll earn so much money I'll have to Uh, file a return. If you have to next year, then all I've got to say is the government will be mighty hard up for money. Oh, be quiet, Randa. Let's see. I think I'll do deductions first. Medical, dental, et cetera expenses. Did I have any doctor bills last year? If you did, they didn't come out of your earnings. Well, I suppose not. <laughs> oh, here's another. Losses from fire, storm, shipwreck, etc. Now, let's see. Have you been in any shipwrecks lately? <laughs> no, I guess I haven't. Hmm. Oh, well, I guess I won't take any deductions at all. I'll look at something else. Yes, do. Interest on corporation bonds. Oh, I like that one. No. Did I make any interest last year on corporation bonds? Well, we'll have to give that some thought. Don't be hasty now. Take your time. Try hard to remember. I didn't. You amaze me. No interest on corporation bonds? I can't understand it. Oh, here's a cute one. Income tax paid to a foreign government or United States possession. I guess I didn't pay any income tax to a foreign government or United States possession. Not even to Texas? Well, hand me a pen, Randall. I've got work to do. Dora, who's been monkeying around with my income tax form? I don't know, dear. Judy has. Oh, Don, that girl. Doesn't she have any respect for my property? Now, dear, if Judy's written on one of your forms, just put it aside and start to work on one of the others. All right, but it makes me mighty angry. Where is Judy? I'd like to tell she her. She went out on a date. Now, Melvin, you've left your return to the last minute. Don't you think you'd better work on it? I am working on it. All you've done so far is fuss. Write something down, dear. How can I write something down with everybody interrupting me every minute? Mm. Melvin, I've been sitting here quietly sewing, and Randolph has been quietly playing with his chemistry set. All right, all right, all right. Fourteen and eight are twenty-two. If I poured what's in this test tube into this test tube, I could raise an awful stink. (laughs) There's been enough stink raised around this house lately. (laughs) Now, Randolph, will you please be quiet? You know I'm trying to figure out my income tax. How are you getting along, Melvin? I'm not. I wonder what'll happen if I mix a little potassium chloride with a little sulfur. I'll tell you what'll happen. I'll lick the pants off you. If you don't keep quiet and let me concentrate. Randolph, dear, let your father concentrate. Okay. Father, concentrate. <laughs> 743 plus 600. Melvin, did I tell you what Mrs. Whiteman said today at the club? No, no, you didn't, and you're not going to. <laughs> Three and four is seven. Four and nine is thirteen. Carry Mr. One, Schlutzhammer has an two. adding machine down at his store. It's too bad it broke down the other day. Are you How do you like that? He's interrupted me again. Well, as long as he's interrupted you, let me tell you what Mrs. Whiteman said. She said that her sister had the most terrible operation. Nobody knew what was wrong with her, but when they operated, guess what they found? A litter of kittens? No. <laughs> oh, no. Gallstones. What a letdown. Dora, would you please keep Mrs. Whiteman's sister's gallstones for some other time? Well... I've got to file this report tomorrow. 
And so far, I don't even know how much I earned last year. Do you know how much Mr. Schlitzhammer earned last year? I don't care how much I earned. <laughs> what I want is quiet around here, and if I don't get Mr. it... Mr. Schlitzhammer it... made his income tax report out months ago. I don't care if he never makes it. Why don't you just copy Mr. Schlitzhammer's report? May I ask why? Well, if Judy can copy Fatty Schlitzhammer's exams in school... I don't see why you can't copy Mr. Schlitzhammer's income tax report. Oh. Suppose the answers are the same. Nobody's going to... In one minute, I'm going to pack my suitcase and leave home. Man's better off being a bachelor at a time like this. Uh Uh-oh, where would you be without your two cute little exemptions? (laughs) I'm going to turn one of my cute little exemptions over my knee in a minute. That's what I'm going to do. Well, anyhow, your other cute little exemption is out on a date tonight. I wish Randolph were old enough to go out on dates. Well, if that's the way you feel, Father, lend me two bits. Huh? There's a cute little number visiting next door. She says she's only 11, but she looks pretty sophisticated to me. I'd say she's 12 if she's a day. I wonder what would happen if I didn't file any income tax report at all this year. Oh, I just heard somebody come up on the porch. I wonder if Judy's home so early. Well, that's all I need. Just Judy and some young squirt. Well, he's going right home. That's where he's going. I'm going to kick him right out of here. He's... Hello, everybody. Oh, hello, dear. How are you, Willie? Fine, ma'am. Hiya, Mr. Foster. Father, you remember Willie Gibbons, don't you? Young man, this is no time to barge into a girl's house. I want you to do... Willie Gibbons? Oh, Gibbons. Well, Willie, I'm delighted to see you. Come right in. Make yourself at home. Okay, Mr. Foster. Well, Melvin, I thought that Now, Willie, I'm tickled to death to see you, but uh, I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to be just a little quiet. I'm making out my income tax report. Oh, sure, Mr. Foster. I understand. Come on, Willie. Sit down over here. Okie doke. Let's see. Eight and nine or 15. 17, Father. Who asked you? Oh, all right, 17. Carry one. Willie, Three I think it's just disgusting for you to take me out, just so I'll say something nice about you to Mitzi Hawk. Well, well, gee, Judy, she stopped going steady with me, and well, all I'm asking you to do is keep dropping hints in her presence that I'm a very attractive number. I don't care. It's very demoralizing to a girl's ego to be used for the simple purpose of helping a man go steady with some other girl. If I mix some sodium nitrate with some sulfuric acid, I wonder if it'd explode. No, but I would! Uh, I'll tell you what, Mr. Foster. If you want to work, Judy and I will go out in the kitchen and leave you alone. No, no, not the kitchen. No, never mind, Willie. You just stay right here. I'll take Mr. Foster out in the kitchen. He can work on the kitchen table. Uh, Come on, Melvin. Uh, Of course, dear. I'm just gathering up my phones. Well, uh, excuse me, Willie. Well, gee, I'll be very glad to go to the oh, kitchen. No, my... no, 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 never mind, Willie. Come on, Melvin. Yes, dear. Well, I guess I'll be just as comfortable out here in the kitchen. Oh, Melvin, I don't understand you. You said you were going to kick whatever boy Judy brought home out of the house. And then when it turned out to be Willie Gibbons, you were sweet as angel pie. Dora, do you realize I've got a deal all set with Willie Gibbons' father? Oh. We've been working for weeks on the contract. Oh, I know, Now dear, that but it's that... all set to sign, I don't want Willie Gibbons going home and telling his father I... Kicked him out of the house. Fine thing if that deal fell through at the last minute. Well, you certainly are unpredictable. I don't know how you're going to act from one moment to the next. Incidentally, Dora, why were you so anxious to keep Willie out of the kitchen? Why, I'm surprised at you having to ask. Do you remember what happened the last time Willie went in the kitchen? No. Well, I do. He ate half a pie, three cupcakes, a dish of spaghetti, and a bunch of bananas. <laughs> Well, after all, he's just a growing boy, Dora. Maybe so, but he doesn't need to do all his growing in my kitchen. (laughs) (laughs) Don't you think you're being a little hard on the boy, Dora? Oh, Melvin Foster, all I've got to say is I certainly hope that contract gets signed soon. I'm getting awfully tired being nice to the Gibbons. We'll hear more from the Fosters in a moment. But in the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, be wise when you suffer a spell of acid indigestion. Do what thousands do for prompt relief. Take Tums. Now, Tums don't fool around. Almost as fast as taken, Tums relieve heartburn and indigestion due to excess gastric acidity. Yes, in almost no time at all, Tums help a sour, fussy stomach feel calm and comfortable again. And Tums are easy to take. Ready for use the instant you need them. There's nothing to mix or stir. You don't even need water. Slip one or two Tums in your mouth as you would candy mints and relieve that upset acid stomach promptly. Ask for Tums for the Tummy at any drugstore, only 10 cents a roll. 
And now back to A Date with Judy. Well, Judy has practiced making out her income tax report using one of the blank forms that Father brought home. And now it's the next morning. Father's been up most of the night making out his income tax return. We find the Foster family at the breakfast table. Dora, for heaven's sake, give me that coffee quickly. I have an appointment at 9 o'clock at the factory, and it's a quarter of 9 now. Well, then you shouldn't have waited until 8.30 to get out of bed, dear. Do you realize that all I had was five hours sleep? Oh. Didn't go to bed till 3.30 this morning. You're going to be as just as bad as Judy. Oh, don't be silly, Randolph. I haven't had a date for years worth staying up till 3.30 for. Well, now, let's see. You've been going out since you were 15. You're 16 now. Judy, did you ever stay up till 3.30? Yes, Smarty, I did. When? That night the house burned down. <laughs> I'll just have one more cup of coffee and then I've got to scram out of here. What time did Willie go home last night, Judy? Too late. It was only 10 o'clock. Wow, that was one of the quickest dates you ever had. Well, as a matter of fact, he was getting very boring and I sent him home. He's really not my type. As if he cares. The only thing he cares about is he's not Mitzi Hoffman's type. Oh, be quiet, Randolph. Jeepers, the things you say. Well, that's all I have time for. Uh, Dora, where's my income tax report? I don't know. Where'd you leave it? I thought I left it in the kitchen. Oh, I think I put it on your desk in the living room. Oh, okay. I'll grab it on the way out. Oh, for the love of heaven, I may. Goodbye, everybody. Oh, give me a kiss before you go. Just a quick one. <laughs> Goodbye, Goodbye, dear. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye, Father. Au revoir, Father. Oh, don't forget to drink your milk, Judy. Yes, Mother. Say, Mother, did you hear about Oogie Pringle's income tax? If Oogie Pringle has to pay an income tax this year, I'm a chihuahua's maiden aunt. Well, that's what you are, then. Oogie Pringle and his orchestra have been doing very well. The hot licks have been in demand almost once a week for simply ages. Do they really earn very much, Judy? I should say they do. Well... Yeah, but how often do they get paid off in money? Randolph, the orchestra very frequently got paid off in money. When they played at the plumber's ball, they each got a hamburger and two Cokes... And a discount on any plumbing they'd need in the future. But that was only just that... And when they played at the Daughters of Byron Frolic, they got all the ice cream and cake they could eat and a copy of Byron's poems. That has nothing to do with the case. Oogie is very conscientious about his obligations. He's figuring out every cent of what he would have earned if he had been paid in money. Oh, that's very patriotic of Oogie. And if his income amounts to over $500... He fully intends to file a return. Something tells me that Oogie isn't going to file a return. <laughs> well, he's to be admired anyway. <laughs> I wonder if the Department of Internal Revenue would consider being paid off in hamburgers. Oh, Randolph, <laughs> you're just impossible to talk to. I'm leaving the room. That's what I'm going to do. Jeepers, what did I say? Well, she's very touchy about her friends, Randolph. Man, you were being a little critical of Oogie Pringle and his hot licks. Gee, she didn't need to get so mad. Oh, you'd better go make up with her, honey. Don't you think? Mm, okay. Little Randolph, always the martyr. Hey, Judy. Look, Randolph. What do you know? Father left his income tax return at home. He did? Mm hmm It's right here on the desk. Well, that's funny. He was so anxious to file it today. Oh, well, I suppose he thinks there's still time tomorrow. Now, I wonder what happened to my income tax return. Was it missing? Yes. I thought I'd left it here on the desk. Oh, well, it isn't important. Nothing will ever come of it anyhow. Well, Mr. Gibbons. Uh, hello, hello, Willie. Well, hello, Mr. Foster. Glad to see you. I'm sorry I'm late getting into the office. Did I keep you waiting long? Oh, you certainly did, Foster. When I say nine o'clock, I mean nine o'clock. Well, I'm terribly sorry, but I, I was up so late last night uh, making out my income tax report, you know. Well, you certainly left it till the last minute, didn't you? <laughs> well, you know how things are. But anyway, it's finally done. Here it is. I'll just put it on my desk and run over and file it this afternoon. And uh, how about our contract, Mr. Gibbons? Oh, uh, you didn't mind my bringing Willie along with me, did you? No, not at all. I want him to learn everything he can about business. Of course, of course. And I'll get the contracts. Be right back when we get out of work. Excuse me, Gibbons. Pardon me, Willie. Uh, a very irresponsible man, leaving his income tax till the last minute. Oh, I think he's a pretty nice old guy, Father. What do you mean, old? He's five years younger than I am. Well, I didn't mean anything by it. It was just an expression... Say, hey, look at this paperweight on his desk. Gee, it's snazzy. I don't know if I'm making a mistake or not signing an important contract with him. Gee, he's got a lot of papers on his desk. Of course, he tells me the earnings of his factory last year was a pretty high figure. Father, here's his income tax report. Willie, keep away from there. 
Well, don't you want to know how much income tax Mr. Foster has to pay? Willie, I'm ashamed of you. The idea of peeking at another man's income tax report. Why, it ought to be a criminal offense. Even the idea of your suggesting it is positively... How much is it? Huh? <laughs> Quick now, I'll watch the door. Go ahead, just look at the figure opposite net income. That's all I want to know. Yeah, I've got it. Well, what's it say? Net income, $11.25. <laughs> $11? Are you sure? Oh, yes, positively, Father. Well, can you imagine that old rascal? He led me to believe that... Oh, quick, Willie. Get away from the desk. Here he comes. Well, here are the papers. I'm all ready to get down to signing the contract. Oh, uh, Forster, I, uh, I've been thinking things over. As a matter of fact, Willie and I have just been discussing it, and, uh, well, we think it'd be best for all concerned if we call the deal off. Called it off? Yes. On giving the matter some real consideration, I think we should. But I... Hey, come on, Willie. But you... Good day, but we... Well, I'll be an uncle's monkey. Well, it looks as if Judy's income tax report is going to make a big difference in father's income. We'll see in a moment. Say, so, you know, folks, many of our friends have written us that the familiar metal carrier for Tums makes a convenient holder for the new fiber ration tokens. Now, these metal Tums carriers, which used to be packed into every handy three-roll package of Tums, are, of course, no longer available, since along with so many other precious metals, they've gone to war. But many people are lucky enough to still have one or more of these containers on hand. Now, uh, if you're one of these fortunate souls, you'll be glad to know that the new ration tokens fit just perfectly into the Tums metal container, which holds 40 tokens. Handiest thing imaginable. Now, we still have a few of these Tums carriers in stock. And as long as they last, we'll be delighted to send you one free. See the instructions on the front of the three-roll package of Tums. And then write Tums at St. Louis, Missouri, for your free Tums carrier for the new ration tokens. And remember, always carry Tums with you, for you'll never know when or where acid indigestion will strike. That address again is Tums, T-U-M-S, St. Louis, Missouri. And now, back to A Date with Judy. Well, Mr. Gibbons has called off a big deal to Father's dismay. And all because Mr. Gibbons' son, Willie, got a peek at Judy's income tax return, thinking it was Father's. Now we find Father at home that evening with a terrible headache. I can't understand it, Dora. I just can't understand it. We'd worked on that contract for weeks. And just when it was all set to sign. Bang. Oh, I never did like Mr. Gibbons. Oh, I got the most awful headache. Uh, I thought something was wrong when you barged in here in the middle of the afternoon. Take another aspirin, dear. Take two of them. Did you get your income tax return filed today? No, that's another thing. In my hurry this morning, I picked up that darn thing Judy had been making out. You did? I could spank oh. her. <laughs> oh, I'll have to file mine tomorrow, the last day. You know what lines there are on the last day. Probably take me hours. Oh, Melvin, I'm so sorry. Oh, thanks, Dora. I'm glad somebody gives me a little sympathy. My goodness, what a man goes through in the course of a business year. It's a good thing I at least have a nice, helpful, sympathetic family. Yes, dear. Isn't it, though? <laughs> Try to play up to me, Willie Gibbons. I'm mad at you. Me? <laughs> what did I do? It's not only you, it's your whole family. Do you know what your father did to my father? He refused to sign the contract. And poor father came home tonight a physical wreck. Well, but Judy, I... I wouldn't be surprised if he had a nervous breakdown. But Judy, the reason my father called the deal off was because my father knows that your father is, well, kind of impoverished. Impoverished? Why, that's perfectly ridiculous. How could your father get an idea like that? Well, oh, I can't imagine. Why, my father makes just stacks of money. He does? Of course he does. Are you sure that's the reason your father won't give my father the contract? Mm, sure, I'm sure. Willie, would you consider trying to write a terrible mistake? Well... I knew you would be. Willie... You're very anxious to take Mitzi to the dance Friday night, aren't you? Well, you bet. But I already asked her. She said no. Well, if I get you a date with Mitzi, 
Will you get your father over to my house tonight for dinner? Oh, but, gee, Judy, I... You know, of course, that Mitzi is my most intimate bosom friend this week. She listens to me. Judy, it's a deal. My father will be at your house tonight. Mother! Mother! Oh, be quiet, dear. Your father has a terrible headache. I'm dying. Well, that's too bad, because we've got to get to work. Mr. Gibbons is coming over for dinner tonight. Mr. Gibbons? Mm -hmm, I just saw Willie. I never want to talk to that man again. I wouldn't have him sitting at my table. Oh, you got to be nice to him. You simply got to. Willie thinks he might change his mind about signing the contract. Oh, he does. D he does? <laughs> of course. Now we've got a lot of work to do. We have to set the table perfectly, gorgeously. Judy, do you know what I'm having for dinner tonight? No. Ham hocks and sauerkraut. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mother, that's perfectly terrible. Well, you'll have to keep that for some other time. Tonight we'll have to have caviar. Caviar? And, <laughs> of course. And roast pheasant would be nice. How about some nice hummingbirds' tongues? Does it take points? No, oh, for the love of it. Oh, Judy, what's the idea of all this, this sumptuousness? It's the idea of the whole thing. We've got to impress Mr. Gibbons with our, well, our sumptuousness. We do? Yes. I think the whole reason Father's deal fell through is because Mr. Gibbons thinks we're paupers. Paupers? Well, it certainly won't hurt to let him know he's going to sign a contract with a man who makes a lot of money. Well, maybe she's right, Melvin. I wonder if he does think we're paupers. Oh, that's nonsense. Well, anyhow, I guess we're stuck with him for dinner. Oh, Judy, you'd better go to the store. And mind you, no caviar. <laughs> Mrs. Foster, this is mighty good liver paste. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gibbons. Yes, I think it's nice for a change. We get so tired of caviar. Yeah. Oh, we can hardly look at it anymore. <laughs> Malvin, would you pour Mr. Gibbons another glass of water? Yeah, okay. I feel just dreadful about the champagne, Mr. Gibbons. What champagne? To think that we had to run out of it the very night we have company for dinner. Yeah. <laughs> but how was I to know this afternoon when I lapped up the last three bottles? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, don't, don't pay any attention to him. You know how kids are, Mr. Gibbons. Yes, yes. Doesn't my boy think he's a swooner crooner? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Pater, dear. Oh, Pater, I was speaking to you. Who's Pater? <laughs> you, of course. Well, I'll be down. As I was saying, Pater, dear... Uh, whatever happened to that yacht we used to own when we went on the lake? We sold it back to the canoe man for four bucks. Well, <laughs> I, uh, I hope you like chicken, Mr. Gibbons. Oh, it's very nice, thank you. Of course, you know, it really isn't chicken at all. Mother always calls fowl that, one of her little whimsies. <laughs> this is really pheasant, of course. Oh, of course. Oh, that's so? Yes, um, ring-tailed pheasant, I believe the caterer told me. Hmm... <laughs> Tastes like chicken to me. Isn't it amazing how expensive pheasant is this year? Well, no wonder. I hear chicken feed costs eleven dollars and twenty-five cents a sack. Oh, Randolph. Uh, Randolph, uh, did you say eleven dollars and twenty-five cents? Well, yeah, I guess so. Well, why do you ask, Evans? I don't know. There's just something sort of familiar about the amount. Yes, there is, isn't there? Hmm, Eleven dollars and twenty-five cents. I'd better bring the coffee in. Oh no. Let's wait and have it in the drawing room, Major. After all, Major. Uh, that's you, Mother. Oh. <laughs> After all, as the Duke always used to say. Uh, what Duke? What did you say, Mr. Gibbons? I said, what Duke? Oh, that's what I thought you said. Now, Judy, you know perfectly well you don't know any nobility. Of course she does, Mother. I do? Who? Oh, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Wayne King. <laughs> she listens to him all the time. Randolph. Uh, Mr. Gibbons, would you like a, another nice piece of chick, uh, pheasant? Yeah, I sure would. I'm just getting to love pheasant. Give him a piece of the breast, Mother. Uh, I mean, Mater. Yes, dear. Hey, I just remembered. What? Uh. Judy's income. Oh, does Judy have an income? I'll <laughs> say. She earned $11.25 last year. Yes, sir. She made out an income tax return. Income tax? <laughs> oh. Oh. She did, huh? Yeah, wasn't that cute? Oh, yes, yes. Real cute. $11.25. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Imagine anyone taking an amount like that seriously. Uh, uh, Foster. Yes, Kevin? If you come to my office in the morning, I'll be glad to sign that contract. Do you mean it? I certainly do. Oh, and, and Judy, please pass the chick, uh, the pheasant. <laughs> Well, Judy will be back with us in just a moment. While the Fosters and their guests are enjoying their feast, uh, does mealtime find you eager to pitch in and get the utmost pleasure out of your food? Or does that haunting dread of acid indigestion interfere with your enjoyment? Now, don't let dread of indigestion due to excess gastric acidity spoil your relish of good things to eat. Now, be moderate, of course, but be wise, too. Keep Tums handy. For Tums relieve acid indigestion almost as soon as you take them. Yes, Tums act fast to relieve heartburn and acid pain and that uncomfortable, stuffy, full feeling. And yet Tums contain no bicarbonate of soda, no baking soda. They relieve acid indigestion in a different way entirely, a quick, pleasant way we think you'll like better. Tums are easy to take, too. There's nothing to mix or stir. You don't even need water. Just take one or two Tums, as you would candy mints, and know what it is to relieve an upset acid stomach quickly. Tonight, or first thing tomorrow morning, ask at any drugstore for Tums, only ten cents a roll, or the handy three-roll package for a quarter. But be sure you get Tums for the tummy, T-U-M-S. There are many imitations of Tums, but no substitute for them. And now, here are the Fosters again. Well, family, Gibbon signed the contract. He did? Oh, that's wonderful, dear. Yeah, I'm tickled to death. Only I, I, I can't figure out what made him change his mind. Oh, I'm sure it's just because you're a very clever businessman and made him realize mm. it. Well, probably <laughs> something you said at the dinner table, Father. You think so? Well, I am pretty cagey about business matters, if I do say so myself. <laughs> What'd I say? You asked him if he'd have another piece of chicken. Oh, well, I don't remember exactly, but it must have been something very clever. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Gibbons really got a kick out of Judy's income tax return. Yes, he did. <laughs> hey, that was it. Mr. Gibbons was impressed by the idea of there being two breadwinners in the Foster family. Why, sure. Mr. Gibbons couldn't turn down a deal with a firm that has all Judy's earnings behind it. Of course not. <laughs> Date with Judy is written by Arlene Leslie and stars Louise Erickson and Dix Davis. The original music is composed and conducted by Tommy Peluso. The program is produced and directed by Helen Mack. This is Art Baker inviting you to be with us again next Tuesday at the same time to keep your date with Judy. Chaperone by Tums. Quick relief from acid indigestion. Get a roll tonight. Only ten cents at all drugstores. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Testing Company. Testing Company. Testing Company. Tums, famous quick relief for acid indigestion, presents A Date with Judy. <laughs> Judy, this is Mr. Pringle. How are you, Judy? Oh, my back hurts, and I've got a splitting headache, and I've got the most violent toothache. I feel simply dreadful. Oh, that's a shame. My nephew's home on furlough, and he wanted a date with you. But I'll tell him a that you're... A date? Oh, Mr. Pringle, I feel simply marvelous. <laughs> that's Judy, folks. Judy Foster, the cutest date in town. Your date with her each Tuesday at the same time is arranged by the makers of Tums, famous quick relief for acid indigestion. Well, now, uh, let's see what's doing at the Foster house. 
It seems that Father is home alone when suddenly the front door opens and Judy enters with her friend Barbara. Hello, Father. Hello, Judy. Hi, Barbara. Hello, Mr. Foster. Oh, Father, we had the most scintillating afternoon. It was yes. simply gorgeous. Oh, it was just devoon, Mr. Foster. Devoon? <laughs> Terrifically. And the leading man. Oh, he's so beautiful. Even in those raggedy clothes he was wearing, isn't he, Barbara? Oh, yes. He's devoon. Oh, it's all coming back to me. You went to the matinee today. Yes. It was the most wonderful, wonderful show I ever saw. What was it called? It was called Love in the Slums. It's about a tragedy in the tenement. All about the poor and oppressed. Oh, it was the most depressing, divine show I ever saw. Yes. Sounds just like the kind of show I enjoy missing. Oh, Father. Hey, where's Randolph? I thought he went with you. Yes, he went with us, all right. But, Father, do you know he refused to walk home with us? Why? said we were disgusting. He acted like he didn't know us and walked home 20 paces behind us the whole way. He did? Hiya, Father. Hiya, girls. Well, imagine he spoke to us, Barbara. I'm certainly surprised you're deigning to notice us, Randolph, after the way you kept looking the other way every time we addressed you. Oh, that's all right. On the street where everyone could see, I wouldn't want anyone to know I know you. But here in the house, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Well, do you, do you have any reason for disowning your sister, Randolph, or are you just doing it for a whim? Have I got a reason? Oh, Father, you should have seen the way she and Barbara carried on in the theater. What, what'd they do? They started crying in the first act, and they didn't stop till ten minutes after the final curtain came down. How would you know? You moved into another seat ten rows back as soon as we started to cry. You think I wanted to be seen with a couple of weeping women? Oh, you should have seen him, Father. Their eyes leak like faucets. Well, you certainly weren't very gallant, Randolph Foster. Drip, drip, drip all afternoon. <laughs> well, what happened on the way home? They couldn't have still been weeping. Oh, no, that was much worse. There they were, walking along the street. Oh, didn't you adore it? Giggle, giggle, giggle. Wasn't the hero gorgeous? Giggle, giggle, giggle. <laughs> well, Randolph, after all, girls will be girls. They certainly will, and I wouldn't be seen dead with them. Father, you make him stop talking about us like that. Yeah, Randolph, stop talking about him like that. Okay, but it's either drip, 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 or giggle, giggle, giggle all the time. Hello. Oh, hello, dear. Oh, hello, Mother. I'm furious. You are? Why? I was not elected vice president this afternoon. I thought Henry Wallace was pretty solid in the job. <laughs> I'm talking about my club. To think that Mrs. Whiteman, of all people, beat me by four votes. You know, Mother... Sometimes I think you hate Mrs. Whiteman just as much as I hate her daughter, Tootsie. Why, Judy, I don't hate Mrs. Whiteman a bit. I just think that she... Well, I, I just don't happen to admire her, that's all. Mrs. Foster. Yes, Barbara? Have you ever wanted to be an actress? An actress? Well, why do you ask, dear? Oh, I don't know. I was just thinking. I'd love to be an actress. Oh. Well, Mrs. Foster's already been an actress, Barbara. She's had her career. She went through the whole thing and then retired. You did, Mother? <laughs> well, sort of. Well, I personally saw her play the lead in several productions. Oh. There was uh, Seventeen, given by the Ashtabula High School. Well, <laughs> Camille at the Ashtabula Watermelon Festival. <laughs> and uh, As You Like It by the Ashtabula Shakespearean Society. I take it the mother was quite a celebrity in Ashtabula. <laughs> well, who wouldn't be? <laughs> well, I wasn't so bad at that. Maybe I gave up a successful career to marry you, Melvin. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. You forget that I saw you in all those plays, Dora. Well, I don't like your tone. If I remember correctly, several people suggested at the time that I make a career of acting. Well, they were your mother and your Aunt Mary, I believe. Well, <laughs> anyhow, right now I'd better attend to my more immediate career. I'm going out to the kitchen and cook dinner. Hooray. Dinner? Oh, I wouldn't be able to eat a thing. That play made me much too sad to eat. Took away my appetite. The only thing that takes my appetite away is food. <laughs> Sometimes I wish we lived in a tenement, like those people in the play. Don't you, Barbara? Oh, yeah. They had souls. And bed bugs. <laughs> ever heard of. Guess what? Tootsie Whiteman broke her leg. Be still, Randall. Oh, Judy, you'll never guess. Oh, Barbara, she's not, is she? Your mother's not going to let you quit school and join the WAC. No, it's even more wonderful than that. The love in the slums cast has been stricken with a flu. Well, that is delightful news. Really, Barbara? All of us? Oh, Barbara, not the hero. No, not him. 
Only the lady whose husband drinks and the girl who plays her doll. Just those two? Oh, dear me, that is a disappointment. But wait, you haven't heard the best part yet. Don't tell me, double pneumonia has set in? Oh, Randolph, if you don't keep still, I'm going to bop you. Well, it seems that it's too late to send to New York for actors. The show's closing tomorrow night, so they're going to fill in the missing parts with local actors. They are? Why, we could... We could... Uh-oh. Barbara, I have the most terrific idea. We could go down and try out for the part. Well, yes, but... What's wrong, Barbara? You seem so, well, unenthusiastic. Well, you see, Judy... Well, I already went down and applied for a part. You did? Yes, I did. Barbara, you betrayed me. No, I didn't, Judy. The fact is, I got turned down. Why? Well, the man said mainly because I'm too fat. Too fat? He said I didn't look down and out enough. But I'm not fat, and I could look terribly down and out if I tried. You know, I think the real reason I got turned down was because I don't have an agent. An agent? What's an agent, Barbara? It's a man who represents you in a business way. I read about it in a fan magazine. All the big stars have them. They do? Sure. They discuss all your business for you and get 10% of all the money you make. Really? 10%, huh? Uh, say, Judy, you know who would make a heck of an agent for you? No, who, Randolph? Me. <laughs> Before we find out whether or not Randolph is a heck of an agent, let's look into the pockets of thousands of men and women. You will find one thing always present. That's a roll of Tums. Thousands of people would no more be without Tums than they'd be without car fare home. Yes, literally millions of people now carry Tums as ready relief for indigestion due to excess gastric acidity. They help keep your stomach and mouth in that fresh, sweet state that means so much to your state of feeling as a whole. Get Tums today and try them out. See how much they do to relieve and prevent acid distress. See how much they do to ensure you a sweet and happy stomach. Tums may be had at any drugstore, only ten cents a roll or three rolls for a quarter. Ask for Tums for the Tummy, T-U-M-S. And now back to A Date with Judy. Well, Judy has made up her mind to try for a part in Love in the Slums. Her brother Randolph is going to act as her agent. We pick up the kids on the way to the local opera house. Judy, I'm getting cold feet. I don't think I want to be an agent. I think I'm going to quit right now and go in the shoe shine business. Now, Randolph, you can't back out now. Not just the crucial moment. Well, remember, you get 10% of everything I make. Which won't be a great deal if you don't make anything. Oh, don't be so mean. Come on. You should be very proud to have a sister who's going to make a success of herself. Hmm. Besides, I've got to have an agent to handle my publicity. What publicity? Well, after my debut tonight, somebody's got to go to the papers and give them a big story. Well, don't look at me. I've got more clients than I can handle already. Randolph, honestly, you act as if you don't have the slightest bit of confidence in my future. I don't. Randolph, dear, what if I should happen to advance you 50 cents? Cash? Cash. Oh, that's a horse of a different color. Hand it over. Okay. But remember, Randolph, it comes out of your 10% when you get it. If I get it. Tell me, do I look down and out enough? Halsey, you look so down and out, you look positively icky. This dress I made out of a horse blanket was a wonderful idea, wasn't it? Yeah, only I feel so sorry for the ice man's horse. He must be freezing. Oh, don't be silly. The ice man was glad to give it to me. He said this one was getting all worn out anyhow. He has another blanket for the horse. I thought not even a horse would wear what you have on. Well, here's the opera house. Come on, Nando. Well, here we are. Who's there? It's the Randolph Foster Agency. And client. And oh. client. Oh, and uh, what can I do for you? We heard you were looking for actresses. And I have a little client here I'd like to have you look at. All right, I'll talk to you in a moment. You'll have to wait, though. I'm interviewing somebody else just now. Oh. I'll see you later. Look, Judy. Look who he's talking to over there. It's Mrs. Whiteman. But really, Mrs. Mulligan, I feel perfectly capable of handling the part. My background in the theater is quite... What's her background in the theater? She sewed the costumes for the school production of the Mikado. Hey, Judy, let's get up closer and listen. Okay. It isn't a question of background, Mrs. Whiteman. The scene calls for a mother and daughter. 
And I would like two people who resemble each other. Oh, but that's just it. My daughter Tootsie resembles me perfectly. Really? Poor Tootsie. Oh, and incidentally, she's quite a finished actress. I'll say she's finished. In that case, I might consider you, but I'll have to see her first. Well, I'll be right back with her. Uh, would you mind going out through the theater entrance? I have uh, somebody waiting backstage. No, of course not. But don't you dare give those parts to anybody till I get back with Tootsie. I'll try and remember. No matter what happens, I'm not going to let Tootsie get that part. All right, kids, I'm ready for you. How do you do? My name is Mulligan. Uh, Mr. Mulligan, I'd like you to meet my down-and-out client, Miss Judy Foster. Well, I, I must say you're certainly dressed for the part. Why, what do you mean, Mr. Mulligan? Well, you don't normally dress like that, do you? Oh, yes, she does. Sometimes even worse. Oh, my best dress. And to think you don't like All right, all right. Forget about the dress. It's very, very pretty. Well, I uh, take it you want one of the parts that are open. Yes, Mr. Mulligan. And I can't tell you what it would mean to me to get the job. Well, that's very unfortunate, but after you all... You see, things haven't been going too well with my family lately, and it's just, well, just odd jobs like these that keep us going. Well, that's, that's too bad. And uh, who's this young man? He's my brother. I'm her brother agent. We're too poor to afford a regular agent. Well, your brother's pretty well dressed. Oh, he borrowed the clothes. Oh. Well, I'd be very happy to give you the job, but you see, I'm I'm looking for a mother and daughter. Oh, who... but I have a mother, Mr. Mulligan. And she used to be quite a well known actress until she gave it all up to support father. Uh, support him? <laughs> he can't get a job. But in times like these, a manpower shortage, I why I thought anybody could get a job. You see, Mr. Mulligan, our father drinks. He... <laughs> oh, I see. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I can't promise you the part, but bring your mother around, little girl. And if she looks as bad as you do, uh, <clears throat> I mean, not that you look so bad, but if uh, she looks like you, the job's in the bag. Oh, Mr. Mulligan, I'll never forget you for this. Neither will Mother when she hears about this. Oh, Mr. Mulligan, um, would you please not tell Mother anything we've told you about our, our condition, I mean? She likes to pretend we're, well, that we're not impoverished. Hates to take charity. She's so sensitive about it. Hmm. Oh, she's just a bundle of nerves about it. Okay, okay. Now, hurry along and get your mother. I'll, I'll have to rehearse you right away if you're going on tonight. We'll be right back. And, oh, Mr. Mulligan. Yes? You've made me so happy. I mean, well, just to think. We'll be able to eat again. Au revoir. Au revoir. Oh, the poor little kids. <laughs> What is it, Judy? I'm out in the kitchen. Oh, Mother, you'll never guess what's happened. You're going to have a career after all. Yeah, drop those potatoes and get out your false eyelashes. Yeah. What on earth are you two talking about? Mr. Mulligan, the director of Love in the Slums, wants you for a part. He's heard all about you. He's heard all about me. He must have seen you as Camille and Ashtabula. Mother, a couple of the members of the cast are sick, and he's replacing them with local people. Well, he's not replacing them with me, I assure you. But, Mother, it's the chance of a lifetime. And you did say you were sorry you had to give up a career to marry father. I said no such thing. Uh, sometimes, Judy, I think you should try to control your imagination. Judy, what are you wearing? I'm dressed for my part. Well, if anybody thinks I'd dress up like that just to act... Mother, no. you're going to break Mr. Mulligan's heart. Oh, and may I ask what you get out of this, Randolph? Ten percent. Oh, I thought so. Well, both of you can just run back and tell Mr. Mulligan that I have no intention of returning to the theater. I have to make some potato pancakes. But, Mother, if you don't come, Tootsie Whiteman's going to get the part. Oh, I'm glad to hear that little Tootsie and I are the same type. Oh, you don't understand. They want a mother and daughter. Mother, would you want Mrs. Whiteman to get your part? Oh, I don't care who... Uh, what did you say about Mrs. Whiteman? <laughs> I said she'll get the part if you don't take it uh, She will, will she? Yes But the man said he'd hold it open for you and me Well, Judy, I... Oh, I realize I'm being very silly But this is once when I'm going to get the best of Mrs. Whiteman Oh, Mother, you'll do it? How thrilling I'll run right upstairs and change Oh, no, Mother, don't do that Well, why not? You want me to look my best, don't you? Well, not exactly well, What do you mean, Randolph? Well, he means that... 
Uh, well, you won't have time to change. Oh, but Judy, you certainly don't want me to go in an apron. Oh, we have to hurry, Mother, before Mrs. Whiteman gets back. Oh, well, all right. But I cleaned the attic this morning. My hair's all messed up. I look a mess. Oh, Mother, you look beautiful. And besides, there's no time to change if you want to beat Mrs. Whiteman back to the theater. Oh, well, all right, dear. Ah, oh, women, women. <laughs> Mrs. Foster, I'm indeed happy to meet you. Uh, won't you sit down? Oh, thank you, Mr. Mulligan. My uh, daughter here tells me that you have a part for me in your play. Well, in uh, <clears throat> looking you over, I think I have. I, I understand that in more fortunate times, you too were of the theater. Well, yes, I, I played in quite a number of productions, but I, I gave it all up. Yes, to... yes, Mrs. Foster, I, I know how precarious a living in the theater can be. Uh, <clears throat> and now about the part. There are... Uh, there aren't many lines, but would you care to read them for me? Oh, of course. Uh, would you mind telling me a little about the part? Well, no. Woman is poor, down and out, uh, forced to support her children. My, that sounds familiar. Uh, Mr. Mulligan, does this character have a husband? Uh, yes, yes, she does, but uh, he's a drunkard. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> who uh, lets his wife and children support him. <clears throat> I, uh... I think you'll have a natural feeling for the part. <laughs> I, uh, well, I just have to make a phone call, and then I'll be back, and we'll run over the script. Uh, we'll have a lot to do before the performance tonight. Of course, I understand. Oh, uh, Mrs. Foster. Yes? Would you like me to advance your salary to you? Advance it? Yes. Oh, oh that won't be necessary. Oh, now, now, don't be proud. It's perfectly all right. Go ahead and... Well, all right, if that's customary. You see, it's been so long since I had anything to do with the theater. I, I just don't know how to act anymore. Hello? Is it Whiteman? Yes. Uh, this is Mr. Mulligan from the Opera House. Oh, yes, Mr. Mulligan. I'm just getting to be ready and we'll be right down. Well, that's what I called you about. I, well, I just cast the parts. You did? Uh, you see, this poor woman came in and... Well, she needed the job desperately. Her little girl tells me at times they don't have enough to eat. Oh, I see. And I felt compelled to help them. Poor things. The husband drinks. I hope you understand. Oh, well, of course, under those circumstances. They seem to be quite desperate. Is that so? Well, uh, maybe I could do something to help them myself. How kind of you. You see, I desperately need a washwoman. Well, that's very nice. I'm sure the woman will be very grateful. Well, isn't this lucky? The fact is, I need a washwoman a lot more than I need the part in the play. Uh, we'll be back to listen in to the stage career of Judy and her mother. But first, ladies and gentlemen, here's your relief for acid indigestion. Here's your relief for those mean acid pains, that stinging heartburn, and that oppressive full feeling. Take Tums. Tums, spelled T-U-M-S, are made to order for the relief of acid indigestion. They quickly neutralize the excess acid in the stomach. They quickly relieve the feeling of pain and heartburn and heaviness. In a matter of seconds, your stomach is feeling serenely comfortable. Yes, Tums are swift in their relief, and they do it without the use of bicarbonate of soda or baking soda. Tums are entirely free from bicarbonate of soda. They do their work in another way entirely, in a way that you'll like and approve. Don't let acid indigestion spoil another hour for you. Carry Tums with you, and the first sign of any distress, put one or two in your mouth. Get Tums tonight at any drugstore, only ten cents a roll. And now, back to A Date with Judy. <laughs> Well, uh, Judy has pretended that she and her mother are extremely poverty-stricken in order to get a part in a play that's running at the opera house. Mother, of course, doesn't know what Judy has led the manager to believe. Now we pick up father just as he comes home from work. Oh? Anybody home? Only me, father. Oh, where is everybody? Everybody's acting. Acting? Yeah, father. Very shortly, you will be pointed out on the streets as the husband of that famous Dora Foster. Well, what are you talking about? Well, Mother and Judy are rehearsing Love in the Slums. Are you kidding? No. The two members of the cast got sick. Mother and Judy took over, and I'm cooking dinner. Well, I can't believe it. Judy, yes, but your mother... <laughs> you don't know the half of it. Well, it certainly is a new experience to have the women folk out earning a living for us. <laughs> well, Randolph, what say we go out someplace to dinner? Why, Father, you sound as if you don't care for my cooking. Well, 
I'm not going to take any chances on finding out if I care for it or not. I tell you what we do. Let's celebrate. We'll have dinner out and go to the theater afterwards. But, Father, I have a pan full of biscuits our boy Scott in the oven. They'll spoil. If they haven't already spoiled. Uh, go wash your face, son, and I'll call up the theater and order a box. A box? Well, sure. The best is none too good for the wealthy Foster family. <laughs> Time. Five minutes. Oh, I'm so excited. I hope I don't forget my line. Well, you have only two, Judy. I know, but what if I give the second line first and the first line second? Oh, calm down, calm down. You'll be fine. Well, that's all right for you to say. You've had experience, but me? Oh, jeepers. Tootsie, do you see who that is up there on the stage? It's Mrs. Foster. Please do not evict us, sir. No, please don't, sir. My mother will earn me money for the rent somehow. And Judy, too. Tootsie, can you believe it? So the Fosters got our paws. Oh, sir, not in the cold. I'll take in washing. Take in washing, take in washing. Tootsie, either Mrs. Foster pulled a fast one on, well, to get the part away from me, or Mr. Foster is a drunkard, and I never knew it. Well, the first act was wonderful, simply marvelous. Don't fall out of the box, Father. <laughs> well, I'm just leaning over to make sure your mother and sister hear my clapping. Father, was Mother's acting any better in Ashtabula? <laughs> Why, Randolph, what do you mean? I thought your mother was simply splendid tonight. The way she read that line, please do not evict us. Such feeling. I am now able to understand what the theater goers of Ashtabula went through a few decades ago. Oh, Don, if the applause has died down, I'm going to start it up again. Father, everybody's looking at you. Do huh? you realize that you're the only one clapping? Well, I'm the only one here related to two members of the cast. Well, Tootsie, it was a good show, wasn't it? Well. All except Mrs. Foster and Judy, whom I thought were terrible. Well, come on, let's go. All right, Mother. Tootsie. Look who's coming toward us and weaving like a fool, Mr. Forster. Hello, Mrs. Whiteburn. The way he's acting. Well, I think he does bring up all the money he makes. Yo, Mrs. Whiteburn. I'm just going to snub him. That's what I'm going to do, snub him. Well, how'd you like it, Mrs. Whiteburn? Melvin Forster, all I can say is that you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Huh? Making the women in your family work and slave to support you, while you, you carouse in boxes. Why, Mrs. Whiteman? Don't you, Mrs. Whiteman, me, you, you, you drunkard? <laughs> again. Oh, it seems a thousand years since I left the house this afternoon. Dora, I can't understand it. I simply can't understand it. The way Mrs. Whiteman spoke to me. Oh, probably just sheer jealousy, dear. <laughs> probably. But do you realize what that woman called me? She called me a, a drunkard. Now, who's that? Probably your bootlegger. <laughs> I'll answer it, Father, dear. Why, Mr. Mulligan. Good evening. Well, Mr. Mulligan, how nice of you to call on us. I don't believe you've met my husband, Mr. Foster. How do you do, Mr. Mulligan? How do you do? Great show tonight. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Mrs. Foster, I just thought I'd... Well, this package wasn't quite ready by the time you left the theater, so I thought I'd bring it over. A package for me, Mr. Mulligan? Yes, yes, this. Oh, how nice. Uh, mm, mighty nice house you have here. Of course we can't afford it. How sweet of you to bring me flowers. Oh, Oh, it's not flowers. No, no, it's just something the cast got together. Why, they're clothes. And here's a card. Well, read it, dear. For the courageous Mrs. Forster. Now, oh, isn't that sweet? I hope you won't mind, but these clothes still have some wear in them, and I thought you might use them for yourself and your little girl. Yours truly, the wardrobe mistress. <clears throat> a very generous woman, Mrs. Duval. But I don't understand. Well, I've got to be running along. Uh... Well, before I go, Mr. Foster, yeah. a word of advice. At one time, I, too, was what you might call, well, not quite a teetotaler. <laughs> <laughs> but I took the kitty cure, and it made a new man out of me. The kitty cure? Yes. Just four months in a sanitarium, and now I can honestly say I haven't touched a drop in 20 years. Well, so long. <laughs> well, but I haven't... Touched a drop in 20 years either. Uh, hardly. Never mind, Father. He's gone. Is everybody crazy? 
I don't get this at all. Well, I don't either. Now, these clothes he gave me, they're nearly worn out. Mrs. Whiteman, old clothes, and and now the, the kitty cure. Judy? Father, there's a slight something I ought to explain to you. I might have known. Well, Judy, talk fast. Well, in order to get the job for Mother and me, I found it necessary to imply that you... That you... Go on. Well, that you... Did I drink? (laughs) Judy, how could you do this to me? I'm sorry, Father, but I did it for the theater. Mother said she hated giving up her career. Why, I love giving up my career. There's nothing in the world I wanted so much as a home and a family. Oh, and now Mrs. Whiteman's probably spread it all over town. (laughs) Drunkards and paupers. Now, now, Father, don't be so mad at Judy. Young man, I... Now, Now, wait a minute, Father. After all, she could have said you were a dope fiend. Oh, for the love of heaven. Well, Judy certainly fixed things up this time. We'll see in a moment just how she straightens them out. In the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, uh, were you ever sitting in the movies and suffered a spell of acid indigestion? You know the misery you went through. If you didn't leave the theater altogether, you enjoyed very little of the show. Well, when you have Tums with you, you're always prepared for acid indigestion distress. All you need do is slip one or two Tums in your mouth. You don't have to go to any bother. You don't have to have any water. Just take one or two Tums as you would candy mints, and relief is yours. Tums quickly relieve the indigestion due to excess gastric acidity. Yes, they give prompt and decisive relief, and do it without the use of bicarbonate of soda. Tums contain no baking soda or bicarbonate of soda at all. Carry Tums with you as your first aid in case of acid indigestion distress. They're sold at all drug stores, ten cents a roll or three rolls for a quarter. Ask definitely for Tums for the Tummy, T-U-M-S. There are many imitations of Tums, but no substitute for them. And here's Judy again. I just explained everything to Mrs. Whiteman. I confessed all. You did? Well, what'd she say? That she was sorry she said such awful things about us to people, but that she'd go around among all her friends and make a retraction. She did? Oh, how wonderful. Mm-hmm. But she said not to worry if it took her a few weeks. She doesn't see how she'll be able to contact more than nine or ten people a day. <laughs> I want to wish over one million Girl Scouts in the United States a very happy birthday. This month, they're celebrating the 32nd year of that organization. From the youngest seven-year-old brownie to the most adult volunteer, the Girl Scouts are pledged to service for their country. They're doing a super job. So please, everybody, let's all back the Scouts. Date with Judy is written by Arlene Leslie and stars Louise Erickson and Dix Davis. The original music is composed and conducted by Tommy Peluso. The program produced and directed by Helen Mack. This is Art Baker inviting you to be with us again next Tuesday at the same time to keep your date with Judy, chaperoned by Tums, quick relief from acid indigestion. Get a roll tonight, only 10 cents at all drugstores. This is the National Broadcasting Company. KFI Los Angeles. T-U-M-S. Come. Tums, famous quick relief for acid indigestion, presents A Date with Judy. Hello? Hello, Judy. Yes, it is. Judy, do you think this is a good night for a date? Oh, I certainly do. It's the most scintillating night. The moon is out and... Oh, I think it's an utterly perfect night for a day. Oh, good. Then will you please give me Mitzi's telephone number? (laughs) 
That is Judy, folks. Judy Foster, the cutest date in town. And your date with her each Tuesday at the same time is arranged by the makers of... T-U-M-S! Tums! Tums, quick relief from acid indigestion. Well, now uh, let's see what's doing with the Fosters. Judy's 12-year-old brother, Randolph, is on his way home from school when suddenly he hears somebody calling. Randolph! Hey, Randolph, wait a minute. Okay, Donald, I'm waiting. Hello, Randolph. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, Donald. How are you? I... Don't answer that. I can see for myself. Oh, I'm fine, too. Uh, Randolph, do you think... Well, can I ask you something? Why, certainly, Donald. Just think of me as Mr. Anthony. Oh, thanks, Randolph. <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot. Do you think your sister... Uh, how is Judy, Randolph? Oh, she's fine. So are my mother and father. That's good. <laughs> uh... Randolph, do you think your sister would go out on a date with... Oh, gee, maybe I'd better forget the whole thing, maybe. Maybe. Well, so long, Donald. Nice seeing you. Oh, no, no, no. Wait, wait. Please, Randolph. Uh, do you think your sister would go out with me? Well, I don't know. I've got $2.35. <laughs> that ain't hay. We could go to a movie and, and then for a soda. Well, I imagine... Then we that... could go to Lulu's party. We could? Okay, I'll go with you. You will. <laughs> Oh, but, but, but I want Judy to go with me. Oh, oh, yeah, that's right. Too bad I almost had a date. <laughs> Why don't you call her and ask her? Mm, well, I'm afraid she might not go with me. Why not? What's wrong with you or your $2.35? Well, I'm not very handsome. Well, that's true, but it's not fatal. I'm not a very, <laughs> not a very good dancer. That could be fatal. Also, very often I, I don't know what to say to a girl. The vital things on a date with Judy is, are you a good listener? Oh, yes. I don't know what you're worried about. Frankly, I think you'll make the grade. You do? Mm-hmm. You ought to see some of the goons Judy goes out with. Oh, boy. <laughs> I feel much better. Am I glad I met you, Randolph? Oh, well, would you do me one more little favor, huh? Why, glad to. Just name it. Well, would you ask Judy if she'll go out with me? <laughs> Would you please pass me another chocolate eclair, Judy? Here, Father. Oh, Melvin, that's your third one. You'll be sick. Nonsense. I got the constitution of a horse. So then, Judy, this Donald asked me to find out whether you go out with him. Well, I don't know why he can't call me himself. Well, I just told you he's afraid he's funny looking. Well, I don't think he's funny looking. In fact, I think he's kind of nice looking, in a way. In what way? Maybe from the back. <laughs> oh, not very funny, Melvin. And don't forget, I knew you when you were that age, and you weren't the handsomest boy in the block. Well, I wasn't the funniest looking. <laughs> I don't know about that. Well, I can prove it. Remember your brother? <laughs> <laughs> Is that so? Well, it so happens that my brother was a very handsome boy. Then why did the kids on the block call him the monster? Because some nasty boys like you thought they were being cute. Judy, I think Donald's a very nice boy, and he isn't funny looking at all. Even if your father does think so. Oh, Dora, I never said he was funny looking. I just said... Well, what is it, Judy? Yes or no? Well, I haven't decided yet. I'll make up my mind when he calls. Well, it doesn't give you much time to make up your mind, does it? You might as well answer it. It's probably for you. Hello, Judy Foster speaking. Judy? Judy Foster? Uh, hello, Judy. Uh, hello. Hello. Who is this? Uh, this? Uh, this is, uh, uh... Oh, yes, this is Donald. You know, Donald. Oh, hello, Donald. Hello, Judy. I, uh, uh, how are you, Judy? I'm fine, Donald. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, Judy. Uh, I just, uh, uh, how's Randolph? He's fine. Well, that's good. Uh, how's your mother? She's fine. That's nice. Uh, how's your... He's fine, too. Oh. <laughs> hey, does he want a date or is he selling insurance? <laughs> well... I was just wondering, Judy. Yes, Donald? I wondered if you'd, uh, uh... Judy, how are you? Oh, no. Well, what are you doing tomorrow night? At night, I mean. Nothing. Well, that's good. I mean, neither am I. Oh, that's too bad. Yes. Judy, would you like... Well, do you think you would... Could I... And Judy, would you go out with me? I'd like to very much, Donald. You would? Well, what do you know? He did it. 
He hung up and he didn't say what time he'd call for me. Hello? I'll call for you at eight. Jeepers, he hung up again. <laughs> Goodbye, Judy. <laughs> Well, we'll hear more about Judy's amazing date in a moment. But uh, first, I have a question. Do you realize that acid indigestion makes an acid disposition? When those acid pains and that heartburn get going, you're not fit company for anyone. Now, here's how to relieve acid indigestion in a jiffy and sweeten your stomach and disposition at the same time. The moment you feel any sign of acid distress, just put one or two tums in your mouth. You can chew Tums or dissolve them in your mouth as you like. They're delicious and acid mints. Tums quickly relieve the situation. Yes, in a jiffy. Tums neutralize the excess acid and relieve heartburn and indigestion due to excess gastric acidity. My, you'll say, can this be true? Well, you probably have never experienced such speedy relief from the distress of acid indigestion as Tums give. Now, don't take our word for it. Give Tums a trial. See for yourself their amazing effectiveness. Get Tums for the tummy at any drugstore counter, only ten cents a roll. And now, back to A Date with Judy. Well, Donald finally got his date with Judy, and now it's Saturday night. And if you think getting the date was hard, well, let's see what the date itself is like. Mother, would you come here and zip my zipper, please? As soon as I find your pair of stockings is out of rum, dear. Do you want both shoes polished, Judy, or just one? Both. Please hurry, Donald. I'll be here and I won't be What's ready. What's going on around here? A cyclone? Oh, hello, dear. No, Judy's getting ready for a date. I'd rather have the cyclone. Oh, Father. <laughs> Randolph, hurry, Mother. May I borrow your fur piece? No, you may Please, not. please, everybody. I've had a very hard day today. I, I have a headache and I feel terrible. Oh, doggone it. Who is it? Uh, can I please speak to Judy Foster? Judy, it's for you. I can't answer just now, Father. I'm not dressed yet. Hello, Judy isn't dressed yet. Oh, She's indisposed. Jeepers. Temporarily or permanently? <laughs> oh, oh, temporarily, temporarily. Uh, is there any message? Yes, thank you. Would you be sure and tell Judy I'll be right over? Well, I'm certainly glad you called to tell her that. That's a very important message. I wouldn't have wanted her to miss it for the world. <laughs> That's what I thought, yeah. sir. Uh, thank you. You're quite welcome. Goodbye. He'll be right over. Who cares? Now, Melvin, be reasonable. The boy's just trying to make a good impression on Judy, that's all. Why doesn't he try to make a good impression on me? It certainly is nervous. Who's nervous? Not you, Father, darling. Oh. Look, all I'm asking for, Dora, is a little chance to relax and be just as sick as I feel like being. Is that asking too much? Now, Melvin, in a moment, Judy will be ready, and Donald will call for, and they'll be gone. Mm. Then you can have peace and quiet for the rest of the evening. Well, I certainly hope... <laughs> I'll be right there. Please, 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 I beg of you. Oh. What do you want? Hello? Hello? Hello, sir. Oh, it's you again. What world-shaking message do you have for Judy this time? Well, sir, this is very confidential. You see, my pants haven't come back from the pressers yet, and... Yeah? Well, I'm waiting for my pants, sir. I should hope so. <laughs> Oh, Judy! Judy, he's waiting for Oh, no, his... no, no, don't tell her that. I mean, uh, please don't tell her that, uh, sir. Well, make up your mind. Are you waiting for your pants, or aren't you? I am, sir. But that's not what I wanted to tell Judy. I... Oh, gee, could I please speak to her, sir? There is nothing I would like better. Judy! Judy! No, oh, now they got me yelling, too. Judy! What, Father? Would you please come down and talk to this boy? Would you do that little favor for your old father? Certainly, father. Oh, high heels. Why your mother let you wear them, I'll never know. Hello, Donna. What is it? Oh, Judy, uh, you see, Judy, uh, I sent my... Well, for a certain reason, Judy, I may be a little delayed. Would you mind meeting me in the lobby of the Bijou Theater? Well, of course not, Donald. But if you'd rather, I'd wait for oh, you. No, thanks, but the, the show starts at 8.13, and if I have to call for you, we'd better get there on time, because... Oh, I don't know when they'll come. When what'll come? But when my pa I mean, uh, uh, would you mind, Judy? I'll pay you back for the car for, of course. All right, Donald, I'll leave right now. Goodbye. Oh, goodbye, Judy. 
I'm meeting Donald in the lobby of the theater. Is that all right, Mother? Well, I suppose so. Smart boy, that Donald. A nickel saved is a nickel earned. That's not true, Randolph, and you know it. Anyway, he said he'd pay me back. Isn't it time for you to go yet? Melvin. All I meant was... Oh, that's was... all right, Father. I'm going. Good night, everybody. Good night, dear. Oh, Judy, buy a paper to read on the streetcar and add it to Donald's bill. Oh, good night, Randolph. Good night, good night. Thank goodness. Oh, beautiful quiet. What repose. And and I knew it was too good to be true. Who is it? As if I didn't know. This is Donald, sir. I didn't doubt it for a minute, sir. <laughs> well, what do you want this time? Have they came, sir? I'm so happy for you. Oh, Melvin, you better let me speak to him. You'll frighten him to death. Might interest you to know that he'll be wearing pants. <laughs> uh, hello, Donald. Uh, Judy left a moment ago. She did? Yes. Oh, gee, Mrs. Foster, can you get her back? What? Well, you see, I'm leaving right this minute, and, well, I'd like to call for her. To call for don't her? Don't let him come here. Oh, uh, well, uh, do, don't you think, Donald, it might be better to leave things as they are? Well, I think I should call for Judy, Mrs. Foster. My mother thinks so, too. Oh, well, all right, Donald, that's very nice of you. And your mother. I'll send Randolph out to bring her back. Goodbye. Randolph! Going, Mother. I missed Judy. You missed her? Yeah. I ran into that streetcar for five blocks, but I couldn't catch up with him. Oh, what a shame. And Donald's on his way over here. This is going to make it mighty inconvenient for him. How do you think it's making it for me? How do you feel, Father? How do I look? Putrid. That's how I feel. <laughs> oh, there's the doorbell. Here we go again. Please, Melvin, try to be pleasant to the boy. He's only trying to do the right thing. Well, he doesn't have to overdo it. He's young. I'll bet you two to one he asks us how we are. <laughs> Hello, Donald. Yeah, come right in. Well, I see your pants arrived. Uh, yes. Uh, good evening, Mr. and Mrs. Foster. How are you? <laughs> We've all had physical checkups recently. The doctor assures us we're in good shape. Uh, d don't bother sitting down, Donald. Judy's already on a streetcar whizzing to the bijou. She is. Yeah, that makes a nickel you owe her. Oh, huh? well, uh, uh, Judy will be waiting for you to be you, Donald. You'd better go. Yes, I, I think I'd better. Oh, well, good night, everybody. It's been very nice meeting you, I'm sure. There is a debatable subject if ever I heard one. Uh, uh, good night, Donald. <laughs> Have a nice time. Now maybe I can get some rest. Oh, what's the use? There's a conspiracy against oh, me. Melvin. Hello? Mother, this is Judy. Donald hasn't shown up yet. I can't understand oh, it. Oh, he was just here, Judy. He should be at the Bijou fairly soon. He was at our house. What for? Well, you see... Uh, well, uh, let's not go into that now, Judy. All you have to know is that he just went out the door this minute. Oh, Mother, can you get him back for me? I've got to talk to him. Oh, is it absolutely necessary? Oh, yes. Well, I'll try. Oh, Randolph! Okay, Mother, but I'm not going to chase a streetcar more than two blocks this time. <laughs> hey, Donald! Oh. Donald! Will this night never end? What is this? Judy's on the phone. She wants to talk to you. No, I'm coming. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. Foster. Good evening, good evening, good evening. We're <laughs> <laughs> just feeling fine, Donald. Here's the phone. Oh, thanks. Hello, Judy. Donald, what's keeping you? It's getting crowded here in the lobby. There'll be a line soon. Well, look, Judy... Why don't you buy yourself a ticket and go in now before it gets too crowded? Of course, I'll, I'll enumerate you. Oh. Oh, that's a good idea, Donald. I'll go in right now and save your seat. Goodbye. Goodbye, Judy. I'll see you in a little while. You hope. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Foster, I hope you'll be kind enough to excuse me. Don't waste a minute. We'll understand. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Oh, well, good night. You know, this date can cost Judy a fortune. <laughs> Yes, so far, Judy's date's been nothing but an expense. We'll hope things improve soon. In the meantime, may I ask, where is the man or woman who does not suffer from acid indigestion now and then? Well, now, here is what to do about it. Here's how to get relief in a jiffy without taking bicarbonate of soda. Just take Tums. Tums are guaranteed to contain no soda. Chew Tums or dissolve them in your mouth as you wish, as they're minty and delicious. Tums are a real relief for acid indigestion. They don't fool around. 
They quickly neutralize the excess acid in the stomach. They quickly relieve that acid pain, that heartburn, that full feeling. Yes, whether acid indigestion be due to unwise eating, excessive smoking, or nervous strain, Tums will give you the relief you seek. Just try Tums and see for yourself how effective they are. You'll be surprised and delighted. Get Tums for the tummy, T-U-M-S, at any drugstore counter. Ten cents a roll or three rolls for a quarter. And now, back to A Date with Judy. Well, Judy has a date with a young man named Donald. So far, it's caused a great deal of inconvenience to father, who has a headache. Let's see what happens now. Oh, this is more like it, Dora. I'm practically relaxed. Ah, oh, beautiful, peace, and quiet. No, 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 I had to open my big face. I knew it. I knew it couldn't last. Hello? Uh, hello, Mrs. Foster. And this is Donald. Did Judy call? Why, no, Donald. Isn't she with you? Oh, no, not exactly. You see, when I got to the theater, there was a big lion. The usher wouldn't believe me when I told her Judy was holding a seat for me. Donald, have you been waiting in line all this time? Yes, Mrs. Foster. But it's almost three hours since you got there. It was a very long line, Mrs. Foster. Oh, it must have been. Well, what I wanted to ask you, Mrs. Foster, was... If Judy calls, would you tell her to wait for me in the lobby? Donald! Donald! Where were you? I saved your seat, but you didn't come. Oh, the usher wouldn't let me. Was it a good picture? It was wonderful. It was. Did you? I thought it changed my ticket. I'll go see you tomorrow afternoon. Well, come on, let's go. Sure. Oh, Donald, I must have lost my gloves inside. You did? Oh, but, well, I'll go in and look for them, Judy. Okay. About the third row tennis. Oh. Well, I'll tell you what. You go over to the college ice cream parlor and hold a table before the crowd comes. I'll meet you there. All right, Donald, but hurry. I will. Oh, Usher, can I go in and look for a lost pair of gloves? If you have a ticket. Oh, here it was. <laughs> If that's that kid again, I'll... I wish Alexander Graham Bell had minded his own business. <laughs> you answer it, Dora. I don't trust myself. Hello? Hello, Mother. This is Judy. Do you know where Donald is? Yes, he called a little while ago to tell me to tell you he'd meet you in the lobby. Well, I met him there, but he went in to look for my gloves. You mean you've lost Donald again? That is the best news I've heard tonight. <laughs> If he calls, would you tell him I've been waiting and waiting at the college ice cream parlor? All right, dear, I will. Are you having a nice time? I don't know. So far, I haven't seen Donald for more than two minutes. <laughs> well, goodbye, Mother. Goodbye, dear. You know, Dora, I'm beginning to hear a ringing in my head. No, oh, there it goes again. Father, don't pull the telephone out of the wall. Why not? Well, I'll answer it, dear. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Foster. If Judy calls... Well, she's we... here, Donald. She's waiting for you at the ice cream parlor. Well, I know, but I'm having a little trouble finding her, her gloves. They've got about 800 of them in the lost and found, and I'm not sure which is hers. <laughs> M- Mrs. Foster, I wonder if one of you would mind coming down to help me pick out Judy. Oh, for heaven's sake. Just a minute, Donald. Randolph! Please, you. Here I come. Why can't that kid leave us alone for one minute? But, dear, he's just a victim of circumstances. Well, I'm getting out of here. I'm going to take a walk out in the nice, quiet streets, any place where I can. Oh. Hello, Donald. Yes? I just sent Randolph. He'll be there in a little while. Uh, uh, Mrs. Foster, the usher just... Well, the usher just showed me a pair with Judy's initials inside, so it won't be necessary to send Randolph. But Randolph's on his way. Huh? Oh, what a shame. Oh, Donald, you better wait until he gets there and tell him so he knows what's what. All right, Mrs. Foster, but I haven't seen Judy all evening so far. Oh, I forgot about that. Well, all right, Donald, I suppose you'd better go and meet Judy. <laughs> Donald! Donald, here I am at this table. Oh, hello, Judy. Well, here are your gloves. Have you ordered yet? Oh, sure. I finished already. I had a double scoop. Sinatra delight. Huh? Well, I guess now we've got to hurry or we won't get to Lulu's party before it ends. Well, I guess we don't have time for me to get anything. No, I guess not. Oh, did you enjoy it? Oh, yes. Here's the bill, Donald. Oh, that's right. The bill. Oh, Judy, I... Uh... 
I only have seven cents left. I must have spent the rest on phone calls. Judy, would you... Uh, of course, I'll remunerate you. But all I have is nine cents. Huh? Is that enough? I don't think so, Judy. Your bill is... <laughs> gee, 55 cents. Oh, yes. Barbara came in and I treated her to a banana split. Well, after all, I, I couldn't sit here all alone all the time, could I? Oh, of course not. But what'll we do? I don't know. Maybe you could run home and There's get... There's nobody the... home, Judy. Judy, could you call your house and, uh, uh, well, sort of ask your mother if she... Uh, well, of course, I'll remunerate her. Hello? Mother, I'm in terrible trouble. I... Judy? Judy, what's the matter? Hello? Hello, operator? Oh, dear... This is the operator. Oh, uh, operator, you cut me off. Please connect me. What is the number, please? Oh, I don't know. Please trace that call. I'm sorry, madam. I will connect you with the chief operator. Oh, but yes, please do immediately. Oh, for goodness sake. This is the chief operator. Oh, but I, I've just been disconnected. What is the number, please? I, I really don't know. Would you please trace the call for me? I'm sorry, madam. We only do that in emergencies. This, this is an emergency. Something's happened to my daughter, and I don't know where she is. Your daughter is missing. I'll connect you with the missing persons bureau. Oh, no, no. no this is with somebody. Somebody took her. Oh, please trace that call for me. I'll have to report this to police headquarters. Will do anything you like, only get me that number quickly. One moment, madam. Oh, won't you please hurry, though? Hello? Hello, 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 oh, operator! That call came from the college ice cream parlor at 143 Pinehurst Street. Yes, yes. The number is 139. 13, uh, thank you, thank you. Oh, 139. Oh, my. I don't... Oh, oh, I can't stand this. I'm going down there. <laughs> Donald, our phone still doesn't answer. Oh, well, let it go, I guess. I can't understand it. After we were disconnected, all we got was a busy signal, and now no one answers. Well, I'll talk to the manager, Judy. Maybe you'll let me pay him tomorrow. Uh, mister, are you the manager? Yeah. Uh, I wonder if, uh, it so happens, sir, that I, uh... Oh, another kid who just happened to run out of money, eh? But... Look, son, do you see that door over there? Yes, sir. Well, beyond that door is the kitchen. And in the kitchen are a lot of dishes and glasses. Dirty ones. Get in there and make them clean ones. Yes, sir. Judy, you better go over to Lulu. I'll meet you there when I'm through. Yes, Donald. Gee, this is the lonesomest date I ever had. Well, I'm back from my walk. Where is everybody? Dora! Dora! Again! Hello? Mr. Foster? Yeah, who is this? Police. Police? Mr. Foster, has the ransom note come yet? Ransom note? Now, listen, this is a practical joke. Uh, wait a minute, here's a note from my wife. Judy in terrible trouble, taking car to look for her, try not to worry, love Dora. Terrible trouble. Ransom note. Kidnapping. Oh, my gosh. Uh, stay right where you are. I'll be right over to the police station. <laughs> Finished. Can I go? All right, beat it. Thank you, sir. Donald? Donald! Mrs. Foster, oh, Donald. what are you Where doing here? What happened to her? What did she mean? She's in terrible trouble. And why aren't you with her? See, Mrs. Foster, I kind of ran out of money and he called you, but the operator disconnected us. So Judy went to Lulu's house to wait for me while I finished washing dishes. Oh, then Judy's all right. Uh -huh. And you were washing dishes. Oh, Donald. I don't think you'd better have a date with Judy again. No, Mrs. Foster? No, I couldn't stand it. I couldn't find Donald in the gloves room. Hey, where is everybody? Hello? Randolph, is Mother home? No, Father, where are you? In jail. In jail? <laughs> what did you do, murder Donald? Not yet, but I will as soon as I get out. <laughs> Randolph, Judy's been kidnapped. Kidnapped? Has the ransom note come yet? What are you talking about, Father? You're not stir-crazy so soon, are you? Stir-crazy? <laughs> now, look, Randolph, just do what I tell you. Listen. I took a cab to come here to find out what happened to Judy. Yeah. And in my rush, I forgot my wallet. So the cab driver thinks I'm trying to cheat him and he's having me held. <laughs> now, now look in the inside pocket of my blue striped suit and bring the wallet to me here at the police station. 
and Randolph. Hurry. Wow, what a night. Hello? Oh, Randolph. Judy's all right. Tell Father to ignore my note. Oh, I can't, Mother. He's in jail. In jail? <laughs> oh, Randolph, he didn't do anything desperate. No, Mother, he didn't take his wallet when he took a cab to the police station. Well, what did he go to the police station for? Well, he said it was something about a ransom note. A ransom note? Oh, Randolph, don't do anything, do you hear? Just don't do anything. I'll be right home. A ransom note? Oh, what next? Hello, Lulu. Gee, sorry I'm late. Well, you sure are late. Gee, it's a quiet party. I'm looking forward to seeing Judy. Oh, but Judy's gone home. She left a message for you, though. She said to tell you that you... Hey, Donald, what are you running away for? I thought you, Judy. Hey, good night, Lulu. Judy. Hey, Judy. Donald. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'll, uh, I'll take you home, Judy. But I am home, Donald. Here's my door. Oh, well, good night, Judy. Good night, Donald. Judy? Yes? I've had a wonderful time. Yes, quite an exciting evening. Now, I have a message for you, friend. If you want to be at your best, look out for acid stomach or acid indigestion. Acid indigestion can't only cause you a great deal of discomfort, but it can affect your looks, your disposition, and your efficiency. What you want to do if you're at all subject to acid indigestion is carry Tums with you all the time. Tums take up no more room in your pocket than a pen knife or a lipstick, and yet they're always ready relief for the indigestion due to excess gastric acidity. All you have to do when you feel any sign of acid indigestion is slip one or two Tums in your mouth, and almost instantly you have relief. Yes, in a jiffy, Tums neutralize the excess acid in the stomach and relieve the acid pains and the heartburn. And what's more, Tums are guaranteed to contain no soda whatever. Always convenient, always effective, always pleasant to take, Tums are indeed your first aid for the distress of acid indigestion. Get Tums and try them out. They cost only ten cents a roll or a three-roll package for a quarter. Demand Tums for the tummy. T-U-M-S, Tums. There are many imitations of Tums, but no substitute for them. Well, uh, here are the Fosters again. Hello, everybody. Well. 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 Well, did you have a nice, quiet evening? <laughs> Personally, I had the dullest evening I ever spent. <laughs> Mother, look, Father's turning purple. <laughs> A Date with Judy is written by Arlene Leslie and stars Louise Erickson and Dix Davis. Original music is composed and conducted by Tommy Peluso. The program was produced and directed by Helen Mack. This is Art Baker inviting you to be with us again next Tuesday at the same time to keep your date with Judy. Chaperone by... T-U-M-S. Tum. Tum. Quick relief for acid indigestion. Get a roll tonight. Only ten cents at all drugstores. This is the National Broadcasting Company. 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 The Pepsodent Show, presenting A Date with Judy. Tuesday night. Quiet. Nothing. Oh, swell. Uh, can I have a date with you? Oh, of course. Sure, you certainly can. Uh, who is this? Uh-huh, you've got a date with Judy, chaperoned by Pepsodent. You'll meet Judy in just a moment, but right now let me tell you about another date you have. 
a date down at your corner store to get some Pepsid and tooth powder. And that's an important date, for it'll mark the beginning of a brighter smile than you've ever had before. And lots of brighter dates, too. For you see, Pepsodent with Irium contains the patented polishing agent, composite metaphosphate, that not only makes your teeth feel so clean, but also makes your teeth look so bright. And Pepsodent's the only tooth powder in the world that contains this marvelous ingredient. So remember your date at the corner store. Get a package of Pepsodent tooth powder tonight. And now, flick back your hair and straighten your tie. You have a date with Judy. The town Judy Foster lives in is not small and not large. But if Judy were to take the census, she'd count only the men. With Judy, there are always too few, or too many as the case may be. Right now, there's one too many in the Foster living room, a creature named Herbert. And about Herbert, Judy has this to say. Mother dear, he's about the droopiest dick I've ever been the cause of sitting on our sofa. And I've been the cause of some two positively droopy it sitting on our sofa. Mother darling, would you please, as a special favor, go downstairs and be simply precious to him? Me? Be precious to him, Judy? Yes, on account of it's very discouraging to boys to have a girl's family popping around and being sweet. Now, if you go down to the awfully nice room, it'll discourage him and he'll go home. I'm not very flattered about the way you want to use my charms, Judy. But if I go out with him, somebody will see me with him. Oh, please help me, Mother. And are you sure it would work? I might go downstairs and be sweet to him, and he'd simply love it. And he'd come every evening after that just to see me. Mother, you're 38 years old. Well, I'm still rather glamorous, though. Father says so time and time again. Oh, Father. Really, Mother, I think it's very undignified to speak of luring Herbert in that undignified manner. At your age. I'm rather well-preserved. At least, uh, rigor mortis hasn't set in yet. Hey, Judy, you better come downstairs and collect this item of yours named Herbert. He's been plopped there since... Randolph, will you please remember that you're only 10 and stop acting like you're 11? Well, you better get him out of there. Father can't stand it anymore. He's turning green. Who? Herbert? No, Father. I should have thought it would have been Herbert. Knowing you and your father as I do. This is the first time I didn't care how Father and Randolph reacted on one of my men. But if you're suffering so, Randolph, you know you don't have to stay in the power if you don't want to. There are other rooms in the house. I can't drag myself away. I'm held spellbound. I'm like one bewitched. Oh, the horror of it all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what have you been reading now? Your collection of guys fascinates me, Judy. You always think there can't be a ghoulier one than there is. Mother, will you please make Randolph stop analyzing everything? Stop analyzing everything, Randolph. Go downstairs, dear. The heroic women of your family will follow. Okie dokie. This may curl the braces on my teeth, but I'll go downstairs and take one more whack at it. Judy, let me get this all straight. Where did you meet this boy? Oh, I never met him. I never saw him before in my life. Well, I'm sort of ignorant about these things, dear. You never saw him... How do you happen to have a date with him tonight? Well, that's on account of Gertie's sister, Wayne. You see, she wrote me this man was coming to town. This so... man? Herbert. Oh, he's a man. Well, of course he is, Mother. He's 18. Oh. So he phoned me, and on account of Gertie recommending him, I gave him a date tonight. Well, things are beginning to get a little clearer now. All except one thing. You haven't ever seen him. How do you know he looks so awful? Oh, I saw him. Well, now everything's all mixed up again. When did you see him? Just now, I sneak downstairs and peek. And Mother, he's icky, but too positively. Mother! Yes, dear, I'm right here. Suddenly, I see the whole grisly plot. It's Gertie Sissonway, because I took a date away from her up at the lake last summer. And now she's getting even with me, sticking this hermit on me. Well, I bet she's been looking around for months to find something awful enough to stick on me. And finally, she found Herbert. And now we have to get rid of him. Well, we, um... We could stay up here and let Father and Randolph take their natural course. No, Mother, that would be cheating. All right. We'll go downstairs together. And working cheek by jowl, maybe we can pry the ick off the sofa. Don't forget to get him to work. I will. But what sort of work, I won't say till I see him. I may go for it. Mother! Judy, is that you, finally? Yes, it's me, Father. I mean, I. Uh, how do you do? I suppose you're Herbert Tompkins, I presume. Well, Father isn't Herbert Tompkins, and I'm not, so I guess you hit it right on the nose. Randolph, please. How do you do, Herbert? I'm Judy. How do you do? 
this is Mr. Foster, my father. Yes, I've been talking to Herbert. And this is my brother, Randolph. Yes, I've been listening to Herbert. <laughs> and this is Mrs. Foster, my mother. Oh, I'm so happy to know you, Herbert. Judy's told me so much about you. I Shall just... we all sit down? Uh, thank you. Nice evening, isn't it? Oh, lovely. <laughs> Beautiful for this time of year. Yes, it is. <laughs> where, uh, where did you say you were from, Herbert? Cleveland. Oh, Cleveland. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> Cleveland's a beautiful city. Yes, it is. <laughs> Let me see. Uh, who do I know from Cleveland? Uh, do you know the Dunlap? No, I don't. Oh. Well, I know some people there by the name of Spencer. Do you know them? Spencer? No, I don't. <laughs> you don't? <laughs> They're in the brewing business. I don't know. Uh, do, do you know the uh, Eldridges? Well, the name is awfully familiar. Yeah, Mr. Eldridge is in the canning line. He's a great salesman. You know, I, I don't know him. Uh, Herbert, uh, do you know the McSlap cabbages? The McSlap cabbages? Well, I know of them. Well, Mr. McSlap cabbage sells snowshoes. <laughs> oh, yes, I've heard of him. Well, isn't that lovely? Imagine you knowing the same people. Oh, this is a small world when you think Randolph, of... have you ever been to Cleveland? Has father, and he knows the Eldridges. Mother, will you please make Randolph stop making up people? Never... Randolph, your sister says to stop making up people. Never tell that to me directly sometime. Herbert, there's something important, vital, that I want... I'll never forget old Ed Eldridge. You know, one time father, he... Father, please. Huh? Herbert, oh. I feel simply dreadful about this. Because, you see, I'd absolutely forgotten about another engagement I had. But, gee, I had some tickets for the show. I'll go. Now, Randolph, nobody asked you. Oh, how lovely and thoughtful of you, Herbert, to have bought tickets for a show. So I'm terribly sorry, but I'm afraid it would be the most tactful thing for you to leave before this other person comes, on account of it might be very embarrassing for you to meet, on account of the most tactful thing when you... I'll uh, walk to the gate with you, Herbert. Thanks, Mrs. Foster. I'll make it up to you real soon. Honestly, I will. Oh, I think I hear a car driving up in front of the house. You better go through the side door, Herbert. Quick, this way. Well, good, good night, night Judy. Herbert. Good night. Good night. Mrs. Good night, Mrs. Good night. Oh, good night. Well, thank everything. He's gone. You, um, you didn't give me much chance to use my charm on him. Oh, is that what it was, charm? <laughs> Judy, did you really have another engagement for tonight? Of course not. <laughs> but wasn't I tactful, Mother? No, but it got rid of him. And I'm sure Father was helping, too. Uh, what did you talk to him about before we came downstairs, dear? Mm, hubcaps. Hubcaps? Automobile hubcaps. It was very dull. Oh, dear, a whole evening and I'm stuck without a date. Now I don't know what to do. You had a date? Oh, him. I certainly must be very unpopular not to have anybody phone me. If nobody does, what'll I do? I don't understand, girls. Who wants to? Oh, Mother, you answer. Because I don't want men to think I'm sitting by the telephone waiting for them to call. Well, you wouldn't want to give them a false impression like that. I should say not. Keep still, Randall. Hello? Yes. Yes, she is. Judy, it's for you. Is it a boy? Judy, I don't want you to take this too hard. I, I hate to break it to you, but it's a girl. Oh, no, dear. Hello? Hello, Judy. Uh, this is Gloria. Haven't you got a date either? No. Look, it's only 8 o'clock and a date can call any time up to 8.30. I always give up at 8.30, so maybe we ought to hold up the line. Well, you're positively right, Judy. But do you mind if I just say something quick? Somebody might be trying to get me on the phone right this minute. Well, just listen to this, Judy. There's a new man in town. I heard Bruce talking about him this afternoon. There he is. Yes. And from what I understand, he must be quite the something. They call him Tiger. Oh, a wolf? I imagine that's the idea. Anybody call Tiger, it'd be sort of, well, you know. <laughs> you sure would. Uh, you think we could get to him anyway? Oh, uh, the only person who knows him that I know is Ruth. Well, I'll give her a buzz and see if I can find out anything. Call me back if you hear anything. Uh, okie dokie, I will. Three, six, five, four. It, uh, it isn't 8.30 yet, dear. I know. But I'm sacrificing tonight for the future. Oh, how brave of you, dear. Hello? Hello, Ruth. This is Judy. Oh, haven't you got a date either? No. Well, would you mind calling me back about 8.30? Well, I just want to say this quick. I hear there's a new boy in town, a tiger somebody or other. I hear he's cute, and I understand you know somebody who knows him. Hello, Edith. This is Ruth. Ruth, 
Listen, I hear this new man in town, this tiger, is terribly cute. I understand you know somebody who knows him, and I'm not... Gloria, this is Eva. I hear this new man in town, tiger, is too positively glamorous. <laughs> Hello? Judy, this is Gloria. Listen, everybody is just simply raving about this tiger. Edith just calls me, and she says he's absolutely terrific. Yes, but where did you live or anything? Well, this is the funny part of it. You know your father's partner at his factory? Yes. Well, this tiger is the nephew of your father's partner. I hear he's been... Oh, uh, I've got to go now, Gloria. Goodbye. Father? Well, uh, were you addressing me? <laughs> Father, you know your partner at your factory? Yes, by some strange coincidence, I do. I met him first about 20 years ago when I was a traveling salesman, and he was... Father, this is important. I bet. Father, do you know your partner has a nephew? Well, I might have supposed your interest in my factory would turn out to be something like this. No, Judy, I did not know my partner had a nephew. Honestly, Father, you're never any help. I know, I'm a droopy hick. (laughs) If you don't know your partner's nephew, then you can't very well invite him here for dinner, can you? No, I can't. But you won't let this make any difference in our relationship, though, will you, Julie? You'll you'll still go on living in this house? Father, I do wish you'd reserve your hilarity for the proper occasion. Oh, this is not the proper occasion? Look, Father, couldn't you go to this partner of yours and say, Look, Pard, Randolph, I will thank you not to interrupt me when I'm speaking to Father. You could say you hear he has this nephew who's terrifically super... And you'd adore to have him come to dinner at your house. I can see Father adoring. Well, uh, the truth is I'd hate to lie to my partner like that. He never lies to me. What I could say is I hear he has this nephew who is terrifically super, and my daughter would adore to have him come to dinner at our house. As for me personally, I could say I couldn't think of anything I would adore less than having a terrifically super nephew to dinner. Me too. Mother, please make Father be serious. I am serious. There have been enough terrifically super nephews around this place without having any more of them. And a dinner, too. A man's house is his castle. He has a right to sit down to a meal unhampered by... Mother, say something to Father. Hello, Father. (laughs) I don't see why anybody in this house can't discuss matters seriously with a girl when a girl is seriously discussing matters. I don't see why... Father, maybe you could invite this young man to dinner. I'd kind of like to see this terrifically super young man, Tiger. I'm rather intrigued myself. Yeah, if I thought you were serious, Dora, I'd say you were just as man-crazy as Judy. Oh, I am serious. To tell the truth, I would adore to have this terrifically super nephew to dinner. I want to see what a boy called Tiger looks like. Very tigerish, I hope. With his dripping paws all over everybody. <laughs> you will do it, won't you, Father? All right, but I never heard of anything so disgusting in all my life. Seems to me Judy could be called Tiger. When I was a young man, girls didn't come after me with their with dripping paws. Oh, didn't they just? Oh, Father, you're a sugar puss. I think it's wonderful you to invite him. Just wonderful. I think I'll run upstairs and try a new polish on my nails. Is that the way girls always express themselves, by trying a new polish on their nails? Don't be drooly, Father. I just want to see if the series will go with my chartreuse. I'm going to wear my chartreuse gown Thursday night. What's Thursday night? That's the night you're going to invite Tiger to dinner for. So soon? Dora, do you understand, young girls? <laughs> yes, dear. Well, I don't. That's why I was able to hook you. I was never hooked. I married you of my own free will. (laughs) Yes, dear. Dora, what are you thinking about? About Tiger. Do you remember what you used to be called when you were a young man? Oh, what? Bear Cat. (laughs) Bear Cat Foster. So I was. Oh, you were terrifically super. Well, now let's see. It's the next afternoon, and Judy and friend Gloria are in a booth at Scully's drugstore, poring over fountain menus. Gee, I don't know what to order. I'd like one of these 30 cent super dupers, but I suppose I often always get sick when I eat a super duper. And besides, they cost 30 cents. I can't come over to your house Thursday night, Gloria. I didn't know you were supposed to come over to my house Thursday night. Should I order one of these super dupers or should I order a Coke? I thought in case you were expecting me over to your house Thursday night, I can't come. I wasn't expecting you. Listen to this, Judy. 
Lover's delight. Two scoops of maple walnut ice cream, marshmallow sauce, whipped cream, and maraschino cherries. I wouldn't be able to come over Thursday night because I'm going to be busy. Of course, I think the Hawaiian dream is even better. One banana half, two scoops of pineapple ice, hot fudge sauce, and ground pecan. I have a date Thursday night. That's good. Shall I take the Hawaiian dream? So the lover's delight has maraschino cherries. If the Hawaiian dream had maraschino cherries instead of old ground pecans, I... I have a date with Tiger Thursday night. Here's one called African Idol. Two scoops of chocolate... Judy! Did you say you have a date with Tiger? Yes. Yes, I do. Let me see the menu. Oh, but Judy, how simply terrific. Tiger, how on earth did you swing it? Well, he's sort of... Oh, this moonlight special sounds interesting. One peach half, two scoops of rainbow ice cream, maple syrup, top well, off with Judy, macaroon... Well, but what happened? How did he happen to call you? Did you meet him any place or what? Oh, possibly he saw me someplace and thought he'd give me a ring. I think I'll have a lover's delight if you can lend me three cents. I only have 27. Sure, but listen, how about Tiger? You mean he just saw you someplace and found out who you were and called you? Mm, I guess so. Oh, but that's the most romantic thing I ever... Oh, Judy, it's just luxurious. Oh, it's all right. It just happened, that's all. Yes, I think I'll have a lover's delight. Oh, I wish something like that had happened to me sometime. There must be something irresistible to men about you, Judy. Oh, it's nothing much. I Hello, just... witches. Oh. Hello, Randolph. What are you two blab, blab, blabbing about today? I and Curly were standing outside, and we saw you two through the window, blab, blab, blabbing. And I said to Curly, I bet they're blab, blab, blabbing about... Randolph. Oh, I have good news for you, Judy. Father just got word Tiger accepted his kind invitation to dinner on the evening of Thursday, June... Oh! Oh! Well, I guess that's all I know of interest to you. So long, Winches. Hello, Faye. Hello, Randolph. Well, girls, I'll take the order now. What's it going to be? Well, well, what's the matter? Did reading them super-dupers hypnotize you? I'll have a small Coke. I'm saying here. <laughs> was the most vicious and malicious thing anybody ever did. All I did was tell the truth. Well, you didn't have to tell it in front of my best girlfriend. Do I got to be careful who I tell the truth in front of? A girl can't even have a private life without her own brother telling every single thing she does. I didn't say you did anything. I said father invited him. What are you so sore about? What are you so piggledy-wiggledy about? Randolph, I wish you were draft age. <laughs> I bet I know. I bet you were filling Gloria full of poop about how Tiger's running after you instead of you running after him. And now you're all piggledy-wiggledy because Randolph, I... Randolph, just... will you please stop concerning yourself with my affairs? My goodness, all you do is investigate me like the FBI. Why can't you ever leave me alone? You're a very interesting psychological study. <laughs> That's a fine thing to say to your own sister. Suppose I told Mother you said I was a very interesting psychological study. She'd see the point. Really, Randolph, I've had entirely sufficient of this conversation with you. You can consider it ended. All right, so it's ended. It's completely at a close. If you're waiting for me to bust out into heart-rending sods, you can stop waiting. Just remember this, Randolph. If anyone asks you how it happens that Tiger's coming to dinner Thursday night, just say he phoned me. That's just what I'll say. For a girl as truthful as you, I'd do anything. Yep, that's just what I'll say. <laughs> You know, Curly, my sister's being pursued by some guy, Tiger. Ever hear of him? Sure. My sister, Ruth, she's been talking about him for a week. She's been trying to whip up a date with him. He phoned my sister, Judy. My sister, Ruth, she can't get a rise out of him. He's got a date with my sister, Judy, on Thursday. My sister, Ruth, she's been trying to angle one. She doesn't know him, though. Well, nobody knows him. He's a mystery man. To everybody but my sister, Judy, they're running a big fever for each other. Love, huh? <laughs> like nothing you ever saw outside of a movie. He pursues my sister Judy all over the place. My sister Ruth, she can't get a rise out of him. Oh, I guess my sister Judy's going to marry him. Yeah? Well, then, then he'll be your brother-in-law. Yeah. Imagine having a brother-in-law named Tiger. Oh, gosh. I got to tell that to Ruthie. She'll, be, she'll certainly get a kick out of this. I got to tell her right now. 
Listen to what I'm saying. You'll be interested in this, you will. You know I'm never interested in anything you say. Go away, Curly. Can't you see I'm giving myself a pedicure? Yeah, I can see. Wow! Have you got big feet? <laughs> will you please go away, Curly? Oh, keep dokey. If you aren't interested in anything about this wonderful tiger you're always talking about... Tiger? What about him? Oh, you wouldn't be interested in anything, I see. Oh. Besides, you got a pedicure on hand. No, on foot, I guess. Which do you like best? On hand what or on... about Tiger Curly? Hmm? Oh, Tiger. Hmm, nothing. Except that he's got a big romance on hand. Or do you like on foot? What do you mean, romance? Him and Randolph's sister, Judy. They're running a big fever! <laughs> This is Ruth. Guess what? You know who Judy Foster's running around with? Tiger. Yeah, and she never said a word to us. Gloria, this is Edith. Gloria, you'll never guess who's going steady with who. Judy and Tiger. Everybody says he's simply that way about it. She must have gone in on him before any of us had a way. <laughs> Hello? Hello, Judy. This is Gloria. Oh. Hello, Gloria. Judy, Randolph was wrong about what he said in Scully's yesterday, wasn't he? He was? Oh, he must have been. Because everybody in town is talking about you and Tiger. And the way he's pursuing you. They are? Yes. And I think it's just luxurious. Judy, are you... Are you engaged? Engaged? You mean to be married or something? Oh. Isn't it true? Well, uh... There isn't much in it. I, uh, well, I'm not exactly engaged. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. Forks on the left, teaspoons on the right. Mother, how do I look? Like a glamour puss. Well, here I am. Do I look like a glamour puss? Randall, I'm kind of worried about this polish, though. You think it goes all right with this shirt, Cruz? Do I have to wear a black tie and dinner coat? Mother, please don't let Father spoil everything. You know, if he gets into one of his usual moods... Oh, don't I... worry about him. I'm positive he'll be absolutely charming. When the time for it arrives... What time did you say he was coming, Father? For the fifth time, 6.30. I can hardly wait. Mother, please don't let Randall spoil everything. You know, if he acts like he usually does... Well, none of us are going to act like we usually do. We're all going to be polite to each other. And lovely to look at and gracious, even witty. None of us ever did that before. (laughs) Mother, please try and get your son not to make any of his habitual remarks this evening. Randolph, for your sister's sake, please don't make any of your habitual remarks this evening. What do you want me to do, sublimate my personality? (laughs) Here he goes again, analyzing everything. Mother, listen... What do you think of this to say to Tiger when he comes? At last. The mysterious Tiger. Are you really as mysterious as they say you are? Well, I, uh, I think it's fair. Are you sure I look all right? Yes, dear. I'm not sure. Mother, I don't know why you never discipline Randolph. He doesn't care what he says. He says practically anything. And if he says the wrong things in front of Tiger, I'll, I'll scream. Gee whiz, all this fuss about a goon named Tiger... My goodness, if we weren't having strawberry shortcake for dessert, I'd get sick right now. All this fuss about it. You see, Mother, that's what I mean. He'll just keep that up. Well, I'm ready. I haven't worn this dinner jacket since the Elks Convention. I feel like a stuffed pig. (laughs) Please, Father, be civilized tonight, won't you? Just this once. Dorothy, I have to let your daughter talk to me like that. Civilized just this once indeed. Oh, I wish everybody'd stop appealing to me to make everybody else stop doing everything. Can't anybody in this house ever stop anybody else by themselves? Oh, Mother, please don't get excited now. It's bad enough Father's all excited and Randolph will probably act like a boor. Oh, if only everybody calm down. Calm down, everybody. He's here. Tiger's here. And nobody gets excited. Everybody be absolutely themselves. I'm myself. I'll go to the door. Do I look all right? Do my nails look terrible with this chartreuse? Well, I guess I'll open the door. At last, the mysterious tiger. Are you really as mysterious as they say? Hello, Judy. (laughs) Herbert, what are you doing here? Well, this isn't the wrong night, is it? Because tonight was when I thought my uncle said for me to come. Your uncle? 
You aren't... You aren't Tiger, are you? That's what they call me. Why? No reason. I just... Hey, what's the matter with Judy? Her face is chartreuse. Well, when that Judy has a date, anything can happen. In fact, it very often Mr. does. Mr. Goodwin, I wonder if... Well, now, just a minute, Judy. Uh, before I talk to you, I want to introduce our audience to a young fellow who's having a little chat with his alter ego. You know, his other self? Listen. And the trouble with you, the boss says to me, the trouble with you is you're a sourpuss. You'll never be a star salesman till you learn to smile. Well, smile then, you chump. With teeth like mine? Dingy, dull teeth? What do you think I am? Well, that's an argument that can go on forever, but here's the solution. If you want a brighter smile, a more brilliant smile, then use the tooth powder that independent laboratory tests prove gives greater brilliance. And that tooth powder is Pepsodent tooth powder. For you see, Pepsodent's the only tooth powder in the world containing composite metaphosphate. That's why it has the power to produce a luster actually twice as bright as the average of all other leading brands. So, if you want a brighter smile, a cheerier smile, just say, as thousands say, Pepsodent Tooth Powder, please. Well, good night, Judy. Good night. I had a perfectly wonderful time. Oh, really, the pleasure was mine. I, I'm not doing anything next Tuesday night. In that case, it's a date. I think that would be simply super. Remember, you have a simply super date with Judy next Tuesday at the same time. A date with Judy, with Ann Gillis, Paul McGrath, and Margaret Brayton, is written by Aline Leslie and Jerry Schwartz. And the orchestra is directed by Wilbur Hatch. Now, mark this on your calendar, won't you? You have a date with Judy again next Tuesday. (laughs) Bill Goodwin speaking for Pepsodin. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Pepsodent Show, presenting A Date with Judy. Hello? Hello, Judy. Hello. Uh, Listen, I called you up to ask you a question, Judy. Do you believe that it's all right for a girl to have a date with two men at the same time? It sure is. Bring them both right over. Uh Uh-huh. We've got a date with Judy, chaperoned by Pepsodent. You know, one of the most charming characteristics of Judy is that honest, bewitching smile of hers. When Judy smiles, well, the boys just melt. And say, speaking of bewitching smiles, how's that smile of yours? If it isn't as bright and sparkling as you'd like it to be, then get high-polish Pepsodent Tooth Powder. For, you see, thanks to its exclusive ingredient, composite metaphosphate, Pepsodent Tooth Powder has the power to produce a luster on teeth twice as bright as the average of all other leading brands. So if your smile lacks sparkle and brilliance, if its bewitching power isn't all you think it should be, well, just say to the man behind the counter, Pepsodent Tooth Powder, please. And now smile that big Pepsodent smile. You have a date with Judy. No, that's not a whirlwind headed down Elm Street toward the foster home. It's Judy. And at the moment, she's pretty excited about something. Mother, where are you? I'm right here, dear, as usual. I don't travel much. Mother, we've got to do something about the house. Right away. About the house? What's wrong with the house? I mean the furniture and the rugs. Why? They look all right to me. Let me see. Now, we'll move back the furniture. Maybe take the sofa down to the basement. And, of course, we'll have to take up all the rugs. 
Whatever for? Well, for dancing, naturally. What did you think? Oh, I've given up thinking. About the orchestra. Well, we can be there in the corner by the piano. Now about food. Oh, do you think it'd be simpler just to call in the caterer? Oh, much simpler just to call in the caterer. For what? What would you say to lobster a la Newburg, shrimp aspic, hors d'oeuvres, French pastry, and punch? Well, I don't know what else is going on here, but I do know this. I'm getting hungry. Then what do you think I ought to wear? If I could only fix my chartreuse evening gown so that it'd stay up strapless and still stay up. <laughs> oh, Mother, I'm so bored with straps. Judy, I hate to barge into your boredom like this, but would you mind telling me what goes on here? Oh, it's all too simple, Mother. Not for me, it isn't. Oh, Mother, it's for the party. What party? The surprise party they're giving me tonight. Who's giving you? My friends. Everybody. I just found out. I was sitting in a booth at Scully's Drugstore having a super duper. Oh, and... now we're getting someplace. Well, you keep interrupting me. I was sitting in a booth and I heard them talking in the next booth. Heard who talking? Eleanor and some of the other girls. And I overheard they were giving me the surprise party tonight. Judy, I I'm just a mother and I don't know very much. But if your friends came here tonight and found French pastries and a caterer and, and an orchestra, wouldn't they suspect that the news about the surprise party had leaked out a little? Well, you could just say that... Well, you could say that you and Father felt like dancing a little. <laughs> and, um, uh, like eating 50 French pastries? Oh, Mother, that's ridiculous. Well, it seems to me if they find you in a strapless evening gown with orchestras and shrimp aspic all over the place... They think their surprise party wasn't surprising you very much. Mother, do you or do you not intend to cooperate? On account there isn't very much time to get everything done. Well, I'll cooperate to the extent of sandwiches and lemonade. All right, Mother. If a girl's own mother won't cooperate when a big surprise party is held in her honor, well, I'll just take care of things myself. That's what I'll do. Well, you don't need to go flying out of the house like that. Hmm. I guess the surprise is on me. <laughs> Judy, I don't feel like being dragged all the way downtown. Oh, I'm not dragging you, Randolph. I'm merely asking you to accompany me. On account of somebody has to accompany me where I'm going. Where are you going? To get things for the party. There'll be things to carry and stuff. That's me, the good old carrier. First, we have to go get an orchestra. What do you expect me to do? Carry home an orchestra? We are going to the hotel to inquire if Rudy Henderson is available to play at my party tonight. Rudy Henderson? He's got one of the biggest name bands in the country. You think he's going to play at your party? He opens tomorrow at the Bijou Theater, and if he's in town already, he'll probably have no place to play tonight. Should be very glad of an opportunity to play at a party. Oh, he'll be aching to. I can see him falling on your neck in gratitude. <laughs> well, this is going to be very interesting. I wonder how he'll say no. 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 No, you cannot see Mr. Henderson. But this is very important, vital. I'm Mr. Henderson's secretary. You can confide in me. Any number of young girls who wish to see Mr. Henderson do. This is purely a matter of business. It's about a job for Mr. Henderson. What's going on out here? Oh, Mr. Henderson. Yes? You are Mr. Henderson. <coughs> I knew you were out away from your pictures. Yes, well, what can I do for you? Well, Mr. Henderson, this is about a job. My friends are giving me a surprise party this evening, and I would like to hire you and your orchestra to play. A surprise party? On you? Yes. The name is Judy Foster, 715 Elm Street. Would you have your secretary take that down? Uh, I'd be glad to. However, perhaps it would be wise to discuss price at this time. Oh, yes, price. Well, what would it be? Well, my usual price is 750 an evening. 750? Gee, that's going to be kind of hard to scrape up. I could manage about five dollars, though. Uh, Miss Foster, this may be something of a shock. When I said seven fifty, I was referring to seven hundred and fifty dollars. Wow, seven hundred and fifty dollars, Mr. Henderson. That's it. Well, I uh, guess I won't be able to state that much up. Well, even if you, even if you came down to a mere five hundred dollars, you wouldn't be able to scrape it up. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Henderson. It was nice talking to you. Well, I guess I'll be going. Well, goodbye. What were you doing in that 
that telephone booth, Judy? Establishing squatters' rights? I call Harvey Lake and his high school hot lake. His orchestra isn't bad. As a matter of fact, it's as good as a big band. Any day of the week. Except Fridays when it plays for the school dances. I was able to hire him quite reasonably. For how much? For nothing. Yes, that was pretty reasonable. <laughs> he said he'd do it just for refreshments for him and his boys on account he'll have to take substitutes on a of some of his good players won't be able to play tonight. Some of his good players? Well, without them, I can understand. Hey, Judy, where are we going now? To the caterers. Where did you suppose? There'll be about 50 people, Mr. Newman. Now with lobster a la Newberg, shrimp, aspic, French pastry, and punch, how much would that be, Mr. Newman? Offhand, about... Uh, $120. Oh. Well, um, how much would it be if you left out the punch? Maybe, uh, $100. Oh. Well, how much, uh, if you left out the shrimp basket? Oh, say, $75. How much if you left out everything? <laughs> <laughs> how much you really got to spend, Judy? Well, I thought I could sort of get something for $2. Two dollars, hmm? Well, you've been a good customer of mine for a long time, Judy. There's never been a Saturday you didn't come in for an ice cream cone or a piece of licorice. Now, I'll tell you what. How would you like a nice wedding cake for two dollars? A wedding cake? Well, yesterday I spent the whole day making a beautiful wedding cake. And today what happens? The bride jilts the groom. Now, what am I going to do with my wedding cake? What, I ask you? Don't you ever eat any of your own cooking, Mr. Newman? <laughs> Jeepers, that would be wonderful of you, Mr. Newman. A whole wedding cake for two dollars. You could get married at the same time. The bride paid for it. I'm not losing any money on the deal. The two dollars is just for the delivery. Isn't that an awful lot of money, just for delivery? Well, you see, it's an awful big cake. Stands four feet high, diameter 30 inches. Maybe I'd better throw in something else on the deal. A little punch, maybe. Oh, that would be wonderful of you, Mr. Newman. Just wonderful. <laughs> Now, there's nothing else to do now but get a butler. A butler? Well, with an orchestra and a four-feet wedding cake and all, the least we could do is have a butler. How would it look with an orchestra and a four-feet wedding cake having mother serve? Mm, all right, I guess. It would be disgusting. I wonder where I can get a butler, Randolph. I don't know any butlers. I just run around with the hoi polloi. <laughs> if we could only get somebody like Mr. Van Twine. The guy used to play butler parts in the old stock company. He was such a wonderful butler. Randolph, why couldn't we get him? Mr. Van Twine, I mean. Are you bad? He's an actor, not a butler. He might be very glad of a chance to play a butler tonight at my party. Why, he hasn't had a part since, since the old stock company closed down. You fascinate me, Judy. What a mind. What a cranium. And hot ziggity, what a party that's going to be. <laughs> I came to you, Mr. Van Twine. I know it's asking a lot, asking you to play the part in our house instead of on the stage like you're accustomed the to. The lights go dim, the curtain rises. I enter carrying a silver tray. The doorbell rings, and I announce the Duke. There aren't going to be any Dukes there tonight. There'll be a lot of punks, though. <laughs> Randolph, would you do it, Mr. Van Twine? Why not? I shall wear my royal livery, the purple satin knee breeches, my gold. Would you require that I direct the silver service, madam? Why, yes, I guess so. Very good, madam. Oh, well, guess it's all arranged then. Very good, madam. Yes, isn't it? Well, just one thing more, my lady, if I may have the privilege of speaking my mind. Oh, sure, go right ahead. Would madam be good enough to address me as Jarvis? I was Jarvis in Alone at Last, which ran four weeks with the Bijou on popular demand. Okie dokie, Jarvis. Unless uh, Madam would prefer Simpson. I was Simpson in the Countess Laugh. However, that ran only two weeks. 
Oh, well, then I guess I'll say just. Very good, madam. Yes, isn't it? Well, um, thank you very much. I guess I'll be running along now. I'll be seeing you this evening. So long, Jarvis. Come on, Randolph. Very good, madam. Randolph, please. Boy, what a surprise this is going to be to those 50 droops who are giving you the surprise party. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, it begins to look as though Judy's surprise party is going to be really super. And if Judy has her way, it'll be the most elegant surprise party the town ever heard of. We'll hear more about that in just a minute. But right now, I'd like to tell you about a surprising friend of mine who conducts one of those early morning cheer-up programs. He's one of those characters who sounds like this when he goes on the air. Hello there, folks. Now's the time to greet each new day with a smile, a great big jolly friendly grin that reaches from ear to ear. Smile, folks. But smile. wouldn't his listeners be surprised if he said what he really thought? Smile my eye. Teeth like mine will just keep my great big jolly mouth shut. <laughs> so, you see, you never know. But the most surprising thing is that this jolly fella doesn't know that you have to do more than just talk about smiling. You have to do something about it. You have to make a smile register by making it sparkle and shine. You've got to polish up those dingy teeth. And that's just where Pepsodent High Polish Tooth Powder can help you. Pepsodent, and only Pepsodent, contains composite metaphosphate, the remarkably safe, effective polishing ingredient. Developed by Pepsodent, patented by Pepsodent, and scientific tests show it has the power to produce a luster on teeth twice as bright as the average of all other leading brands. That's why Pepsodent can do things for you that no other tooth powder can. So get a package of Pepsodent tooth powder tonight. Well, let's see. Uh, all the arrangements seem to have been made for the surprise party. Now an enthusiastic Judy rushes home, followed by a haggard Randolph. Mother! Mother! Oh, it's all arranged. Everything. It's all perfectly marvelous. What is? Everything. For the party tonight. We've got an orchestra and a wedding cake and a butler. Oh, isn't it all too thrilling? Much too thrilling. What did you say, Judy? A, a what? A butler? Yes. Jarvis. It's really Mr. Van Twine, but we're going to call him Jarvis. Oh, he's simply wonderful. Wait a minute. Go slow. I'm the excitable type. I, I haven't got a heart condition. That is not yet. But I may get one any minute. Now, have I got this straight? You've got a butler, and... And did you say something about a wedding cake? Yes, Mr. Newman got stuck with one, and we're getting it for two dollars. We've also got Harvey Lane as hungry sick. <laughs> Randolph, will you please go away while I talk to Mother? Very good, madam. I'm a little bewildered yet. Spent the afternoon making sandwiches and lemonade. Where do you see what's coming? Your sandwiches and lemonade won't stand a chance. Oh, I'd better run upstairs and take the straps off my evening gown. I think I know how to make it stay up strapless. Oh, you go ahead and fix dinner, Mother. I'll run right afterwards, and Father can move back to furniture and take up the rugs. Oh, if Father knew what was in store for him, I bet he'd hurry home in a hurry. Well, Randolph can help. Very good, madam. What? Oh, I'll answer it. I don't want you to exert yourself anymore, Judy, after all you've done this afternoon. You must be exhausted. Good heavens! What's this? That's Jarvis. Forgive me, madam. I thought it advisable to come early, inasmuch as I may be required to participate in the preparations. Oh, mother, isn't he marvelous? Why... Why, Mr. Van Twine, Jarvis, I... Mother. Well, why, Jarvis, this is, this is lovely of you, Mr. Van Twine. I... But the knee britches. It's in case the Duke comes. The du... Oh, I don't know what I'm doing. Would, uh, would anybody mind if I just sat down a moment? Very good, madam. <laughs> Mother, I think I hear Father coming up the front steps. Well, stay where you are, Master Randolph. I'm for Nancy. Very good, Jarvis. Good evening, sir. May I have your name, sir? Mm, what? Your name, sir. My name is Melvin Foster. What goes... Mr. In? Melvin Foster! 
Hey, what, what in blazes is this? Our butler, dear. Our what? Our butler. Did you say our butler? Yes, I said our butler. Startling, isn't it? Startling? Startling isn't the word. What's going on in this house? Judy's crowd is giving her a surprise party tonight. A surprise party? Yes. Surprise, isn't it? So now we've got a butler and an orchestra. Oh, that's the back door. Mr. Van Twat, I mean Jarvis, I wonder if you'd mind answering. All of us were a little too weak to make it to the kitchen. Mind you, mind you. Seldom required to answer the back door. In the purple livery, I seldom answer the back door. <laughs> Only in the crushed camellia did I ever answer the back door. Well, um, just suppose you imagine this is the crushed camellia. All of us were imagining so much this evening, we might Very have... good, madam. Did he say very good, madam? Yes, dear. You weren't imagining it. I never in all my life heard of anything like this. I come home after a hard day's work, and what happens? I'm announced. Well, I got there too late to stop it. I suppose we owe all this to that daughter of mine. Well, I don't understand, Judy. Sometimes I think she's a... a... She sure is. Yes, yeah, she sure is, Randolph. The thing that girl gets into. A button that. Isn't he that ham from the old stock company? He might hear you. He has a great deal of professional pride here. He takes his role very seriously. It's the cake, madam. Oh, it is. Well, come on, everybody. Let's go look at it. Well, for the love of heaven, who's getting married? Nobody is, but I wish Judy would. That'd be one way of getting her out of the house. Why, Grandor, that isn't a very respectful way to speak of your sister. Well, I wasn't serious. I really like having her around. There's never a dull moment. Dull moment? I should say not. Look at this thing. I'll bet it stands three feet high. Four. Diameter, 30 inches. I'll be switched. I bet the surprise party is going to be surprised when they see the little bride and groom on top. Well, look over there on the table, Mother. Mr. Newman threw in punch and chicken salad, too. I can't stand it anymore. I, I really can't. It's too much for me. Let's sit down at the dinner table and have our dinner. I need sustenance. I need a good stiff drink. And Randolph, tell your sister if she's able to pull herself away from that strapless evening gown that we're going to have dinner now. Okay. You also want me to tell Father that after dinner he's going to have to move all the furniture and take up the rugs? Oh, me? I'll be danged if I will. <laughs> think you'd be willing to leave the piano where it is. It's got to be over there, Father, because on this side of the room there isn't room enough for the orchestra. Oh, hurry, Father. Everybody will be coming soon. Should I stand over here against the fireplace when they get here, or should I sort of drape myself over the piano? I wish you'd sort of drape yourself over my knee. <laughs> Mr. Randolph Foster. There I am again. Randolph, will you please stop running in and out of the house all the time? You're wearing out my butler. Nobody cares about wearing me out. Should I stand over here like this when they come? Or do you think maybe I ought to go upstairs and come down all surprised? Well, wherever you are, dear, I know you're going to be very surprised. Oh, I bet that's them. I bet that's everybody. Where I stand? Do I look hard? Calm down. I peeked out of the window. It's only the orchestra. Hey, are we going to hear a job of announcing now? Mr. Harvey Lane! Mr. Skinny Slocum. Mr. Fatso Webster. Mr. Jojo Duran. Mr. Oogie Schutzhammer. <laughs> Mr. Panty Waste Banks. Well, I guess they're here. Hello, boys. Hello. Well, I guess we're all ready for you. Well, there's something I'd like to explain to you, Judy. Yes, Harvey? It's about the band. I had a little trouble. My clarinet player is out of town, and I had to get a substitute. Oh, well, that's all right if he's any good. Well, he's had six lessons. <laughs> and my piano player, I had a little trouble with him, too. He had a date tonight with the dame. He's been trying to date up for months, and he wouldn't break it. But I got another guy who's pretty fair. 
And about my trumpet player, he fell down and broke a valve. Did he get hurt? No, I mean on his trumpet. Oh. I also have got a new man at the saxophone. He isn't terribly hot, but he's got a brand new saxophone. That's nice. Oogie Schlotzhammer is one of my regular men, though. Oh, that's great. Unfortunately, his sister kicked his drum in yesterday. Well, I guess that about covers everything. Except, I guess I, I didn't manage to get a violin player at all. Well, anyhow, he'll be good. Well, I, well, you have nothing to worry about, Judy. I'll be at the baton. You won't have a thing to worry about. Oh, that's them. Oh, I mean they. That's everybody. Should I run upstairs and come down all surprised? Or should I be sitting on the divan? Or should I be leaning sort of languorously against the piano? Mr. Rudy Henderson. <gasps> Mr. Rudy Henderson? Good evening, Miss Foster. I found that the boys and I could make it out for all tonight. Well, gee, that's wonderful, but $750. Oh, forget about the money. As a matter of fact, we need a little practice. Oh, ah, I see you have a band. Well, uh, yes, but we'll step down for you, Mr. Henderson. Oh, we'll be fine then. Shall I have my boys come in? How many of them are there? 25. Why? Well, nothing, except if you hold on, you'll hear something very funny. <laughs> Uh, if that butler announces every one of those 25 oh, men... I... I'll, I'll call him off. Uh, Mr. Van Twine, Jarvis, I mean, you won't need to bother announcing the members of the orchestra. Very good. Oh, Mr. Henderson, I guess I ought to introduce my parents or something. This is my mother, Mrs. Foster. How do you do? How do you do? And this is my father, Mr. Foster. How do you do? How do you do? Oh, isn't it wonderful? Wasn't it marvelous of Mr. Henderson to come? Oh, everything's so wonderful. We have a butler and a cake and chicken salad and everything. Now, Rudy Henderson's orchestra. Oh, it's all so marvelous. There's only one thing that worries me. When the orchestra sits down, where's there going to be any room for the party? See, it's getting late. I wonder why they don't come. Mother and father are having fun. Yes. They danced three dances together, haven't they? Gee, it's awful late. I wonder why they don't come. Oh, everything looks wonderful, doesn't it, Randall? Mr. Van Twine, and... should I sit under the fan or should I kind of drape myself around the piano? Oh, I'll answer it. Hold the second, boys. Maybe they've been held up or something. I thought this was a surprise party. Hello? Hello, who is this? Gloria? Oh, Gloria, I don't have any time to listen to any news right now. What? What did you say, Gloria? They're giving who a surprise party tonight? Ruth! Oh, but they can't be, Gloria. I was sitting in the drugstore and I heard them say they were giving this party for the cutest girl in town. Oh, uh, Gloria. This, this surprise party is full of more surprises than anything I ever heard of. But, Gloria... I thought they meant. They said, oh, what will I do now? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to eat a wedding cake. <laughs> What's wrong, dear? Aren't they coming? No, Mother. I've made a perfectly horrible mistake. Well, that's all right, dear. We're having fun. Fun? Boy, this is the best party I've ever been to. No people. <laughs> It's a wonderful party. Two of the prettiest girls in town are here tonight. Henderson. Gee. May I have the honor of the next dance with Judy? Oh, gee, Mr. Henderson, I, I think that would be just smooth. But who will lead your orchestra? Oh, I think Harvey will, if I ask him nicely. Will you, Harvey? Who am I? Oh, Oh, Mr. Henderson, you danced so much better than any of those icky boys who might have come. You know, I'm glad it turned out this way. Mr. Van Twine, I mean Jarvis. Yes, my lady? We're not at home to anyone. Very good, man. Mr. 
Goodwin. You know what I think is going to happen next week, don't you? Gee, I'm so excited. Well, now, now, just wait a minute, Judy. We'll talk about next week's date in a minute. But right now, I want to tell the folks about some date insurance. You know, ladies and gentlemen, the best insurance against a spoiled evening is to gargle for a few seconds with peps and antiseptic before you go out. It's your breath insurance because it makes your breath cleaner and sweeter. It gives, as a matter of fact, three times the safe breath protection because even when it's diluted with two parts of water, it's still an effective antiseptic. And incidentally, a real money saver because it goes three times as far. So before you go out this evening, stop a minute and think, is my breath sweet and fresh and clean? Will it stay fresh? If there's any doubt in your mind at all about those two questions, then gargle for a few seconds with Pepsin and Antiseptic, the finest breath protection we know of, and the best date insurance you can buy. Just go to the drug counter and say, Pepsin and Antiseptic, please. <laughs> Well, uh, good night, Judy. Good night. Uh, Judy. Yes? Uh, well, um, uh, what are you doing next Tuesday night? Why, nothing. Then, uh, how about a date? Oh, I think that would be positively priceless. Yes, you have a positively priceless date with Judy next Tuesday night. A date with Judy, with Ann Gillis, Paul McGrath, and Dix Davis, is written by Aline Leslie and Jerry Schwartz. Music is directed by Wilbur Hatch. See you on Judy's front porch next Tuesday night. Bill Goodwin speaking for Fabsida. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Pepsodent Show, presenting A Date with Judy. Hello? Judy? Why, hello. Judy, I I'd like to ask you for a date tonight. Of course, I don't have a big car like Ozzie Prindle, and I know I'm not as good-looking as Ozzie Prindle, and I don't have as much money as Ozzie Prindle, but could I have a date anyhow? Why, certainly, but uh, can I ask you one question? Sure, Judy. How can I get in touch with Ozzie Prindle? Uh-huh, you've got a date with Judy, chaperoned by Pepsodent. But first, here's a 30-second beauty hint entitled, How to Have a Gleaming Bright Smile to Go with Your Summer Coat of Tan. Just go to work on your teeth with high-polish Pepsodent tooth powder. But be sure it's Pepsodent. For in competition with all other leading brands of tooth powder, Pepsodent was found to produce a higher shine, a more beautiful luster on teeth than any other. Twice as bright as the average of all other leading brands. So there you are, for a gleaming smile that's twice as bright, then go to your drug counter and say, Pepsi and tooth powder, please. Well, it's a nice sunshiny morning in the town Judy Foster lives in, and her 10-year-old brother Randolph, one of Judy's major problems, is strolling down Main Street with his sidekick, Curly, when they encounter one of those man-on-the-street radio interviewers. Ah, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, sir. And now, ha, 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 look who we have here, two little gentlemen. Won't you step right up, young man? Sure, why not? Come on, Randolph. Uh, may I have your name? Show them your name, Stinky. My name's Sylvester Whiteman. Everybody calls me Curly, though. Except me, I call him Stinky. Ha, ha, ha! And what is your name, my little man? Randolph Foster. What's yours, my little man? <laughs> well, 
Well, that's uh, sort of reversing the procedure a little. <laughs> I'm smiling. <laughs> yes, smiling when Niles. <laughs> the sidewalk interviewer, and I'd like to ask you a few questions. Sure. Uh, do you gentlemen go to school? In the summertime, don't be a drip. We're a newspaper man. Really? What newspaper? It's the Tri Monthly Tri Boy Tribune. I'm editor in chief. That's only because his father owns the mimeograph machine. And uh, what's your official position? Me, I'm sports editor. And society editor. Do I have to get that society stuff? You sure do. But I don't want to. I'm a sports editor type. You either get the society news or you're fired, Randolph. Oh, oh thanks. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, this is Smiling Wind Niles, ladies and gentlemen. Your old sidewalk interviewer. Now run along, boys. There run, isn't run along. any justice. Muse covers the He-Man versus Superman baseball game. Me, the sports editor deluxe. Who's editor-in-chief of this outfit? Now, Randolph Stinky, please, we're on the air. Who wants to be a society editor? <laughs> Just a minute, boys, a minute. The table was tastefully decorated in green and pews. Oh, please, please. Festoons of stinkweed made the nuptial bower a veritable garden. Boy. <laughs> phone calls for me this morning? This morning, Judy? Do you mean to tell me you know anyone who gets up before noon during summer vacation? I mean this date I had last night. He said he wouldn't sleep all night. He promised, Judy? Oh, he's utterly feverish about me. He said my eyelashes were luscious. He just said everything. Oh, he poured on the roses. And now, just like any old lug, he sleeps all night through and doesn't call you in the morning. Man, man. He said he was going to rush me every moment of the day and night. Mother, will you please stop sorting the dirty wash while I'm confiding in you? And here it is, half past eleven. Don't you think he's an ick for not having phoned? He's a villain. Mother, I wish you wouldn't tear up Father's shorts and a dish rag while I'm talking to you. Oh, look at that. I don't know where that man gets so many holes in his underwear. It's not from doing the rumba. But... Ho, ho, ho! This is smiling Randolph Foster, your old society editor. Why, Randolph... Mother, have you been to any shindigs lately? Shindigs, Randolph. What sort of shindig? Oh, society stuff. Weddings, teas, receptions, hen parties, anything you've got. Randolph, I was talking to Mother. Well, you don't have a monopoly. Mother, <laughs> how about it? Haven't you been any place lately? Well, uh, one night last week your father and I went bowling, and uh, one night we went to a weenie roast. Socially, Mother, you're a total loss. <laughs> well, if you hear of any social items, let me know. I will, dear. Why don't you ask Mrs. Sluttammer next door if she has any items? She always knows everything that goes on in this neighborhood. Okay, but if you happen to be presented at court or anything before my deadline, let me in on it. Ho, 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 Mrs. Sluttammer, this is smiling Randolph Foster, your old society editor. <laughs> He's a dreadful drain on my vitality. Oh, is he? I personally am very fond of him. Oh, that's it. I'll answer it, Mother. It's my last night's date. I knew he wouldn't be able to sleep. Hello? Oh, hello. Yes, yes, she is. Mother, it's for you. Oh, for me? Is it a girl or a man? Or am I quoting you, dear? It's a man. Well, I hope it's a sugar puss. And not the garage mechanic telling me we need a new battery. Hello? Who? Sydney. Not Sydney Holland? Whatever are you doing in town after all these years? Me. Oh, this is a surprise, hearing your voice again. But do you know I recognized it almost immediately? No, really, I did. Why, how could I forget you? Your image is engraved indelibly upon my heart. Uh, tell me what you're doing here. Do you hear a clicking sound in the wire, Mother? It usually clicks when somebody's trying to get us. Oh, how exciting. Of course I'm interested, Sydney. How could I help but be? I'll tell you what, Sydney, I won't say a word to my husband. The hotel? Today? Well, oh, Sydney, I'd adore it, but I, I've so many things to do. Well, all right, I'll just drop everything. I'll meet you there at one o'clock. Goodbye. Who is that? Mm, an old bow of mine. Turned out to be a sugar puss after all. Well, I've got to hurry and get these things together and go. Where are you going? I have a rendezvous. Your old mother has a rendezvous, Judy. Isn't that luscious? Did you know him before you knew father? I did. He was utterly feverish about me. He didn't sleep all night for nights and nights. Mother! Well, you... You sound shocked, dear. Well, I should think you'd have some loyalty for Father. Oh, I do, of course. 
But I always say a sugar puss is a sugar puss. Is he handsome? Sidney? Oh, there's glamour written all over his sugar puss. <laughs> I, um, I have a picture of him I might show you sometime. In a football uniform. Very collegiate. As the, the quaint old phrase went in my day. You haven't kept a picture of him all these eons. Oh, yes, all these eons. <laughs> Dear, why don't you um, scram in a quiet way? I'm terribly busy. I see. Well, I wouldn't dream of being in your way. Perhaps you'd like me to get out of the house completely. Well, of course not, dear. I just... I'll have... go over to Gloria's. She doesn't mind having me around. My, how sensitive we are today. Let me see. Eight sheets, 12 pillowcases, 17 bath towels. Oh, and I was keeping that laundry. Four wash rags, six napkins, 11 face towels. Hello? Oh, hello, Woody. Has Petunia left yet? Just left, eh? Well, I'm afraid I can't wait for her. I guess you'll know what to do about stretching the curtains. I'll leave a note. Thank you, Woody. Where was I now? Five dish towels, eight telephones. Oh, I'll never get away. Hello? Oh, hello, Mrs. Cambridge. Oh, those old clothes for the club rummage sale. I have them already, but I have an appointment. In... Oh, your house? Yes, I could drop them off there. I'll just stick them in a suitcase and leave them with you. That'll be fine. Oh, I'm an ick to have forgotten. Ick, Mrs. Cambridge. I-C-K. Mother, mother, anyone home? Isn't anybody home? Ho, ho, ho! Smiling Randolph Foster's home. If you consider that anybody, and there are sometimes I think you don't. Where's mother? I don't know. Oh, I remember. She had a date at a hotel with a glamorous man. Mother did? At a hotel? Yes. How long is she going to stay? Well, how should I know? She had a pretty big suitcase with her. <laughs> a suitcase, Randolph? Oh, Randolph. She's eloped. Oh, mother? You mean with a man? Oh, Randolph. How are we going to break the news to father? <laughs> Well, imagine seeing you two here at my factory. Not only my son, but my daughter. This is indeed a surprise. Wait here in my office just a minute, you two. I have to go tell my stenographer something. Be right back. Let me do the talking, Randolph. I'm more tactful. I think this is a bunch of bunk, Judy. I've always trusted Mother. You wouldn't talk that way if you'd heard her raving about this man this morning. Why, from the moment she heard his voice, she was a dead pigeon. He lured her right over the telephone. I bet all he, all he lured her into was buying a vacuum cleaner. Poor father. He'll be utterly stricken. Oh, here he comes. Brace yourself, Randolph. I'm braced. All right, kids. I'm free now. Tell me what's on your minds and how much it's going to cost me. Father. Father, there's something we've got to tell you. Hmm? But before we say anything, there's something you have to promise us. All right, I'm in a good humor. I want you to promise you won't shoot anybody. Shoot anybody? With a gun. At first it'll be difficult, but later on when you become rational, you'll thank me for making you refrain from taking another's life. Hey, what is this? Father, prepare yourself for a terrific shock. I wish I could spare you. If only for a few more hours of happiness. Judy, you've spared me long enough. I haven't got a few hours to be spared. <laughs> I've got a sales meeting in a little while, so stop sparing me any longer and tell me quick. It's about, well, it's about somebody very near and dear to you. For the love of heaven, I don't want to play guessing games. Who's sick? Come on, let me have it. Well, nobody's sick at all, Father. It isn't a question of illness. It's something else entirely. Judy, Father. if you don't... Mother eloped with another man. What? <laughs> oh, Randolph, how could you say such a thing before I prepared Father properly? Oh, Father, I feel dreadful. I meant to break it to you gradually. I wanted what to... What Sam Hill are you prattling about? Did you come down here to tell me a fish story like this? Your mother would no sooner elope with another man than I would. Well, I couldn't see you eloping with another man. <laughs> I've been telling Judy that it's this is... It's true, Father. I heard her personally on the telephone saying she'd meet him at a hotel. And then she went off with a suitcase. And... Well, these uh, 
probably a wholesale furrier, and she's meeting a man who... Why, she was saying the other day she wished she could get a fur wholesale. A suitcase, Father. Well, she's probably carrying her knitting in it. <laughs> Lord only knows what women are likely to carry their knitting in these days. I'm sorry, Father. But I personally heard her say he was glamorous. Can you stand this, darling? I heard her say she never could forget him, and that his image was engraved indelibly upon her heart. Indelibly upon her... Your mother doesn't talk that way. Not to you, Father. But she did to Sidney. Sidney? Sidney who? I can't remember his last name. I think it began with an H. Sidney Holland? Yes, Father. He's the man. So you knew about him. All these eons. Knew, knew what? That she cared. Cared, my eye, that fat fool from Ashtabula, Ohio. He's, he's got ears, ears that stick out like... A... Mother thinks he's handsome. Handsome? Sidney Holland? Flat feet, couldn't even get in the army in 1918. Well, Mother has a picture of him in a football uniform. Football? <laughs> That's a good one. I'd like to see Sidney play football. Up until now, I too thought Mother had gone to see a wholesale furrier carrying her knitting in a suitcase. But in view of your remarks about Mr. Holland, Father, ugly doubts are beginning to rear their fat heads with ears that stick out like... Be Sydney. quiet, Randall. <laughs> Father, I suggest you come home now and try to get some rest. I'll do the driving. Randolph and I will help you out to the car. I'll and... do no such thing. I'm staying right here. The whole thing's perfectly ridiculous. I don't believe a word of it. Your mother would no more look at Sidney Holland than Miss Henkel. I'm going home for the day. Break my appointment. Come on, children, we'll go home. I don't know why I'm doing this. Your mother's probably there baking a cake or something. Just lean on Randolph and me as you walk, Father. Well, you can always depend on one thing. When Judy gets going, things really happen. For example, that was Judy's idea of how to break a bit of news gently. We'll see the results of that gentle treatment in just a moment. But right now, here's a bit of news that doesn't need to be broken gently. It's about how to get double value in toothbrushes. You see, Pepsodent's 50 Tough Toothbrush is the only toothbrush in the world that gives you double cleansing power, double brushing power, and double the number of tufts in a modern small-type head. Now, obviously, you get double value... Because the Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush means cleansing power twice that of any other brush. Brushing power twice as efficient, and bristles that are springier, easier on your gums because there are twice as many tufts. Just go to your nearest drug counter tonight and ask for a Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush. When you get it home, break the seal at the end of the sanitary glass container. Remove the brush and throw the container away. Then you'll see why we say you get double value. Because the Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush feels different, has a more pleasant action in your mouth than any other brush you've ever used before. Do it tonight, will you? Well, let's see. The family thinks Mother has run off with Sidney Holland. Father has been reluctantly led home from the office by an overly sympathetic daughter. Here they all are, walking up the foster steps. Well, I'll show you she's home right now. Dora! Dora! It's hopeless, Father. The sooner you reconcile yourself to the fact that... Dora! She... Dora! That's funny. Maybe she's in the kitchen. Dora? No, she's not here. There's a note here on the kitchen table. A note? It must be Mother's farewell note. Let me see it. Had to leave. Get on as well as you can without me. Signed, Mrs. Foster. She didn't need to be that formal. <laughs> Well, she could hardly sign it mother any longer if she's no longer a mother to her. Now, could she sign it your loving wife if she's no longer... Oh, excuse me, Father. Maybe we ought to check if it's in her handwriting. I could put it under my microscope and check it with another specimen of her hand. Sidney Holland? He, he can't even swim. <laughs> he took your mother on a picnic once and the canoe tipped over. He blubbered in the water like an oversized whale. Father, you won't forget your promise, will you? About not tracking him down and shooting him, I mean. Sidney Holland? But when he was 23, his hair started falling out. They probably wouldn't give you the electric chair, but there will be a long jail term and additional disgrace and... What do you mean, additional? I mean everybody talking. 
When I think of what Mrs. Schlesheimer up next door alone will say when the news of Mother's elopement comes out. Excuse oh. me a minute, please. I have to go in the other room to make an important telephone call. Hello, Curly. Ha, ha, ha! This is smiling Randolph Foster. Have I got some hot news for the society page. Take this down, Curly. Mr. Melvin Foster of Elm Street announces the elopement of his wife, Dora, <laughs> to a Mr. Sidney Holland of Ashtabula, Ohio. That is all. <laughs> Gee, Gloria, I'm glad you dropped in. You're just in time to help me cook supper. What are you cooking supper for? Where's your mother? Oh, the most terrible thing has happened, Gloria. Now, this is absolutely confidential. So I want you to promise you won't say a thing about it until everybody else is talking about it anyhow, so it won't matter. I promise. <clears throat> Okie dokie. Well, mother has run off with another man. With another? <gasps> Honestly? Yes, it's dreadful. I'm too positively worried about father. He's utterly stricken. Jeepers. Jeepers, that's grand. I know. So you see what a responsibility I have. It's up to me to try to take Mother's place. I'm going to keep house for Father and cook his meals and make him as comfortable as I can and, and comfort him. And well, I'm just going to do everything to bring a little comfort into his poor, broken life. Jeepers. So that's why I'm cooking dinner. Look, Gloria, this fish was in the icebox. What'll I do with it? Gee, so raw. Uh, I know. Doesn't it look awful? Is it dead? Well, I... I think it's dead. It hasn't moved for five minutes. That's good. Because I wouldn't like to have to kill it. I wouldn't either. But I think we can go on the assumption it's dead. But then what do we do? I don't know. I think it has to be cooked. When we have fish for supper at home, it comes on the table all cooked. With a slice of lemon in its mouth. A slice of lemon? That's a good tip, Gloria. That's just what I'll do. I'll put a slice of lemon in its mouth. I'd cook it, too, if I were you. <laughs> well, all right. Gee, it certainly is going to be hard to take Mother's place now that she's run off with another man. Don't ever let anybody tell you it's easy for a girl whose mother has eloped. Aren't you going to have anything else for supper but fish? Well, I was going to make spaghetti, but it's all long and stiff and it won't fit in the pan. Maybe... <laughs> Maybe you need a longer pan. Well, there aren't any longer pans except the dish pan. Oh, it'd fit in that. Well, then use the dish pan. I think you have to put water in it, too. Well, hot or cold water? I don't know. Well, let's not take any chances. Let's make it half hot water and half cold water. <laughs> sort of mix them up a little bit. Well, thank everything. We'll have a good supper tonight. What a comfort that'll be to Father. Can't eat a bite of this. What'd you do to this fish? Cook it in soap suds? Really, Father, I was only the trying spaghetti to... spaghetti is very interesting, too. <laughs> if I shut my eyes and I never take the chance, I couldn't tell it from angleworms. <laughs> All it needs is big blue eyes. Randolph. Well, it tastes like angleworms. Did you ever taste an angleworm? I don't have to now. I've tasted the spaghetti. <laughs> For the love of heaven, what are these supposed to be, shoe buttons? They're peas, Father. I tried so hard. I worked my finger to the bone trying to make a good dinner for you, and all you do is talk about angleworms and shoe buttons. What I like is the expression on the fish's face. <laughs> sort of dejected. Yeah, well, you'd be dejected, too, if you went through what that fish has just gone through. <laughs> appreciation I get for trying to make a home for you and keep the family together and husband. Oh, I wish I knew where your mother was. Thanks ever so much, Mrs. Gray. It's so late. My family will think I've run off or something. I'm glad to do it, Mrs. Foster. Goodbye. Goodbye. 
Hammer, is that you? Uh, I can hardly see you over there in the window. Well, I saw you coming along the street, and I thought I'd say hello. So you've decided to come back, have you? <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, giving him up, haven't you? <laughs> well, believe me, Mrs. Foster, you've done the wise thing. Well, Mrs. Buttammer, I, I really don't understand what you... Oh, and I'm glad you decided to come back so soon. When I saw this item in the tri-monthly Triboy Tribune, I said to Mrs. Buttammer, I can't believe a woman like Dora Foster uh, would do what, it. Uh, what item do you mean? Oh, you probably haven't seen it. <laughs> well, it was just delivered on this street just a few minutes ago. I have it right here. I'll read it to you. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Melvin Foster of Elm Street announces the elopement of his wife, Dora, to oh. Mr. Sidney Thomas. <laughs> Dessert, that's what it is. I don't know what's so mysterious about it. I got it right out of the cookbook. It's called Floating Island. It floats all right. <laughs> Somebody just came in. Dora. Mother. It's Mother. Well. So, you decided to leave Mr. Holland and return to your unglamorous old husband, huh? You too, Melvin. Well, I, I never heard of anything like this in all my life. I just can't believe... Randolph. I have here a copy of the tri-monthly Tri-Boy Tribune. You yeah. <laughs> have? Mrs. Lutzhammer gave it to me. Mrs. Lutzhammer, of all people, the biggest gossip in town. Look at this. Mr. Melvin Foster of Elm Street announces the elopement of his wife. What? Let me see it. For the love of heaven. How could you do a thing like this to your father and me, Randall? Well, I guess I'm a newspaper man first and a family man second. <laughs> And you, Melvin Foster. Why, when I came in, you acted as though as though you thought I had a loan. Well, I the, the note and everything. The note? What note? It was on the kitchen table. Oh, I left that note for Petunia about stretching the curtains. Oh, was it for Petunia? Uh, well, how about the suitcase? The suitcase? Oh, I was just taking some old clothes to Mrs. Cambridge's for the rummage set. What's come over this family? I never... Melvin. Huh? If you really want to know what I was doing all this time, I was getting an order for your factory. What? Sidney Holland and his father have bought out a salmon canning factory, and they're going to need thousands of cans every month. I went down and had lunch with them both, and... Both? Both. I wanted to surprise you on what happened. I come up the street, and I'm told I've eloped with the... What's this on the table? Is this my fish? We had a hard time recognizing it, too. <laughs> Well, I was only doing my best, trying to take your place in the home and make things comfortable for Father. Oh, you, you poor, dear, noble child. <laughs> and you, all of you, you thought I'd run off with Sidney Holland. Sidney <laughs> 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 Holland! <laughs> with Sidney Holland, that fat fool. I never believed it for a moment. <laughs> sort of print a retro action. I know what we'll do. We'll put out an extra. Here's what we'll say. The tri-monthly Tri-Boy Tribune, which is to announce that Mrs. Melvin Foster, wife of Melvin Foster of Elm Street, did not elope with her old boyfriend, Sidney Holland of Ashtabula, Ohio. <laughs> Well, that unravels another set of complications in Judy's life. As to what happens next in her exciting young life, well, your guess is as good as mine. Oh, yes? Come in. Ha, ha, ha! Mr. Goodwin! Just the man I've been looking for. I have here in my suitcase some beautiful framed mottos for your wall. Ah, now here's a dandy. It says, ho, 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 you can win success and win it by a mile if you always stretch your face and smile, smile, smile. Ha, <laughs> ha! Beautiful, isn't it? Want one? Now, now, wait a minute. That's my department. Listen to this, my high-pressure motto merchant. 
One way to success is, as you say, to smile at people. But that's not going to do you any good unless your smile is attractive. And that means you've got to have better than just a halfway tooth powder that only cleans teeth. It means instead that you should choose one that not only cleans teeth, but one which actually makes teeth brighter than any other powder can. And that one is Pepsodent Tooth Powder. For independent laboratory tests prove beyond doubt that Pepsodent Tooth Powder has the power to give teeth a luster twice as bright as the average of all other brands. Thanks to Pepsodent's exclusive patented ingredient, composite metaphosphate, which Pepsodent alone contains. So if you're interested in success via the smile route, don't go just halfway. Go twice as far with Pepsodent Tooth Powder, which does twice as much. There, Mamato Merchant, what do you think of that? What was that? Them, brother, was my motto. Yes, sir, I'm going to sell Pepsodent Tooth Powder. <laughs> Well, we all have a terrifically super date with Judy again next Tuesday night. A Date with Judy with Ann Gillis, Paul McGrath, and Margaret Brayton is written by Aileen Leslie and Jerry Schwartz. The music is directed by Wilbur Hatch. See you next Tuesday. Don't be late. You have a date with Judy. This is Bill Goodwin speaking for Pepsodent. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Pepsodent Show, presenting A Date with Judy. Hello? Hello, Judy. Can I have a date with you? Will you call for me in a taxi? Yes. Will you bring me a big box of candy? Yes. And orchids? Yes. Then I can't go out with you. Why not? My mother won't let me go out with boys I don't know. Uh Uh-huh, you have a date with Judy, chaperoned by Pepsodent. But first, I'd like to take just a few seconds to tell you what several important testing laboratories took many months to establish as undeniable fact. When these laboratories had satisfied themselves by making all sorts of tests on all sorts of tooth powders, here's the conclusion they reached. Pepsodent tooth powder has the power to produce a luster on teeth twice as bright as the average of all other leading brands. Briefly, here's what this means. You can expect Pepsodent Tooth Powder to make your teeth twice as bright as you see them now. And that's something it won't take you long to find out. Try Pepsodent Tooth Powder and see. Well, it's a wonderful summer evening, but Judy doesn't feel wonderful. Her current heartthrob, Norman, has taken her to a movie, but wiggled out of taking her to Scully's for a super-duper Sunday. Now it's only 10 p.m., and he's brought her home already. They pause on the front porch. Well, good night, Judy. Good night? You mean now? Well, it's 10 o'clock, and besides, i got to get up early tomorrow. Norman, when I first met you three weeks ago, you used to think of nothing but staying up till 1 or 2 o'clock, and now... I guess I was younger then. Norman, has something come between us? Well, no, I'm just sleepy, Judy. Well, you never used to get sleepy when we first started going out with each other. Well, the trouble is, I've stayed out so late with you every night that uh, my constitution is sort of breaking down. Well, good night, Judy. Do you really mean it? Mean what? Good night. Yeah, I have to go. All right, go ahead and go home. But just for that, I won't give you a date tomorrow night. Oh, okay. I'll go to bed early tomorrow night. Oh, good night. Oh, nausea. Judy, is that you? Yes, Father. This is me. 
I mean I. Well, I'm glad to see you home so early. About time you realized your constitution required a little sleep. Will everybody please stop talking about constitutions all the time? Mm, who talks about constitutions all the time? Everybody does, all the time. Is anything bothering you, dear? Not a thing, Mother. Not one easy thing. Except every other girl in town trying to lure Norman away from me. Every other girl in town, Judy? Well, nearly everyone. Anyhow, Ruth. Mmm, the old mortal enemy. She's utterly scrupulous. I know she lured Norman into a date last night. I had it from a reliable source. And now tonight, he's too tired to stay up any later than 10 o'clock. She is scrupulous. Say, who's been tearing my newspaper limb from limb? I guess I did. I was reading it. You were reading a newspaper? Why, Judy, there's no end to your reform. Hi, everybody. You know the news? How can I know the news with my newspaper in a condition like this? I'm in a radio quiz show. How very juvenile. Juvenile? You know what show this is? It's put up or shut up. <laughs> Well, I suggest you shut up, Randolph, before you make a goop out of yourself in public. I imagine Randolph would be very good on a quiz show. Thank you, Mother. I'm glad there's somebody in this family who appreciates my ungoop-like qualities. If I win, I'll make 50 smacks. 50 what? Smacks, Father. Simoleons. <laughs> Dollars to the hoi polloi. <laughs> there's a big article all about it on page two of the paper. Page two? I'd like to see John Kieran find page two of this mess. Good heavens. What's wrong, Melvin? Who cut this hole right smack through the middle of the sports page? Oh, uh, uh, could it have been termites, Father? No, Randolph, it could not have been termites. Randolph, what did you cut out of here? It was a free offer, Father. How many times do I have to tell you, Randolph, that you can't get anything free in this world? Well, this one said absolutely free, Father. Yeah, let me see what you cut out. Yeah, here. Uh, find your lost youth with our physical training course? <laughs> Absolutely free introductory offer, really, Randolph. Well, it's free, isn't it? Well, I don't care how free it is. I, I don't care if they paid you to find your lost youth. If you found your lost youth, Randolph, we'd have to put you back in diapers. <laughs> yes, Father. Well, how about quiz shows? They give away money on them, free, I mean. You earn money on those, Randolph. You have to have brains. Well, not on some of them, you don't. They just pour the shekels all over you. <laughs> Turn to page two, Melvin. I'd like to hear more about this quiz. Well, that's not so easy, the condition this paper's in. Well, down to here isn't page two, right after page 17. <laughs> Go ahead and read it, Father. Yes, a special junior session of the popular quiz show, Put Up or Shut Up, will be broadcast from the ballroom of the Central Hotel on Sunday evening. It features as master of ceremonies the popular quiz master, Tom Brenneman. Tom Brenneman? I wonder if he's from Wheeling, West Virginia. Oh, here's our son's name, Dora. Among the contestants are Randolph Forster, 716 Elm I bet that is little Tom Brenneman from Wheeling, West Virginia. Fancy Brenneman's little boy. Says on the radio page he's six foot two and weighs 187 pounds. I knew him when he was a youngster. He used to live next door when I visited in Wheeling when I was a girl. Well, what is all this goopy conversation about anyhow? Mm -hmm. So Randolph's going to be on the quiz show. So Mother knows the MC. So what? Well, I think it's rather interesting in view of Randolph's participation in the show. You answer it, Randolph. I don't want anybody to know I'm home so early from a date. I can't answer it. I'm wearing diapers. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, nobody gets any cooperation around here. Hello? Who? Ruth? Oh, well, I'm not really home. I mean, I'm home, but I have a date. Norman's outside on the porch. The invisible man. What? Oh, yes, Randolph's on the quiz show. He's very intelligent, you know. His teachers say he's positively abnormal. <laughs> Your brother Curly's on the show, too? Hmm. I'd like to see Curly beat Randolph. Why, Randolph is practically the most superior intellect in this town. Is she talking about me? Sure, I'll take a bet. I'll be mighty glad to take a bet. Anything you want. Name your own steak. I feel just like Seabiscuit. <laughs> <laughs> the one whose brother loses doesn't accept a date with a boy for the entire month of August. That's rather steep, isn't it? Wowie. All right, I'll take it. If you think I don't think my brother is smarter, smarter than your brother, Curly, any day... Okay, it's all set. Goodbye. Oh, I didn't mean for you to bet your very life's blood on me. It, uh, it was a rather daring thing to do, dear. Oh, what have I done? 
Oh, Randolph, you've got to be Curly. You've absolutely got to. Well, my whole future depends upon it. Randolph, I look at you with new respect. If Judy's willing to bet a month's dates on you, you must be a, a genius. Mother, you said you knew Tom Brenneman, didn't you? Yes, when he was about four. Well, then, you've got to ask him for dinner the night before the show. But, Judy, I haven't seen him since he was four. Mother, you wouldn't let the son of Bessie Brenneman, who used to live next door when you visited New Wheeling, West Virginia, come to town without having him to dinner, would you? I might. But, but Mother, after all, right next door... I'm beginning to think Judy's confidence in Randolph is a complete phony. Yes, Father. I'm beginning to doubt whether I'm really a genius at all. All right, Randolph, let's keep going. What's the highest denomination in American currency? A $10,000 bill. It says here a $100,000 bill. It's wrong. Ask Father. Father, did you ever have a $100,000 bill? It will surprise you to know I never did, Randolph. <laughs> All right, we'll try another one. How many of the seven dwarfs wore beards? Judy, as a special favor to me, could you stop asking him questions for, let's say, five minutes? But, Father, you know how vitally important it is that he beats Curly on the quiz show. Would I laugh the braces off my teeth if I won? And then Norma didn't ask you for a date all month anyhow. Randolph, please. Father, I'm merely getting Randolph in condition for Mr. Brenneman's guest appearance at dinner at our house. I'm in the pink of condition now. If you keep this up, Judy, I'm going to be overtrained. To what do the following terms refer? Stratus, cirrus, nimbus, and cumulus. Cloud formation. Before that quiz show is over, I expect to find my ears in the shape of question marks. Oh, Melvin, dear. Yes, Dora? Did you turn the light off in the garage? For the love of heaven, can't anybody in this house use a declarative sentence? You'd like another piece of chicken, wouldn't you, Mr. Brenneman? Oh, you're right. You're absolutely correct. Oh, it was wonderful of you to come to dinner here. I think it was terribly democratic in everything of you. She's just handing out the goo, Mr. Brenneman. She really wants something from you. Well, sir, you know, just yesterday, a lady wanted something from me, my landlady. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind quiz shows. The joke's I can't stand. Well, I'll, uh, I'll never forget what a cute little boy you were, Mr. Brenneman. Uh, don't you think Mr. Brenneman is intelligent-looking, Mother? I mean, he has the most intelligent-looking nose. Well, you know, just yesterday a lady said to me, you have the most intelligent-looking nose, and I said, intelligent-looking noses run in our family. <laughs> <laughs> you get it? <laughs> I get it. Oh, Mr. Brenneman, you were just a coochie-coochie's baby. <laughs> Mother, what an embarrassing thing to say to Mr. Brenneman. Well, I don't see anything embarrassing about being a baby. After all, we were all babies once in the early part of our lives, generally. <laughs> Doesn't Randolph have the most intellectual sense of humor, Mr. Brenneman? Well, you know, just yesterday I met a lady who told me she'd been married three times, eloping across the border from California each time. And I said, what a sense of humor, Arizona. <laughs> oh, uh, you'll... Uh... You'll have some more candied sweet potatoes, won't you, Mr. Brenneman? Oh, that's correct. That's absolutely correct. Oh, I wish I were a mind reader or something, so I would know what questions you were going to ask on the quiz show. Well, you know, just yesterday I met a mind reader, and I said, um, why are you able to read minds? And she said, I can read minds because I'm really a ghost. And I said, I think I'll put you on a ghost-to-ghost hookup. <laughs> <laughs> well, you... Oh, you certainly were a darling little boy. Did you know the dorsal fin sprouted on all mammals during the Paleozoic Age? Randolph, what has that got to do with the conversation? He's right. He's absolutely correct. Oh, isn't that fascinating? Mr. Brenneman, would you tell us frankly, as an old friend of the family, is that the sort of thing you'll ask on the quiz show? Well... Judy, why don't you come right out and say, Mr. Brenneman, exactly what are the questions you're going to ask on the quiz show? Oh, Father, how can you be so brazen? Well, I was gradually choking on your subtlety. Father, please. Mr. Brenneman, is there some mild hint you could give us as to the sort of questions you'll ask? Well, the contestants can pick what subject they want to be questioned on. 
such as sports or popular songs or American history. American history? Hmm. I don't know why you don't ask Mr. Brenneman to let me be one of the judges. Oh, Father, you couldn't possibly. Why not? Well, because if Randolph should win, it might look like he were trying to influence dear Mr. Brenneman. <laughs> said, speak for yourself, John Alden. Priscilla. Who made the first American flag? Betsy Ross. Who saved John Smith? Pocahontas. What year did the pilgrims land on Plymouth Rock? Look, Judy, you've asked me that three times, but they only landed once, 1620. Do you suppose there'd be any way to ease it around town that the pilgrims landed in 1820 or something so that it would mix up anybody else who happened to get that question? No. Well, let's continue. Judy, can't we stop for a while? But you've got to win. Just think how terrible it would be if you let Curly show you off. Just think how much worse it would be if you went without dates for a month. Now, look, Randall. You've chosen American history for your classification, and you've simply just got to know some. Is there anything I can tell you that would come in handy? Not a thing. Randolph, this is serious. Go ahead and ask me some quick questions. Okay. What's the Talia Perodi? I don't know. You're right. You're absolutely right. Here's another one. What's a four-letter English word ending in E-N-Y? A four-letter word ending in E-N-Y. Any, Benny, Kenny, Danny, Stop Annie, the question. Stop the question. I can stand just so much to know more. Randolph, come here this instant. Yes, Father. Tell me quick before I go bats. What is a four-letter word ending in E-N-Y? Deny, Father. D- d- oh, for the love of heaven. <laughs> Well, questions are flying thick and fast in the Foster household. But it's the answers that count, and we'll see how Randolph stacks up in just a moment. You know, when I was a little kid about Randolph's age, my gang used to get in trouble because we always used to do a little extra artwork on any billboard picture of a pretty girl. We used to take a big black pencil and block out several of her front teeth. We did it because it changed the beautiful picture completely, made it pretty funny looking. And the point I'm making is this, your teeth are a great deal more important to your appearance than you may realize. Dull, dingy teeth can ruin your smile. And when your smile is gone, ladies and gentlemen, you're gone. So don't take a chance on making a sad or funny picture of yourself. Brighten up your teeth. Brighten up your smile with Pepsodent tooth powder. Make your teeth flash brilliantly and make them attract attention. You can do it with Pepsodent tooth powder because Pepsodent contains composite metaphosphate, the wonderful safe polishing agent that helps make your teeth twice as bright. Yes, twice as bright, my friends, as the average of all other leading brands by actual scientific test. No other tooth powder in the world contains composite metaphosphate. So go down to your corner store now, tonight, and ask for Pepsodent tooth powder, the kind that has the power to make your teeth twice as bright. Well, let's see. Randolph is to be a contestant on the quiz show, Put Up or Shut Up, and Judy has bet her rival, Ruth, that Randolph will beat her brother, Curly. The stakes are a month without dates, and Judy is beginning to get jumpy. Randolph and Curly, however, have a conference all their own. Hello, Curly. Hello, Randolph. You look terrible, Curly. So do you, Randolph. I've been going through more than human capacity will bear. So have I. My sister Judy's been coaching me for the quiz show. My sister Ruth... She's been doing ditto. I'm worn to a frazzle. Me too. I don't care much anymore whether my sister Judy has dates all next month or not. I don't care much whether my sister Ruth is ditto. Let's cross them up. Answer the questions on the quiz show wrong, you mean? Yeah, let's both be so terrible neither of us win. Okay. That would be more fun than winning anyhow. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. All right. It's a deal. Shake. Shake. Of course, if I wanted to beat you, Curly, I could. Why, if I wanted to, I could beat you without straining my cranium. Listen, I could beat you without twitching my cerebellum. <laughs> but I'm going to. You will not. You think I'd let my sister Ruth down? I'll fight for my sister Judy to the finish. I'll battle to the death for my sister Ruth. And if I can help it, my sister Judy isn't going without a date for one single night as long as she lives. <laughs> It was 
very intelligent of you to think of coming here to the library, Randolph, where we could really get some facts on American history. I'll be able to do some serious cramming here. Gee, it's awfully sweet of you to work like this for me, Randolph. For you and the $50, and to get even with a certain little squirt I know. Well, I don't care why you're doing it. I just think it's too utterly angelic of you. Randolph, do you see who's over there across the room? Curly. Curly and his sister Ruth. I bet she came here to bone him up for the quiz show. The cheat? Sneaking into the library, huh? To cram the sneaks. It's absolutely unfair. Randolph, you've got to be Curly now. You've just got to, in spite of their underhanded methods. Just rely on me, Judy. Just rely on me. <laughs> Father? Yes, Judy. Go on in, Dora. Thank you, dear. Oh, I'm so excited and nervous I can hardly inhale, Father. Gee, I hope Randolph backstage isn't as nervous and excited as I am nervous and excited sitting here in the audience. Yeah, he's probably as exhausted as I am exhausted. Thank heaven it's here at last. I couldn't have stood another day of preparation. Oh, look, Father. Over there on the other side of the ballroom, huh? there's Norman. I'm overwhelmed. And there's Ruthie and her family down front. I'll kind of give her a little smile. A little stinky smile, poor girl. Little does she know that I'm going to have Norman exclusively during the whole month of August, I hope. Oh, I once saw a horse race for a stake of $100,000, but it was nothing to this. Look how goofy she is looking at Norman. Oh, Mother, it was so wonderful of you to have visited next door to Tom Brenneman's mother in Wheeling, West Virginia. You know, when I did that, I was probably thinking of this moment. Shh, they're beginning. Oh, there's Randolph sitting on the stage. Cross your fingers, Mother. Cross your fingers, Father. My brain's been crossed for a week now. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the put-up or shut-up show. Now, uh, just relax in your chairs. We're about ready to begin. <laughs> oh, I'll perish. I'll positively perish if I have to spend the whole month of August Judy, alone. Judy, they're starting. Ah, 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 ah. Dusk America, here comes the quizziest quiz show on the air. Put-up or shut-up. <laughs> Master himself, Tom Brenneman. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As you know, each contestant chooses a subject. If he wins, he gets $50. If he loses, the duck gives him the bird. Just like this. <laughs> That's right. And now, our first contestant. Will you step right up here, young man? What is your name? Curly Whiteman. And how old are you, young fellow? Eleven years old. Well, isn't that fine? You know, just yesterday, I heard about an 11-year-old boy who went around putting tacks on chairs. It was one of his standing jokes. <laughs> and uh, now, Curly, put up or shut up. What subject would you like to take tonight? We have famous quotations, classical music, women, American history. I'll take American history. Hey! Uh, what is that young man over there saying? <laughs> Nothing. Hey. Oh, I see. <laughs> Well, to turn from the farm back to the show, the first question I'm going to ask my first contestant is, who said, speak for yourself, John Alden? Priscilla. You're right. You're absolutely right. And now, put up or shut up? I put up. That's fine. What year did the children land on Plymouth Rock? Oh, Mother, I'm dying. I'm too positively dying. Randolph was going to take American history, and now Curly's taking it. And Randolph will have to take another subject. I'm sure he'll do well in any subject. But, Mama, all he knows is American history. Shh, I'm listening to Curly. Oh, I'm too positively dying. What am I going to do all the month of August? Oh, nausea. This is too positively drear. Ah, uh, that was great, Curly. Yes, sir. You have a good chance to win $50. And now, the next contestant. What is your name, young man? Well, you know me. You were just over my... What house. did you say your name was? <laughs> Foster. And your age? Ten, I told you. And that. now what subject do you choose, young fellow? We have famous quotations, sports, women, fruits, vegetables. I'll take women. Mm -hmm. Women. <laughs> now, Mr. Foster, are you sure you want women? Uh, maybe something else is more suitable. Sports, for instance. I'll take women. I can't blame you. <laughs> 
All right, now, is it true that 50% of all parents in the state of Pennsylvania are women? Certainly. You're right. You're absolutely correct. Any droop would know that. <laughs> and now a chance to make 20 cents. And, of course, the grand bonus prize of the evening. $50 to the top contestant. Uh, will you put up or shut up? I'll put up. All right. Now, according to social authorities, is it proper that a lady keep a gentleman waiting? It isn't proper, but it's being done. Now, my sister Judy, she has a system. She's always ready for an 8 o'clock date by 7 o'clock. But she keeps the guy waiting downstairs till 9, just to make it look like she isn't too anxious. Mm, thank you very much. Just last night I had to wait. <laughs> Sarah had to wait. 200 pound girl sat on my lap. Boy, was she awake. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now, uh, will you put up or shut up? Uh, I'll put up if you'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> what is the art of feminine makeup called? Uh, cosmetology. That's correct. Absolutely correct. And is that an art? Sometimes when my sister Judy takes her makeup off, I don't know who she is. <laughs> Well, you see, uh, I was going to tell a joke here, but I don't think I will. <laughs> you now have 40 cents, Randolph. Will you put up or shut up? Put up, naturally. Oh, such confidence. Now, the next question is, on what finger does a woman wear an engagement ring? Well, third finger, left hand. That's... that's... Of course, my sister Judy, every time she gets engaged, she does it with fraternity pins. She hasn't been engaged much lately, but once she had four fraternity pins at the same time. Well, I guess that evens things up. <laughs> I was going to tell a joke here, too, but I guess I won't. Uh, you now have 80 cents. Will you put up or shut up? Put up. All right. What is a misogynist? Uh, a misogynist is a woman hater. That's... Ab Norman, my sister Judy's boyfriend, <laughs> he didn't used to be a misogynist a few weeks ago, but lately he's been massaging all over the place. <laughs> what was that? That was my sister Judy. <laughs> You're winning the $50 like that. Well, let me shake your hand, son. Boy, if I'd only learned about women from you. <laughs> Gee, thanks, everybody, but it was nothing. Randall, I never was so humiliated in all my life. What's the matter with you, Judy? You didn't have to tell 30 million people about my whole private life, did you? Oh, I'd be cruelly deny that's what you wanted. Well, it's not like something going around the town. This has gone around the world. Look over there. There's your friend Ruth blubbering her way out of the place. Where? Jeepers, <laughs> I bet she's burned up. Oh, but I wonder what Norman thinks now. He'll think you're mysterious. Just ask me. I know all about women. Oh, be quiet, everybody. Here comes Norman. Little does he know that he's going to be mine for the whole month of August. Hello, Judy. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Foster. Hello, Norman. Gosh, congratulations, Randolph. Oh, thanks, Norman. See, Norman, I think it was just luscious of you to come and talk to us like this. After the plug, Randolph gave you on the show and all. Oh, that's all right, Judy. I just came over to say goodbye. Goodbye? Yeah, Judy, I I'm leaving on a camping trip, and I'll be gone the whole month of August. The whole month of August? You're oh. correct. Absolutely correct. What'll I do now? Well, I know what I'll do. I'll start my own quiz show, and my first question will be, quote, what keeps me from going nuts, unquote. <laughs> No, sir, I'm afraid there's no question about the trouble that Judy gets into. And as long as we're in the quiz spirit, may I ask you a few questions, uh, Just a minute, gentlemen. sir, Goodwin. You're talking uh, about questions and quizzes. That's my department. May yeah. I ask you a few questions? Why, you bet, Tom. Go right ahead. What's your name, young man? Bill Goodwin. And your age? Too old. Too old. <laughs> <laughs> now, your next question, Bill. There's been a lot of talk about how to win friends, how to be the life of the party. Can you tell us how to keep friends? How to be sure you'll be invited to party. Well, that's my department, Tom. And the answer is keep your breath fresh and sweet. Take care that you won't offend in a close-up. Guard against those heartbreaking whispering campaigns that may start behind your back. Very good, Bill. Excellent. Now, can you tell us how to guard against whispering campaigns? Yes, just do this. Before you go out where you'll meet people, gargle a few seconds with a mouthful of Pepsodent antiseptic. It makes your mouth sweet in a split second. Makes your breath fresh as spring. Pepsin at antiseptic gives you three times the safe breath protection because it lasts 
three times as long. You see, even when it's mixed with two parts of water, it's still an effective antiseptic. So you can save money and still have your breath insurance if you'll just go out tonight and get a bottle of Pepsin and antiseptic. Keep it handy where you can use it at least twice a day. That's correct. Absolutely correct. <laughs> Good night, Judy. Good night. You know, we all had a perfectly luscious time. You did? Well, um, I'm not doing anything next Tuesday night. You're not? Well, we'll all be a buzzing of your doorbell then, Judy. Holy drooly. You all have a date with Judy again next Tuesday night. A date with Judy with Ann Gillis, Margaret Brayton, Paul McGrath, and Dix Davis is written by Aline Leslie and Jerry Schwartz. Music is conducted by Wilbur Hatch. You're all fixed up, so don't forget next Tuesday night, will you? You have a date with Judy. This is Bill Goodwin speaking for Pepsodent, and this is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company. The Pepsodent Show, presenting A Date with Judy. Hello? Hello, Judy. What are you doing tonight? Oh, I have a million things to do. Wash my hair and manicure my nails. I've got to go to the store, and Gloria asked me over, and I've got to clean up my room. Oh, gee, that's too bad. I was going to ask you for a date. A date? Oh, gee, that's wonderful. I'm not doing a thing. Uh-huh, you've got a date with Judy, chaperoned by Pepsodent. Pepsodent, you know, is the tooth powder with the power to produce a luster on teeth twice as bright as the average of all other leading brands. Pepsodent, and only Pepsodent, contains composite metaphosphate, a remarkable, safe, and efficient polishing agent. If you want to see your teeth gleam and sparkle as they never have before, I suggest you go to your corner store and say, Pepsodent tooth powder, please. And now slick back your hair and straighten your tie. You have a date with Judy. Well, let's see. Tomorrow is Father Foster's birthday. And that's why we find Judy and her brother Randolph at a downtown department store shopping for the perfect gift. You don't think Father would like a baseball bat, do you? Certainly not. Let's stop fooling, Randolph, and get Father something he needs. Here's a baseball glove. Do you think Father go for that? Randolph, we only have two dollars, and we're going to use it to buy Father something he wants. Do you think he'd like a canoe? Father would know what to do with a canoe. I don't know. He does all right with a paddle. Let's get out of this sports department. Hey, where are you going now? Oh, there's just something over here I want to look at. In the lingerie department? Will you please wait a second, Randolph? <gasps> Isn't this gorgeous? I don't think Father would look well in lingerie. <laughs> oh, Randolph, this slip is divine. Do you think a slip is something Father really needs? Well, no, but I wish he would. Well, I'm sure he'd get a lot more wear out of a black lace nightgown. <laughs> look, my birthday isn't so far off. So if we bought Father a slip, he'd have it to give me. Well, in that case, let's get him a chemistry set, a baseball glove, a bicycle, and a Boy Scout knife. It'll relieve Father of birthday worries as far as I'm concerned for five years. All right, let's shop further, Randolph. Okie dokie. Hey, Judy, what are you going over to that counter for? Father doesn't wear earrings. Did you 
get your father a birthday present? Yes, Mother, we did. We almost got lost in the wilds of the lingerie department, but we managed to hack our way out. Why, Randolph, how can you say that? We just took sort of a quick swing through that department. Yeah, swing and sway with lingerie. (laughs) Where'd you get your father? Something useful, I hope. Oh, yes, Mother. Something very useful. What, Judy? Well, I don't think we ought to tell you. Because he wanted to be a surprise for Father. Oh, I won't tell. We got him a smoking jacket. Oh, Randolph, what did you tell for? You know how intimate Mother is with Father. A smoking jacket? But your father doesn't smoke. When he has this jacket, he will. You mean you got a smoking jacket for $2? Oh, no, Mother. We couldn't get Father anything cheap. This was $18. $18? Where did you get $18? Oh, we charged it. You charged it? You bought a present for your father, and you're making him pay for it? Well, what happened to the two dollars you saved? Oh, the two dollars. Well, Randolph bought himself a baseball glove for 79 cents. Well, Judy bought herself an evening bank for 85 cents. It was a necessity, Mother. That still doesn't count up to two dollars. Oh. Well, when we finished, we were so exalted from shopping that we just had to buy Super Duper Sundays. Another necessity, Mother. I see. Well, I'm going to call up the department store and cancel it right now. The baseball glove can't be canceled. We bought it outright. Your father works hard. Then he has a birthday, and what do his children do? They buy themselves evening bags and baseball gloves. Oh, only one baseball glove, Mother. Poor father. No one ever thinks of him. All he ever thinks of is us. But we... we just neglect him. He is neglected, isn't he? He certainly is. Oh, Mother, I'm terribly sorry. I feel awful. Poor father, we hardly pay any attention to him. Well, I could take the baseball glove back. You know what I think would be nicer than anything? What? If you two spend the day with father on his birthday. Oh, mother, what a perfectly lovely idea. Sounds mighty ghoulish to me. Oh, it's perfectly beautiful. Father will have one perfect day. We'll start out early in the morning. We'll go down to his office and surprise him. And just make father happy. No? What? Happy birthday, Father. Oh? Oh, thanks, kids. And uh, now, would you mind scramming? But, Father, Randolph and I are going to devote the whole day to you. Well, I'm sure that would be very pleasant, but I have an 11 o'clock appointment. But, Father, I... all the arrangements are made. You've simply got to leave. And... Uh, look, Judy, a man has come to town. A man from whom I expect to get a large order. A very large order. It's the most important business But, I... Father, we're going to spend the whole day making you happy. I don't want to be happy. I just want to get my order. Who is this man who's going to be here at 11 o'clock, Father? Huh? Well, he's stopping at the Carter Hotel just across the street. He'll be here in a minute. What's his name? Quigley. A.Q. Quigley. And now, would you mind getting out of here? Oh, Father. Well, this is what's called a paternal brush-off. Goodbye, Father. Goodbye. Oh, Randolph, what are we going to do? And after all the wonderful plans we've made... I guess Father's been neglected so long he likes it. Randolph, we simply must rescue Father from himself. Come on. Where are you going now? To the Carter Hotel. We'll see Mr. Quigley and explain the whole situation. After all, it is Father's birthday, and we must do everything. Very. The situation is, you see, it's Father's birthday, and we've planned this perfect day of happiness for him. Hmm. I see. We know business is your primary interest and all that, but but you wouldn't want to interfere with filial affection, would you? Mm, Decidedly not. Oh, thank you, Mr. Quigley. I think you're wonderful. Not at all. I'll call your father now and cancel our appointment. You will? Oh, that's wonderful, Mr. Quigley. You don't know what this day of happiness is going to mean to father. Yes, Mr. Quigley. I see you, Mr. Quigley, but couldn't you... uh... Well, when could you... I see, Mr. Quigley. Goodbye, Mr. Quigley. Oh, I'm sick. Come in. Hello, Father. Hello, Father. Oh, you two again. What do you want now? We thought we'd try once again to give you a happy birthday. Happy birthday. This is the most horrible day of my life. Mr. Quigley just phoned me. He isn't keeping his appointment. He doesn't know when he'll give me another. Is that so, Father? Then why don't you just come along with us? 
Well, why not? What have I got to lose? Lead on. Oh, Father, I think that's just scrumptious. Now, remember, Father, this is absolutely your day, so we want you to do everything you most like to do. Now, what would you like to do the most? Well, I'll tell you right now what I'd like to do least. Go to that horrible amusement park you're so fond of. <laughs> amusement park. Oh, but Father, this was all prearranged. And after we're through here, we can go do something you'd like to do. But you see, Father, this had been planned beforehand. Do you wonder where the gang is? The gang? Yes, Father. Your gang? Yes, Father. Oh, there they are in front of the fun house. Just what I love most, your gang. I don't get enough of it at home every night. I have to have it on my birthday, too. I see everybody else, but I don't see Mr. Quigley. Quigley? What's Quigley got to do with it? Well, we invited him to come along. You what? Well, yes, Father. We thought it'd be nice if you had a pal about your own age. A pal? That tight-faced conservative old... For the love of heaven. Well, we just did it for you to make you happy. Happy? I was never lower in my life. I can't believe it. You asked quickly to come to this... This den of horrors? Oh, Father, he'll enjoy it as much as you will. That's what I'm afraid of. A.Q. Quigley. Good Lord, a staid, blue-nosed old bachelor. Your crowd will kill him. Oh, is he a bachelor? Yes, he is. Oh, Judy, why do you do things like this to me? Oh, well, if he's a bachelor, I'll have to fix him up with a girl. I wonder if Mitzi's his type. Fix Quigley up with a... Oh, no, 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 Judy, not that. You want him to have fun, don't you? Hello, gang. Hello, everybody. Hello, Judy. Happy birthday for your father, Judy. Thank you, Mitzi. Oh, Oogie. Yes, Judy? Something's happened that calls for a tremendous sacrifice on your part, Oogie. Would you mind giving up Mitzi? Giving up Mitzi? Yes, only temporarily. My father's pal who's meeting us here is a bachelor. And since it's father's birthday, you wouldn't want my father's pal not to have a date today, would you? Well, no. Well, I thought Mitzi would be a good type for Mr. Quigley. So would you mind terribly if you went stay? Well, gee, I don't know. Maybe Mitzi isn't willing to sacrifice me. Mitzi, come on over here a second. Yes, Judy? Mitzi, Oogie's willing to release you for the day because I have another date for you. You have? Mm Mm-hmm. He's an older man. An older man? Oh, how marvelous. I adore men in their 20s. Well, he's not exactly in his 20s Well, suppose he's 19 Even that is all Well, he's not exactly 19 either Heck, that's getting right back to Oogie (laughs) Oh, he's older than Oogie And he's very rich A millionaire Maybe even a multimillionaire And I give you my word of honor that he's an older man Much older it's a deal, Judy. Swell. Hey, Judy, come on out of your huddle. Mr. Quigley's here. Uh, Mr. Quigley, let me explain. This this is all... Oh, it's all fixed, you... Father. I mean about Mr. Quigley's date. Judy, for the love of heaven, how are you, Miss Foster? I'm fine. <laughs> Mr. Quigley, here's your date. Uh, Mr. Quigley, Miss Mitzi Hoffman. <laughs> how do you do? Is this Mr. Quigley? Well, yes, Mitzi. I think I'll go back to Oogie. <laughs> Mr. Quigley, really, I, I didn't know this was going to happen. I older men, Judy. But after all, not that old. How can you say that? How old are you, Mr. Quigley? Why, uh, I'm uh, 45. You see, that's not so old. He's even got most of his hair. Turn around, Mr. Quigley. Judy! You see? In the back, it's pretty well covered. It's what I call a fringe. Don't be silly, Mitzi. Well, I bet if Mr. Quigley had on a toupee, why, he'd be stunning. <laughs> uh, can I get you something, A.Q.? I'm dreadfully sorry. <laughs> no, no, nothing at all. Can I get you something, Father? You look like you need it. No, Randolph. <laughs> well, okay, Judy, I'll do it for you. I'll be his girlfriend, but just for today, on account of it's your father's birthday. Oh, don't do me any favors. Gee, thank you, Mitzi. Come on, Quigley Wiggly. Which would you rather do first? Going to the fun house or in the tunnel of love? Oh, this is horrible. I'll never get an order from him as long as I live. Let's go, gang. Nice and loud. Now, all together. Happy birthday, Mr. Foster. Well, that's going to be some birthday, all right. Randolph, uh, did I hear you say, let's go, gang, nice and loud? That's right, Mr. Goodwin. Wasn't that a slick birthday greeting? Oh, it sure was. But, Randolph, do you have any idea how loud, twice as loud it'd be? 
Heck, that'd probably bust the tubes near radio set. <laughs> well, it might. As a matter of fact, you'd know it was loud, all right. But you wouldn't know it was twice as loud because you couldn't exactly measure it. Of course, scientists could tell you by using delicate instruments. And that's just why the Pepsodent people went to several scientific laboratories to find out how much brighter Pepsodent tooth powder made teeth as compared to other tooth powders. Well, of course, we knew it made teeth brighter, but we wanted to know how much brighter. Well, here's the answer we got from these independent laboratories. After they'd made all their tests and all their comparisons, measured by scientific instruments, they found that Pepsodent tooth powder makes teeth twice as bright. Yes, sir, twice as bright as the average of all other leading brands. Now, that makes a whale of a lot of difference in the way your teeth sparkle and shine. It makes a lot of difference in the way your smile flashes. And it'll certainly make a lot of difference in the way people will look at you. So get the big plus in polishing power that Pepsodent tooth powder can give you. Make your teeth shine twice as brightly. All you have to do is go to your corner store and ask for high polish Pepsodent tooth powder. <laughs> Well, Father's having anything but a happy birthday. He's just about dying at the sight of his straight-laced customer, Mr. Quigley, being led by the nose by Mitzi and the rest of Judy's gang. Right now, they're in the fun house at the amusement park. Thank you! Thank you! Let me explain! Oh, Father, I'm so glad you're enjoying your birthday so. I'm enjoying a merry chase, that's what. Every time I open my mouth to Quigley, a rolling barrel upsets him or he shoots down a slide. But it's fun, isn't it, Father? Yes, Judy, it's fun. The kind they have an insane asylum. Oh, Father, watch out. Is that a trap door in front of you? A trap door? It's nothing of the kind. Oh! Well, that takes care of Father. Judy, what's this hole in the wall called? Father, how unromantic of you. This is the tunnel of love. Well, I can hardly see. I wonder where Quigley and that magpie are. I don't know how Quigley's going to hold up under this. Normally, he looks like he was ready to cave in. If he's 45, I'm 16. Father, he and Mitzi are sitting in the seat in front of us. In the seat? Of... If Quigley, is that you? Yes, it is I. Oh, oh it's... It is, isn't it? Well, I, uh, I was just seeing how nice it was you being near me where I could get a chance to talk to you, explain this Can I tell myth. you something, Mr. Quigley? You may tell me something, Mitzi. Well, usually when we get in the tunnel of love, we pitch woo. Pitch woo? <laughs> yeah. You know, hold hands. In your day, Mr. Quigley, it was probably called bundling. Uh, that was a little before my day. You see, Mitzi, he's not so old. Uh, Miss Mitzi, shall I be required to pitch woo? <laughs> That's entirely up to you, Mr. Quigley. Just do what you like. Father and I won't watch if you don't want us to, will we, Father? No, not if you don't want us to. <laughs> oh, it's so wonderful to celebrate your birthday with you, Father. I never knew how much fun it was to just give of yourself for somebody else's happiness. I love it, just giving and giving. If you really want to give, for the love of heaven, give me a chance to talk to you quickly alone. Mitzi? Oh, Mitzi, would you mind changing seats with me? I'd like to sit up there with, uh, with your date. I want to discuss a new type of canning process I'm going to... Change seats? That would be terrible. It would? Why, of course. Because what would everybody think if they saw us emerging from the tunnel of love into broad daylight? Me sitting with Judy... And Mr. Foster sitting with Mr. Quigley. Judy. Judy, what are we going to do now? Eat our picnic lunch, Father. Then we're going swimming. Oh, isn't it lovely? 
And to think it's all for your birthday, Father. All I can say is I wish I were never born. <laughs> oh, Father, you say more things to make me laugh. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be laughing the rest of my life in a maniacal sort of way in a padded cell. Hey, come and look at Mr. Quigley. What's wrong with Mr. Quigley? Well, nothing's wrong with him. He just fell off the pier into the water. <laughs> he's all right now. They pulled him out. Of course, he's kind of puffing like an old dinosaur, but oh. I guess... Oh, <laughs> For 20 years, I've been trying to build up a good, respectable business, and in one fell swoop, I'm ruined. Oh, don't worry, Father. If necessary, I can become a professional baseball player and support the family. I've got a glove now. Well, when we get home tonight, you'd better plan wearing it someplace else besides on your hand. <laughs> Here we are, everybody. Help yourself to lunch from the basket. Oh, Mr. Quigley. I say, Mr. Quigley, are you all right? Mr. Foster, please don't disturb us. We're having lunchy wunchy, aren't we, Quiggly Wiggly? Uh, quite so, quite so. Yes, but after Quiggly Wiggly, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Quiggly's fall from the pier. He's perfectly all right. He's a little wet. But after he eats his lunch, he's going to get in the bathing suit anyhow. So what's the diff? He might catch cold. That's silly. Come on now, Quiggly Wiggly. Open your mouth. That's it. Now I'll just poke in a spoonful of ice cream. I forgot. There we are. Now, how's about a bite of pickle? Oh, for the love of heaven. Uh, I'm, I'm all right, Foster. But, uh, but Please, but they... Mr. Foster, Quig is my day. Open wide. Yeah, yeah. Okay, everybody, get into your suits. We're going swimming. Swimming? Right after lunch? Are you crazy, Judy? Oh, Father, we're right here on the lake. You might as well use it. Here's a suit for you, Father. Now go in the bathhouse and put it on. I refuse to go swimming. But, Father, everyone's going in. There goes Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley, he's got his clothes on. Yes, he isn't going to bother changing. He's all wet anyhow. <laughs> oh, I'll never get an order from anybody again as long as I live. Last one in is a stinky pie. Gee, <laughs> father's having a perfect day. <laughs> Do I have a stomachache? Come on, Father. We're going to the dance pavilion. The dance pavilion? You mean to dance? Oh, you won't have to jitterbug. I'll dance with you any way you want. To. I don't want to do it anyway. I just want to stay here and hold my stomach. Oh, everybody's dancing. Just do it the way you used to in the gay 90s. Well, you might even try trotting out a minuet. Do they call that boiler factory din music? Mr. Quigley? Oh, AQ? Are you referring to me, Foster? Look, A.Q., when they're not looking, we can sneak out the side door. Come on, Quigley Wiggly, let's dance. Uh, I shall try to oblige you, Miss Mitzi. Can you jitterbug? Jitterbug? Oh, Mitzi, please, please don't do that to him. I took him on for today, and I'm going to do my duty. I'm going to see he has a good time. That's it, Quig. Am I uh, manipulating properly, Miss Mitzi? Not bad, Quig. Only don't pop my arm, just jerk it. Oh. You mean uh, like this? Now you're getting in the groove. Come on, a worm, a squirm! Scully's had the most scrumptious Sundays, Father. That's why we brought you here. It's sort of the finish of a perfect day. Finish is right. Let's order. Quigley Wiggly, what do you want? The Hawaiian Dream Special is simply lush. It's pistachio ice cream covered with ripe oh. cherries, ground pecans, and marshmallow sauce. Look, can't you just order? Do you have to discuss it out loud? Oh, jeepers. They have the regular 30-cent Junior G-Man Sunday today for only 27 cents. Ooly drooly. Uh, ooly drooly? Uh, that means a state of suspended elation, A.Q. What are you going to have, Father? I'll have a Bromo Seltzer. Four Super Dupers, one Junior G-Man, three Hawaiian Dreams, a Bromo Seltzer. Coming on? Oh, Judy, please. As a special favor to a sick old man, will you let me out of here? But this is all for you, Father. How would it look if the person at the party's for just got up and left? In five minutes, I won't be able to leave. I'll have to be carried out. You know, Quiggly Wiggly, I'm beginning to think you're kind of cute. Uh, thank you, Miss Mitzi. How does he hold up like that? My gills are purple. Well, George is a cokey dopey, but he's got a puddle jumper, so he doesn't entirely curdle you. Uh, Foster, would you care to interpret that? Oh, certainly, A.Q. A, a cokey dopey is a droopy ick. And, uh, 
A puddle jumper is a, a meat grinder. Yes, but that I... That is a broken-down old jalopy. When you get through, Father, I'll interpret what you said. Here's your pleasure, wenches. Father, you've got to take just one spoonful of my super-duper. It's in celebration of your birthday, after all. Oh, why not? After all I've gone through, what can a super-duper do to me? Good Lord, is this glorified muck edible? Oh, quick, let me out of here. What's the matter with Father? Why'd he run out of here like that? I guess Father decided to give up his birthday. Here, Melvin, put this hot water bottle on your tummy. Oh. Would you like the ice bag on your head? Everything hurts. My legs from walking around, my head spinning in a million different directions. I never had such an awful day in my life. We were only trying to celebrate your birthday. Well, you celebrated it all right. Another hour of it, and it would have been my last birthday ever. Oh, now calm down, Melvin. Calm down. You didn't just have a birthday, Dora. Listen to me, all of you. My birthday is hereafter struck out of the calendar completely. Oh, Father... Well, I'm afraid I've seen the last of Quigley. But, Father, all we did was for you. Well, don't think I don't appreciate it, Judy. You devoted a whole day to me. Giving up your time, not doing the things you usually do. Spending all that... Mo Incidentally, who footed the bill? Mr. Quigley. What? He insisted. If I ever get up from this deathbed, I'll... Oh, my stomach. And poor Quigley. Who's taking care of Quigley? Who's putting hot water bottles on his stomach? Oh! That wasn't your stomach, Father. That was the telephone. <laughs> I'll get it. Hello? Oh, yes. Melvin, it's Mr. Quigley. Quigley? What am I going to say to the man? Here, J Judy, hold this ice bag. Randolph, you hold this hot water bottle. Hello? Hello there, Foster. Mr. Quigley, I want to explain about today. I, I feel just the way you do about it. Well, I didn't know you had it in you. I thought it was wonderful, too. Just wonderful. You what? Oh, it was a fine day. Thanks very, very much. And, Foster, about that order. Yes? I've decided to double it. What? Well, see you in the morning. Yeah. Say, you don't sound so good. Can't take it, can you? No, I... Well, try to get back in shape. I feel great. Well, I never... What happened, Melvin? He doubled the order. He enjoyed the day. Here's your hot water bottle, Father. I don't need it. I feel great. You know, you never can tell about those blue noses. Uh-oh, I wonder who that can be. I'll get it. Hello? Yes? It's Mr. Quigley again. Give me back my hot water bottle. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it couldn't be true. Let me have that phone But door. he doesn't want to talk to you. He wants to talk to Judy. To Judy? Mm -hmm. I'll take it. Hello? Hello, Quigley Wiggly. Uh, hello, Miss Foster. I just called back to ask you a favor. Yes, Mr. Quigley? Could you give me Mitzi's telephone number? <laughs> hey, he wants Mitzi's telephone number. He what? <laughs> Happy birthday, Father. Well, well, Father seems to have had a happy birthday after all. And talking about birthdays, by the way, we're having a pretty happy birthday ourselves. Well, many happy returns, young man. What birthday are you celebrating? Well, Father Foster, just exactly six months ago today, on the first Tuesday night in February, the new Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush was announced to the country over these same stations. And in the six months that followed, the Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush has become one of the most popular fastest selling toothbrushes in America. Now there's a good reason for that, ladies and gentlemen. The Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush is giving men and women, and children too, a more comfortable, more thorough cleansing action than any brush they've ever known. That's because with its 50 tufts of Fibrex, this Pepsodent brush gives you twice as many tufts in a small, compact head as any other brush you see in your store. Twice as many tufts for double power cleansing. And those Fibrex bristles are so slender, so gentle, so unlike the harsh, stiff bristles people used for years that they need no breaking in. They're easier on tender gums. 
No wonder people have gone for this brush in a great big way. No wonder we're celebrating. In just six months, the Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush has set a record in the drug trade that has never been equaled. Happy birthday! Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to have you join the celebration. If you haven't used a Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush yet, get one tonight at your corner store. Well, good night, Judy. Good night. I had a dreamy time. You ain't wolfing? Well, then how's about a date come Tuesday next, Judy? A date next Tuesday? Oh, I'm mad for it. Yes, you have a date with Judy again next Tuesday. A date with Judy with Ann Gillis, Paul McGrath, Margaret Brayton, and Dix Davis is written by Aline Leslie and Jerry Schwartz. Music is under the direction of Wilbur Hatch. See you next Tuesday. Don't be late. You have a date with Judy. Bill Goodwin speaking for Pepsodent. This is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company. Pepsodent invite you to have a date with Judy. Here's Judy Foster again. So far, she's lived 16 years, and life has been a whirl the whole way. Right now, she's in a special summer class in domestic science over at City High School. We are preparing ourselves for women's place in the world, and that, of course, includes the rearing and training of children. Judy Foster. Yes, sister. The workings of the underground in occupied Norway are of nothing compared with what is going on in this class. I don't know what you mean, Miss Sister. Is this a class in domestic science, or is this a class in note writing? It's a class in domestic science. So you are really the teacher. Judy. You wouldn't have had to take so much trouble to send a note to Mr. You could simply have read it aloud to her in the first place. Like you're going to do now. But, Goofy, if I read it to Mr., everybody else will hear you. That was the idea. Read it, Judy. Well, all right. But you won't like it. I'm sure I won't like it. Let's read it anyhow. Well, quote, Dear Mr., I think your dream man is a fool. <laughs> My type of dream man is Gerald Putnam, who is the most unfilthy man I ever saw. Are you sure you want me to go on, Miss Dixon? I'm positive. Well, quote, I'd give anything to snag a date with him if he has strictly not given me a tumble up to date. Just sincerely, Judy Foster, unquote. That's all. That is enough. Now, could we return to domestic science? Oh, gee, Miss Whitzel, if you don't think about dreaming, you don't get married. And if you don't get married, you don't have any domestic science to worry about. Judy! Oh, gee, Miss Whitzel, you probably didn't think about dreaming when you were young, and you didn't get married. Judy, I don't want to hear another word from you. Now return to our last work in the hypothetical problem of baiting a baby. Sorry, we could have been married. Now, now Miss <laughs> What is the first thing one does when one bathes the baby? One undresses it. Naturally. And after that? One places some water and one baths the nap, and then one sticks the baby in the water. <laughs> ah, but the water. One taps it for temperature. Very good. Judy? One puts the thermometer in the water, and if it says 96 degrees, it's okay. And if one doesn't have a thermometer, one sticks in one's elbow. And if one, one's elbow feels about 69 degrees, I mean 96 degrees, yes. one goes ahead and sticks the baby in the water. <laughs> quite right. I see if one can put dream men out of one's mind, one is quite able to concentrate on domestic science. I still think one's got to concentrate on a dream man before domestic science is very practical. On account of you guys... You did? Oh, off on another date with Judy, chaperoned by Pepsodent. And in a moment, we'll see where concentration on dream men will lead Judy. You know, the direct opposite of a dream man in Judy's set is a drip 
Now, a drip is an ick with no personality, no sunny smile. And why no sunny smile? Dingy teeth, that's the trouble. On the other hand, the lads who use Peptodent toothpaste have the brightest, sparklingest smiles there are. Yes, sir, Peptodent with Irium is the super cleanser that speeds up results. It makes teeth not only look cleaner, but feel cleaner than they've ever felt before. It gives your mouth a wonderful feeling of freshness, too. There's no excuse for anybody to go around with dingy teeth when it's so easy to keep them really clean with Peptodent. It's so easy to have a bright, beautiful Peptodent smile. If that's what you'd like tomorrow, well, go to your drug counter tonight and say, Peptodent toothpaste, please. And now, let's get back to that date with Judy. <laughs> We're in the kitchen, dear. Mother, I can bathe the baby. Oh, how nice, dear. Now, if you only had a baby, Randolph. <laughs> this is a hypothetical baby we baked in class. Did it get hypothetically clean? Mother, please, Miss Randolph, stop discouraging me. Uh, Randolph, uh, stop discouraging, Judy. I'm not discouraging her. I'm just trying to find out how good she is at bathing a baby. Oh, why, dear? Because my dog hasn't been washed in three months. <laughs> Are you trying to get me to wash your dog? Well, the dog's mighty smelly. My field is baby. Mother, I have a wonderful idea. I could go in the baby-minding business. Oh, no, not that. Think of the future generations. People are always looking for somebody to come in and mind their baby. I could charge 25 cents an hour, and if I worked seven nights every week... And went out on dates in the daytime. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Oh, well, it would have been a good idea. Maybe some night when I don't have a date, I'll do it. I'm sure glad my cradle days are over. Judy! Judy! Yes, Randolph. Judy, I drummed up some business for you. Business? What kind of business? Baby minding business. Mr. and Mrs. Hess have to go to their sister's wedding, and they want you to come over and take care of their baby this afternoon and stay all evening until they get home. But I might still get a date for tonight. Mrs. Hess will pay 30 cents an hour, Judy. 30 cents an hour? Why, that's a nickel more than I planned on charging. Well, don't change your plans. The nickel is for me, for getting you the job. <laughs> Now, you know what to do, Judy. Give him his bottle now, and then at 6 o'clock again, and at 10 o'clock tonight. Can I bathe him, Mrs. Hess? No, it won't be necessary. He had his bath this morning. Now, here are the bottles in the refrigerator, and just keep them in the bottle warmer. I know how to give a baby a bath. He's perfectly clean. Judy, are you sure I can trust you to like him home? Oh, absolutely, Mrs. Hess. You don't need to give the baby another thought. I've been taking care of a hypothetical baby in domestic science for the last two weeks. I know simply everything. Oh, if my husband didn't want to go to his sister's wedding so much, I'd stay home. But nothing could possibly go wrong. Nothing went wrong in domestic science. Yes, well, all right. Don't forget his bottles. You can have the most implicit trust in me. Well, goodbye, Judy. Bye. I think God of pain. Has him little baby got a pain in that the old tummy. What? What a pain in nasty old tum tum. Oh, it's you, Randolph. For a moment, I thought the baby was talking. What are you doing here? Oh, I just thought I'd stop in and see how well you're minding the baby. I've got to look out for my commission. You know, I think I'll give the baby a bath. Does it need it? Well, its mother said it didn't. She said to give it a bottle. I think it ought to have one or the other. Is it a boy baby or a girl baby? It's a boy baby. Are you sure? Well, its name's Chester. Give it a bottle. <laughs> Now, what I came over here mainly to tell you is that I detect a little item in the newspaper which reads as follows. Baby contest this afternoon. $25 prize for most beautiful baby. Honestly, Randolph? Why, that's wonderful. We could enter Chester. Well, he isn't very beautiful. My enthusiasm for the contest has practically petered out since I saw him. Never mind. <laughs> Randolph, you have a great idea. I'll get the baby ready right away. Come on, Peter. Kim's going to look mighty pretty. Kim's going to be in boots. Randolph, he's kind of, you know, well, don't look at me. <laughs> Mrs. Hess gave you the directions about what to do in emergency. Oh, I don't think I'll bother. After all, they'll just look at him at the contest. Well, put his hat on and hurry up. There, he's got him. Pretty on and on. Well, we're ready. 
My, won't everybody be surprised when they hear we won the gravy contest? Yeah, and won't they be goggle-eyed when they hear we kept the 25 bucks? <laughs> It's a mess of babies. I feel kind of out of place, Judy. I like dog shows better than this. We aren't concerned with dogs today, Randolph. We're concerned with babies. Entrance register here. Oh, uh, how do you do? I'd like to enter this baby in the contest. Well, how do you do? I'm Mr. Singer, the judge. So you want to enter your baby. My, how young you are to be a mother. Yes, isn't she? <laughs> uh, may I have your name, madam? Judy Foster. Foster. And the baby's name, madam? Chester. And his age, madam. Five months. Oh, that's fine, madam. Now, just go over there to the last seat and make yourselves comfortable. Thank you. The judge, that's me, is ready to begin. And good luck, madam. I wish you'd stop calling me madam. Well, sit down and hold him in your lap. Well, the judge is starting down the line. Gee, Judy, I'm terribly nervous. Isn't there something we ought to do to the baby to help him win the prize? Do to him? Well, when I entered my dog in a contest, I stood him on the floor and pointed his tail. Well, you can't do that to a baby. Well, we ought to do something. He looks terrible. You think he looks better lying down or with me holding him up? At the dog show, I made my dog stand up on his hind legs. The judge is getting closer. You know, I'd feel a lot better about it if we'd have fed this baby raw eggs for a few weeks beforehand. Makes the coat so much glossier. <laughs> Randolph. My goodness, Chester will never win the prize if the judge hears you talking like this. And now, Chester Foster, five months. Oh, fine, little fellow. Aren't you going to see those biceps? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> no. The contest is based purely upon appearance. Oh, I guess our goose is cooked. Well, this is the last one. I'll now go into a huddle and decide the winner. Hmm. Meanwhile, will everybody please place their baby on the blanket in the center of the room so the photographers can photograph them all together? Gee, she's going to have a picture took. Well, bring him over here, Judy. Sit him down someplace in this squawking mess. Look, Randolph. Here's a baby with a bonnet, just like Chester's. Now, this is no time to worry about millinery. And now, everybody, while the photographer sets up his camera, I wish to announce the results of the contest. Oh. First prize of $25, baby Dorothy Johnson. Oh, oh no, that's better. Yes, a little gloss. Second prize of the blue ribbon, baby Chester Foster. Oh, dear, one second time. Oh, Jesus, what do you want with the blue ribbon? I don't know, but my visions of living in wealth for the rest of my life are fading fast. Randolph, let's get out of here before the photographer takes up the picture and Mrs. Hurt finds out about this. There's no use taking any risk. Okay, grab Chester and let's plan. Here he is. Come on, hurry, Randolph. Hmm, I'll get out of there. Oh, imagine that dumb man giving Chester a blue ribbon. What do you think he is? A cow? Randolph, I think I put Chester to bed. I bet he's all tired out from these cutting and losing his stuff. Please, Chester, what a dud you turned out for me. Randolph! Huh? Look at Chester. Does he look sort of strange to you? Yeah. He doesn't look like Chester at all. Randolph, we're going home the wrong baby. <laughs> Judy's troubles with the baby mining business are becoming a bit hectic, and somehow they remind me of my worst trouble. It happened when I tried one of those toothbrushes with the stiff, scratchy bristles. I couldn't break it in. Finally, I gave up and threw it away. Now, a pestilent 50 plus toothbrush would have saved me all that trouble, because the nylon bristles in the pestilent toothbrush are gentle. They're kind to your mouth, but they're not wishy-washy. They give you extra cleansing power because... 50 cups of gentle bristles are united for strength. So, if you want the best feeling, smoothest working, and most efficient toothbrush you've ever used, get a Pepsodent 50 cup toothbrush at your store tonight. And get that bonus for buying it. Remember, packed in every Pepsodent 50 cup toothbrush container is a cash certificate good for 10 cents in extra spending money. And now, let's get back to that date we have with Judy. Terrible mistake I ever made. 
Mrs. Hess isn't going to like it at all. My goodness, don't you ever look at anything but a baby's hat? Well, you were there, too. You could have looked. Gee, I'm coming in the sun. I picked him up and made it to bun. Well, we've got to do something. Got to get the right baby back. Take this to her in post-mortem. Gee, I hope that isn't Mrs. Hess. Hello? Judy? Oh, you're home this time. Gerald Putnam. Gerald Putnam? Gee, Oh, Gerald, that's an absolute vicious lie. Well, I got it on good authority. Listen, how about a date? A date? Yeah, sure. Well, I'll call you back in a few minutes. Okay. Gee, I'd love to, Gerald, but I'm minding a baby. And I just got him mixed up with another baby, and now I've got to get the right baby back. If you want to help me, you can. Well, it sounds like a novel way to help me. It's different, you know. Well, then come over here to the Hesitant House. Okay, I'll be right over. Oh, sure. Yeah. Stand off, Gerald's coming over to help me get this again. Oh, I'll go home. Stand off, I think I've got some expression in the Well, I was just wondering what happened at the baby contest when some kid's mother found the wrong baby under its bonnet. Oh, Jesus. Well, I think I'll go home. See you, Randolph. I'm worried. Well, don't worry. The penalty for kidnapping isn't so bad. Only the death sentence. <laughs> Now, now, do try and control yourself, Mrs. DeLucci. But this isn't my baby, Mr. Sink. Somebody put my bonnet on this baby and stole my Eleanor. Well, keep calm. I'm, I'm sure there must be some very simple explanation of it, Mrs. DeLucci. And where's my baby? If it's so simple, answer me that. Where's my Eleanor? If you'll just let me think. Now, let's see my part of it. This baby is Chester Foster. I know because I was just about to award it second prize. But Mrs. Foster left without waiting for the photographer. Let's not say stole, Mrs. Delucia. This is a very respectable baby contest. He stole it. Come now, we must be ready. Why should she prefer one baby to another? Because my baby is a better baby than her baby. <laughs> now, now, now. Remember, her baby won second prize and yours didn't. <laughs> my baby should have won second prize. He should have won first prize. Now, now, Mrs. Delucia, the judge's decision is final. I don't care. I want my Eleanor back. Very calm. It's so simple. I'll just go to the phone and call Mrs. Foster, and I'm sure as soon as she realizes her mistake, she'll return your Eleanor to you at once. Oh, there's nothing to it at all. <laughs> Uh, what was it you wanted me to do? I want you to look at your baby. My baby? <laughs> oh, oh, all right, I'm looking at him. <laughs> Are you sure he's your baby? Well, of course I'm sure he's my baby. Well, uh, look again. Are you positively sure? What is this? If it's a practical joke, I don't think it's very funny. Now, I want to ask you something. Is your baby a boy or a girl? Well, a boy, of course. <laughs> oh, there's where you're wrong. The baby is a girl. <laughs> yes, that baby's a girl. It's Mrs. Delucci's baby. Mrs. Delucci? Why, this is ridiculous. Who is this? Why, well, this is Mr. Singer. I just awarded your baby second prize at the baby contest. Remember? I certainly do not. I think you have the wrong number. Goodbye. Of all the crazy things. Try to tell me you're a girl, Randolph. He's talking about baby contest. See, but... <laughs> baby contest. Wait a minute. Baby. Here it comes. Randolph. Where's Judy? Now there's an interesting question. <laughs> Randolph, I don't want any of your heading. Out of it. Has Judy done something with the head baby? Well, if you look at the matter closely. Yes. I'm implicated, too. Tell me, Randolph, and tell me quick. Well, I guess I'd better... Judy and I took the Hess baby to a contest. And by mistake, we brought home the wrong baby. Oh, no. Judy's out with Gerald Putnam trying to re-switch the baby. Oh, for the love of heaven. Look, I'm going out and find Judy. And you stay right here, Randolph. Oh, don't worry. After this, I'm not going near her baby. Because she's at least 18. <laughs> Hey, 
Where's the baby? Now, come, come. Let's unravel this whole perturbing mess. This is Mrs. DeLucci, and she's come for her child. Now, where's Mrs. Foster? She's out. Out? My, and I got no satisfaction at all from her on the telephone. Honest, right now I couldn't say just where your baby is. Look here. You're certainly the boy who was with Mrs. Foster at the contest. Oh, yes. now, oh. oh, don't bother with him. Search the house. All right, all right. You go upstairs, Mrs. DeLucci, and I'll look over here. Oh, Mrs. Oh, nice seeing you again. Oh, my God. Hey, Chester, while they're looking around, what do you say you and I scram over to your house? Ah, what? Right here. In one quick switch, we'll straighten this whole thing out. We'll get you home and get Mrs. Delucci's baby out of duty's place. Boy. Boy. Now, where did he go? And where's the baby we left with him? Mrs. Delucci! Mrs. Delucci! <laughs> Something terrible has happened. Now we're missing two babies. Go away, Curly. I'm in a hurry. God, I'm so hungry. I expected to see you carrying a baby, Randolph Foster. Yeah. Oh, you sure look funny. You tell me, do you gotta follow me every place I go? Where are you going in this house for? <laughs> because Chester lives here. Chester is this here infant. Judy! Hey, Judy! Oh, something Juniper, I would get stuck with a baby on my hand. <laughs> you look real dementia, Randolph. <laughs> you gotta mind this baby for a while. <laughs> Where are you going? I gotta find my sister Judy. Now don't let this baby out of your sight. Stay right here. Well, go ahead and play it, Chester. I look domestic. Oh. Hello, Miss Foster. Shirley, what are you doing here? I'm minding the baby. Well, you can stop right now. I'm taking it back where it belongs. Well, doesn't it belong here, Mrs. Foster? It certainly does not. It belongs to a Mrs. DeLucci, and I'm going to take it right back to her. But, Mrs. Foster... Goodness, I don't know how Judy could have mistaken one baby for another. Well, for goodness sake... <laughs> I thought somebody would be at the baby contest, but they were all gone. Well, you can tell Mrs. Hesh you tried to get her baby back. Oh, Gerald, I'll never be able to face you. I'll tell you what. Let's go back to Mrs. Hesh's house. You've still got this, baby. Maybe she won't notice the difference. Of course she'll notice. Judy! Hey, Judy! Oh, I've been looking all over for you. What do you want, Linda? Come on to Mrs. Hesh's house. Quick! I got Chester back. You did? That's wonderful. You grab this, baby. Oh, come on, Judy. Let's run. We can't take any chances on making connections this time. See that baby you got there? His name is Delucci. His mother's been screaming all over the place. Your mother's been screaming all over the place, too, Judy. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, boy, I sure got my fingers crossed. Here we are. Now, where's Chester? Yes, he was right here at home. Well, Curly is here. Maybe we have this same old, what's his name? Lucy. Oh, gee. There's been a mighty lot of baby snacking going on. You know, I wonder if whoever snacked Chester just now snacked Curly, too. Curly's very... Curly, where have you been? I've been around. Well, I wish you'd been around Chester. Somebody took him. Your mother did. Mother? Yeah, she said he belonged to Mrs. Uh, DeLucci or something like that. She just took the baby and walked out. Well, you're some baby miner, you are. Well, well, sure. What John Maple she didn't over to Spruce. You, you know, know where she is now. Why, well, sure, I just came back from there. Well, lead us through it. <laughs> Colossal mess in the history of man. Gee, what will we do, Gerald? We can't just walk in and say, how do you do, here's your baby, give us ours. They'd arrest us. There's something worse, maybe. Well, let's meet in the back and I'll put you through the open thing. That's a good idea, Gerald. Come on. No, I see it, Curly. Take Randolph. <laughs> Now go right down and do the sleep on dinner. 
Well, Judy, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking care of Chester. Poor child, you must have had a very dull day. <laughs> oh, it was all right. <laughs> oh, my Chester looks contented. You must have taken marvelous care of him. He's sleeping peacefully as a little angel. I guess maybe he's tired. <laughs> oh, what would he have to be tired about after a peaceful day at home, the little darling? <laughs> Judy, oh, I thought I'd meet you on the way home. Listen, I've got the most amazing news. What's wrong, Randolph? Oh, nothing's wrong. Listen, the baby that won first prize was disqualified for being overage. And Mr. Singer just called to say Chester won first prize. He did? Yeah. And I went right over to Mr. Singer's house and got the dough. Twenty-five dollars. Count him. Oh, my. Oh, it's funny. For heaven's sake. Gee, I hardly feel right about keeping it, though. You know, Randolph, what I think would be the fair thing to do? What? Not to charge Mrs. Hess for taking care of the baby. Well, that's that. Oh, Randolph. Randolph, what were you doing five years ago today? Sorry, Mr. Keating, I hadn't any idea. Really observant. Well, five years is a long time, and it's easy to forget things. But what about those five years? Have they been pleasant ones for you? Oh, sure. Everything has been just swell. Well, that's because you've been one of the lucky ones, Randolph. And I wouldn't want to change that for anything. But here's something that all true Americans should try to change. For five years, things haven't been so swell for some real friends of ours. The Chinese people. Five years ago today... Japan launched its brutal assault on China. For five long years, China has been fighting to save her freedom from the Japs. And those years have been horrible ones for the Chinese people. More than three million Chinese soldiers have been killed. Soldiers like your sons, brothers, and husbands. Fifty million Chinese civilians are homeless. People who are as peaceable and home-loving as you and your neighbors. Two million Chinese children are orphans. Helpless, innocent children just like yours. No, things haven't been so swell in China. Let's do all we can to change that. You can help relieve the suffering there by contributing to United China Relief. And when you do, remember this. Not only does China need us, but we need China. If the Chinese front falls, our hope of a short war falls with it. So... Put it on the basis of giving tangible evidence of American friendship to the Chinese people. Put it on the basis of insurance against the invasion of our shores and the bombing of our homes and factories. Put it on any basis you want. United China Relief deserves, yes, demands your support. Send your money to your local United China Relief chairman or the United China Relief, 1790 Broadway, New York, New York. Hi, Judy. Remember, you all have another date with Judy come Tuesday next. A date with Judy with Deli Ellis and Dix Davis is written by Jerome Lawrence and Aline Leslie. Original music by Gordon Jenkins. And remember, for the safety of your smile, use Pepsodent twice a day, see your dentist twice a year. Larry Keating speaking. <laughs> this program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. K. Company. K. Company. K. Company. K. A date with Judy.
you ever attend a high school sorority meeting? If not, you're going to attend one right now. It's Judy Foster sorority, and there is plenty going on. Madam President, there's some new business I'd like to bring up. We haven't finished the old business yet, Sister Judy. To heck with old business. This is utterly vital to the future of the sorority. Okay, Sister Judy, what is it you wish to bring up? Men. Again? Gee, Sister Judy, every time you bring something up, it's men. I can't help it. This time it's devastating news. What's happened, Judy? This year, the boys have decided to make their annual July picnic a stag affair. A stag? A stag? A stag? Oh. You mean without women? It's a terrific insult to our beauty and intelligence and charm. Gee, and I had a new personality all dreamed out just to spring at that picnic. Girls, we've got to take this matter into our own hands. I move the sorority goes out on strike. On strike? Yes. We won't date him and we won't talk to him. But what do we do with all our time? Well, we can... Well, we can be career women. Career women? But then we'd have to work. Yes, but once we're earning big salaries, the boys will realize we can be utterly independent of them. Madam Chairman, I call for an immediate vote. All those in favor of going out on strike right away indicate by saying... Now, wait a minute, Judy Foster. This is not according to parliamentary procedure. Besides, there's something else sort of stinky going on. Why, Madam Chairman, what do you mean? I mean that you and Gerald Putman had a fight, didn't you? Well, what's that got to do with it? Wasn't he seen the other night with that redhead from Glendale High School? I don't care if he was. Madam President, this is nothing personal. It's just that a stag picnic is an attack on all womanhood. It is? It's the beginning of a trend. I've seen it coming for a long time. Why, men treat girls just like, like anybody else. You're right, and sometimes even worse than that. If it'll help us get to the picnic, maybe we ought to go out on strike. If it'll help me get a date ever, maybe we ought to go out on strike. <laughs> Madam President, I call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Nay. Motion carried. That settles it. From now on, we're on strike. No more men. <laughs> Jeepers, we're off to a ghoulish start. It looks as if our date with Judy tonight is going to be something for the books. And here's a problem that's usually something for the chemistry books. What's NaPO3 taken X times plus Ca3PO4 taken two times? Well, that's not as ghoulish as it sounds. It's the reason why some girls have brighter smiles than others. It's composite metaphosphate, the marvelous polishing ingredient that makes teeth shine and sparkle. Pepsodent produces a luster on teeth twice as bright as the average of all other leading brands. So it's just simple arithmetic. If a girl's teeth are twice as bright, her smile is twice as sparkling. Everybody who wants a dazzling smile, go to your drug counter tonight and say, Pepsodent tooth powder, please. Remember, you don't have to exchange an empty can or tube when you get Pepsodent tooth powder. And now, let's get back to that date we have with Judy. Mitzi. Frankly, Judy, I'm not sure I want a career. But, Mitzi, if we give up men, we've got to do something. And I think it'll be spelled swell being a telegraph girl. Gee, I don't know, Judy. Look, it's just right there in the window. Girls wanted must be able to sing. But, Judy, I really don't have a trained voice. It doesn't say trained voice. It just says must be able to sing. Come on in. Ah, how do you do? We saw your sign in the window, and we'd like to apply for jobs. Ah, uh, good. We're looking for a telegraph girl. Been having some difficulty lately. There's a shortage of boys, you know. Isn't that funny? We've been having the same trouble. <laughs> uh, shall we have a little audition? <laughs> now, who wants to be first? Go ahead, Nancy. All right, young lady. Uh, suppose you had to deliver this. A special congratulations 342A. It's to the tune of, do you know, do you can John Peel? Who? John Peel. You know it, of course. Well, not personally. <laughs> Shall we try? Uh, try to get spirit and feeling into it. I'll give you the pitch. We wish you happiness. We wish you joy. We hope you have a baby boy. And when it's there, begins to grow. We hope you have a baby girl. Congratulations. <laughs> My, uh, you don't have much range, do you? <laughs> I, I can practice. I'm very sorry. I don't think you do. Uh, Talk next. Talk Talk I'm ready. What do you want me to sing? Let us grapple with a message which presents a real challenge. A number 342C. It's to the tune of Happy Birthday to You. Here's the pitch. 
Happy 22nd wedding anniversary to you. Happy 22nd wedding anniversary to you. Happy 22nd wedding anniversary, Mr. and Mrs. Kendall F. Thurston and family. Happy 22nd wedding anniversary to you. And gee, do they get all that for 26 cents? <laughs> Young lady, you're just what we've been looking for. Now get your uniform and report for service immediately. Jeepers, Judy, you've been drafted. <laughs> Well, what are you supposed to be? I'm a telegraph girl. When did all this happen, Judy? This afternoon. I just got my uniform. Do we have to salute you? Certainly not, Randolph. Don't be silly. Well, to what do we owe this sudden change in your personality? <gasps> Father, what time is it? Uh, five after seven. Why? Mother, tell Father I can't speak to him anymore. Our strike deadline was seven o'clock tonight. Strike? Against men. Uh, against men? Yes, the whole sorority went out on strike tonight, and I can't speak to Father because technically he's a man. Uh, <laughs> what do you mean, technically? Well, you see, the boys are having a stag picnic and not inviting us, so we're going out on strike against them. We're not going to date them or talk to them. <laughs> oh, that's the funniest thing I ever heard. <laughs> Randolph, tell Father this is a very serious matter. Uh, Randolph? Well, isn't he technically a man? Well, during the strike, we've got to have some means of communication with the outside world. So... The sorority has hired Randolph as our go between. Morally, I'm still on the man's side of this, Father. But the girls are career women now, and, well, money talks. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a mediator, huh, Randolph? <laughs> sure. What has the NLRB got that I haven't got? <laughs> I can only give you a few minutes of my time. I have some very important telegrams to deliver tonight. Really, Miss Career Woman, you shouldn't waste so much valuable time on us. Randolph will be here any moment to give us a report. A report on what? A report on how the boys are taking our strike. I only hope the boys don't find out how we're taking our strike. Hello, agents. Here's Randolph. Hello, Randolph. <laughs> Boy, have I got some dirt to dish. Are the boys positively gaga? I'm not passing out any free adjective, Winches. All information is strictly COD. Twenty-five cents, please, in advance. How do we know you've got anything to tell us? Madam President, I just spent a full hour in Scully's drugstore listening to all your jewelry boyfriends drool. All right, all right, here's your quarter. <laughs> what did Gerald Putnam say? Let me see. Uh, Gerald Putnam, he said like this. Gee, I wish Judy let me talk to her. Did he really say that? Yes, I think it was Judy he said. Huh? No, it might have been I wish Janie let me talk to her. Or maybe it was Sadie. What did Mervyn say? Mervyn, he said like this. Scully, bring me another chocolate marshmallow super duper. Is that all? He's a very quiet youth. <laughs> Did you see Howard Teichman there? Oh, yes. Was he miserable about me not talking to him? Howard Teichman, Madam President, he said like this. I think this strike's a good idea. It saves this guy so much money. I don't believe it. You're a nasty little boy. Okay, by me. If that's the way you feel, Madam President, I resign. With certain information now in my possession, I can get a job anytime with the boys. So long, witches. Yeah. What do you want, young lady? I have a telegram from Mr. Schwartz. He's supposed to be here at the athletic club in a meeting. Well, I guess he's here, but you can't see him. Why not? Well, because you're a girl, ain't you? No girls are allowed to stag party. A what? A stag party. That's where he is. Honest? Yep. Do you believe in stag parties? Well, I ain't firm. Uh, but I ain't again him. Well, I'm again him. How am I ever going to deliver this telegram? Could I sneak in real quick and then sneak out real quick again? Nope. But uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll sneak in and sneak out again. <laughs> Mister, what happens at stag parties? Uh, you ever been in a hen party? Oh, sure, lots of times. Well, it's the same thing, only uh, kind of a masculine kind of way. Hey, I'll open the door and you take a peek. Oh, swell. <laughs> Gee, just a bunch of men singing and stuff. Yep. Oh, sometimes I wish they'd do something interesting. 
Well, I guess I'll take that telegram into Miss Swart. Good morning, Judy. Good morning, Mother. Ah, it's Miss Mercury. Did you sleep well here? No. I was delivering telegrams all night in my sleep. Oh, well. After delivering them all day and then again last evening, no wonder. Yes, I delivered six and a half messages last evening alone. Six and a half? How can you deliver half a message? What happened, dear? Well, the man the telegram was addressed to was in a stag party at the athletic club, and the watchman kind of helped me deliver it. Did you say a stag party at the athletic club? Yes. There were a lot of men who were playing cards and laughing and singing and everything. What were they singing? Oh, like this. Dum, 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 dum. Oh, dum. they were. That's not Tchaikovsky. There's a certain husband of mine named Melvin Foster who couldn't take me out last night because he had to go to a political meeting at the athletic club. Oh. What Judy probably heard was a campaign song. I'd like to hear the tune he sings when he comes down to breakfast. Heads up, everybody. By a wonderful coincidence... Here comes Father now. Uh, uh, well, good morning, everybody. How's everything this bright and cheery morning? Hmm? <laughs> well, what's the matter? What are you looking at me like that for? Well, isn't anybody going to talk to me? Well, what is the matter here? Melvin, how was that political meeting you attended last night? Oh, a corker. Best discussion of world affairs I've heard in a long time. <laughs> Well, then maybe you can tell me whose national anthem this is. La dee 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 dee. Lord, where have you been? <laughs> where have I been? Where have you been? That's what I want to know. Judy. Yes, Mother. What is it you girls are doing since your men started sagging it? We're on strike. We don't date him and we don't talk to him. Randolph, will you please inform your father that I'm not talking to him? And I'm not going out to them on any more dates. Beginning right now, I'm on strike two. Shall I deliver that as a straight message or as a singing telegram? Judy will be back in just a minute to untangle all this wire trouble. Now, I'd like to send a telegram myself. It's addressed to a man named Case, who's so cross they call him Crank Case. No, really, they do. And here's the message. Quote, understand you always frown. Stop. Let me tell you about a man who was as grouchy as you, but who now is all sweetness and life. He used to have trouble after trouble with toothbrushes. Scratchy ones gouged his gums. Droopy ones bogged down on his teeth. Then he tried a Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush. It's the brush that makes people glad to brush their teeth because it feels so good. The nylon bristles are gentle, not scratchy. They're springy and alive. And 50 tufts of them are united to clean teeth better than they were ever cleaned before. Get a Pepsi and 50 tuft toothbrush for every member of your family. And with every brush, you'll receive a cash certificate worth 10 cents extra spending money. A 10 cent bonus for you. And now, straighten your tie, because we're off again on that date with Judy. Gerald. Are you spying on me? Well, yes, in a nice sort of way. Are you working for the sorority? Well, I don't exactly have a social security number, but I suppose I could be construed as being employed. Well, I've been watching your work, Randolph, and I'd like to make you a little offer. How would you like to come over on our side? Friend, if you can match the pay, you can consider me working for you as of now. Swell. Well, get to work. I have a killer of an idea to break the strike. But it's worth a quarter if it's worth a nickel. I'll give you a nickel. This is strictly a two-bit idea. Well, that's big dough. But this is a big idea. Frankly, Gerald, it's not the money. My sister Judy hasn't had a date for four nights. And, friend, if she doesn't get out of the house soon, I'll go back. Well, all right. What's the idea? Well, since my sister Judy's a telegraph girl... <laughs> Foster, here's a telegram to be delivered to Mr. Gerald Putnam. To Gerald Putnam? 
Oh, I can't deliver to him. I'm not on speaking terms with him. Well, you don't have to speak to him. You merely have to sing. Technically, it's the same thing. Miss Foster, have you ever heard those sacred lines? Neither rain, nor snow, nor sleet, nor gloom of night can stay these faithful couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. Jesus, that's beautiful. Then chin up out into the rain and snow. Why, Mr. Sawyer, it isn't raining or snowing. Technically, it's the same thing. Well, a telegram from me? A straight singing wire from Mr. Gerald Putnam. Are you he? I am he. You know darn well I am. Well, give her the vocal. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Gerald Potsdam. Happy birthday to you. Signed, a loving friend who's the first to remain anonymous. I didn't quite get that message. You did so get that message. Besides, it's not your birthday at all. Your birthday's in February. Oh, I'm talking, Miss Foster. I thought the motto of your company was the customer is always right. Well, you're an exception. Look, Judy, why don't you girls call off this strike? What are you mad at me for anyway, Judy? You know very well what I'm mad at you for. Is it because of that old picnic being stagged? It's a lot more than that. Well, then what is it? Well, when a man has been going steady with a girl for a whole week like you have with me, he, he, he isn't seen with a certain red-headed number from Glenville High School. Oh, but Judy, give me a chance. I'm not talking to you, Gerald Putnam. But you've been talking to me, Judy. I was talking to myself. And if you happen to overhear me, that's just too bad. <laughs> Foster, I'm so glad you're back. There's another singing telegram to be delivered in your territory. Yes, it's right. Uh, well, my goodness, isn't this a coincidence? It's addressed to the self-same party, Mr. Gerald Putnam. Oh, caterpillars. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, Gerald Putnam. Happy anniversary to you. Signed, a warm admirer. Lovely, lovely. Just how long have you been married, Mr. Putnam? <laughs> to Mother on Mother's Day. Though your hair has turned to silver, though your cheeks are wan and pale, we will th think of you forever and your years of hard travail. Sign your girl who loves you very much. Oh, that's sweet. Judy, how about a date? I wouldn't go out with you if you were my... my mother. Best wishes to you on Halloween. Salutations on Michaelmas. Greetings to you on Groundhog Day. We hope you have... Gerald Putnam, I never want to have anything to do with you again. Either in person or in my professional capacity as a telegraph girl. Goodbye. <laughs> Randolph, as an idea, man, you're a dud. I've been sending telegrams to myself all day, and Judy hasn't even given me a tumble. You give me my quarter back. Now, hold on, Tim. Think I can save your investment. I have in my possession an idea that is so good it staggers even me. I'm not interested. At 50 cents, I'm practically giving this idea away. 50 cents? It's guaranteed to get Judy on a date. Well, okay. And curiosity is making a sucker out of me again. But here... What's the idea? Very simple. Just start back with happy birthday and go through the whole thing all over again. Well, Ice Cube, we're home. I had an adorable time, Mr. Gerald Putnam. I had a fine time, too. Great experience. As the nearest I ever came to dating a clothing store, dummy. Thank you very much. That was a very lovely compliment. But remember, you wore me down. You positively coerced me into this thing. Oh, but gee whiz, Judy. Furthermore, if you don't like my company, you can go out with that red-headed beauty from Grenville High School. But I've been trying for hours to tell... I told you at the start of this evening that we're not indulging in any conversation on this date. You forget I'm on strike. Oh, okay. I'll walk you up to the door. You needn't bother. Somebody might see us together. Good night, Mr. Putnam. Okay. Good night, Judy. Surprise! Surprise! What are you girls doing? 
doing here? What do you think we're doing? Strike breaker. Wait a minute. Are you spying on me? You're darn right we are, Scab. Oh, why did you do it, Judy? Scab, you took a solemn oath not to date men. But that wasn't really a date. I was only Come trying on, to... girls. The prize is over now. The strike's over, too. I but, Madam President, Judy Foster, after this, if you want to do any striking, it's going to be a one-woman strike. Oh, caterpillar. <laughs> Hi, Father. Hello, Randolph. As the only one in this family who is talking to you, Father, I wanted you to know that I feel for you very deeply. In fact, condolences to you on Father's Day. Oh, well, thank you, son. Randolph, do you understand women? Yes, Father, I do. You do? Well, you've got something on me. Father, I hate to see you sitting in here and the female element of our family sitting in the study and never the twain till me. I'm an old fixer, Father. Do you think you can clear me with uh, Mrs. Foster? Well, for certain pecuniary remuneration, Father. <laughs> so, dear Randolph, you get your mother talking to me again, and I shall do but handsomely by you. Oh, but, Father, before I can handle your case, I have to have complete frankness. Uh... Frankness, Randolph? Yes, Father. Were you at a political meeting at the athletic club, or were you at a stag party? Randolph, I'm going to tell you, man to man, in about 15 years from now. Gee, Mother, you and I are the only two women left on strike. You against Father and me against Gerald. Frankly, I don't think it's very effective. But we can't give in, Judy. It would be a confession of weakness. I'll get it. Hello? I'll speak to Miss Judy Foster, please. This is the telegraph office. Speaking? This isn't Mr. Sawyer, is it? No, this is Mr. Sawyer's superior. Your voice sounds very familiar. Oh, <laughs> I uh, don't think we've met. I guess not. I haven't met many executives. <laughs> Funny, for a minute I thought you were my brother. <laughs> Ridiculous. Miss Foster, we've had a complaint from one of our customers. Who? The other evening you were supposed to deliver a message to a meeting at the athletic club. Were you not? Yes, sir. Well, it got to the wrong person. You delivered it to the stag party instead of to the political meeting. Miss Foster. Oh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I... Well, in the future, be more careful. Good evening. Good evening. Mother... I'm in disgrace with a telegraph company. Why? What did you do? There were two meetings the other night at the athletic club. A stag party and a political meeting, and I don't know... A political that... meeting at the club the other night? Yes, I guess that's where I was supposed to go. That's where your father was supposed to go. But that's where he did go. Oh, the poor man, the injustice I've done him. Injustice? Oh, I can't wait till I see your father so I can ask him for a date. Oh, Judy, as of now, you are on a one-woman strike. Oh, lonely. I'll get it. Hello? Hello, Judy. This is Randolph. Guess what I just found out? What? That redhead from Glenville High School is Gerald's first cousin. His cousin? Their relationship is purely a relationship. I extracted the information myself. Right out of the mouth of the redhead. I'm dying. Oh, poor Gerald. That's all there is for now. Goodbye. Oh, Mother, now that everything's all right, everything's all wrong. Why, dear? Joe's been too blue to me all along, and I've been treating him like a brute. Do you suppose he'll ever look at me again after the way I treated him? How can I ever face him? Oh, I'll get the door, dear. Oh, Randy, it's really hot. Oh, it's you, dear. I love you, too. Gerald! Your telegraph voice. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, Judy, how about a rehearsal? Rehearsal? What for? Mr. Sawyer's orders. From now on, we're doing duets. A one, a two. I, I love, love you truly, truly, truly. Hold on. The story's not over. In a moment, we'll see what happens. But first... Here's an important message from your government. 
there's an exciting, important new branch of the armed forces now forming, the Winged Commandos. The Winged Commandos will operate Uncle Sam's fast-growing glider force, and the U.S. Army Air Forces need thousands of men to become glider pilots. Tough, self-reliant men are needed for an all-out offensive against the enemy. And make no mistake, these Winged Commandos will be among the leaders in our smashing attacks to crush the Axis. You may be one of the men qualified for immediate training in the six weeks course at the new Army Air Forces Glider School. Listen to see if you are eligible. The Air Forces will accept the following men for training. If you are a civilian between 18 and 36 years of age who can pass an Army physical examination and now hold a pilot certificate of private grade or better, register at your nearest Civil Aeronautics Administration office. If you are a former aviation cadet, with 50 hours or more of flying time at an Army, Navy, or Marine flying school who is not currently in the air services of the armed forces, register at the nearest CAA office or Army Air Corps headquarters. If you are an Army man who was a civilian pilot or has had flight training in the armed services, see your commanding officer. And if you can't meet these requirements, you still get your chance. Men between 18 and 36 may apply to any one of the 600 colleges of the Civil Aeronautics Administration to take a preliminary course for glider pilot training. When you complete this schooling, you are then eligible to take the regular Army Air Forces glider course. America is growing wings, big wings, fighting wings. Get your wings as a glider pilot. Join the wing commandos now. Before Judy comes downstairs, I've got a piece of man command advice for you. Keep clear of stag parties. Oh, don't worry, Mr. Foster. We've already called off our stag picnic. Say, does anybody remember me? Randolph Foster, the old fixer-upper? Well, yes, yeah, say thanks, Randolph. <laughs> that phony phone call you made saved my life. I'll pay you back someday. I'm a cash-on-the-line man, Father. Fee for impersonating the telegraph company, 75 cents. Well, Okay. You are, Randolph. And as for you, Gerald, my fee is one American dollar. Haven't you bled me enough? <laughs> what did you do for Gerald that was worth a dollar? One of the toughest assignments of my career. I converted a Glenville High School redhead into a first cousin. <laughs> invited to have another date with Judy next Tuesday night. A date with Judy with Deli Ellis and Dix Davis is written by Jerome Lawrence and Aline Lester. Original music by Gordon Jenkins. And remember, for the safety of your smile, use Pepsodent twice a day. See your dentist twice a year. Larry Keating speaking. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. This is the National Broadcasting Company. This is the National Broadcasting Company. This is the National Broadcasting Company.